of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. dates and places in the following story are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Now that warmer weather prevails throughout the country, more and more families will be getting out of doors, into the yard, on trips to the beach, and drives to the country. Yet, via the medium of radio, you will be able to keep informed on world events as they happen at a rapid-fire pace. You will be able to listen and be entertained by music, drama, mystery, and comedy. For wherever you go, there's radio. And the NBC Radio Network is on the job to keep you informed and entertained. Yes, whenever you tune to this NBC station, you can be sure that you'll hear the finest in radio listening. More than one-third of the radio sets in the nation are in automobiles or are of the portable type. So if you go to the beach for an afternoon of fun in the sun, if you drive into the country to view the lush new growth... Or if your outdoor activity is limited to putting Vigoro on your lawn to bring it back to rich green life, take along your radio. You'll be royally entertained when you tune to the NBC radio network. And now, let's get back to the tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, from the files of the Texas Rangers, the case called Address Unknown. It is just before noon on a hot day in August 1940 in the Big Bend country of Texas, 40 miles northeast of the Mexican border. A poorly dressed woman trudges along a dirt road. With one hand, she leads a four-year-old boy. In the other, she carries a cheap cardboard suitcase. How far we got to walk, Mama? Oh, quite a piece yet before we get the bus stop. Now, you come on, Tommy. Give me a hand. I'm hungry. Yeah, I expect you at that. I reckon I could use a bite of food myself. What we got to eat, Mama? We'll go over across the road and sit under that tree. Give us a little bit of shade anyhow. And we'll use that old flat rock for a table. What we got to eat? Oh, something good. What? Sandwiches. We got the nice side meat. I want peanut butter. Tomorrow, Tommy, when we get to Aunt Josie's. Peanut butter would make you too thirsty to dain all this hot sun. I want a drink, Mama. Well, I ain't got none, Tommy. Left the house so fast this morning, I clean forgot about bringing a jar of water. But I'm thirsty. Tommy, we're just gonna have to... Wait a minute, that ranch house over there, they ought to have some water. I'm thirsty. Tommy, honey, see that house down the road? Uh Uh-huh. Well, you just walk down there and ask them if they got a tin can they can give you some water in. It's so far. Well, I'll be watching you. Now, go long now. All right, Mama. Mind you, don't stop to play now. Just get the water and bring it right back. All right, Mama. Well, now, look what we got here. <laughs> hey, what's a little fella like you doing all the way out here by yourself? My mama wants a can of water. Why, sure, Sonny. Where's she at? Over there. We're back on the road? Uh-huh. We're going to Aunt Josie's. Is that so? Now, what's your name, Sonny? Tommy. Well, Tommy, you come right on out back and we'll see what we can do about getting you some water. We got chickens and a horse. Yeah, well, now. What kind of horse is he? His name's Robin. Robin and Tommy, huh? Yeah, I bet you make quite a pair. Now, here's a cup full of water for you. There. Now, I reckon we can put the water for your ma in this pail here. You and your ma live around here, Tommy, do you? No, we live home. Huh? Uh Uh-huh. There you are now. There. You want some more water? Uh-uh. Yeah, maybe I'd better ride you back to your ma in my car. It's too hard for a little fella like you to be walking. Come on now, Tommy. Mama and me rode in the car this morning. Is that so? Hey, did you come for her? I don't know. Yeah, in you go, Tommy. Yeah, now slide all the way across. Now we just put this pail in the middle here. 
this your car? Yep. Had it a long time, too. Now, where'd you leave your mama? Over there. We got side meat sandwiches. Yeah, I bet they're good, too. <laughs> your face looks funny. Huh? Oh! <laughs> you mean my whiskers, huh? Well, that's what happens when you don't shave for a couple of days. I don't got no whispers. Well, you'll get whispers soon enough, Tommy. And when you do, you'll wish you didn't have them. Yeah, this where you left your mom? Uh-huh. All right. Come on, Tommy. Come on. There. There we are. My mom ain't here. Where's my mama? Oh, she's around there somewhere. Suitcase and lunch are sitting there. Where's my mama? Now, 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 Tommy. She'll probably be right back in a minute. I'll give her a call. Let her know that we're here. Lady! Oh, lady! I want my mama! Lady! Where are you, lady? Mama! Mama! Lady! Lady, I got your little boy here. Mama! I want my mama! Tommy, Tommy, she'll be right back now. I want my mama! 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 mama. After the rancher had waited half an hour for the boy's mother to appear, he took Tommy back to his house. Then he phoned Texas Ranger Company headquarters, located some 30 miles to the north. Rangers Jace Pearson and Clay Morgan arrived an hour later. They went with the rancher and the boy to the spot where the missing woman had last been seen. There, Ranger. Suitcase and lunch spread out on that there rock. I just can't figure it. I want my mama. Now, Tommy, don't cry. Everything's going to be all right. I want my What's your other name, Tommy? Tell me what. Tommy, who else? I want to go. Whoa, mama. now, Tommy, whoa. Let's not run away. I want to go to my mama. Come here, son. We're going to find your mama. Clay, take a look around. See if you can find anything. Sure, Jace. What's that? What? Oh, that's my badge. What's it for? Well, uh, to wear. Tommy, where's your daddy? Didn't he come with you? My daddy's in heaven. I see. Where do you live, Tommy? Home. I don't know if it'll help any ranger, but he said they lived in a place where there were chickens and they have a horse named Robin. Uh huh. Well, did you walk over here from your house, Tommy? Yeah. We got thirsty. He said they rode in a car this morning. I might have got a lift part way. Where were you going, Tommy? To Aunt Josie's. Yes. Now, what is it, Clay? Come on over here a second. Can I go with you? Oh, you stay here, Tommy. I'll be right back. Yeah, Tommy, yeah. You stay here with me. And if you're real good, I'll let you ride one of my horses. What'd you find? Some tracks here leading into the brush. Yeah, let's see where they go. You figure the woman could have run off and left the kid? Maybe. Doesn't seem likely she'd take off into the brush like this. Yeah, you're probably right. She left her suitcase, too, if she... Hey, Jace. Look at that. Yeah, another set of tracks coming in at an angle. Much heavier than the ones we've been following. Could have been a man. Looks like he was moving pretty fast, too. Come on. The tracks are starting to overlap. Maybe the second set was made by somebody coming along after the woman already passed. No path going through here. Doubt if anybody would come this way unless he had some special reason. Yeah, I wonder why... Clay. Huh? Over there to the left. All that torn brush piled up. Looks like it's covering something. Let's go have a look. Pull the brush aside. Yeah. Here she is, Jish. Dead? Yeah, strangled. Beaten up first. Pretty powerful man from the look of those marks on her face and throat. There's a little purse in the pocket of her dress. Anything in it? Twelve dollars and a comb. Reckon we can rule out robbery. Uh Uh-huh. My poor little boy. It's times like this when I wish I'd never seen a badge. How are we going to tell him about this? Well, we can't for a while. The thing we have to do is keep his mind off his mother until we find out more about him. I guess you're right. The way it looks, Jace, the killer didn't go any further into the brush. No, oh, he probably headed back for the road. Let's see if we can pick up his trail. We found the trail. The tracks came out on the road 50 feet from where the dead woman's suitcase had been left. We checked the suitcase without finding any identification. Then we called for the Justice of the Peace, and I waited while Clay took Tommy Wilkes back to our headquarters. After the J.P. arrived, we took the woman's body into town. It was 4.30 when I walked into the office where Clay was talking to Tommy. 
<laughs> All right, Tommy, you just play with these while I go over and talk to Major Pearson for a minute. Hi. How are you doing? I've been trying to keep him occupied. Maybe those handcuffs will keep him busy for a while. Mm, it's a wonder you didn't give me your pistol. Maybe you think he didn't ask for one. <laughs> He's a swell kid, Jace, but I'm worn out. He's got more energy than a two-year-old bobcat. Did you have him photographed? Yeah, we had to practically chain him down to keep him still. I see you got him some ice cream. Yeah, he was hungry. He's already eaten over half of it. How come you got so much? I tried to get a pint. All they had left was corks. Find out any more about his family? No. Maybe you better have tried it. Mm Mm-hmm. How's everything, Tommy? Fine. Just sit and talk a while, huh? Can I have some ice cream? No, I think you had enough, Tommy. I want some ice cream. Well, all right. Clay, put a little more ice cream in that dish. Sure. Tommy, you said you were going to your Aunt Josie's. Uh-huh. Here you are, Tommy. Will you fix it for me? Hmm. What's he mean? He likes it stirred up. Won't eat it unless it's like soup. <laughs> All right. Now, let's see. You like ice cream? Yeah, sometimes. Here you are, Tommy. Is that better? Uh-huh. Tommy, did you ever go to your Aunt Josie's before? Uh-uh. How long were you and your mama walking on the road? I don't know. Did you eat breakfast at home this morning? Uh-huh. Well, that could narrow down our area some, Jason. Yeah. Tommy, when did you... Oh, wait a second. You're spilling ice cream all down your sleeve. Here, I'll wipe hey. it. What's the matter? It hurts. Where? Here. Just let me pull that sleeve back and take a look. Hey, that's an ugly-looking black and blue mark. How'd you get this mark on your arm, Tommy? George did it. Who's George? Is he your brother? No, he's George. Where does he live? At our house. Why'd you do it, Tommy? He he said I was bad. (gasps) I wasn't bad. Is George a little boy or a man? A a man. You tired, Tommy? I want my mom to put me to bed. Uh, We'll put you to bed, Tommy. A nice big bed. I want my mama. Take him out and put him in that cot in the next room, will you, Clay? Sure. Come on, Tommy. Let's go. You gonna take me to bed, though? Sure. I want my mama to... While Clay was putting Tommy to bed, I checked by phone with the two post offices within a 30-mile radius of the spot where Tommy's mother had been killed. Nobody by the name of Wilkes was listed in the entire area. We sent Tommy's picture to all newspapers in the vicinity. The next morning, Clay and I took Tommy in the car and started combing the countryside in the hope that he would recognize some landmark. By noon, we'd accomplished nothing. You getting a little hungry, Tommy? Yeah. Yeah, we'll see if we can't find some kind of store soon. We'll all have lunch, huh? Can I have peanut butter? Yeah, if you want. Mama gives me peanut butter at home. I don't like side meat sandwiches. Mm Mm-hmm. You like side meat? Oh, there's Pedro. Who? Pedro, he comes to see George. You mean that man on the burrow we just passed? Yeah. I'll back up. You sure you know him? He's Pedro. Hey, senor, hold up a minute. You call me, senor? Yeah, you mind coming back here? Arre, conchita, arre. Come out here, Tommy. That's a boy. That donkey sounds funny. Buenos dias, senores. What is it you want? Your name, Pedro? Si, Pedro Sanchez. You ever see this little boy before? No, I never see him before. Pedro? Just a minute, Tommy. He says he knows you. Told us your name was Pedro. Yeah. Senor, many people have that name. I know you, Pedro. No, little boy, you make a mistake. Maybe the mustache will make him think he know me. You sure you don't know the boy? Maybe he see me somewhere, senor, but I don't remember him. Tommy here says you've been to his house, says you visited somebody there by the name of George. George? (laughs) No, senor, this little boy, he make a mistake. You know how it is with the small ones. Sometimes they have a large imagination. You live near here, Pedro? Si, Maybe seven, eight miles by the river. On the border? See. Si. All right. I'm sorry we troubled you. Oh, any time, senores. Any time at all. Oh, by the way, is that general store down the road still open? Maria store? Oh, see, si. It's open. Thanks. De nada. Adios, senores. Arre, Conchita. Arre. Bye, Pedro. Tommy, you sure that's the man who come to see George? He comes to our house and sits at the table and talks to George. I don't know. What do you make of it, Jason? Could be a mistake or Tommy's imagination. Then again, it's just possible our friend Pedro is lying. In 
In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Have you ever left home, locked the door behind you, and had the uneasy feeling that you left a burning cigarette behind? Next time, you'd better go back and check, because every 20 seconds throughout the year, a fire breaks out in the United States through carelessness. These fires kill 11,000 persons each year, disfigure for life or severely burn thousands more, and destroy $7 million worth of property. Protect your home from fire by following these simple safety precautions. Don't smoke in bed or throw away lighted cigarettes. Clean out closets, attics, basements, and any place where old newspapers, magazines, and inflammable materials are liable to accumulate. Repair defective electric equipment and replace worn or frayed wiring. Use cleaning fluids that won't burn and be careful with matches. Keep them out of the reach of children. Fires in the home, your home, can and must be prevented. Remember, don't gamble with fire. The odds are against you. And now back to the tales of the Texas Rangers. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and our authentic story, Address Unknown. After we left Pedro, we drove down to Maria's general store. We took Tommy inside with us. One corner, two men sat playing checkers and arguing in low voices. A large woman sat behind the counter, swatting as many flies as she could reach from where she was sitting. Buenos dias, senores. Oh, you ever see such a hot day? Well, it's dear, senor. The heat comes, all the flies. To kill one fly, you get ten in his place. We'd well, like to get some lunch. Si, sí, senores. I have some cheese in the icebox. If you got the time, I can make uh, chili, tacos. How about peanut butter? Si, si, I get it. Uh, one bottle of peanut butter. Anything else, senores? Yeah, a loaf of bread and a bottle of milk. I see. Oh, it's hot, senores. Here's the bread and peanut butter. I'll get the milk in a minute. Her name is Maria. What'd you say, Tommy? Her name's Maria. <laughs> you remember my name, eh, muchacho? You know this boy, senora? Oh, see, he comes here sometimes with his mother. Tommy, suppose you go with that candy case and pick out something you want. We'll be right over. Hi. You know where this Mrs. Wilkes lives? Wilkes? Pero, senor, the senora who bring a little boy here, she's not named Wilkes. Her name Collins. Collins? You sure that's her name? Well, that's what she call herself, senor, so that's what I call her. You know where her place is? Oh, see, you go down the road two miles, and then you turn left. After maybe half a mile, you come to her house. Is she and the little boy the only ones who live there? Hell no, senor. She got a husband. Husband? His name George, by any chance? Yeah, George Collins. He's the one. He come here sometimes to drink beer. Mm, sounds like Tommy's mother must have remarried. Uh-huh. And look at that bruise on Tommy's arm. I'd say George Collins isn't a very affectionate stepfather. Senora, you know a man named Pedro Sanchez? Hello, see? He was here today, just a little while ago. Have you ever seen him with George Collins? Well, sometimes they are together here drinking beer. Thanks. Let's get Tommy, Clay. We're going to pay George Collins a visit. We went to the Collins' house. It was empty. We guessed that nobody had been there that day. We we're pretty sure now that George Collins was involved in his wife's murder. But before we could look for him, we had to get Tommy taken care of for the night. On the way back to town, we radioed Austin for a make on Collins. After we made arrangements for Tommy, we went to headquarters and found a mugshot of Collins that had come in on the wire photo together with his record. He'd served a two-year sentence for car theft. Our problem was to find him. We had an idea that Pedro Sanchez, the man we'd met that morning, knew more than he'd told us. After getting directions to his place from the general store, we took horses and started out. It was nearly 11 that night when we rode along the bank of the river and started up a rocky slope. That should be a chase up there near the top. I must still be awake. Leonard's burning in his window. Why do you figure he lied to us this morning? Only thing I can think of. He knows where Collins is and doesn't want us to know. Mm. Nice view of the river from here. Yeah, a little cooler, too. Oh, whoa, Charky. Whoa, Dan. Whoa, boy. Chase, you reckon Collins is hiding out up here with Sanchez? Maybe. It's going to take us long to find out. So much noise. 
You want to have the whole... Oh. Can we come in, Pedro? Uh, si, si. Uh, come in, senores. Can we wake you up? Uh, si. Uh, I was sleeping. Are your lantern lit? Uh, uh, I, I must have forgot to pull it out. Maybe if I move it from the window and put it on the table, we can see better. Are you expecting somebody? Me? Oh, no, senor. Why give you that idea? I kind of thought that lantern in the window might be some sort of signal. Signal? No, senor, you make a mistake. I'm over here by the light, Pedro. Look, you recognize the man in this picture? No, senor. You should. We understand he's a good friend of yours. His name is George Collins. George Collins? I don't know such a man I've never seen before in my life. Why you look so at me, senores? I tell the truth. You always tell the truth, Pedro? She always. This morning you said you didn't know the little boy we had with us. He's George Collins' stepson. That's the truth, senor. He make a mistake. I don't know him and I never see this George Collins. Maria up at the general store says you have. Do you believe this fat woman? She, she lies. If anybody's lying, it's you, Pedro. Senor, I never... Are you sure never... that lantern in the window wasn't a signal for Collins? No, no, no senor. Then put it back in the window, Pedro. Pero... All right, senor... Better go out and move the horses, Clay. Collins is going to show up. We don't want him to know he's got a reception committee. I'm sleepy, senor. It's how much longer I got to sit and wait? Joe Collins gets here. Senor, I tell you, this Collins is not coming. You're wasting your time. Maybe so, but... Hold it, Clay. Somebody's coming. Yeah. When he comes, I'll get the door. Don't you make a sound, Pedro, you hear? Senor, si, si, I right hear. I kill you! Lock him, Gates! Put down that chair, Come Pedro! On, please! This will hold you. Come on, Clay. There he goes, down the slope. Hold it, Collins! He's heading for the river. I'll get him up. Watch it! Last one got him, Jace! Careful. He may be trying some kind of trick. Yeah. He ain't got his shoulder still breathing, though. Must have just knocked him out. Turn him over. Yeah. Case. Yeah. It's not Collins. Well, then who is Wait it? a minute. He must have been carrying this package. Heroin. Pretty good-sized batch of it. So that's Pedro's racket. Narcotics. Where's Collins fit into this deal? Why'd Pedro lie about him? I don't know. But I think Pedro's going to give us the answer. We took Pedro and the man we'd shot back to town. After we put the wounded man in the hospital, we drove Pedro to headquarters and began asking him questions. His calmness had us puzzled. I want to know why you lied to us about Collins, Pedro. I have nothing to say. Is Collins mixed up in this narcotics racket with you? Why you ask me questions, senor? Send me to jail. I stayed there five years. How do you know it's only five years? I got a friend. First time he get caught, he go to jail. Five years. Where's Collins, Pedro? I don't know. Now, look. Wait a minute, Clay. I've got an idea why Pedro isn't talking. Maybe he thinks as soon as he gets out of jail, he'll be able to go right back into the narcotics business. And he figures Collins will be waiting for him. Is that right, Pedro? I've got nothing to say. If that's what you think, you're wrong. Because when we catch Collins, he's going to be held for murder. Murder? What do you mean? I'm pretty sure Collins killed his wife. Sooner or later, we'll find him, Pedro. And when we do, you'll go on trial with him. Me? I got nothing to do with the killing. You got plenty to do with it. If you know where Collins is and won't tell us. Oh, senor, you got to believe me. I didn't know he's mixed up in this. You want to tell us what you do know he's mixed up in? See, Senor Collins, he's the man I've been working for. When the stuff comes from Mexico, always before I take it to his house. Where were you supposed to take it this time? Two days ago, Senor Collins come and he said he must go away. He say I have to bring the stuff to him in San Antonio, to a hotel there. Which one? The Park Hotel. Senor, I had nothing to do with this killing. You gotta believe me. Come on, Clay. Let's lock our friend up and get moving. It's a long drive to San Antonio. We reached San Antonio at 10 that morning. The Park Hotel was a run-down establishment that advertised rooms from a dollar up. The desk clerk told us Collins had left word that if anyone came for him, he could be found in a barber shop down the street. We left the hotel and started looking for it. That must be it down there, Jase. It's the only barber shop in this block. Yeah. How do you want to work it? We go in and get him? Probably better wait till play. A man coming out of the barbershop. That's Collins, all right. Jace, he sees us. He's running. Come on. 
You ducking into that restaurant? Get around the rear entrance, Clay. I'll go in the front. All right. Be careful, Jace. Yeah. Don't come no closer, Ranger. Drop that gun, Collins. You're gonna make me. A lot of people in here, Ranger. You wouldn't want me to get hurt, would you? Now look, Collins. Don't come no closer. If you're doing, I'll start shooting, and I don't care who I hit. You got a narcotics and a murder rap already. You want to make it worse? How can I make it worse? I got nothing to lose. Now I'm going through this kitchen door. Don't try to come after me unless you want someone out there to get hurt. Grab him, Clay! Grab him, Clay! Grab him, Clay! Grab him, Clay! I got him, Jake! Hold still, Collins! You lousy... Shut up. Come on, Collins. You were going on out the back. Let's keep right on going. It's all her fault. She shouldn't have poked her nose in my business. Pick up your feet. Come on. That's right. That little brat son of hers was going to learn something bad from me. Said she was going to the cops. That's why you killed her, Collins? I had to call her force. She ran away. I had to beat some sense in her head. Crazy woman. Come on, keep moving. Quit pushing. The biggest mistake I ever made was marrying her. I never should have married her. That's one thing we agree on, Collins. If you hadn't, a little kid would still have his mother. In just a moment, we will tell you the results of the case you have just heard. Today, two new shows join the NBC Entertainment lineup. Next on this station, you'll hear The Chase. And then stay tuned for your old favorite, The First Nighter, with Barbara Luddy and Olin Soule, the original stars of the series. Later today, it's Theater Guild on the air. Listen to this preview of today's show. We haven't far to go. If we can just reach the longboat, we'll have a chance. Wait. There's someone in the shadows. Good morning, Mr. Van Biden, and my dear young lady. I'm sorry to be such a spoil sport, but you see it's quite impossible to escape from my ship. And if you move one step closer to the longboat, I shall be forced to shoot you both. This is Margaret Phillips. You have just heard a scene from The Sea Wolf, a dramatic production in which I have the pleasure to co-star with Boris Karloff and Burgess Meredith. This evening on Theatre Guild on the Air on NBC. Hear The Sea Wolf today on Theatre Guild on the Air. And now... Back to the conclusion of today's Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, here are the results of the case you have just heard. Tommy Wilkes was taken to the home of his aunt, who identified him through a newspaper picture. George Collins revealed the two other men who completed the narcotics ring. They were picked up by Texas Rangers, and all four men involved were given prescribed jail terms. George Collins was found guilty of murder with malice and was sentenced to life imprisonment at Huntsville. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae will soon be seen in San Francisco Story, a Warner Brothers release. The cast included Tony Barrett, Lillian Byeth, Dick Beals, Leo Curley, Herb Ellis, and Don Diamond. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Charles E. Israel, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Next, it's The Chase on NBC. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. Names, dates.
dates and places in the following story are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. There's nothing so comfortable as a nice, plump cushion. And I don't mean the sofa pillow variety. I mean a financial cushion to fall back on when times get tight, when sickness lingers, or when unemployment strikes. The best way to build this necessary cushion is to chop a little money off each paycheck. Not necessarily a great sum, but a steady little sum which you can put into United States defense bonds. These bonds now earn greater interest, give you a quicker return, and may be held at interest for as long as 10 years beyond maturity. You're putting a financial cushion behind Uncle Sam's back when you buy your own with bonds. Because every dollar you put in United States bonds is an investment in your country's strength and security. That's the same as setting up a safer world for your children. Start building your cushion now by signing up for the payroll savings plan where you work or use the bond-a-month plan where you bank for United States defense bonds. They're now even better. Now back to Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, from the files of the Texas Rangers, the case called Alibi. It is approximately 10 a.m. on Wednesday morning, July 17, 1948. A large truck carrying sheep is traveling at a moderate speed along Highway 28, leading into Bancroft, Texas. The driver of the truck squints his eyes against the glare of the morning sun, while his sleeping companion stirs uneasily in the blazing heat. Come on, you darn fool. Get by me. Traveling at that speed in this heat, you blow a tire for sure. Hmm? Hmm? Well, what's the matter, Jack? Ah, tourists. Always in a hurry to get no place. Must have been doing 70 at least. Hmm? Who's that? Oh, that car that just passed us, going like the devil. Oh, didn't see him. Now open your eyes and take a look. There they go, just over that rise over here. Oh, yeah. Oh, man, it sure is hot. How'd you know? You've been asleep since the sun come up. Say, you sore about losing the toys last night? I ain't sore about losing last night so much. But well, we've been trucking together for over six months, and I ain't warned once. Boys, get this sunrise shift while you just snooze away peaceful as anything. Chucks, I won't have any eyes left. Well, if it'll make you feel better next place we come to, let's stop and I'll buy you a beer, okay? I could stand something to wet my whistle. This heat is awful. How far are we from the next town? Bancroft's about ten miles up, but we can stop the Deacons. That's his place down there on the right. Yeah, man, look at those shade trees. Oh, the sheep will go over that. Yeah, about time we were schooling these tires, too. Hate to have one blow on the road hot as it is. Yeah, I know what you mean. Deacons, I ain't never been here before. Well, here we are. Oh, I feel like I've been driving for a week. Come on. Now, you think the sheep will be all right? Sure, they'll go for that shade. Well, I guess we're the only ones around. There ain't nobody here. Deacon's probably around Summers. Let's sit down here at the counter. Yeah. Deke? Deacon? Hey, De That's funny. Somebody's been here. Look at them two bottles at the end of the counter. Uh, maybe he's out back. Yeah, could be with his chickens. Besides the coldest beer, old Deacon's got eggs here the size of bowling balls. <laughs> Must have pretty big chickens, too. Biggest in Texas. <laughs> hey, where do you suppose you went to? I'm dying of thirst. Hey, why don't we help ourselves? The beer's right over there in the refrigerator. No, I wouldn't want to do that. Deacon might not like... Deacon! Hey, Deacon, you got a couple of cash customers. I ain't gonna sit here all day. I'm gonna get me a beer. Yeah, I reckon the Deacon won't mind. Bring me a cold one. Yeah, right off the ice. Just wait till you... What's the matter, Jim? Chuck. Huh? Chuck, come here. What's the matter? What is it? Look. Look through that door. In the storeroom on the floor. Huh? Good Lord, it's a deacon. No wonder he couldn't hear us. His head's crushed to a pulp. Hey, hey, don't touch him, Jim. Huh? What, what do we do? Better call the sheriff. Come on, there's a phone out front. As soon as Sheriff George Hoffer of Bancroft County received the truck driver's call, he immediately requested the assistance of the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case and arrived at the scene of the crime about an hour later. Is that all you men can tell me? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, 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 all right, but I want you to... 
Well, howdy, Jace. Hello, Sheriff. Uh, Ranger Pearson, this is Chuck Roberts and Jim Patrick. They're the ones that found the body. Howdy. All right. Hello, Ranger. That's your truck outside with the sheep in it? Yes, sir. We're uh, kind of anxious to get along, too. I've already talked to him, Jace. Is there anything you want to ask him? Yeah, in a few minutes. Why don't you men wait over there? It won't be long. Okay. Did you look at the body, Sheriff? Yeah, it's out back in the storeroom. Poor fella, he sure took an awful beat. Is that the door over there? Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, Jace, before you go out there, I want to show you something. What's that, Sheriff? Over here. Cash drawers, partly open. Yeah. Cleaned out all right. You men touch this cash register? No, Ranger, we ain't touched nothing. Just the phone when we called the Sheriff. Okay. Well, there's the motive, Sheriff. Robbery. Kind of business the Deacon did here. He couldn't have had more than 15 or $20 in that thing. That's a lot of money to some people. Yeah. How about those beer bottles down at the end of the counter? Were they yours? No, sir. Golden box. It's like the deacon had a thirsty customer. Uh, Jace, look here by the refrigerator. Isn't that a blood stain? It sure is. What do you make of that? It looks like the deacon might have been slugged right here. If the man who was drinking that golden box was sitting at the counter, he could have done it when the deacon had his back turned. Guess he wasn't hit with a bottle or there'd be some broken glass around. It wouldn't have to be a bottle. Could have been anything. Come on, let's take a look at the body. There's some blood here by the door. Yeah. The body's right behind this barrel, Jace. Sure did take a beating, didn't he? Yeah. I figured it must have happened last night around closing time. Else he'd have been found before this. The deacon do much more in business? Oh, a little bit. Didn't amount to a hill of beans. Nighttime seems more logical. Yeah, I'd think so. I wonder if they cleaned his pockets out, too. I don't know. Yes, I better have a look. Find anything, Jace? Uh, a few coins, some keys, that's all. Uh... Sheriff. Hmm? What's the matter? Sheriff. Get on that phone and call an ambulance. What? Why? Deacon, he's still alive. The deacon remained unconscious. His condition was critical. X-rays showed he'd sustained triple fractures of the skull. After the lab crew arrived and went over the store for additional clues, the sheriff and I started checking on people known to be deacon's customers. The next morning, we were still looking for a lead. Who's next on the list, Sheriff? Well, now, let me see. There's Doty Carson, Ranch Road 220. That's about a half mile farther on. You know him? Yeah, but he couldn't have done it. Why not? He's an old fella. He ain't got the strength to break an eggshell. ATX 80, unit 10. Yeah, this may be something. ATX 80, unit 10. Unit 10 to KTXA. Go ahead. Lab reports late fingerprint obtained in Deacon's Cafe. Belonging to one John Sampson, age 34, 5 feet 10. 195 pounds, brown hair, brown eyes, ruddy complexion. Released Huntsville Penitentiary January this year after serving two of a three-year sentence for burglary. Subject now employed as ranch hand, flying B Ranch, your vicinity. 10-4, no other traffic, unit 10, clear. No other traffic, EDX John Sampson, huh? Yeah, what's the matter, you know him? The name's familiar. I, I, I think we pulled him in a couple of months ago. Brawl in a pool hall, if I remember right. Oh, yeah, he's a tough one. Where's the Flying B located, Sheriff? It's west of here, about ten miles past the Deacons. Hang on. Fifteen minutes later, we arrived in the ranch yard of the Flying B. The foreman told us that John Sampson was out riding fence. I got charcoal out of the trailer while the sheriff borrowed a horse, and we headed for the area where Sampson was supposed to be. Foreman said he ought to be just over this rise. Yeah. Oh, there he is. Where? Over there by that mesquite. Come on, Chark. He sees us, Jace. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, Chark. Oh, 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 oh. Howdy. You John Sampson? Yeah, why? That ranger here wants to ask you a couple of questions. What's on your mind? You ever stop by the Deacons on Highway 28? Deacons? About 10 miles down the road from here. Oh, that place. Yeah, I, I go in there sometimes. How often? I don't know. Once in a while. You in there Tuesday night around closing time? Tuesday? Let's see. It's day before yesterday. No, I wasn't in there. Where were you? I was uh, I was in town. Where in town? Say, what is this? Just answer the ranger's question, Samson. All right. Tuesday night I was at the Easy Ace there all night. Where's that? That's a beer parlor and a pool room, Jace. I know where it is. Uh-huh. You say you were there all night, Samson? Sure, just told you. Don't they stop serving beer at midnight? All right, so what? Pool tables stay open. They serve food there. What's wrong with that? He's right, Jace. The joint don't close. Well, you must have come back to the ranch sometime. I did, after daybreak. You shoot pool all night? 
We had a little game going. Who's we? Some of the boys and me. And you didn't stop by the Deacons on your way back to the ranch? No, it was closed. When was the last time you were at the Deacons? I don't know. Monday night, I think. Don't you know? Sure I know. It It, it was Monday night. I uh, had a beer in there. You sure it wasn't Tuesday? No, it wasn't Tuesday. It was Monday. Why? What do you want to know for? What kind of beer do you drink, Samson? Uh, what kind? Well, I don't know any kind. You ever drink Golden Box? Sometimes. You better come along with us. I ain't going nowhere. I got to finish checking this fence. You get on your horse. I ain't done nothing. Why? Tuesday night, somebody beat up the deacon and robbed him. Nearly killed him. What's that got to do with me? Plenty. We found your fingerprints all over the place. We took Samson in and checked his alibi. The manager at the Easy A said he had been there all Tuesday night and had left near daybreak. It seemed like the man was telling the truth, but we didn't want to release Samson until we had a talk with the deacon. We called the hospital and learned that he was still unconscious. We went back to the sheriff's office. Samson was getting impatient. Hey, how much longer are you guys going to keep me here? Just until we check on a few things. Now, listen, I know my rights. You're going to keep me here, you got to book me. We will when the time comes. On what? manager at the pool room told you I was there. What more do you want? Better witness. What's the matter with him? How do we know he's not covering up for you? He's no angel, you know. I've had him in here before, too. And on account of that, you're holding me. Take it easy, Samson. If you're in the clear, you've got nothing to worry about. Who said I was worried? Excuse me, Jason. You guys think you're fooling with some dumb bunny or something? Hello. If you're so innocent, Samson, yes, sir, why are you giving us so much static? Okay, I'll look, Ranger. Either you've got to book me or right turn me loose. It's as simple as that. Right. You got anything more important to do? That's my business. All right, Samson. I got a deputy outside who'll be glad to entertain you for a while. What do you mean by that? You'll see. Look, I want to get out of here. You will if you're telling the truth, and that's what we're going to find out right now. What was that phone call, Sheriff? The hospital. The deacons regained consciousness. This is a lucky break for us, Jace. Yeah, if he identifies Samson, we can wrap it up this afternoon. I sure hope so. Of course, Doc says he's still pretty weak. He might not take the question. Here's your room, 121. Deacon, can you hear me? His eyes are opening. Deacon. Mm -hmm. Who's that? I'm Ranger Pearson. This is Sheriff Hoffer. Pleased to meet you. What, Deacon, you know me, George Hoffer. Hoffer? Oh, yeah, sure. Tell me, do you know a man by the name of John Sampson? Who? Sampson, John Sampson. He stops in your place from time to time. Oh, yeah, nice fellow. You know him, then? What did you say your name was? Pearson, Ranger Pearson. Oh, yeah, Pearson. You come about the eggs? Eggs? What do you mean, Deacon? Those were bad eggs, Mr. Pearson. I can't have that. You should have candled those eggs. What's he talking about, Jim? I got good customers, Mr. Pearson. You sold me three dozen bad eggs. Can't have that. Look, I'll show you. Now, wait a minute, Deacon. Uh, Don't try to get up. It's all right. I've been out here on the porch long enough. I want to show you them eggs. Right back here in the store. Now, now, Deacon. You stay here. We'll talk to you later. Yeah, you do that. Come on, Sheriff. Can't have no more bad ones. What is the matter with him, Jay? He's lost his memory. In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joe McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. If you want your child to have the best elementary schooling you can give him, won't you get a pencil and paper to take down the address I'm going to give you at the end of this message? Unless we start preparing now, in a few years our public schools will be as behind the times as the little red schoolhouse. Because of the huge increase in our birth rate during and after the last war, it's estimated that by 1956 there will be some 7 million more children in elementary schools than there are now. We must start preparing at once. More equipment will be needed, textbooks, playgrounds, and above all, more elementary school teachers. To help assure your child a proper education, join and work with local groups and school boards. And for free information about how people in other communities are improving their schools, write to this address. National Citizens Commissions for the Public Schools, 2 West 45th Street, New York, 19, 
New York. Now back to Tales of the Texas Rangers. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and our authentic story, Alibi. With the deacon suffering from loss of memory, we knew there was only one thing to do, release John Sampson. We went back to the sheriff's office and asked the deputy to bring him down from his cell. Well, it's about time. What's the big idea of locking me up? Oh, pipe down. All right, Joe. I'll take over things. Ranch. Yeah. Look, what do you think you're kidding? You ain't got nothing on me. Right now we haven't. What's the matter, Ranger? Did the deacon die? Would it make you feel better? Wouldn't make any difference at all. I got an alibi and you know it. All right, Samson, you're free to go. But if we want you again, you better be around. Yeah, and remember this. If you did do it, we'll get you sooner or later. You're a two-time loser and still our number one suspect. So what? You can't prove nothing? Go ahead. Book me. But if you do, I'll sue you for false arrest. Now, what do you know about that? Go on back to your ranch. But I'm warning you, you set one foot out of this county and we'll pick you up so fast you won't know what's happened. I'll go in no place. Don't worry. <laughs> I'll be seeing you, Sheriff. Ranger. Yeah, he's so sure of himself. Yeah, I'm too sure. I don't like it. Well, what do we do now? Wait till morning, I guess. Then I want to have another talk with a deacon. Well, Jace, what do you expect to gain by that? I don't know. Maybe if we just keep asking him questions about anything, we might pick up an angle to go on. He might remember something. Mm -hmm. Suppose it's worth a try. Right now, it's our only hope. The next morning, Sheriff Hoffer and I went back to the hospital. There we learned the deacon had improved to the point of taking nourishment, though he was still suffering from loss of memory. Even with the odds against us, we had to try once more. Deacon? Huh? Oh, hello. You remember me, Ranger Pearson? Yeah, seems I do. I've seen you someplace. We were here yesterday. Yesterday? Yesterday? I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know you. I, I, I can't remember. Don't you remember anything? I, I don't know. I can't seem to make any sense out of anything. So, something's happened. Look, Deacon... You got a store on the highway. No, not me, mister. I think you're wrong. Sure you have, Deacon. You and Mary Ann started it about 17 years ago. Mary Ann? Mary Ann? Who was that, Sheriff? His Mary wife. Ann? She died three years ago. Mary? Look, look, mister, you gotta help me. You gotta help me. We're I, trying to. I can't remember. I, my head is hurt. I... What happened to my head? Tuesday night, I... somebody came into your store, robbed you, and beat you up. Me? Someone done that to me? Yes, Deacon. Tuesday night. I don't remember. I can't remember. Well, Deacon, look, maybe you'll remember something if you just answer a few questions. All right. All right. Try to help me, mister. Please try to help me. We will. Now, do you remember where you live? Yeah. Yeah. I got a house. You know where? Yeah. It's, uh, out back. It's out back. Out back of what, Deacon? It's out... I don't know. It's behind your store. Remember your store? My store? Oh, yeah. Yeah, my store. That's right. Now, Deacon, I want you to tell me everything that you do from the time you get up in the morning until you go to bed. Can you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Let's see. I get up. I fix breakfast. Oh, wait, wait I... a minute. You skipped over a lot there. Yes, Deacon, not so fast. What time do you get up? Do you know? Uh, early. Daybreak. Every day? Yeah, every day. I feed the chickens. I open the store. Wait a minute. I... You're getting ahead again. Uh, I'm sorry. Now, what's the next thing you do after you get up? Uh, a shave. Wash up. Anything else? Uh, calendar. I set my calendar. You set your calendar? What kind of calendar? A uh, little desk model on a roller. Gives the day and the date. It's in my bureau. Top drawer. Did you set it Tuesday? Tuesday, yeah. It was raining Tuesday. Yeah, I set it. Hey, Jace, he's right. He, he's remembering. It, it did rain early Tuesday morning. Yeah. Wednesday. I set it then, too. It was a nice morning. Now, wait a minute, Deacon. Not Wednesday. You couldn't have set it then. No, I, I set it. Wasn't raining Wednesday. Jace, you reckon he did? I don't know. 
Deacon, are you sure you set your calendar Wednesday? Oh, I set my calendar every day. So, man, don't you believe me? You gotta believe me. Sure, Deacon. We believe you. You try and sleep now. We'll see you later. Yeah. Sleep. If he did set his calendar Wednesday morning, you know what that means, Jason. You bet I do. Samson could have been at the Easy A's Tuesday night, but he's gonna have to have another alibi for Wednesday morning. Come on. Let's see if we're on the right track. <laughs> Forty-five minutes later, the sheriff and I pulled up to the deacon's house behind the roadside store. In the top of the dresser, we found the calendar. The deacon was right. It was set for Wednesday, July 17th. From there, we went straight out to the ranch where Samson worked. He wasn't around, and no one had seen him. On our way into town, we sent out an APB to pick him up. Then we headed for the Easy Ace pool room. Well, I don't see him anywhere, do you? No, the manager's not around either. Let's ask the waiter. Waiter? Be with you in a minute. Oh, howdy, Sheriff, Ranger. What can I do for you? You know a fellow named Samson who hangs out here? Uh, Samson? I don't seem to, don't seem to recollect. You ought to know him. He's here a lot. Huh? Oh, oh, you mean the one that uh, works out the flying bee? That's him. Uh, yeah, I see him in here time to time. Was he here last night or this morning? Oh, it's uh, hard to say. Lots of people here last night. Was Samson here? You fellas looking for him? Look, will you quit stalling? I was just asking. Come on, mister. If you know, you better tell us. Uh, well, it seems to me he was here Wednesday night, I think. That's not what we asked you. Wait a minute, Sheriff. What was he doing here Wednesday night? Oh, just, uh, hanging around. He broke most of the time. Did he have any money Wednesday night? Well, he seemed to. How do you know? Did he spend much? He lost most of it. What do you mean, lost most of it? Now, now, don't get me wrong, Sheriff, Hey, Charlie, get that money off the table. We don't allow gambling in here, and you know it. Oh, let's see. Uh, what was it you was asking, Ranger? About Samson. He almost killed a man. You know where he is? Almost killed a man? Samson did? That's right. Oh, so, so that's what you're here for. Did you expect us for something else? Look, Sheriff, uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, Wednesday night, there was a little crap game here. Uh, Samson was in on it. I... I thought you'd come about that. Crap game. Here? Well, not exactly, Sheriff. I mean, well, it started in here. As soon as I saw it, I told him to break it up. Manager, don't allow that sort of goings on. And Samson was in on it, huh? Well, now, now, that's what, that's what I was going to tell you. A few minutes after I told him to quit, they moved out back into the alley. Well, now, that ain't exactly in here, but, but it still don't look good. So the manager sent me out to break it up again. Then what happened? Well, this, this Samson got kind of mad. That's how I figured he was losing. He didn't want to quit. Did he? Well, finally, I have to told him about three times. You know how much he lost? Oh, about 20 bucks, I reckon. He sure was mad. 20 bucks, huh? Probably every cent of it was Deacon's. Mm. Oh, I ain't saying he lost all of it. Because uh, he come in here earlier today and broke a five. How long ago was that? Mm, about half an hour. Bought a dozen bottles of beer and left. Where'd he go? You know? Yeah, the only place I know would be his girl. Where does she live? Over the dry goods store on Benner Street. <laughs> We called for a stakeout on the pool hall in case Samson returned. Picked up a search warrant and headed for the dry goods store on Bentner Street. And there it is, Jason. Yeah, I see it. Better park around the corner. Uh, he won't be able to see our car here. Let's hope he's up there. Yeah. Uh, those must be the steps going up the side of the building. They are. Looks like only one apartment up here. Yeah. And there's only one door. Huh, it's a break. He's coming. Who's there? Police officers. What do you want? Open the door, ma'am. Look, I was sleeping. Uh, sorry to disturb you. Mind if we come in? I sure do. I told you I was sleeping. This time of day? I sleep late. Better let us in, lady. We got a search warrant. For what? We're looking for John Sampson. We well, he ain't here. We think he is. I ain't seen him in a week. Sure, you can look. See for yourself. What's your name, ma'am? The name's Molly. You say you've been asleep? That's right. What's this empty beer bottle doing here? Ain't no law against beer in this county. I drank it before I went to sleep. Why? The bottle's still cold, and it's Samson's brand, Sheriff. Yeah. He must be up here. No, he ain't. What's back of this door? Hey, that's my bedroom. You can't go in there. Sorry, ma'am. That a closet there? 
Yeah, just my clothes in it, that's all. Stand back, Sheriff. I'm going to open it. Johnny, look out! Watch it, Johnny! All right, Samson. You almost got your girl that time. Come out of there or we'll blast you out. Throw your gun out first. Okay. Okay. There it is. Now put your hands out in front of you. Come on. That's right. Put the cuffs on him, Sheriff. Right, Jace. She did it, didn't she? She turned me in. Oh, shut up. You got him, Ranger. Now get him out of here. Dirty two time and Hold it, you? Samson. She's not getting off either. What did I do? There's a law in this state against harboring a criminal. Come on, you two. Let's go. In just a moment, we will tell you the results of the case you have just heard. 20 seconds from now, a fire will break out somewhere in the United States, causing untold misery and devastation. Yes, every 20 seconds, all day long, a fresh fire starts in a home or a factory or a forest. More than 11,000 persons are killed annually by these fires. Many more are injured, and more than $700 million worth of property is lost. The most tragic part of this statement lies in the fact that more than 90% of all fires in the home start through sheer carelessness and could be avoided. Here are a few simple rules of safety which will help you to protect your home and your loved ones from the ravages of fire. Don't smoke in bed or discard lighted cigarettes carelessly. Clean out old newspapers, magazines, and other inflammable debris. Promptly repair all defective wiring and electrical equipment. Use only those cleaning fluids which will not burn. And finally, be careful with matches. Keep them out of the reach of small children. You can't afford to gamble with fire. The odds are against you every time. Now, back to Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, here are the results of the case you have just heard. John Sampson was found guilty of robbery by assault with intent to murder. On October 11th, 1948, he was sentenced to 99 years in the state penitentiary at Huntsville. Molly Andrews was given two years in the women's prison at Gorey for obstructing justice, as prescribed in Article 338 of the Texas State Penal Code. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you and your friends will be listening to our show next week. There are two reasons we are asking you to be tuned in. First, because the case is a very interesting one. And second, because it will be the last performance, for a while at least, of Tales of the Texas Rangers. We hope you've enjoyed this series of authentic stories and that you'll make it a point to be with us for our last show next week. Thank you. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen in San Francisco Story, a Warner Brothers release. The cast included Tony Barrett, Paul Fries, Herb Bygren, Parley Bear, Dan Riss, and Betty Lou Gerson. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Arthur Brown, Jr., and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Keep tuned for the Standard Hour on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from
from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Bad Blood. It is 7 p.m. September 14, 1950. In an isolated house trailer in the fields on the outskirts of Cheney, Texas, Joe Prager, an aircraft worker, is packing a suitcase. There is a knock on the trailer door. Just a second. Howdy, Joe. Oh, howdy, Russ. Ain't you gonna ask me in? Yeah, sure. Come on in. See you packing already. That's right. What's on your mind, Russ? Well, Joe, I figured two weeks is long enough for old friends to be mad at each other. I come to ask you to shake hands. <laughs> you know, now that you're here, I can't figure just what we've been mad about. Ain't anybody I'd rather shake hands with than you, Russ. You're my boy. But we ain't never gonna talk politics again. Oh, <laughs> that's a <the> deal. <laughs> I didn't want you to leave feeling sore at me. Why are you going, anyhow? Why are you pulling out your job, Solid? You're needed here. Well, I didn't want anybody to know about it yet, but... Looks like I'm needed someplace else, too. Huh? Here, read this. Well, going back in the Army, huh? I didn't know you stayed on the reserve list. I'm on it, all right. You talked to him about this out at the plant, after all. You're married now, you got a kid, you're in essential work. Maybe you could get out of it. I thought about it, Russ, but... Well, I don't want to get out of it. I got kind of a funny feeling about it. A feeling I've had ever since the kid was born. Like, well... Maybe if I go again now, maybe I can help so he'll never have to go when he grows up. Yeah, I can't argue against that. Not with two boys of my own, one of them pushing 17. Ella and me are plenty worried about him with this Korea thing. Oh, don't let it get you down, Russ. Boy, I'll be all right. <laughs> Say, uh, I was just about to fix me some grub. How about joining me? Oh, thanks, but Ella's expecting me home. Uh, say, where's Marge and the baby, anyhow? Oh, she drove the kid up to her mother's today. I got a week more before I report, and yeah. well, we sort of figured we'd go away someplace together, just the two of us, you know, till I have to leave. Yeah, well, when are you pulling out of here? Tomorrow, when Marge comes back. Ella would like to see you and Marge before you go. She's been beefing at me ever since you and me fell out. Yeah, Marge's been bulldogging me about it, Well, too. can't you come and have supper with us tomorrow before you go? How about that? Well, that's a deal. Swell. Ella would be tickled. Well, guess I better be getting home with the old pay envelope. You need any help with anything? I mean, we got a few dollars. We'll no, buy. no, thanks, Russ. We'll get by. Well, good luck to you, fella. We'll see you tomorrow. Hmm? Sure thing, Russ. Say, if they had a draft somebody, why couldn't they take that brother-in-law of yours? <laughs> Orville? That'd be giving aid and comfort to the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> I know Orville ain't giving any aid and comfort to his department out the plant. If we wasn't short-handed, he wouldn't last ten minutes. Well, good night, Joe. Good night, Russ. Just a second. Did you forget something? Oh, it's you, Orville. Yeah, it's me. Russ was just here. I thought it was him coming back. I know he was here. Been waiting out back long enough, waiting for him to leave. You could have come in. Russ don't buy it. He doesn't like me. Reckon that's your fault, Orville. Oh, sure. Everything's my fault. How come you're sticking up for him? Thought you and him wasn't talking. We are now, and I don't think it's any of your business. What do you want, Orville? Joe, I need some help. I got my check cashed, and I guess I didn't notice it till I was almost home. I got a hole in my pocket. I lost my pay. Do I look like a half-wit to you? Well, I only want... The last time you came to me with that story, you said your pocket was picked. And the time before that, you said you got stuck with a loan you signed for somebody. That's right, Joe. Honest. Stop using the word honest, Orville. Doesn't sound right coming from you. If your money's gone, you lost it in the pay night crap game at Holland. I haven't been near Holland's in weeks. Oh, Joe, you gotta help me. My wife will buck like a maverick under a branding iron if I don't bring some money home. You and Sis got some side money. I know you have. I ain't denying that, but this is one time you ain't dipping your hand into it. Yeah, take a look at this paper. Go ahead, read it. <laughs> Drafted, huh? Going to play soldier again and leave my sister with a kid to take care of. She and the kid will be taken care of, Orvie. I'll see to that. You never had to give us anything and you never will. Joe, I need money. And I ain't leaving here without it. There's nothing here for you, Orvin. Better try someplace else. 
I said I wasn't leaving without that money. Well, I reckon you'll be here a long time then, Orvin. You have to excuse me. I'm going to fix my son. I ain't going to ask you again, Joe. Glad to hear. Just going to keep ignoring me, huh? Like I wasn't even here. That's right. Maybe I can make you pay a little attention with this. Orvin, put that down. No. I'm going to help you dish out your supper like this. I wasn't... I told you, Joe, I told you. The body of Joe Prager was discovered when his wife returned to their trailer home early the following day. Sheriff Vern Lamont immediately called for the help of a Texas ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. He joined the sheriff at the scene of the crime shortly after noon. I've kept the whole field blocked off, Jace. Nobody's been near the place except Prager's wife and me and the deputies. Good. Where's the wife? Sitting over there in her car. Tried to get her to go into town to the hotel, but she won't. She's in... In kind of a daze. Shock. That's natural. You want to talk to her? Yeah, it wouldn't help when she's like that. Maybe by the time we've had a look around, she'll break down and cry it out, and then we may be able to get something. Let's have a look inside the trailer. Right. There's the body. And there's a murder weapon. Wrought iron frying pan. You won't be able to pull any prints off that. Metal's too coarse. That's why I just let it lay there. Medical examiner estimate the time of death? He figured it was between 6 and 8 o'clock last night. Hmm. The suitcase on the bed, half packed. Prager trying to run away from something? No, I don't think so. Letter on the table here explains it. It was in the Army Reserve. Called back to duty. I see. Where was he working here? Out of the aircraft plant, other side of town. Spot welder. How come his wife didn't report this until this morning? Well, she was away for the night. They got a baby? Baby oil and nipple jar on the dresser there. Yeah, that's why the wife was away. She took the kid to her mother's up in Abilene. Come back this morning. You check on that? First thing. Got a list of eating places. She stopped at both ways, and she gassed up at a mobile station in Abilene last night after she got there. Well, it spots her away from here, all right. Let's check around outside. All right. Will it be okay for the medical examiner to move the body now? Yeah, I think so. How come they parked their trailer out here instead of using one of the parks near town? Save money, I guess. Rents are high with the plant working full blast. Mm, Gasoline lamp in the trailer for light, but what'd they do for water? There's a well out back. Used to be a house here some time ago, but it was moved. They had everything they needed to get by. I see. Want to walk out to the road where our cars are? I can send one of the boys into the funeral home to arrange a pickup. All right. Wait a minute, Sheriff. Hmm? Watch your feet. What's the matter? These car tracks up the road to the trailer. Prager's own car, I reckon. Same tracks all over the road from coming and going. Uh, Different tire pattern and a couple of the soft spots, though. Look here. Yeah. Overlaps most of the older tracks, but Prager's car tracks go over the strange tread once. Right here. Yeah, I see what you mean. Another car must have driven in here after Ms. Prager left yesterday. And that spot is where she drove over the tracks when she came back this morning. That's the way I measure it. Yeah, we can pull a cast off that tread. May help us run down the car. Hey, one of your deputies coming up the road now. Well, that isn't one of my boys. Uh, why'd they let him in? I don't know. Hey, you! Yeah? How'd you get in here? I come to help my sister. Who is your sister? Marge, Prager's wife. He was my brother-in-law. That's why the deputies let me through. Mm-hmm. All right. Your sister's sitting in the car back there. Reckon she does need somebody with her at that. Thanks. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, Ranger? Walk along the edge of the road. Stay out of the tire tracks. Why? Because we're asking you to. Isn't that good enough? Well, I only ask you for a reason, that's all. What's your name? Orville James. You work with your brother-in-law? Well, yeah, sure. Out at the plant. Not in the same department, though. How'd you know your brother-in-law had been killed? I didn't know. Until I saw your deputies down by the road, and they told me. Isn't the aircraft plant working today? Yeah, sure it is. It's on the other side of town. What brought you out here now? I got a lift out during lunch to see my sister. That'd just about take your whole lunch hour. And more if you didn't catch a ride back right away. You make a habit of hitchhiking out here on your lunch hour? No, of course I don't. Then why'd you do it today? What are you asking me all this for? You trying to pin something on me? Reckon that's going to depend on how you answer. Come on, talk up. Well, I... I just... 
Well, I wanted to ask her about my mother. I knew that she'd been up home, see, and I wanted to find out how my mother was. I see. Your mother been sick? Yeah. No, no, she, she's been all right, I reckon. And why the rush to get out here this afternoon? Why not tonight, after work? Because I wanted to come, that's all. Anything else you want to know? Yes, when did you see your brother-in-law last? I, I don't know, three, maybe four days ago. Not yesterday? No. Not even at work? It's a big plant, Ranger. Joe and me didn't even work in the same building. What time did you quit yesterday? Five o'clock. Then you weren't working between, say, six and eight o'clock last night? No. Then where were you at that time? And who was with you? Well, I... I cashed my check at Holland's and... And then... And then what? Did you come out here? Yeah. What? I said yes, yes, I come out here. I'd have told you before if you hadn't started to question me so funny. Why'd you say you hadn't seen Prager in three or four days if you saw him last night? I didn't see him last night. Listen, you just told us you I came out you here. I told you I'd come out here, but I didn't see Joe. I changed my mind about going in because there was a car parked here. Joe had company. Well, that fits in, Jace. Those car tracks. Yeah, but it still doesn't tell us why Orville didn't go in. I'll tell you why if you let me. I recognized the car. It belongs to Russ Newcomb. And I didn't want to go in while he was there because I didn't want to get mixed up in any argument. Who's Russ Newcomb? And why should there be an argument? Russ works out at the plant, too. Him and Joe had been friends, but they fell out a couple of weeks ago. Hadn't been talking. Then why would Newcomb be visiting here? Why don't you ask Newcomb that? It took a long time for you to suggest that, Orville. Considering that Prager's dead and you knew that there'd been bad blood between him and the man you say was here last night. I don't like to throw suspicion on a man for murder, Ranger. But you're mighty quick suspecting me. A man ain't likely to kill his brother-in-law. Newcomb had the reason, not me. Now, you're going to let me go to my sister, ain't you? Jace. All right, Orville. Go ahead. Yeah. Looks like this thing is cracking easy, Jace. It sure does. You better get out to the aircraft plant. Yeah. We got enough to pick up Newcomb, all right? We got more than that. If that tire track on the road matches Newcomb's car, we got enough on Newcomb to send him to Huntsville. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Bad Blood, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We drove out to the aircraft plant. News of Prager's death hadn't reached the place yet. We were directed to Russ Newcomb's section leader, and he pointed Newcomb out to us. He was on a welding job. Hey! Hey, you up there! Newcomb! Yeah! Knock off a minute and come down from that wing, will ya? Be right there! What can I do for you? Go into the office where we can talk. Sure, I'd be glad of it. Yeah, Sheriff, what's up? You find the woman who owned that purse? Purse? What purse? What are you talking about? The purse I turned into your office about two months ago. Money in it, don't you remember? Oh, that was on a Sunday. Guess I look different in a work outfit. Oh, oh, yeah. What's this about, Sheriff? I thought he looked familiar. Turned in a woman's purse he found in the streets a couple of months back. No identification in it, and the owners never claimed it. Oh? The way you're talking, Sheriff, I reckon it isn't a purse you want to see me about. No, it isn't. You know Joe Prager? No, him. Why, Joe's one of my best friends. When did you see him last? Only last night, out to his place. Why, what's the matter? Joe in some kind of trouble? You say he was a good friend. Other people say you weren't on speaking terms for the last couple of weeks. We weren't until last night. We, well, we got in a dumb political argument one day during lunch here. Both got hotter than we should have. But you patched it up last night. Yeah, when word got around that Joe was quitting, going away, well, I went out and buried the hatchet. You sure you mean a hatchet, not a frying pan? Look, you fellas asking me something, but you ain't telling me nothing. You talked politics again with Prager last night? No, no, we just shook hands, and I asked him to bring his wife over for supper tonight, and then I left, that's all. Prager still alive when you left? Well, what do you mean he was still alive? You telling me Joe Prager's dead? He was beaten to death last night with an iron frying pan. Beaten to death? Joe? 
You see anybody else at the trailer? No, no, no. We were alone. Just the two of us. Newcomb, the law requires me to warn you that anything you say from here on can be used against you. Used against me for what? You're talking like I'm under arrest. You are under arrest. For the murder of Joe Prager. We took Newcomb back to Cheney and locked him up. Meanwhile, Prager's body had been brought into the funeral home. I went over to see Mrs. Prager to see if she could give further verification of a quarrel between her husband and the man under arrest. Yeah. Joe told me that had some kind of an argument. But I didn't think it'd ever be as bad as, as this. I didn't think Russ would kill him. Why don't you leave her alone, Ranger? I'd already told you there was bad blood. Now maybe you'll believe me. Other witnesses aren't going to hurt anything, Orville. I'm all right, Orville. He's got to find out everything he wants to know. What else do they need to know? If you ask me, they've got enough of a case right now. If we ask you. But so far, nobody has. And until somebody does, how about keeping quiet? All right. You're the law. Go ahead and make them miserable. I'm going over to Holland, sis. I'll be there if you want me. I'm sorry to keep after you like this, Mrs. Prager. Did your husband ever have any trouble with anybody besides Newcomb? No. Was he in fear of anybody, worried about anything? No. Well, he was worried at first when the army letter came. But when we decided it was right for him to go, he didn't worry anymore. Just figured out things so me and the baby could get along. We... We even had a little money saved. We, we were going away together for a week. Just Joe and me. To the place we went on our honeymoon. We were going to have so much fun. Now I'll have to use that money to bury him. I'm sorry, ma'am. Why did Russ do a thing like this to Joe? Why? Why? I don't know, ma'am. I've never been able to figure out why men do a lot of things they do to each other. I went back to the sheriff's office. It looked like the case against Newcomb was just about closed, but it opened again. Opened wide when the sheriff showed me the personal effects that had been removed from Prager's body. Look at this, Jace. Bank book, isn't it? Yep. Prager's. It was in his shirt pocket. Take a look at that last line. Drew out every dime he had yesterday afternoon. Mrs. Prager told me they had some savings. They were going to use it to go away. Reckon that's why he drew it out. Yesterday was payday at the plant, too, Jace. So Prager should have had this amount he withdrew, $312 plus his pay. Wasn't there any money on him? Less than a dollar in change. I had my deputies go out and comb that trailer. Cupboards, dishes. They didn't find a dime. Newcomb turned any money over to the jailer when you booked him? About $5, that's all. But he had time to hide that money. All we got to do is find out where he hid it. If he did hide it. What do you mean? That purse Newcomb found a couple of months ago, the one he turned into you. He mentioned that there was some money in it. That's right. A little over $100. What are you thinking? I'm thinking about motives. We've been figuring Newcomb killed Prager because he was nursing a grudge. Robbery angle changes that picture. Yeah. Yeah, it sure does. Fellow who finds money and turns it in when he could keep it isn't likely to kill somebody and steal from him. Unless, of course, he was trying to cover up. He said he'd invited the Pregers to supper tonight, and they were going to come. That's right. You check on Orville's movements last night, see if he was telling the truth? Had my deputy do it. Only place to check was Holland's, and he was there all right after work. Cashed his check there, like he said, then got in a crap game with some of the boys in the washroom. He couldn't have played very long, or he wouldn't have gotten to Pregers by 7 o'clock when Newcomb was there. I don't get what you're driving at. Orville must have lost in that crap game. Game like that between fellows who work together, the winners usually stick to the end. Yeah. They get sore at a winner who quits until they've had a chance to get even. Your deputies find any sign of bloody clothing when they check Newcomb's place? Nope. But they're checking the cleaning shops now. You know where Newcomb lives? Sure. You want to go over there? Just into the neighborhood. I want to talk to Newcomb's butcher. Come on. Newcomb's butcher? What can he tell you? What Mrs. Newcomb ordered for tonight's dinner... I saw the butcher, and his answer to my question pulled Newcomb back a step away from the electric chair. I got in my car and started to drive toward the field in Prager's trailer. You look like you learned something, Jace. I did. Ms. Newcomb ordered stew meat yesterday for tonight's supper. She called up this morning and changed the order to lamb chops. Twelve lamb chops. 
That mean anything to you? And changing from stew meat to lamb chops sounds like she was expecting company. When she orders lamb chops for her own family, she usually gets eight. I see. The other four chops could have been for Prager and his wife then. I think so. And Prager was dead when she ordered them. Well, Newcomb could have told her to order them for a cover-up. Could have, but it's a little too smart. He didn't strike me as being that clever. Yeah, I'm going to go along with that. I think you're right. Well, what do you expect to find at the trailer? I don't know. I want to look around a lot more than we did before. I shouldn't have waited this long. Didn't seem to be any reason for it with the case we had against Newcomb. Well, there's a reason now. We need a new case, and I got a hunch which way it's going to point. I don't know, Jace. We've fine-combed that trailer, and there's nothing we didn't see before. And the only strange car track you found on the road was Newcomb. Hey, wait a minute, Sheriff. Somebody was sitting down here by the well. Leaned back against it and had his feet stretched out. You can see where the edges of his heels were resting on the ground. Yeah. Circle out around the back here. Let's do a little trail cutting. You figure the killer took off away from the road? If he was on foot, it'd be his best bet. If he went to the highway and walked, somebody might have seen him. If he had blood on his clothes, he'd steer clear of town until it was late and everybody was sleeping. Well, all right, Jace. Which way do you want me to go? Circle out that way. I'll work from this side. Okay. Hey, Jace. Yes, yeah, Sheriff? Orville was on foot. I know he was. That's why we're looking. We found the trail just as it was getting dark. It led me into open country. I got my horse charcoal from the trailer behind my car while the sheriff went to a nearby farm to borrow a mount. It was dark when he caught up to me. You still on the trail or are you cutting to pick it up? I lost it a couple of times further back, but I'm on it now. You know this country back here? Oh, I've ridden it before. We'll be coming to the Horner River soon, about a half mile farther. The river angles toward town, doesn't it? Sure does. Cuts under that bridge just outside Cheney. That may be the way the killer followed to get back to town. Let's ride for the river bank and see if we can pick up tracks there. May save us time. Good idea. Dig, boy. Ah, come on. Oh, Charky. We found tracks on the bank, all right. Just a few that led to the edge of the water, and that was all. We cut back and forth on both banks for hours before we picked up a sign. He'd come out of the river on rock, and we barely spotted the place where he'd marked the ground again. That's it, all right, Jace. Same heel impression. He had us fooled for a while, all right. Now, let's go. Come on, Sharky. Yeah, come on, boy. What's that up there ahead? Looks like a shack of some kind. I don't know, Jace. Quite a few shacks in here along the river. A lot of deer around. Some folks keep places for fishing and hunting. Well, his tracks lead right to it. Yeah. Get on, boy. Come, Come on, Charky. Yeah, he stopped here all right. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh. Flash your light on that door. Yeah. Yeah. Lock's been sprung. It's open. Yeah, he was here all right. Left his marks in the dust on the floor. I guess nobody's been using the place for quite a spell. Yeah. There's something else, too. Footlocker here. Lock on it's busted, too. Hmm. Shirts and jeans in there. I'd like to bet there's one set missing. Orville or whoever it was stopped here to change clothes. He must have known the setup. There's a funny smell in here, Sheriff. Like the place been smoked up not long ago. Something burning. Pot-bellied stove there. Yeah. Anything in it? Plenty. Clothes that didn't quite burn. Smells from kerosene he poured on him. But he came through the river so his pants were wet. Fire must have smoldered out after he left. Better pull those things out and see if we can save enough of them for identification. It's enough, all right. Look at this. Blood stain didn't even wash off when he came through the water. We prove who owns these things, and we've got our man. We'll be able to prove it. Look. Shirt was bundled up with the wet pants. Just enough to save most of the collar and this. Hmm. Laundry mark. Let's get back to town. <laughs> Daybreak when we got back to Cheney. We got what we were after on our third laundry stop. A half burned shirt belonged to Orville James. We went to his home. His wife was at the funeral parlor with Mrs. Prager, so he was there alone. What you want from me now? Sheriff's got a few things rolled up in that poncho. I thought maybe you might be able to identify them. Who? Who they belong to? Joe or Newcomb? We want you to tell us. 
All right, Sheriff, unroll them. Recognize these? What's the matter, Orville? You look kind of sick. Well, I'm just upset about Joe, that's all. I was at the funeral home with my sister almost all night. Well, you ever seen these things before? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen them. Whose are they? I could be wrong, I guess, but they look like new ones. That's funny. Well, what's funny about it? Looks like they were burned quite a bit. Yeah, but they were too wet to burn all the way. Guess that gives you a real tight case against Newcomb now, doesn't it? It does, doesn't it? A perfect case, except for the laundry mark on the shirt. Laundry mark? That's right, Orville, your laundry mark. But there can't be a laundry mark. There can't be a laundry Keep your hands off those things. You heard him, Orville. Let me go. Let me go. I... Oh, my arm. Uh... You better hold still. Come on. Let's go. <laughs> my wife. My wife always hounding me for money. Always screaming about how hard she worked. Always yelling about how she was ruining her hands scrubbing greasy work shirts. But she wasn't. She was sending them out. <laughs> Laundry boxes. A lazy pig, I'll kill her, I'll kill her. You're not going to kill anybody, Orville. Your killing days are over. Open the door, will you, Sheriff? Sure. All right, Orville. In the car. Let's go. Orville James broke down at his trial and confessed the robbery slaying of his brother-in-law. He was found guilty in less than 20 minutes and sentenced to Huntsville for the rest of his natural life. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Paul Fries, Whitfield Connors, Sam Edwards, Harley Bear, and Barbara Luddy. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcutt, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keats. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Tomorrow, the voice of Firestone presents Metropolitan Opera Basso Cesare Siepi in a melodic variety of operatic selections. Your Monday evening of music also includes the telephone hour. And tomorrow's guest artist is the renowned coloratura soprano Lily Pons. Among Miss Pons' selections tomorrow is the beautiful aria from Rigoletto, Caranome. Bill Baker asks the $64 question next on NBC. the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. Dates and places in the following story are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Right now, I'd like to give you some of the listening highlights of tomorrow's Monday Night of Music on NBC. 
The life and music of Franz Schubert is the basis for the Railroad Hours presentation of Blossom Time tomorrow evening. Starring Gordon McRae and Nadine Connor, Blossom Time is one of Sigmund Romberg's most famous musical romances. Be sure to hear it tomorrow as presented by the Railroad Hour. Also tomorrow evening, over most of these stations, the Telephone Hour welcomes Lily Paws, famous Metropolitan Opera star. As the initial Telephone Hour guest of 1952, Miss Paws continues the schedule of appearances that have made her one of the favorite soloists heard over this distinguished program. Miss Paws will present as her featured selection an aria for which she is particularly noted, the lovely bell song from the opera Lachme, while Donald Voorhees and the Telephone Hour Orchestra lists among their pieces the Gay Festival at Baghdad by Rimsky-Korsakoff. And now, back to Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, from the files of the Texas Rangers, the case called Birds of a Feather. It is three o'clock in the morning of February 23rd, 1940. A cold rain is falling in the town of Baker, Texas. A car drives slowly through the darkness, comes to a stop near the Union High School. The two occupants sit, looking up the street toward the school grounds. Roll down the window, Freddy. You can see better. What? Oh, sure, Ben, sure. Yeah, we got it set for 8.45 this morning. You come down this street heading for the school. We'll be right here waiting for him. Yeah, but suppose it don't show up. He will. And I've been checking it every day for a week. Yeah, but suppose it don't. Suppose something goes wrong. Nothing's going to go wrong. Joe's out the shack now. We want to have everything ready for him. You'll be driving then and we... What's the matter with you, Freddy? You ain't even listening. Uh, sure, sure, Heard every word you said. Well, what did I say? Uh, Joe's out at the shack. Uh, and what? Well, I guess I must have missed the rest. Yeah, you must have. You're scared, ain't you, Freddy? Ain't you? Okay, so I'm scared. Who wouldn't be on a job like this? Look, Ben, why don't we stick to filling stations? We're making a living. A living? Fifteen bucks here, twenty there. What kind of living's that? We'll get more off this job than we hit in a hundred filling stations. I don't like it, Ben. I just don't like it. All right, let's get out of here. Roll up your window. All right. I tell you something, Freddy. Joe ain't gonna be happy when he finds out you've been crying like this. I know, but now, I... shut up and listen. This thing we got planned, it's big. We can't afford no slip ups. Now, just relax. Three of us always done all right. Ah, yeah, sure, but we never tried nothing like this before. Oh, sure. If it goes okay, you win a lot. But if if you lose, it's for good. We ain't gonna lose. Well, I. Okay, Ben. You're set for the job. I, I won't argue. Only, I'm pulling out. You what? Well, I can't help it if I'm scared, can I? Oh, why'd you say something? Oh, look, Ben, you ain't you joking handle a job. I don't need three men. I, I might just last you up. Yeah. Yeah, you just might. Well, I, I wouldn't do you no good feeling like I do, you know. I, I'll catch a train back to Dallas this morning. Sure, Freddy, sure. I wouldn't want you to do nothing you're scared of. Oh, I'm sure glad you feel that way, Ben. I was afraid you'd be so. Me, Freddy? No. We've been through too much together for me to get so at you. Now, if you don't want to... What's the matter, Ben? The car feels funny. It must be this old road. No, it ain't the road. It feels like the back tire's flat. Maybe I better stop. Get the flash out of the dashboard and take a look, huh, Freddy? All right. See anything? Right rear looks okay. Sure it's wet out here. What about this one? Bring a light over. All right. Well, that looks okay, too. Where well, can you imagine the things, Ben? Yeah. Hammer the flash, Freddy. Sure? Yeah. Now, let's get... Ben... What you doing with the gun? You were right, Freddy. Joe and me can't handle the job alone. We don't need you. Ben, no. Like you said yourself, you might loss us up. But I said I was leaving town. You, you never hear from me again. Yeah, ben. but you'll know about the job, Freddy. You'll know who done it. Ben, don't be crazy. Ben, <laughs> Good.
Shortly after seven that morning, a farmer on his way to town noticed a man lying in some brush by the side of the road. He was still alive, but unconscious. While an ambulance took him to the hospital in Vega, the sheriff requested the assistance of a Texas ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned, joining the sheriff in the hospital waiting room an hour later. Hello, Sheriff. Howdy, Jace. Glad you could make it so quick. I was over in the next county. This man who was shot, is he still alive? Just barely. Doc said he'd call me if there's any change. Find any identification? Draft card we found on him said Fred Meter. Gave his home as Dallas. You ever see him around before? No, he might have been just passing through Baker. Mm, the report I got said he was found on a side road outside of town. That's right, about two miles up the old Copper Canyon Road. Mm, probably wasn't just passing through then. Sounds more like he was heading for some place around here. Maybe you're right. I'm hoping he can tell us about it directly. I better send his name and description into headquarters anyhow. Maybe they can give us a lead. Now, here's the doc now. Oh, anything new, Doc? Hey, you and the ranger better come with me, Sheriff. Oh, sure. Come on, Jace. Is Meter conscious, Doctor? Uh, not yet. But there's a chance he may be any minute. You think he'd be able to talk? Yeah, if he regains consciousness at all, he'll probably be able to talk. Mm. You think he might die without coming to? It's possible. He's lost a lot of blood. And the bullets entered his left lung. Here we are. Well, you can leave him now, nurse. I'll stay with him. The same as you did a while back, Doc. Mm, not quite. Pulse a little weaker, respiration slower. I'm afraid he's just about finished. No chance of his pulling through. Huh? Mm-hmm. Sounds like he's coming too. How about it, Doc? Well, sometimes just before the end, mm-hmm. they do. Mm-hmm. You see? He's opening his eyes. Mm-hmm. It's all right if I talk to him now? Certainly. Mm-hmm. Fred, mm-hmm. can you hear me? Mm-hmm. I think he did hear you, Jace. Who shot you, Fred? Tell us, who shot you? Look, Jace, he's trying to say something. Yeah. yeah. John Warren. John Warren. Just a minute, Sheriff. I'm sorry, Ranger. Yeah. Thanks, Doctor. Let's go, Sheriff. You know the name John Warren, Sheriff? I sure do, Jace. Well, this meter fella, he's all wrong. Why, John Warren's one of the leading citizens in Baker. Does he live nearby? About a mile out of town. Oh, but Jace, this don't make sense. I know John well. He wouldn't have any connection with a kid like that. That's something we better make sure of. Come on, Sheriff. We're going to visit Mr. Warren. It was 9.30 a.m. when we left the hospital. I phoned headquarters, gave them all the information I had on Fred Meter, and asked for a report as quickly as possible. Then we headed for John Warren's home. It was a rambling ranch-type house set back in the low hills just outside town. Mr. Warren opened the door for us himself. Howdy, John. Well, Sheriff, this is a pleasant surprise. Come in, come in. Thanks. This is Ranger Pearson, John. Howdy, Ranger. Come on, over here by the fire. Well, sit down, sit down. Ah, sure glad you stopped by. I'm afraid this isn't a social call, Mr. Warren. Oh, well, no matter. Glad to see you anyhow. It gets lonely around here. Boys at school all day. <laughs> you know, sometimes I think I shouldn't have retired so young. <laughs> uh, you and the sheriff want some coffee, Ranger? No, thanks. I'd like to ask you some questions, Mr. Warren. Well, sure. Go ahead. Early this morning, a young man named Fred Meter was shot on the side road near Baker. That's so? Well, sorry to hear it. Sorry to hear it. It don't help the town to have things like that happen here. Oh, no reflection on you, Sheriff. Uh, you know who shot the fellow? I'm coming to that. The sheriff and I were with him in the hospital. Just before he died, he mentioned your name. My name? Why, that's crazy. I, I didn't know this, uh... This... Fred Meter. Yeah, Fred Meter. I never even heard of him. Well, Sheriff, you and me have been friends for near ten years. You, you don't believe this stuff, do you? He did mention your name, John. Well, I, I don't know what to say. I, I just don't know what to say. 
You haven't always lived around here, have you, Mr. Warren? No, no. I moved here ten years ago after my wife died. And where'd you live before? Dallas. Got some oil leases near there. Fred Meter was from Dallas, too. You sure you didn't know him? Oh, Ranger, you've got to believe me. I, I don't know what this is all about, but uh, there's some mistake somewhere that there's got to be. Maybe there is, Mr. Warren. But until we find out what it is, we'd like you to stay in town. Let's go, Sheriff. <laughs> We drove back to the sheriff's office, arriving there just before noon. The sheriff went in to talk to his deputy while I stayed at the trailer to give charcoal his feet bag. Five minutes later, I joined the sheriff in his office. Chase, look at this, will you? What is it? A message from Austin. The deputy just gave it to me. Anything about Fred Meter? You bet there is. Fred Meter had a record. Three convictions for larceny. Filling station jobs. Anything else? Yeah. Seems he worked with a gang. Picked up each time two other fellas. Ben Morphy and Joe Wills. Oh, that could be something. We'll get out a pickup on them. Uh, there's something else, Jace. Fred Meter, Ben Morphy, and Joe Wills all worked at one time for the Warren Oil Company. John Warren's outfit? That's it. Get your hat, Sheriff. I've just thought of a few more questions to ask Mr. Warren. <laughs> Funny you don't answer. His car's still in the garage. Try again, Sheriff. Who's there? Ranger Pearson, Sheriff Holmes. Go away. You better open up, John. I said go away. Reckon I had him all wrong, Jason. Let me handle it, Sheriff. All right, Mr. Warren. If you want it that way, we'll be back with a warrant for your arrest. Why do you want to come around bothering me? Why don't you go away and leave me be? Let us in, John. I... Come on. Why didn't you want to see us, Mr. Warren? I... I can't tell you. All right, we'll skip that for a minute. This morning you said you didn't know Fred Meter. That's right. How many times have I got to tell you? How about Ben Morphy and Joe Wills? You know them? I never heard of them. Now, why don't you go away and leave me be? Mr. Warren, all three of those men worked for your oil company. Well, maybe they did. Had hundreds of men working for me. I didn't know all the names. What's that got to do Have with... Have you forgotten that Fred Meter named you just before he died? I... No. You want to tell us why he did? All right, I'll tell you. I didn't know when you were here before, now I do. It wasn't me that Meter was talking about. He said your name, John. I heard him. It wasn't my name. Did you ever stop to think that I... I've got a son... Young Johnny? But he's just a kid. Yeah, just a kid. And they're going to kill him. My boy. Mr. Warren. They said if I told the police, they'd kill him. I don't want him to die, Ranger. You hear me? I want my boy alive. Easy now, John. What's this? Don't you understand? This, this note I just got. They've kidnapped my boy. In a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Here is an urgent message for all ship's radio officers. The Federal Maritime Administration is calling all former Merchant Marine radio officers to come back to sea. Right now, scores of ships are riding at anchor, loaded and ready to sail. Their cargoes are vitally needed by our fighting forces and by our allies. Especially right now, the need for radio officers is acute. If you have had six months Merchant Marine radio operating experience since January 1935 on any kind of FCC license, the American Radio Association, CIO, will help you get an emergency license to ship out at once. You will earn more than $600 a month. Former radio men are urged to write, phone, or wire to the American Radio Association, 5 Beekman Street, New York City, which will put you in touch with the port office nearest your home. Or go now to the American Radio Association, 5 Beekman Street, New York City. And now, back to Tales of the Texas Rangers. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and our authentic story, Birds of a Feather. The 
kidnap note had arrived in the mail that morning, but Warren had not picked it up until a few minutes before we arrived. It was a crudely printed message, unsigned and mailed the night before in Baker. It asked $10,000 for the return of the boy. The money was to be brought in $50 bills to a shack in Copper Canyon at 4 o'clock that afternoon. It was now 1.15. While we read the note, Warren paced back and forth across the room. John, walking back and forth like that ain't gonna do no good. Why don't you sit down? Sure, you can say that. It's not your boy they got out there in the cold. Now, John, that ain't fair. You know I feel bad about this. I know you do, Sheriff. I... I'm sorry. Mr. Warren, are you sure they've actually picked up your son? Well, they must have. I called the school right after I got the note. Johnny never showed up there today. That means they've had him since before nine this morning. What's the use of talking about it? Just let me leave the money and get my boy back. We'd like to help you get him back. You've read what I said in the note. If I bring the police in, they'll kill him. Mr. Warren, what I'm going to say will sound pretty blunt, but I want you to think about it. No, I can't think. Now, just a minute. You must believe that once the kidnappers get the money, they're going to take the trouble to bring your son back. Well, I... The Ranger's right, John. They wouldn't do that. Too much risk getting caught. Well, you, you mean that even if I leave the money, that they'll kill Johnny? I'm not saying they will, but they might. Look at it this way. Sure, the note said they'd bring your son back, but did it say when or how? Well, no. I've seen a lot of these cases, Mr. Warren. I know how tragically most of them end because the victim doesn't call in the police. All right. What do you want me to do? First of all, you've got to understand one thing. We'll do our best to help you. But it's humanly impossible to guarantee anything. I understand that, Ranger. Good. Now, let's see. It's 1.20. How long will it take us to get to Copper Canyon, Sheriff? Well, if we cut across the back of this ranch, it shouldn't take us over 20 minutes on horses. Good. You got a horse for the Sheriff, Mr. Warren? We sure have. Corral's full of them. Is there some place we can watch the shack without being seen? I reckon the best place would be along the rim of the canyon. They wouldn't spot us there. I don't suppose you have all that cash handy, Mr. Warren. I'll have to get it from the bank. You know any of the bank officials well? The president. One of my best friends. I'll get the money directly from him. Have him mark the bills and record the serial numbers. Well, he'll want to know why. Tell him. But ask him not to say anything to anybody. All right, Ranger. We'll be taking off now. You can ride to the canyon as soon as you have the money. You, uh, you want me to leave it there just like they said? That's right. We'll be watching. And we're going to count on catching whoever picks it up. I contacted headquarters by radio and requested an area blockade of the region around Baker. Then the sheriff and I started off. It was two o'clock when we reached the rim of Copper Canyon. An icy wind was blowing in from the north. We dismounted and eased over to the edge of the ridge. A shack was clearly visible 200 yards below. We waited. At 3.55, we spotted Warren riding up the canyon. He's right on time, Jace. You reckon somebody's waiting for him in that shack? Maybe. Shouldn't be long before we find out. Don't it strike you funny that they only asked 10000 John must be worth close to a million. They could have got 50000 easy. Now, this is a small-time larceny gang, Sheriff. 10000 must look pretty big to them. Yeah. Poor John. Sure hope we can get that kid back to him. We're going to make a good try. There he goes. Open the door of the shack. Uh-huh. Better get ready. If there's anybody in there, we don't want to lose him. I'm ready. But one of the kidnappers is in there. You could pluck him easy with that rifle when he comes out. That wouldn't be any good, Sheriff. And we'd never find out where they're hiding the boy. There's John again. Jeez, he's waving at us to come down. Now, what... Come on, Sheriff. Let's go down and see what he wants. There's something I don't like about this, Jace. Why would John beckon us down here like he did? There's only one way to find out. We'll know in a minute. I don't see him around. He must have gone back into the shack. Oh, oh, Charky. Oh, boy. Oh. Oh. Be careful moving in, Sheriff. Maybe some kind of trap. Mr. Warren? It's all right, Ranger. Uh, Come on in. Look. Look what's in this cage. I'll be darned. Pigeons. What's that strapped on the backs? Capsules to carry messages or money. They're homing pigeons, Sheriff. I knew it wouldn't work, Ranger. These men are clever. They don't take chances. Did they leave any instructions? Yeah, yeah. There's... What's it say, Jace? 
Mr. Warren's supposed to divide the money in ten parts and put it in those capsules on the pigeons. Yes, and then I release the pigeons and they fly wherever the men are. We're licked, Ranger. I'm not so sure. But if I don't do like they say, they'll kill my boy. You'll do exactly as they say, Mr. Warren, because these pigeons are going to lead us to your son. But, Jace, we can't follow homing pigeons on horseback. Not alone, Sheriff. We're going to have help. What kind of help? A plane. I'll use that walkie-talkie out there in my saddle. Have our nearest unit contact Austin. Ask him to send one of the Ranger planes over here. Sounds like a good idea, Jace. Well, suppose they do bring a plane in. How will that help you find my boy? We won't release the pigeons till the plane gets here. Then the air unit will keep radio contact with us and lead us to the place where the pigeons land. You you reckon it'll work? I hope so. You stay here with Mr. Warren, Sheriff. I'll be back in ten minutes. I rode to higher ground so my radio signal would carry. I contacted the highway patrol car. It relayed my message to Austin. Headquarters said they could have Unit 902, our ranger plane overhead, in 25 minutes. Then I went down to the shack again, and we waited. Plane should be getting here any time now, Jace. I wish they'd hurry. I thought I heard it a second ago. Yeah, there it is. In from the southeast. Where? Oh, I see it now. How about the pigeons, Mr. Warren? They're all ready to go. Bring the cage out of the shack, will you, Sheriff? Sure. You, uh... Think the plane sees us yet? I don't know, but I can call him now. Unit 10 to Unit 902. Go ahead, Unit 902. Unit 902 to Unit 10. I'm directly above Copper Canyon. Indicate your position. Unit 10 next to shack at north end of canyon floor. Can you spot us? Gotcha. Relay instructions. Pigeons are all set, Chase. Fine. This unit will release ten pigeons. Follow them and locate landing place. Request you maintain radio contact with us. Stand by for release of pigeons. 10-4, unit 902, clear. All right, Sheriff. Open the cage and let the pigeons go. They're not wasting any time getting away. We've held it up too long. We're half an hour late now. Don't worry, Mr. Warren. The men who are waiting probably think they're pretty safe. Pigeons are heading east, Jace. We're going to head in that direction, too. Get in touch with you as soon as possible, Mr. Warren. Let's go, Sheriff. Get up, John. Get up. We've been riding for over ten minutes, Jace. Shouldn't we be hearing from your plane? Uh, he's probably got more than he can do just keeping his eye on those pigeons. We'll hear from him. I well, sure hope it's soon. It gets dark early these days. Uh, it could be him coming in now. Unit 902 to Unit 10. Ooh, 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 ooh. Boy. Unit 10 to 902. Go ahead. This unit has got off motor. I'm gliding to avoid detection. Is my signal clear? Signal clear, 902. Pigeons are now landing at Shack. Do east your former position. Shack located at base of hill, where dry wash makes horseshoe bend. That's the old Martinez shack, Jace. Been empty for years. Sounds like it's occupied now. Thanks, 902. We'll take it from here. Unit 10, clear. 10-4, 902, clear. How far is the Martinez shack from here, Sheriff? Four miles, maybe. Five at the most. And we got a knock on it, Sheriff. No telling what their plans are now. Get up, Chark. Come on, boy. That's it, Chase. Up ahead. Whoa, whoa, Charky. Whoa, boy. Easy. Whoa, boy. Whoa. We didn't make it any too soon. It's getting dark already. Better leave the horses here. Wonder if they're still inside the shack. There's your answer, Sheriff. Car hidden in that brush. Must have driven up this dry wash. Uh huh. How do you figure to take him, Jace? Yeah, they won't be expecting us. Best way is to break in and get him before they can hurt that boy. If they haven't hurt him already. Yeah. When we get to the door, wait till I give the word to go in. Gotcha, Jace. Come on. Pigeons. At least we know we got the right place. Uh huh. You ready, Sheriff? Whatever you say. Now. Hey, hey, tell the cops! Watch him, Jace. Uh, uh, you all right, Jace? Yeah. You sure took this one? He's dead in the doornail. 
I think we just nicked the other one. Oh, I'm hurt. I'm hurt bad. Ah, it's only your shoulder. Where's the boy? <laughs> In the back room. See if he's all right, Sheriff. Sure. Your name's Joe Wills? No. Joe's over there. Get me to a doctor, will you? Young Warren's all right, Jace. I'm untying him. Good. You must be Ben Morphy. Yeah. Get me to a doctor. Oh, my shoulder. There's nothing wrong with your legs, Ben. Get up. It's a long trip to Huntsville, and you're walking the first part. In just a moment, we will tell you the results of the case you have just heard. There's man-to-man adventure in store for you Tuesday night with Cavalcade of America and the man called X. Gregory Peck will be heard as a prisoner named Brown when Cavalcade of America tells the story of the man who instituted widespread prison reforms by becoming a voluntary inmate. It was in 1931 that Thomas Osborne, a former mayor of Auburn, New York, visited the governor of New York to see what could be done to make Sing Sing more effective. He saw the same men return again and again for new prison sentences. Working from the point of view that prisons should be repair shops and not scrap heaps, he entered the prison to find out firsthand about the conditions in penal institutions. His discoveries and improvements led to his becoming warden of the self-same prison in which he was a prisoner. You'll hear this story Tuesday on the Cavalcade of America. And also on Tuesday over most NBC stations, Herbert Marshall takes over as the man called X with stories of intrigue in the far-off corners of the world. Hear Herbert Marshall as the man called X Tuesday on this station of the NBC radio network. And now back to Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, here are the results of the case you have just heard. Soon after the arrest, Ben Morphy confessed to the killing of the third member of the gang, Fred Meter. He was tried and convicted on dual counts of kidnapping and first-degree murder. On August 31st, 1941, he died in the electric chair at Huntsville Penitentiary. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. cast included Tony Barrett, Bill Conrad, Ed Begley, Ernie Newton, and Bill Johnstone. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Charles E. Israel, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. Hal Gibney speaking. Next, it's the big show. All this and Tallulah, too, on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Blood Harvest. It is a moonless 
almost midnight, September 16th, 1947. A truck without lights is parked in a cultivated field several miles from Fairvale, Texas. In the darkness, two men are perspiring freely as they load bales of seasoned alfalfa onto the truck. How many more we got to go, Slim? Uh, 15, 20, that's all. Now we can get it all on here, then. This will be the last load. That suits me fine. The sooner you get off the place with it, better. Come on. Yeah, whoa, take it easy, will you, Slim? How about time out for a smoke? A smoke? Are you out of your mind, Trent? Oh, we're a half mile from the house. And besides, you said Mullen was asleep. Look, don't give me an argument. All right, all right. But I moved more than 200 bales of this stuff tonight. I'm going to rest for a minute. If you don't like it, load the rest out yourself. Okay, don't get hot about it. I'm just as tired as you are. I'll sit on a running board. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mullen's sure going to be surprised when he gets a look at this field tomorrow. Yeah, he sure is. Uh, what do we get for this stuff? About $30 a ton. Ain't bad. Bound to clear almost 200 bucks a piece. Yeah. Could make more than that running a couple of head of cattle without working up this pig sweat, though. Sure, smart guy. Run cattle and get picked up and sent to the pen. Maybe there ain't as much money in alfalfa, but one thing about it, there ain't no brand marks on the bales either. Nobody can say it ain't yours once you get in the clear with it. Yeah, I guess you got a point. Think Mullins liable to suspicion you when he finds his field stripped tomorrow? Oh, not a chance. I'm an old war buddy, ain't I? And he saw me taking a sleeping pill before we turned in tonight. <laughs> At least he thinks he saw me take it. <laughs> Good thing he ain't seen you take this alfalfa or you'd lose your job for sure. After tomorrow, I can afford to lose it. Farm work ain't for men, it's for horses. Hey, come on, we rested long enough. I want to get you away from here. Okay. <sighs> Now, give me that pitchfork. I'll push those last two bales back and make more room on the tail of the yeah, truck. Here it is. I got to act real surprised tomorrow. When... What's the matter, Slim? Shh. There's something moving. I don't hear nothing. There it is again. Maybe it's Mullen. Maybe he woke up. Keep quiet, Trent. Who's on this field? It is him. You better answer me. I can see the outline of your truck. Slim, I got to start up and get out of here. No. <laughs> he woke up. You must know I'm not in the house. So pile in the truck and come with me, quick. I go to jail, lady, you fool. No. I'll slide around behind the truck. You stay here until he comes up to you. Yeah, but I don't... Don't I tell you. Who are you? Talk up fast. It's me, you Mullen. Harry Trent. Harry Trent, huh? You lost, Trent? What are you doing in my field in the middle of the night with a truck full of my alfalfa? Uh, oh, Save it, Trent. Where's Slim? Wait around to I didn't run any place, Mullen. You know... Don't me. move. There's a pitchfork you feel against your ribs. Just march back to the house. What are you going to do to him, Slim? I'm going to lend him my bottle of sleeping pills and see to it that he takes an overdose of them. It's nice, clean, and quiet. That idea would be great, Slim, if I'd hold still for it. But I ain't about to hold still. Look out, Slim. Punch him, Trent. Let go of that fork, Mullen. Now, oh, Mullen, here's something you don't have to hold still for. But you'll hold still this time. Oh. You killed him. You killed him. You shut up. Stop that and shut up. Uh, oh, we gotta run, Slim. We gotta you gotta do nothing. Get that load out of here and sell it like we planned. Then keep your mouth shut. If you don't, I'll shut it for you. Just before dawn of the next morning, a hound from a neighboring farm came across the body of Robert Mullen. Its baying attracted its master, who called the sheriff. The sheriff requested aid from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. There's a body, Ranger. Black hound dog over there came across it this morning, set up a holler. Owner heard her, knowed she'd find something and come running. I see. Which one owns the dog? Fellow in the Mackinac, Sam Richardson. His farmer joins this one along the east fence. Who are the other two men? Harry Trent. Farmer on the north is his, and Slim Fireman. Slim worked this place with Mullen. They was buddies in the war or something. You want to talk to him? Yeah, in a minute. Anybody touch that pitchfork? Nope, not even me yet. I figured it must be the murder weapon, blood all over the prongs. Hard to read prints off that handle, though. Yeah. Marks on the body show Mullen was jabbed twice. Once would have been plenty. I, uh, sent for the J.P., but I don't think we need an inquest to tag this as murder. No. But he'll have to order a medical examination to establish the time of death. Hmm. Hmm. Mullen felt kind of funny. The left leg bent in under him. 
Well, there's a reason for that. Pull up the pants leg and you'll see. Yeah. That explains it, all right. Artificial leg. He in some kind of an accident? If you can call Okinawa an accident, you get the beach there with the first Marines. Lost a leg and an eye. Left eye's glass. He could have picked an easier life than farming. Did he have any family? Sister, Ellie, lives over at Holtzville. Guess I'll have to bring her the news. You could call the local minister at Holtzville. He can tell her better than you can. And we can drive over and see her later and find out if she knows anything. That's a good idea. I'll talk to these other fellows now. Okay. They uh, don't seem to know much, though. They may know when Mullen was last seen alive. is not often a man gets pitchforked to death out in his own fields. Yeah. Fellas, this here is Ranger Jace Pearson. Ranger, this is Sam Richardson. Howdy. Hello. Harry Trent. Hello. Slim Fireman. Glad to know you. Richardson, the sheriff tells me your dog found the body. That's right. Oh, must have been about uh, 4 a.m. I was just getting out of bed when I heard her, so I come a-running. You always run out and investigate when you hear one of your hounds baying? Nope, but that black hound of mine's a good one. And I ain't never heard a dog sound off like she did. I see. When did you see Mullen last alive? Yesterday morning. Pass each other along the fence and said howdy. How about you, Mr. Trent? Uh, I hadn't seen him for a couple of days. Reckon Slim here saw him last then. How about it? Well, sure, I reckon I did. Last night we ate and then I turned in early. Hmm. Then this happened during the night. Must have, as far as I know. Why would Mullen come out to this field at night? <laughs> I don't know. I didn't even know he'd left the house until Richardson here come pounding on the door and woke me up this morning after he found the body. You live right on the place, Slim? Uh huh. How come you didn't hear Richardson's dog? Well, I was sleeping kind of heavy. I took a sleeping pill last night. Must have knocked me out good. Had a rough day yesterday. What do you mean, rough? Well, all the extra chores, loading the alfalfa from this field onto the truck. I was wondering how come there were so few bales from such a big cutting. Well, Mullen had a buyer for most of it, I reckon. Anyhow, he carted it off. Yeah, I see the tire tracks. Any idea who he sold it to? No, he didn't say. Think somebody paid him for the stuff, then came back to rob him of the money, Jase? Could be, Sheriff. Except that Mullen made the robin mighty convenient by coming out into this field at night. When we learn why he came out here, we'll be learning a lot. <laughs> While the justice of the peace showed up and took charge of the body, the sheriff made his call to the minister at Holtzville so he could break the news to Mullen's sister. He gave her a couple of hours to get a grip and then drove over to see her. <laughs> he was... He was only here last Sunday, spending the day with her, playing with a baby and arguing with Dan. Who's Dan? My husband. What were they arguing about? Oh, I, I didn't mean a real argument. Politics. Cost of living, you know how men get talking. <laughs> and, and now he's dead. Take it easy, Ellie. <laughs> That's your brother's picture over the fireplace, isn't it? Yes, in his uniform. Just before he went overseas in the war. Before he was hurt. Anybody you know of who might gain anything by having your brother out of the way? No. He never made any enemy. Guess it was robbery like we figured before, Jace. No money on him and none in the house that we could find. Mm, might have had time to bank the crop money yesterday. We can check that with the bank. Might as well go, then. Ellie, you shouldn't be here alone at a time like this. The minister's coming back later. Why don't you call Dan and have him come home from work? He's away for a few days on a business trip. Oh, away on a business trip, huh? Who's he working for? He's buying and selling for Hatton's Feed and Grain Company. Don't worry about me. I'll be all right. Well, if there's anything I can do, just holler. Bye, Ellie. Goodbye, ma'am. Goodbye. You, you got to find out who killed my brother. You can't let him get away with it. We'll try not to, ma'am. I never thought how her husband's job might fit into this. Buying and selling feed and grain, huh? Mullen sold that alfalfa. Most likely man he'd sell it to would be his own brother-in-law. It's something we're going to check on. Hop in. We'll put out a radio pickup for him? No, we'll drive over to the Hatton Feed and Grain. They'll know where he is. We'll pick him up ourselves.
Hatton's Feed and Grain Company told us the area that Mullen's brother-in-law, Dan, was working. We caught up to him next morning, making a selling stop at a dairy farm. That must be Dan's car there by the barn. Hatton Company emblem on it. Yeah, let's find him. There he is. Other end of the barn, leaning on a stall. Must be the owner he's talking to. Call him down here. We don't have to. He sees us coming this way now. Watch out for any sudden moves, just in case. Uh, Howdy, Sheriff. Is it for me? Ranger and I'd like a word with you. Uh, reckon it's about Ellie's brother. You heard about it, huh? Yeah, on my car radio this morning. I called Ellie a little while ago. She told me you'd been to see her. A couple of stops I just got to make around here, and then I'm heading for home. When did you see Mullen last? Two days ago, when I started out on this trip. You stopped by his place? That's right. Social call or business? Business. Made a bid on his alfalfa. We just about finished sweating, ready to be hauled for storage. How'd you pay him for it, by cash or company check? I didn't pay him for it, Ranger. He said it wasn't for sale. You better be sure of that, Dan. What do you mean? He means that that alfalfa was sold and moved just before Mullen was killed, the same day you stopped there. Whoever told you that's a lie. It's no lie, Dan. We saw it with our own eyes. Everything was hauled from there except maybe a dozen bales. I don't care what you saw. I know that alfalfa wasn't for sale to me or anybody else. What makes you so sure of that? I'll tell you what makes me so sure, and you can check it with the bank. Bob told me he'd made arrangements for a bank loan to buy 20 head of dairy cattle. That's why I'm sure. He was getting them in next month, and he needed that alfalfa for winter forage. He couldn't have sold it, not to anybody. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Blood Harvest, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. Mullen's bank verified the loan for buying the dairy herd. Unless he'd changed his mind suddenly, Mullen wouldn't have sold the feed he'd been needing for his own stock. The sheriff and I headed back for Mullen's farm. Don't see Slim around any place. Maybe into the funeral home. Let's take a look at the barn. We've looked at the barn before, Jace. No way we could miss a couple hundred bales of alfalfa. No, but we might have missed something we weren't looking for the last time. Just look up. You see the lot is almost empty. He didn't need much forage with just one horse to feed. No, I'm not looking for forage. Here's what I'm interested in. It's just a bunch of scrap lumber. And a keg of nails. Just about what he'd need to build stalls for that dairy herd. Now, Mullen was too far ahead with his plans to change his mind, if you ask me. Sure looks that way. Where'd Mullen keep his hay truck? That vehicle shed out back? Yeah. Come on. What do you want to see, Jace? The truck that Slim said he and Mullen loaded that alfalfa on. Looks like the shed is locked. Yeah. Oh, no, it isn't. It's the wooden peg stuck through the lock ratchet. We can pull it. I'll help you roll it back. Yeah. There's the truck. Is this the only truck he's got? Yep. If this truck was used to haul alfalfa bales, they must have been tighter than any bales I've ever seen. Look at that truck bed. Clean as a whistle. Not a straw on the floor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Sheriff, this is the truck that was loaded out in that field. You can't be sure of that just because the bed is clean. No, but I can be sure by the tires. Look at them. Treads worn down almost smooth. The tire marks we saw out in the field were well marked. Plenty of tread. Hey, that's right. They were. Come on. Take Mullen's horse from the barn, throw a saddle on it. I'll get charcoal out of my trailer and we'll take a little ride. Where to? Out to the fields first where I can make a plaster cast of that tire tread. Truck was loaded heavy. Impression was deep enough to hold. Why can't we drive out? I want to cut across the neighboring farms, too, and see if we can find any matching treads in other fields. We'll see the ground better as we move on horseback. It's as easy to drive around the farms and check the tires on the trucks like we did here. Yeah, but I don't want to be seen doing that. If we scare the man we're after, he might run before we get to him. Okay, I'll have this nag ready in a minute. If you're right, Jace, Slim Ferryman has been lying about moving the alfalfa. Easy, boy. We'll find out. If he was lying, he'll explain why Mullen was out to that field at night. Because it'll mean that the crop was being stolen at night. And he was killed when he saw who was stealing it. Uh, 
How long does it take that cast to dry, Jace? Yeah, be ready in a minute. Well, that would be a lot of truck tires with that same tread. Sure, but this piece I'm making a cast of has a cut mark across part of the tread. Oh, I see. Find that same mark again someplace else. We can make another cast to use for evidence. Here, this is dry now. How's that, Sheriff? Good, clear impression, Jace. Come on. Let's ride. We checked the neighboring farms. Sam Richardson's place was clear, and so were the two others. And we cut through the north fence to Mullum's farm and into the acreage owned by Harry Trent. Looks like Trent moved his alfalfa crop too, Jace. Fields are clear. Yeah. Where's the farmhouse? Other side of that patch of trees. Good. That'll keep us covered. Keep your eyes on the ground. Right. Hey, hold it. Ooh. Hold it. What is it? Nothing. Tractor marks there. Not what we're looking for. Oh. Well, let's keep going. Hey, right. yeah. yep. There's quite a bit of straw on the ground over to the right, Sheriff. Let's move that way. Hey, boy. Yeah. Sharky. Yeah. Probably Trent had his bail stacked there. Huh. He sure did. That's what we're looking for. Ooh, ooh, charcoal. Ooh, oh, easy. Kind of dim, Jace, but they're the same tread, all right. Yeah, it looks like the same cut mark in the tread. I'm going to make another cast. Then after dark, we can slip in and take a look at Trent's barn and his truck. <laughs> We slipped back that night. Trent's truck tires were the ones we were looking for. Heavy duty. We went from the vehicle shed to the barn. Pretty dark night, Jase. Hardly see in here either. Yeah, I don't see enough to find what I want. It's a ladder to the left. All right, here it is. All right, I'm going to climb up. Give me your flashlight. Here you are. Anything up there? Just a few bales. I reckon Trent sold most of his alfalfa crop, too. Even if he had Mullen's crop here, no way we could prove it. That's where you're wrong, Sheriff. If Trent had it, we're gonna prove it. We cleared the farm without being spotted. Got to my car and drove back to town. Robert Mullen's wake had just ended at the funeral home as we pulled up at the sheriff's office. We didn't have to be so careful out at Trent's place, Jace. There he is going toward his car. Must have come in to pay his respect. Uh, he just came out of the door of that cafe. Oh, and look who's in there at the counter. Slim Ferryman. Yeah, we could use some coffee. Come on. Sheriff and Ranger. Howdy, May. How's the coffee? Try stirring it, and it'll fling the spoon right back at you. <laughs> that sounds strong enough. Pour a couple. Yeah, all right. Uh, mind if we sit with you, Slim? Uh, help yourself. Yeah, got a line on who killed Mullen yet? No. Too bad Mullen never mentioned the name of the man he was selling that alfalfa to. No, too bad. You think he might have mentioned it to one of the neighbors, Sam Richardson, maybe, or Harry Trent? No, no, I don't, I don't think so. I guess it isn't likely. man who doesn't tell his plans to an old buddy living right in the same house with him, I guess he wouldn't tell anybody. Well, here's your java, Sheriff. Thanks. Ranger. You and Mullen go all through the war together? No, just part of it. Mm -hmm. Where'd you meet? South Pacific? Uh, no, here in the States, I... Uh, I was a ward man at the general hospital. Oh, then you weren't in action together. No. I see. I, I thought you were real close friends. We were. Who says we weren't? Well, take it easy. Nobody said so. I just meant you, you weren't as close as buddies are when they're under fire together. We were plenty close, and don't let nobody tell you different. Mullen was the best friend I ever had, see? Sure. When you get the guy who killed him, I'd... I'd like to be there to watch when they strap the rat in the electric chair. I know just how you feel. I'll do my best to arrange that for you. Um, here's your money, May. Oh, thanks, Liam. Uh, I'm going back to the farm and get some sleep if I can. Hardly had any since this happened. It's too bad. Maybe you ought to take one of your sleeping pills. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe I will. Good night. Good night, Sheriff. Good night, Slim. You sure rattled his teeth, Jace. He was pretty frank about his service record, though. Yeah, only because he knew I could check it if he lied. 
Let's skip this coffee. I want to see Ellie and her husband, Dan. Ellie and Dan were keeping a lonesome night vigil beside the body of Robert Mullen. We beckoned Dan outside. What is it? I won't leave Ellie alone too long. I'm afraid you'll have to leave her alone for a while if you want to help us spring the trap on the man who killed your brother-in-law. You know who did it? I think so. But I need your help to prove it. You've got to help her. What do you want? How much acreage did Mullen have in alfalfa? Looked like seven or eight acres. Eight's right. You know how much it'd yield? About two ton to an acre, 16 ton all told. That's a good yield for this year. He took good care of his land. Why? I'll tell you in a minute. Sheriff, we saw Trent's alfalfa acreage. I'd say he'd cut about six acres. But, Dan, you don't have to say about. Six acres is right. How do you know? I bought Trent's alfalfa crop from my company. Good. How much? Almost 12 ton. Same acre yield as Bob Mullins. 12 tons. Are you sure that's all? Of course I'm sure. The feed and grain companies keep a record of everybody they purchase from? Sure. Can the lots be identified? I mean, are they tagged or stored in such a way you could tell who they were brought from? Yeah, they are. What are you aiming at, Jace? Final proof to break Trent down? Dan, I want you to come with me. We'll get one of the bales Trent sold to your company, and then we're going to wake up every other feed and grain buyer in the county to see if he sold any more than 12 tons. <laughs> got what we were after. The day after Mullen was killed, Trent had sold an additional 15 tons to another company almost 50 miles away. We got a sample bale and brought it back to the sheriff's office. Hey, put it down here, Dan. Yeah. So Trent did sell more of it, huh? 15 tons more. Well, see how you can tell this bale from the other one? You can when you weigh them. Trent's bales averaged 110 pounds to the bale on his own stuff. The bales in this second batch are tighter packed, about 140 pounds to the bale. Hey, wait a minute, Ranger. There's something else different, too. I just noticed. Look at the wire on the bales. Mm, it looks the same to me. Maybe, but you're not as used to seeing baling wire as I am. Wire on the bales Trent sold me is 16 gauge. Wire on this other bale is 14 gauge. Bob Mullen always used 14 gauge. Come on, Sheriff. Let's get Trent and make him talk. Once he opens up, we'll see where Slim Ferriman fits. Chase, I see the picture's clear as you do now, but how are we going to prove that this second batch of alfalfa was stolen from Mullen's place? We don't have to prove it. Trent's the one who has to do the proving. We do things big in Texas, but he's the first man who ever sold 27 tons of alfalfa from six acres. Let's go. <laughs> It was still dark when we turned in the road to Trent's farmhouse, and the light went on inside as we came to a stop. Trent came to the door. Oh! Oh, it's you fellas. I heard a car. And I... You thought it was somebody else? No, no, no. I didn't know who it was. Oh. I thought you might be expecting Slim Fairman. Uh... No, no. Why would Slim come here? Take a few lessons in farming, maybe? So you could show him how to raise 27 tons of alfalfa on six acres? 26? You must have raised that much, Trent, because you sold that much. The 15 tons of it belonged to Mullen. He bailed heavier and used 14-gauge wire while you used 16-gauge. Uh, I bought Mullen's crop. Why would he sell it to you instead of his brother-in-law, Dan? I mean, I, I hauled it for him. He thought the price would be better someplace else. Not enough to haul it 50 miles. And besides, you made that sale yesterday. After Mullen was killed. I had to do it. I was in a trap. If I told you about it, Slim would have killed me. Did he kill Mullen? Were you an eyewitness? Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw him do it. I never touched Mullen. Where's Slim now? I I thought you were him when you drove up. He's coming here this morning. I got to check for Mullen's alfalfa, and Slim was going to pick it up and take it someplace for cash. And... There's a car coming now, Jason. Handcuff Trent to the door now of that closet. Quick. Right. I didn't kill Shut him. Up. Come on, Sheriff. Slim won't stop. He'll see my car as he makes the turn for the house. He saw it. He's turning around. Get his tires. That stopped him. He's running for it, Chase. Move off to that side. The car is shielding him. Right. Stop running, Slim. You can't beat a bullet. He ducked into the bullet, Chase. Circle in from the side and keep the door covered. I'm going in after him. The gray of dawn was washing across the sky, but the barn was in deep shadow. I slipped in along the side wall and moved slowly toward the stalls. I didn't see what came at me. I just sensed it hurtling through the air, and I threw myself to the side, hit the ground, and fired. Did you get him, Chase? You all right? Yeah. 
He threw that sickle at me from the stall. I didn't see him. Don't even know how I hit him. I just felt it coming and fired. Mighty good aim. He's dead. So is Bob Mullen. Let's get Trent and take him in. For his complicity in the robbery and murder of Robert Mullen, Harry Trent was sentenced to Huntsville Penitentiary for 50 years. Here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae, with another interesting story about the Texas Rangers. The equipment of a Texas Ranger includes a pair of six guns, a rifle, a shotgun, and other weapons. Not to mention his horse, horse trailer, automobile, and scientific crime detection apparatus. However, there's been a fictional addition to the equipment as the result of motion pictures. An addition that has the Rangers scratching their heads ruefully. It came to the attention of one Ranger recently as he passed two small boys on a street. The small fry turned to stare at him. The ranger got quite a shock when he heard one of them say, Oh, shucks. He ain't a real Texas ranger. He ain't got a guitar. <laughs> well, such is the influence of modern fiction. But fortunately, the criminals know the truth. When they see a real Texas ranger, they don't look for a guitar. They look for the quickest means of transportation. They want distance, not music. Good night, folks. See you next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Lou Krugman, Herb Bygren, Tom Cully, Wilms Herbert, Betty Moran, and Gigi Pearson. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Al Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Here's news of two outstanding musical events. This Saturday, January 27th, Arturo Toscanini begins the first of a new series with the NBC Symphony. And starting Monday, January 29th, the Boston Pops Orchestra will be heard in a new Monday evening concert series. They call infantile paralysis the visible crippler. It strikes without mercy any place, anywhere. You can fight him with your dimes and dollars, though. Send them today to your local March of Dimes headquarters. Join the 1951 March of Dimes. Remember, Arturo Toscanini once again conducts the symphony next Saturday on NBC. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. dates and places in the following story are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. You know, when Thursday rolls around, it'll bring more top radio entertainment to you over these NBC stations. Thursday starts right off in high gear with Robert Young starring as heroic and harassed Jim Anderson of Father Knows Best. The Andersons are just like your family, but funnier, for the head of the household can get himself involved in situations that take the concerted effort of wife and progeny to get unraveled. And usually Jim rises from the battle bloody but unbowed, and still firmly convinced that father knows best. 
For adventure fans, Thursday holds the promise of top mystery listening also, as NBC presents Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons, who matches his deductive reasoning against the violence and murder of crime. Later, join Jack Webb as Sergeant Joe Friday of Dragnet, the true story of your police force in action. Father Knows Best, Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons, hear all these and more Thursdays on NBC. Now back to Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, from the files of the Texas Rangers, the case called Blood Trail. It is 7.30 on a Saturday evening in July 1929. For a week, an oppressive blanket of heat and dust has surrounded the town of Whitney in the Texas Panhandle. Despite the unpleasant weather, however, Whitney is enjoying its usual Saturday night activity as Sheriff Dave Fellows strolls down Main Street. Red, you're as stubborn as a mule. Oh, howdy, Sheriff. Uh, howdy, Harry. You having trouble? Oh, just a little argument with Red. <laughs> Another one? Oh, he's just plumb stubborn. Won't admit nothing. Well, what won't he admit this time? Well, it's like this. I've been living near Whitney 40 years now. Been around the panhandle all my life. And I say this is the hottest July since Oct 2. And Red says different, huh? Red says it's just hotter than the summer of 18. I say 18 wasn't near as hot. Now, what do you say, Sheriff? Now, Harry, you know I make a practice of never taking sides in an argument. But if you want the facts... Well, I just come from my office. Weather report on my desk says it's the hottest July in 65 years. <laughs> I know it. I know it. Yeah. <laughs> I sure wished I was wrong, though. If this heat don't let up, I'm going to be a poor man. Don't look like nobody's going to make a crop. Yeah, everybody seems to be worried. Can't remember when we had... Ch- uh... Hey, who's that over there, sir? Hmm? Huh? Where? Oh, yonder. Coming towards the drugstore. Uh-oh. Looks like a drunk. I better get on over there. He sure got a snootful. <laughs> hey, Sheriff, ain't that old Doc Thomas? Doc Thomas? Well, yeah. You're right, Harry. I didn't know Doc was a drinking man. Besides, he got office hours till seven on Saturday. You better help me get him off the street. People are starting to look at him. I'm sure. Who'd have thought that old Doc had... T- Sheriff, he's walking out in the street. He'll get hit. Doc! Look out, Doc! Look out, Doc! Look out! Come on, Harry. Hope he ain't hit bad. Uh, maybe not. The car just grazed. Careful. Move into it. Yeah. Yeah. Now help him. Help him out. He's hurt bad. Hey, one of you folks call Dr. Fields and tell him to hurry. Right, Jeff. We'll do it. Give me a hand, Harry. We'll get him up onto the sidewalk. Sure. Easy now. Easy. Get him out of here. Reckon this was the first time he ever took a drink. This had to happen. All right, folks. Move back, will you? Give us some room here. All right, Jeff. Now set him right down here, Harry. Easy now. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. There we are. Is he hurt? Yeah. Oh, that blood. I didn't think that car hit him that hard. Yeah, it didn't. Look at his shirt. It's soaked. He's been bleeding a long time. You mean when he was staggering down the street, he was already hurt? It appears that way. From the look of it, somebody gave the doc an awful whack on the head. But who want to do that to old Doc Thomas? I don't know. But I'm afraid we're not going to find out from him. Doc Thomas is dead. It was easy for the sheriff to trace Dr. Thomas's path before he was hit by the car. Drops of blood on the sidewalk led directly to the doctor's office on a side street, four blocks from the scene of his death. The sheriff called for a Texas Ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned joining the sheriff outside the doctor's office at 5 o'clock Sunday morning. Sorry, I couldn't get here sooner, Sheriff. Austin told me you were the nearest ranger, Jace. But they said you were quite a piece away. Yeah, Wichita Falls. Reckon you'd like to take a look at his office first. This is the waiting room. Not much to see here. It's the office that'll give you a shock. You know what the actual cause of death was yet? Loss of blood. Had a skull fracture, too. Haven't found what he was hit with, though. Look at there, Jace. Some mess. Not a stick of furniture left in one piece. It, look out for that broken glass. Never would have thought old Doc Thomas could put up such a fight. Didn't he ever have a nurse here with him? No. I figure he couldn't afford it. Treated everybody, rich or poor, the doc did, and didn't mind waiting to be paid. Did he have any money on him when he died? Oh, I don't believe it was robbery, Jace. 
He had about 15 bucks in his pocket. Uh-huh. Yeah, the phone's ripped out. Looks like he was trying to call somebody. Maybe not. Could have been tore out during the fight. I don't think so. Cord's out of the way of any furniture that got pushed over. And look at the way the wires are torn. Now, I'd say somebody meant to pull them out of the wall. The one thing I don't understand. If the fellow that had this fight with Doc wasn't after money, he probably meant to kill him. Mm, sounds likely enough. Well, then why didn't he? The way the Doc was weaving when I saw him, it would have been a cinch for the killer to catch him before he ever got to Main Street. I think this will answer your question, Sheriff. That spot of dried blood? Oh, but how, Jace? There's blood spots all over the office. And some in the waiting room. None as large as this. From the size of it, he must have been lying here at least a few minutes. Could be he got knocked unconscious. Killer thought he'd finished his job and took off. Then you figure the doc came to, got up, and staggered downtown, huh? Yeah. Hey, the fight must have made quite a racket. Any of the neighbors hear anything? Uh, I checked that. People on both sides were out. Downtown for the evening. Uh, you looking for something special, Jace? Yeah. And I've got it. Doc's appointment book. Hmm. Only one appointment after 5 o'clock. 6.30, Carl Hinkle. You know him, Sheriff? Sure. German fella. Lived here about 10 years. I guess he would... Hey, wait a minute. I think we're on to something, Jay. How do you mean? Carl Hinkle's wife. The doc delivered her baby about six weeks ago. Mrs. Hinkle died right after the baby was born. I've heard around town that Carl blamed the doc for her dying. I see. Where does Hinkle live? Not far from here. Over near the Santa Fe Depot. Come on, Sheriff. Let's wake him up and have a talk with him. It was 6.10 when we reached Carl Hinkle's home. It was a small but neat frame house fronting the railroad tracks. Nobody answered our knock, so we walked around to the back door. Hinkle was washing something out in a laundry tub on the porch. He was a big blonde man who looked at us stolidly as we walked toward him. Morning, Carl. Morning. Uh, Carl, this is Ranger Pearson. He and I'd like to talk to you. Well, I'll show the inspector. I tie my hands. Pretty early be doing washing, isn't it, Mr. Hankel? Yeah, I wash for the baby. Mm, some of your own clothes there, too, aren't there? Mm, I wash for myself, too. You always do the baby clothes yourself, Carl? Well, nobody does for the baby but me. My wife is dead, so I got to do for the baby. Mr. Hankel, did you visit Dr. Thomas last night? Oh, yeah. Why? I owe him money. I go to pay him. Every week I pay a little. You usually make an appointment just to pay him money? Nine. Uh, no. But you made a special appointment last night. Why? Why, well, I have an ache in my leg. I asked the doctor to fix it. So, why do you ask me these questions? Somebody murdered the doctor last night. Murdered? He was killed just about the time you were in his office. No, but... I uh, I didn't do it. We're not saying you did. Carl. Yeah, but this is what you mean. I'm I mean, what's what you think, now? Huh? Mister Hinkle, your wife died while she was under Doctor Thomas' care. Yeah. Did you blame him for her death? You should have been more careful. Now I'm left with an empty house and an empty heart. If he'd been more careful, this wouldn't be. But you still say you didn't go in there last night and kill him. I went in there for the ache in my leg. What are you giving us, Carl? You went to get treated by a man you didn't trust? Well, with my wife, he made the mistake. For this, you'll be with me twice, careful. You know, Mr. Henkel, you were the last person to see the doctor before he was attacked. Man, I was not. Then who was? Well, when I come from the office, a man sits in the waiting room. Do you know who this man was? Yeah, sure. I've seen him many times. Uh, uh, Mr. Horner. He must mean Tim Horner, Jason. Cowhand on Jim Ford's ranch. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. He goes into the doctor when I leave. All right, Mr. Henkel. We'll check your story. But if it doesn't hold up, we'll be back to ask you some more questions. Let's go, Sheriff. We drove out to the Ford Ranch. It was a small place that had seen better days. The ranch house needed a coat of paint. Some rusty farm machinery leaned against the side of the barn, and an old jalopy sat next to the house. In a corner of the barnyard, a Mexican was hammering some crates together. As we approached, he started kicking at some chickens which pecked around his feet. Howdy, amigo. Howdy, hey. Hey, buenos dias, senores. Chickens, they're always on the porch. One cannot even do the work. Dead. Can I help you, senor? Is Mr. Ford around? Pero no, senor. He's with the cattle. 
But uh, he's going to be here any minute now. We're looking for a man named Tim Horner. Is he with Mr. Ford? Oh, I- I'm pretty sorry, senor. I only come to the ranch yesterday to help senor Ford with the boxes, sir. There is uh, one man who worked with senor Ford, but <laughs> I don't know his name. A big fella? About the size of the ranger here? Got black hair? Si, sí, si, sí, that's the fellow. Sí, sí. Uh, yesterday afternoon, I see him. Well, what about this morning? No, no, senor. This morning when I come to drink the coffee, he's not here. Uh, when senor Ford go out to the cattle, he's still not here. <gasps> God, I make him very angry. Oh? Si, sí, si, sí, si. Sí. When this man, he is not there... Oh, Senor Ford, he cursed and swear, and he do... Oh, oh, there, here's Senor Ford. He gonna tell you about this, oh, man. Yeah. Oh, boy. Hey, howdy, Jim. Howdy, Sheriff. Morning, Ranger. What can I do for you? We're looking for that hand of yours, Tim Horner. Well, I reckon that makes three of us. When I find him, I'm gonna break him in half. Mm-hmm. It's the only hand I got, and he walks out on me just when I need him most. When did you see him last, Mr. Ford? Uh, yesterday evening. He asked me if he could go into town. I said, sure, if he'd be back here at daybreak this morning. He ain't showed up. Don't reckon he will, neither. What makes you think that? Well, check the place where he sleeps. All his stuff's gone. Look, uh, why don't we go over on the porch where we can sit and be comfortable? Uh, take care of the horse, Jose. Hey, yes, si, yes, senor. I do that for you. After all I'd done for that boy, Tim Horner, now when I only need him a day or so longer, he takes off. Are you moving somewhere, Mr. Ford? I'm selling out, Ranger, lock, stock, and barrel. Well, I didn't know that, Jim. I ain't said much about it. But figure I've had about all I want of ranching. The party's been after me a long time to sell them the place. Here, sit down. Yeah. I'm going to take it easy from now on. When Tim Horner left you yesterday, was he sick? Sick? <laughs> that boy never had a sick day in his life. He was just lazy, that's all. Here, how come you're so anxious to find out about Tim? A doctor in town by the name of Thomas was murdered last night. Oh, yeah, yeah. I heard about old Doc Thomas. It's too bad. He was a fine fellow. Uh, well, what's that got to do with Tim? We're pretty sure Tim was in his office just about the time Doc was slugged. That's so. You think, uh, you think maybe Tim was the one who killed him? We don't know yet. But his skipping out's not going to help him any. No, I don't reckon it will. You just never know, do you? Now, who would have thought a boy I had working for me was a killer? Well, I sure hope you find them. We will. Come on, Sheriff. Let's get back to town. On the way to town, I radioed Austin and requested an all-points bulletin on Tim Horner. Then the Sheriff and I started combing the countryside. The rest of Sunday passed without any luck. Early Monday morning, I stopped at the sheriff's office to pick him up. Good morning, Jace. Howdy. We didn't get an awful lot of sleep last night, did we? We'll make up for it after we get Tim Horner. Yeah, but when that's going to be, I don't know. Appears like he just plain disappeared. That's one thing people can't do, Sheriff. Sometimes they take a little longer to find, but sooner or later they turn up. You ready to get moving? As soon as I finish marking these last two reports... You know, it just beats me, Jace. Why Tim Horner'd want to kill old Doc Thomas. Yeah, don't guess we'll know that till we find Tim. Yeah. Well, I reckon I'm ready. Where you want to start today? How about the Stony Creek section? Suits me. I just... Oh. Just a minute, Jace. Sheriff, fellas. Yeah? You did? Where? Yeah. Yeah, we'll take care of it. Well, you were right. Tim Horner's been found. Good. They're bringing him in? Uh Uh-uh. We have to go get him. He's dead. In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. America needs more nurses... Nurses are a vital factor in our country's all-out defense preparations. And in addition, hospitals and clinics, growing by leaps and bounds, have an ever greater demand for trained staffs. All this spells opportunity for you if you are a young woman looking for a good career. 
It means a secure job at good pay, a chance to serve your community in a fine profession. Your nurse's training will provide you with a first-rate education, too, at far less than the cost of four years in college. You'll study interesting subjects such as psychology, chemistry, anatomy, and child care. And when you receive your nursing degree, you can choose from among the wide variety of interesting fields open to nurses. You can enter the armed forces with the rank of lieutenant. You can choose hospital or private duty, industrial or public health nursing, the airlines or the Veterans Administration. Start now on a good career of which you can be proud. Visit your local hospital and learn about the opportunities open to you in the field of nursing. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and our authentic story, Blood Trail. Tim Horner's body had been located 10 miles out in the brush by two boys on a camping trip. We drove within a mile of the spot where a highway patrolman was waiting with the boys. The youngsters pointed out where they'd found the body. We left them with the patrolman and then took horses the rest of the way. You reckon Tim got scared and took his own life, Jace? That's something we'll know pretty quick. There's the three big boulders, Jace. Just like those kids said. Yeah, it must have been their campfire off to the left. Ooh, ooh, Chucky. Oh, ooh, oh. Ooh. It sure is a wild spot. Hadn't been for those kids, we might never have found it. Uh-huh. Should be right around this middle boulder from what those kids said. Jace. Yeah. Pull that brush away from him, Sheriff. That's the man we've been looking for? It's Tim Horner, all right. Shot twice, through the chest. At close range. Look at the powder burns. Now let's turn him over. <laughs> Well, we can be sure of one thing, Sheriff. He didn't kill himself. How do you figure that? No blood on the ground, so he wasn't shot here. Whoever did it carried him out here after he was dead. He sure went to a lot of trouble. Hmm, probably figured it was worth it. Almost was, too. See what you can find in his pockets. All right. Wallet. A little bit of money. But... Hey, Jace, look at this. A box of pills. <laughs> Reckon Tim was ailing after all. Could be. Yeah, but Jim Ford said Tim hadn't been sick. Uh, Jim Ford could have been wrong. It's a cinch there's a tie-in between this murder and Doc Thomas getting killed. If we find out what kind of an ailment Tim had, we might get a lead. But how do you figure to do that? Tim ain't gonna do any talking now. Maybe he will, Sheriff. What's on your mind? Autopsy? Let's get moving. We got a lot to do. We got Tim Horner's body into Whitney at one that afternoon and requested the county medical examiner to make a rush autopsy. He told us to wait in the pathology lab of the hospital. A little less than an hour later, he joined us. Well, gentlemen, must say I've never done such a quick job. I'm sorry, doctor, but it's necessary. I dare say it is. If it helps find out who killed old John Thomas, I'll do anything. What'd you find out, doc? Hey, careful, Sheriff. I don't want to break this slide. Oh. I've only made a preliminary examination... And I can tell you one thing definitely. What's that? Tim Horner died sometime Saturday night, probably before midnight. Why, that'd be only a few hours after Doc Thomas died. Anything else, Doctor? Yeah, Tim was a pretty sick boy even before he died. What was wrong with him, Doc? I'm going to tell you in a minute, as soon as I examine this slide under the microscope. You got an idea what it was, Doc? Uh-huh. On this slide is a section of the dead man's spleen. It was very badly diseased. Could mean any number of things. Didn't I get it set here? Yep. Yes, I thought so. And I wanted to be sure. You know what it was now? It was anthrax. Anthrax? Huh? But that's a cattle disease. It's also found in man. Contracted from sick stock and from contaminated ground. Does that help you, Ranger? Maybe. It might just clear up our whole case. I don't follow you, Jace. I'll explain on the way. Thanks, Doctor. You're welcome. Jace, where are we going? Out to Jim Ford's ranch. Jim Ford? You think he's the man we're after? Look at it this way, Sheriff. If Tim Horner had anthrax, chances are he got it from sick cattle. Maybe from burying them at the place where he worked. You mean Jim Ford's cattle are sick with anthrax? It'll take long to find out, but I think they are. Say, that could explain why Jim was so anxious to sell out all of a sudden. Right. Why he couldn't let anybody discover his stock was sick. Otherwise, it'd have to be destroyed and he'd lose everything. 
So the way you figure it, Tim knew the cattle had anthrax, but he didn't know he had it. Until he saw Doc Thomas. And once Doc knew there was anthrax around, he was bound to report it. Well, how would Jim find out about that? Could be he picked up Tim at the Doc's office, found out he had anthrax. Yeah. And that might be why he had to kill both the Doc and Tim to keep him quiet. Something like that. Now I understand why you're pushing that accelerator so hard. Jim would be anxious to get his money for the property as soon as possible and then beat it. If he hasn't already. Well, suppose he is gone. Let's find out first. Yeah, Jim's old jalopy ain't here. Well, that could be a good sign. He said he was selling out lock, stock, and barrel, and I doubt if he'd try to make a getaway in that thing. Maybe he's in town or somewhere, closing the deal for the ranch. Uh, won't take long to be sure. Let's try the door. Yeah. Looks like the bedroom's back this way. Mm-hmm. Don't appear like he's taken much with him if he has gone. Yeah, but if he's skipped, he's probably traveling light. I... Hey, Sheriff, listen. What is it, Jace? Sounds like that jalopy of his coming up the road. You don't think he's coming I don't back? know. Let's get outside. We want to take him alive. Don't shoot unless you have to, Sheriff. What he did to old Doc Thomas, shooting's too good for him. Oh, that ain't Jim at all. It's Jose. Yeah, buenos dias, senores. Where's Mr. Ford, Jose? Oh, he make the big deal. Senor Ford get money for the ranch. Ooh, so much money. I never... Where is he? I, I take him to the railroad depot. So he can wait for the train. Which train? Do one that go that way. North? That's the limited. What time's it leave Whitney? 4.32. And it's 4.15 now. Come on, Sheriff. We're going to catch a train. I don't know if we can make it, Jay. She's just pulling out. Come on. I, I don't think we'll catch her. We'll make it. Hey, Porter, don't close those doors. Hold it. Except for that railing, Sheriff. Got it! Can you make it, Chase? Yeah. You know, this This ain't the easiest way to board a train. Keeps you young, Sheriff. You ready to go? Yep. Well, he's not in this car, Jason. Yeah, we'll try them all. I sure hope Jose didn't give us a bum steer. Somehow, I don't think he did. There's a diner up ahead. We, must be, we haven't eaten since morning. Yeah, better not to think about it. Oh, that food sure smells good. Jason. Yeah. Looks like Jim Ford got hungry, too. His back's to us. We move in and take it? No. Talk to him first. Sit down at his table. Come on. Howdy, Jim. What? Mind if we join you, Mr. Ford? Well, no. Sit down. Didn't know you fellas were traveling north. Neither did we till a few minutes ago. How about you, Mr. Ford? Well, uh, me, I, I sold my ranch like I said I was going to do. I don't mean to get nosy, Jim, but uh, how much did you take for the ranch? What am I telling you, Sheriff? 16000 A little expensive for run-down property and sick cattle, isn't it, Mr. Ford? What are you talking about, Ranger? Tim Horner had anthrax. He got it from your cattle. Why, you're crazy. Not as crazy as you for thinking you could get away with killing Doc Thomas and Tim Horner. <laughs> well, can you, can you prove that, Ranger? I think so. And we'll start with this. Hey, what are you doing? Just taking the gun out of your shoulder holster. So big, I couldn't miss it. Well, Ranger, you got my gun. You still can't prove nothing. I won't have to. We got a ballistics lab for that. And while we're waiting for the lab report, you'll cool your heels in jail. Oh. Oh. On what charge? You can't hold me until you get some proof. That's right. In the meantime, we're holding you for carrying a concealed weapon in a public place. Who are what you? What the Jace? He's going out the far end. Don't fire too many people. It's, grab him, Jace. Grab him. I got him. Let me go. Let me go. Take it easy, Ford. You'll get off soon enough. And then you'll take another little trip that ends in Huntsville.
In just a moment, we will tell you the results of the case you have just heard. There's more good radio listening Wednesday night on NBC. Wednesday, come to Ivy College in the town of Ivy, USA. Yes, walk the pleasant campus of Ivy College with Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman as Dr. and Mrs. Hall of Ivy. There's adult comedy and heartwarming human philosophy in each sparkling broadcast of the Halls of Ivy. Then, P.B., Gildy, Judge Hooker, Leroy, and all the gang bring you a half hour of mirth and music with the one, the only, the great Gildersleeve. Later, Groucho Marx is your genial paymaster of ceremonies on You Bet Your Life, radio's merriest quiz show. There's prize money for lucky contestants and fun for everyone as Groucho Marx asks, asks the questions and provides the laughs. And for High Adventure on Wednesday, hear both Big Story and Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Yes, Wednesday means top entertainment on NBC. Stay tuned to the NBC Radio Network. Every day of the week, the finest entertainment is as close as this station. Now back to Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, here are the results of the case you have just heard. Ballistics evidence proved conclusively that Jim Ford had killed Tim Horner. He was tried and convicted of first-degree murder. Ten months later, he confessed to the killing of Dr. John Thomas with a paperweight from the doctor's desk. Jim Ford died in Huntsville Penitentiary of a kidney disease on June 17, 1930, just 20 days before he was due to go to the electric chair. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Cattle Drive. The cast included Tony Barrett, Tim Graham, Henry Rowland, Parley Bear, and Barney Phillips. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Charles E. Israel, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Starting Wednesday, Robert Montgomery tells how a citizen views the news over NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Breakdown. It is shortly after midnight, the beginning of Good Friday in the year 1937. Jim Wiley, constable of Romer, Texas, is driving through the lonely outskirts of his territory when his headlights pick out a car parked on the road shoulder. He breaks to a stop. 
Having some trouble? Unless he conked out on me. I've been trying to get it started for half hour. Well, maybe I can get it going for you. I know a little something about cars. Okay about trying? You bet. Go ahead. Looks like it ain't about to start, friend. You must be out of gas. The gauge says you're half full. The gauge must be busted, then. Choked him like I did. Should have flooded the carburetor. If gas was feeding through, we'd get the smell of it. Eh, better check the tank. And get a stick or something to shove in here for measuring, will you? You bet. This branch ought to do. Yeah, it's good enough. Give it here. She empty? Dry as a WCTU meeting. Well, that'd leave me kind of stuck. Well, I got a siphon hose in my trunk. We can drain enough out of my tank to get you back to Roma. Is there an all-night station there? No, I'm afraid not. No hotel either. But I can put you up for the night if you don't mind bunking in the jail. What do you mean, jail? I'm the constable. Oh, I see. Well, don't worry. The jail's clean. Come on, let's go get that hose. Well, it's in here someplace, if I can find it. You got a match? Ah, you bet. I want to be here someplace. I guess I'll let a lot of junk pile up. I can't hold this match much longer. Just light another one. Uh, that's the last one to book. Uh. Well, you got that hose, haven't you? Well, no point getting snappy about it, stranger. How come you didn't know the gas gauge in your car was busting? Well, it must have just happened, I guess. Seems to me there's a car just like yours on my stolen car list. I hope you got proof of ownership on you. I got it all right. In my pocket, point the right square at your bullet. Well, use your head, young fella. Stolen car is a bad charge, but it ain't nearly as bad as using a gun on a peace officer. Now, you better hand that gun over and come with me. <laughs> hmm? Why, you heck, you small town rube cop. <laughs> You're stinking rube cop. <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead, reach for you. Reach for it, reach for us. I can kick a face. Go ahead. Don't be the loco. You can't get away with this. I've heard that before from other dumb cops. You never should have told me you're a cop, you know. You never should. Something coming on your face. Come on, on your face. Get in that brush. Now you look at this cop, you're going to get it right through the way. <laughs> You'll pay off with this. Help! Help! <laughs> Cross country bus. Go on, Pop. Yell. Yell all you want. Try not yell that motor. Go ahead. <laughs> That's too bad, Pop. <laughs> now, you and me gonna make a trade. Bullet from this gun exchange for your car. What's the matter, Pop? Don't you like it? You'll get caught. They'll get you. Uh, the cop ain't born can take me. Come on, Pop. You're gonna die. Yeah. Why don't you crawl a little? Why don't you beg a little? Maybe I'll change my mind. I said... Burn! You, could, you could kill me, but you... You ain't scaring me. I'll make it easy for you, Pop. But you gotta beg me a little. If you don't, I'll give it to you through the kidney. And that ain't nice, Pop. It takes a couple of hours to die that way. Yeah. And it hurts, Pop. I know I watched the but cop die that way once before. You gotta know what he's doing. That's it, Pop. Yeah. Pray louder. Let me hear you. You're the one I'm praying for. You must be crazy. <laughs> praying for me. <laughs> you rude cop. Let's see who you pray for in the next couple of hours. <laughs> it hurts, don't it, Pop? And it's gonna get worse. You don't pass out till right near the end. <laughs> Enjoy yourself, copper. Have a good time. <laughs> Constable Wiley's body was discovered shortly after sunrise when highway patrolmen spotted the stolen vehicle abandoned by the killer. The sheriff was summoned and he called for the help of the Texas Rangers. By noon of Good Friday, Ranger Captain Stinson was at the scene, accompanied by Ranger Jace Pearson. Wiley didn't die easy, Jace. Look at that. Yeah, tried to crawl out to the road on a blood trail. Must have been in agony every inch of the way. Do you have any family? An invalid wife, two daughters, and three grandchildren. The man who did this might just as well have shot them, too. They'll feel the same pain Wiley did, only longer. 
With an alert out for Wiley's car, we might get a break. Killer may have been spotted in it somewhere along the line. I doubt it. He probably got where he wanted to go and ditched it before sunup. Medical examiner figured Wiley's been dead since about 3 a.m. Must have been shot a couple of hours before that. Gives the killer a good start, all right, Captain. Yeah. Let's get back to the road. We've got one thing going for us, though. The man we're after may have left some prints on the car he abandoned when he took Wiley's. Lab men flew in before we got here. They ought to be coming through with a report soon. Well, Steve Clark is in town waiting for it. He'll bring it out. I want you and Steve to stay on this case until it's cracked. It's one I'd enjoy cracking. Only lead we've got is that the abandoned car was headed west. Well, that's something, at least. You and Steve can start off in that direction. Hey, here's Steve now. Oh, yeah. Howdy, Steve. Howdy, Jase, Captain. You get the lab report? Yeah, Captain. It'll rattle your teeth. Here. Killer's been identified by fingerprints lifted from the car he ditched. While he was killed by Rex Lang. Rex Lang? Rex Lang? Yeah, no doubt about it. The prints were as clear as a bell. There's a copy of Lang's record attached to the report. I don't have to see that. I know it by heart. I wonder how long he's been in Texas. Well, he might have been here for a year or more. Last report on him was when he killed a policeman in Great Falls, Montana. Before that, he pulled jobs in Nebraska, Wyoming, and Iowa. Mm, he's blazed quite a trail. Yes, and I want that trail to end in Texas. It's the first time he's paid us a visit. I want it to be the last. He's not easy to catch. According to that report, he's been jailed only once, Idaho State Reformatory, when he was 16. That's about eight years ago. Yeah, and in that eight years, he's killed six people, four of them peace officers. The first one was the guard at the reformatory. Lang butchered him when he escaped. Look at this record. Look at it. Sent to the reformatory for beating his young brother half to death with a stove poker. Is that Lang's picture clipped on the report? Yeah, a mug shot taken at the reformatory. Well, that'll help us. I don't know, Steve. A big-boned 16-year-old kid. And we're looking for a 24-year-old man. He could have filled out plenty by now. Be hard to recognize. Well, uh, there ought to be some description since then. Huh? Ought to be, but there aren't. All the witnesses he's left are dead ones. Is this the complete report? Yeah, that's it, Captain. Oh, except this. It probably doesn't mean anything. The sheriff picked up this empty matchbook that was just lying in back of where Wiley's car was parked here on the shoulder. Lab checked it for prints, but they couldn't pull anything off of it. Well, it might have been thrown from any passing car. Yeah, I guess so. Let me see it. Advertising on the cover. Grand bowling alley in Pintado. Pintado's about 70 miles west, Jase. And that's the way the car was headed. He couldn't pick up matches before he got there. Not unless he'd been in Pintado before and was headed back there again when he tripped over Wiley. Well, that's possible. Our trail leads west anyhow. Won't do any harm to check around Pintado when we get there. You're towing a double horse trailer, Jase, so you and Steve might as well ride together. Suits me. I'll load my horse and put him in with charcoal. There's something about Rex Lang it might pay to remember. He was a ladies' man back where he came from, Pocatello, Idaho. All right, boy. Back up. Even when he was 14? Yeah, even then. It was a high school girl who smuggled in the knife he used to kill the reformatory guard. And there have been indications that he had a woman lookout with him on burglaries where his prints have been found. I'll get my trailer open for you, Steve. Thanks, Jase. Uh, company for you, Charky. No. Oh, you stay in, boy. Now, you climb in, boy. Come on, head off. Okay, Jace. I guess we're ready to roll. You'll hear from us, Captain. Uh, Jace, Steve. Yeah? What's the matter, Captain? You both know Lang's record. A killer with a crazy hate for all peace officers. So understand that what I'm going to say now is not in order. If you corner him, you'll have a mad dog on your hands. But I'd like to have him taken alive. That may not be easy, Captain. I know, but... Rex Lang has become an idol to young punks and reform school toughs all over the country. Now, if we can put him on trial, convict him in a court of law, and have him executed by the state, it'll show those kids that society is strong enough to stamp him out like a flea. There's nothing glamorous about dying in an electric chair. But if you have to finish him in a fight, he'll still be an idol. He'll say Rex Lang was so tough we couldn't take him, we had to kill him. I understand, Captain. So do I. Now, remember, it's not in order. I want both of you back alive, too. That's all. Come on, Steve. Let's go. We headed west, looking for a dangerous kid grown into a dangerous man, with a face we might recognize too late. By midnight, we checked the highway as far as Pintado. In the morning, we started to comb the town, still drawing a blank. 
That guy at the bowling alley wasn't much help, Jase. Didn't seem to recognize that old picture of Rex Lang. Yeah, Lang may have changed a lot in eight years, but if he made the alleys a hangout, the owner should have... Uh, well, you know, Jace thought the face was a little familiar. Maybe yes, maybe no. Lang was blonde and smooth-skinned as a kid. Hair might have darkened plenty since then, face and frame filled out. And he shaves now, a beard line changes a face. Yeah, yeah, he might have just passed through here and picked up those matches, so maybe they were just thrown out of a passing car. I know, well, we can't waste too much time on a lead that may be blind. Yeah, how about some breakfast? There's a Mexican place across the street, Lobo's. That's for me. I'm so hungry, I'll even eat enchiladas for breakfast. <laughs> Come on, let's cross. Easter Sunday tomorrow, Jace. Wish I could be home with the wife and kids. I even forgot to order flowers. Oh, wire the captain. He'll have some sense of the house for you. Yeah, didn't even think of that. Buenos dias, senores. Buenos dias. Howdy. Let's take the booth, Jace. I'm tired eating on the counters. What can I get for you, senores? Here is the menu. I have everything. Uh, fruit juice, couple of scrambled eggs, easy with bacon, coffee and toast. Yes, si, mm. senor. Si. Buenos dias, senorita. I will be with you in a moment. You bet. Here I am starving. I don't even know what I want. Say, why don't you wait on the lady while I'm thinking it over? Of course, senor. Take your time. I thought you were hungry enough to eat enchiladas for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, the man double-crossed me. He gave me a choice. I just want a container of coffee to go, Lobo. Yes, senorita. You want it blind? No, creamy sugar. Yeah, I guess I'll just double your order, Jace. Now, what's the move when we leave here? I haven't figured it yet. You want me to put it in a sack? You bet. How much? You know, Jace, maybe we should go yes. back. Wait a minute, Steve. Yeah. Huh? Fifty cents change. Gracias, senorita. You bet. Sit tight, Steve. Oh, ma'am. Just a minute. Are you speaking to me, Ranger? Yes, ma'am. I happened to look out of the booth and saw you. Don't I know you from someplace? Well, I don't think so. <laughs> you sure look familiar. You live here in Pintado? You bet. I must have met you the last time I was through here, about two years ago. Now, you're a mistake, Ranger. I've only been here six weeks. Oh, well, where'd you come from before that? Fort Worth. That's your hometown? You bet. <laughs> That's one on me. You sure did look familiar. Excuse me, please. You bet. You had the wrong senorita, no? Maybe. Grab your hat, Steve. Why? What was that all about? Uh, something hit me when she was talking. Notice how she kept saying, you bet? Yeah, what about it? That reformatory report about Lang. The part about his habits. You bet was his favorite expression. Oh, now, wait a minute, Jace. Lang may have changed, but I doubt if he's turned into a girl. <laughs> no. But she picked up that expression someplace, Steve, from somebody who uses it regularly. And it could be Lang. Well, it's as good a lead as that matchbook, Jace. It's worth following. I think so, too. Come on. Let's see where she's taking that coffee. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Breakdown, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We followed the girl, hoping she was taking the coffee to Rex Lang. The hope exploded less than two blocks from Lobo's Cafe when she turned into the doorway of a jewelry store, not far from where my car was parked. Doesn't look like the sort of place we'd find Lange in, Jace. And she went into the back of the store. Look through that corner of the window. Yeah. Now, there's the container of coffee on that bench right beside the watch repairman. Mm. Yeah, she must have brought it in for him. Guess he's the boss. Looks that way. And he can't be Lang. He must be 60 or more. Jace, get back a little. What is it? She came out of the back. She's behind the counter now. She's working there, then. Let's not take any chances on being spotted. Drift back this way a little. Yeah, that's good enough. She'd have to come out to see us now. Got to keep a tag on her. She's Lang's girl. She'll lead us to him. Well, even if she is his girl, no telling how often he sees her. He's hot and must be hiding out someplace. We could burn up a week or two and then find out we're sending out dogs at the wrong tree. We won't waste any time. Not if we can get some information about her. I'm going to get to a phone. You stay right here on this block, though. Walk the corner with me. Yeah. Jace, if she was Lang's girl, why should she be working? If she was working in the laundry, that's a question I couldn't answer. But I can think of a good reason why she might be working in a jewelry store. Casing it for Lang to knock it over? It's been done before. I'm going to have headquarters check back on some jobs Lang's pulled before. 
See what you can find out along the street here. She's a mighty pretty girl, so it's a safe bet she's been noticed by other storekeepers along here. Maybe one of them knows her name and where she lives. Chase, we don't want to tip our hand by asking too many questions. Don't make them sound like official questions. Make them sound like you're just another man who's seen a pretty girl. Okay, okay. But you ever mention this to my wife and you and me are going to tang her. <laughs> Get going. I'll make my call and meet you at the car later. I called my headquarters and gave Captain Stinson a description of the girl we were tagging and a list of information I wanted. It was less than two hours later when he called me back. It looks like you may have hit something with that girl, Jace. I made a few phone calls and got answers that fit. Well, what are they? Fingerprint records from out of state show that Lang's burglaries in the past included a jewelry store, a check cashing agency, and a private home where the owner was in the habit of keeping plenty of cash in the safe. Girl fit into those cases? Yes. A girl answering the description you gave worked in all three places. Only thing that varies in description is the color of her hair. In each case, she quit her job a few months before the actual burglary. That's the modus operandi I've been looking for. Well, if it was the same girl in each case, she always changed her name. Well, that's as easy as dyeing her hair. It all fits. If you're right, Jace, you're getting mighty close to Lang. That's where we want to be. Thanks, Captain. You'll hear from me. Jace, maybe I'd better send you a couple of more men. That'd only give Lang a couple of more targets. Bye, Captain. <laughs> The girl was shaping up like the extra joker in a poker game. By the time I got back to Steve Clark, he had a rundown on her. The name she was using in Pintado was Jojo Deering. That night, the stores were open late for the last-minute Easter shoppers, but finally the lights went out. We followed the girl to her home and staked out to wait. Five minutes later, she came out again. Hey, Jace, look. She's changed her clothes. Yeah. Wearing jeans and a jacket now. Yeah, but why? I don't know. She's moving for her car. I'll let her stay about a block ahead. Don't want to tag her too close with this horse trailer behind us. Right. Yeah, she's pulling out now. So are we. Steve, I got a feeling we're moving in for the finish. Why? The way she's dressed. Not the way she'd dress for a date in town, but it is the way she'd dress to go to Lang if he was holed up in some off-trail spot. Works during the week, goes off to meet him on Saturday nights. Yeah, Jace, it adds. We'll know soon enough. She's turning for the highway out of town. Looks like a long trip, Chase. Hey, hey where is she? Took a turn off up ahead. You reach in the back and get a Tommy gun. Well, the captain said he wanted Lang alive, remember? I know. But if we have to stop that car later, she picks Lang up. I want to make sure we can put it out of commission. Okay. Hey! I'm <laughs> sorry, Steve. Sharp turn off there. Grab a look at the map. Where does this road lead? I don't need the map. This is State 61. Nothing down here for more than 100 miles except for a few run-down Mexican settlements. I'm going to cut off my headlights. This road gets kind of rough, Jase. Can't help it. I can follow her taillight without her knowing we're behind her. Yeah, you're right. Odd anything comes through here, she'd scare in a minute. But she'll roll a lot easier if we weren't dragging that horse trailer. I got a feeling we may need it. No need for her changing her clothes like she did if she's going to stay in the car. Any place in here where she could pick up a horse? Yeah, about ten more miles. Ranch owned by an old Mexican woman. All she's got is a couple of horses. Can you think of any place near there where Lang might be hiding out? Yeah, yeah, about three or four miles back in the hills. Used to be a mine there. A couple of them, in fact. They're abandoned, Jace. Isn't there a road to the mines? No, nothing but a rough burrow trail. It's a tough country to get into. If Lang's there... It's going to be tough country for him to get out of. Just before we reached the old Mexican ranch, we let the girl's car pull out of sight. We parked for ten minutes, then drove to the ranch. Her car was there, all right, almost hidden in a clump of brush behind the barn. And there was a fresh horse trail leading into the hills. We unloaded our horses and followed it. Only about another half mile to the mines, Jace. She's heading right for him, all right. Something about this that bothers me, Steve. What's that? She stuck to the burrow trail all the way. That's just what I don't like. The only approach in Lang wouldn't be at the end of a clear trail unless he had some way of guarding it. You mean he might have an ambush taked out along here? A man who hasn't been caught or even described in eight years doesn't leave his guard down. I don't know. He can't stay awake 24 hours a day. I reckon not. Hey, wait a minute. Hold up. Whoa, whoa, Charky. Whoa, boy, whoa. See something, Chase? Yeah. 
Bob's brush at the side of the path's been trampled not long ago either. Just bobbing back into its natural position. Horse was waiting in there, and now we got two sets of tracks on the path. Well, that means he expected the girl. Waited here to meet her. Looks that way. Better get down and lead your horse. Right. Come on, boy. Come on, Charky. Why did he come down to meet her? He didn't have to show her the way. They're still sticking to the path. I don't know. In one way, I wish the moon was a little fuller. And in another way, I'm glad it isn't. Hold it. Huh? Well, yeah. they left the trail here. Brush is disturbed again. The tracks turn in there. Come on. Yeah, this is funny, Jace. We're following their movements through the brush, and we're just making a little half circle right back to the burrow trail. Now, look here. We're right back on the path. You suppose he made that little half circle just to leave a blank spot in the tracks? A blank spot of less than 20 yards? Isn't likely. Must have had some reason. Let's leave the horses for a second. Let's go back along the path and find out why he cut away from it. Right. Move slow and keep your eyes peeled. Nothing that seems out of line. Huh? Stop. Look at this branch overhanging the path. Just a branch? Why, hey, Jace can barely see it. A piece of string running from the end of the branch to that tree on the opposite side of the path. Don't touch it. Let's see where it leads. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. Sawed off shotgun strapped to the tree. That string is tight around the trigger. Gun probably has enough scatter shot and slugs in it to kill an elephant. No wonder he met her to steer her around this. Chase, look at the way that gun is sighted. Anybody on a horse who moved that branch get a charge right through the middle. Anybody on foot who moved it probably get it right through the head. Hey, you were right, Chase. He wasn't planning on taking any chances. The rat. Anybody could be killed by this thing. A rancher, some kid riding through. You don't think that'd make any difference to Lang, do you? What a death trap. A death trap that's gonna backfire on him. This is the thing we use to take him, Steve. When this goes off, he'll come running to see what he's got. You have another gun, he'll still fight. You won't get a chance if we work it right. I'm going to pull the trigger on this thing, and then let out a scream. And plant myself out there on the burrow path. You stay here in the brush. Then what? Just be patient. Don't move, no matter how long it takes for him to get here. He'll come plenty slow, trying to make sure that whatever he hits alone. And when he finds me lying out there, fire your gun and startle him. But keep your fire high. Jace, he might pump a slug into you while you're flat on your back. Not if we time it right. But don't fire until he's close enough for me to jump him. You better get the horses and time off down the trail a ways. You'll have time. Say, Jace, how about a toss to see who stakes out on the path? Why should you take the chance? Why not me? Because you forgot to wire the captain about that Easter plan for your wife and kids. Get going after the horses and then get back here. Good luck, Jace. Good luck to both of us, Steve. myself in the path and waited. I could feel myself breaking into a sweat as cold as the ground. Even if he thought I was dead, a crazy, hate-ridden killer like Lang might waste one more bullet. A half hour passed. An hour. And then we heard him coming. Slowly, like a cat. Watch where step, Jason. I can't help it, Rex. I'm scared. Why, like a cop with a gun in his back. Shut up. Right near here, wasn't it? Can't you see anything yet? You bet. You bet I see something. Look at that. Look at the moon on him. It's a ranger. Rex. A ranger. A fool. Be careful. Must be the one you told me about, but you were so smart. You said it didn't mean anything. You stupid getting followed here. Oh, please. Rex, don't hit me again, please. You bet, honey. <laughs> you ever slip again, I'll make you an honorary cop. Now, come on. I'll show you what you get. I'll demonstrate on him. I wish he was alive to feel what I'm going to show you. Oh, no, Rex. Don't make me look, please. <laughs> now, look at him. Look. Imagine what a bullet could do to that pretty face of yours. I got him, Steve. Let go. Let go of that gun, Rex. Drop it, I said. I'll kill you with my hand. All right. Here's your chance to try. Get the gun, George. Get it. Get it. Get it. Get it. Get it. Get it. Now, 
you want to get up and try again, Rex? Or is that enough? No. No. I come. I come with you. Shall I cup you together, Jason? Yeah. It'd be a shame to split such a lovely couple. I guess this isn't the kind of brace that you were after, Jojo, but it'll have to do. All right, Rex, hold out your wrist. Yeah, that does it, Chase. Yeah. Well, let's get started. It's just midnight. After we get him in, a fast drive ought to get you home by morning and give you a chance to pick up that Easter plant. Not only that, I'll be on time to go to church with the kids. You going? Borrow a couple of words from Rex. You bet. Tried as an accessory in the many crimes committed by Rex Lang, Jojo Deering was convicted and sentenced to a 50-year term in the women's prison at Gorey. Lang tried for the murder of Constable Wiley, slobbered and pleaded for mercy, but the jury gave no heed to his pleas as the prosecution brought his vicious record to light. Found guilty of murder in the first degree, Lang was sent to Huntsville Penitentiary, where on the morning of November 4th, 1938, he died in the electric chair. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Bill Johnstone, Byron Kane, Herb Ellis, and Betty Lou Gerson. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun, excitement, and prizes next on NBC as accordion-playing MC Phil Baker gathers contestants around the microphone to see if they know the answer to America's favorite question. What question is that? Why, the $64 question, of course. You're invited every Sunday for Laughs with Phil Baker and the $64 question. Tomorrow, enjoy the telephone hour. Now it's the $64 question on NBC. of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. Dates and places in the following story are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Before we bring you today's Tales of the Texas Rangers, let's turn on our microphones down the hall in Studio A here at NBC's Hollywood Radio City, where rehearsal for the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show is in progress. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's the way we'll do it on the show. It sounded great, fellas. Phil, uh, would you like to talk to the listeners during this break in rehearsal? Yeah, Bill, I'd love to. Folks, I'd just like to take a few seconds here to remind you about part of the fine lineup of entertainment for the rest of the evening right here on NBC. Right after Tales of the Texas Rangers, listen to the big show with Tallulah Bankhead and all of her darling guest stars. I know you'll want to hear the music and comedy. The big show is lined up for you today. And then we come on to keep you entertained with our show, starring Alice Fay, Frankie Remley, Julia Abruzio, and some band leader, Phil, uh, what's his name? Well, well, please, will you slow up a minute? <laughs> it's the Phil Harris Alice Fay Show, right after the big show today, and I hope you'll listen, folks. And now, let's return to Tales of the Texas Rangers.
And now, from the files of the Texas Rangers, the case called Bright Boy. It is 7.45 p.m. June 19th, 1947. A man and a teenage boy are driving along the highway through Harding, Texas, about 30 miles from Corpus Christi. They've been following an expensive new sedan for the past 20 minutes. The driver watches the sedan ahead of him intently. Beside him, the teenage boy polishes his glasses. Sure that's the buggy you want? Yeah. You sure that's the right color green? Man said he wanted a green one, and asked green. I didn't stop to ask if he meant lime green or chartreuse. Green's green. Okay, okay. Does he have aerial? Can you see? Yeah, yeah. I don't like to drive without a radio. It gets lonesome. You hear about Sleepy? Huh? Who? Sleepy Horner. He got spikes stealing the second. Ah, uh, who cares? Elkin did it. School starts pitching, see? Only he stops and throws the ball to Elkin high. And Sleepy comes sliding now in. Now, cut it. And... Don't care none about Elkin or Sleepy or no pitcher. Ever since you was a kid, all I ever heard out of you was baseball. It wasn't baseball, it was fishing. By the time you growed up. All right, Tom, all right. How fast do you think she'll go? Oh, 100, maybe. Only don't you try it. I drove one once. It was marked on the speedometer for 110, but she couldn't make more than 90. Don't you drive that car up ahead, no 90. You want some cop to stop you for speeding? Ain't no one stopped me yet. Well, you get picked up, Larry, and I don't know you. Now, you remember that. I ain't telling you how to drive this car. Well, I'm telling you, don't you take that car over 50. You're getting too smart for your own good lately. Think everything's a game, like those baseball players of yours. Okay, Tom, I won't speed. You know, I wish I had a gun, like you got. If you get a gun, you'll be dumb enough to use it. What do you think you need one for? I don't know. Just wish I had one. He's turning. Yeah, he'll stop at the grocery store. Always does. Well, I still wish I had a gun. You getting scared? I can take care of myself. When you get down there... You call your cousin Melvin. See if he wants to drive one of the cars across. Mexican can't drive both of them. Yeah, sure. He's slowing down. You know what to do now. Sure. I got the jumper wires already. Connected. Just like you seen me do the other times. On the coil. Try to open that hood quiet like. I know how to do it. Hey, you better. I'm sort of worried you going alone for the first time. I'm telling you, I'll be all right. When will I see you, Tom? As soon as I swipe that other car. Probably day after tomorrow. I'll call you and say where you're to meet me. I'll drop you off just past the store. And wait till he gets inside. Okay, Larry. Okay, so long. Captain Mavis of the Highway Patrol was summoned immediately, and he in turn requested the help of a Texas Ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned, and at 10.30 p.m. met the captain in the hospital where the victim was being given emergency treatment. Howdy, Levi. Well, howdy, Jace. Glad you made it so fast. Uh, he's uh, in there. How is he? Pretty bad. The boys tell me his arms and chest are all cut up, but he could be a lot worse. I expect he'd be scarred up some, though. I'd see him. Yeah. Dykes, I'm Captain Mavis, Highway Patrol. This is Ranger Pearson. Hello. This will just take a minute, Mr. Dykes. Did you get a good look at this fellow who knifed you? No. Not much light. First saw him, he was looking under the hood. It happened pretty fast. Well, how about his size? Was he a big man? Not rightly a man at all. He was just a kid. Maybe 16 or 17. Mm -hmm. Kid, huh? Can you describe him at all? Well, I, like I said, it was dark. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know him if I saw him. Except he had glasses and they got knocked off. I got him here, Jace. Picked him up on the street. Ordinary steel rim kind. Let's see. Huh? 
The lens is pretty thick. He must have bad eyes. One lens broken. Yeah. How'd he start the car, Mr. Dykes? You leave the motor running when you got out? Oh, I know better than that, Ranger. I turned it off and took the key. Still in my clothes, I guess. Oh, the kid must have used a coil jumper under the hood to short the ignition wires. Well, that's what we figured, Jace. Well, thanks, Mr. Dykes. We'll get a complete statement later. You better get some rest now. Come on, Levi. Take it easy, Mr. Dykes. Okay. He's lucky the knife didn't get into his face. Yeah. You said on the phone there's been a string of these car thefts. Yeah, it's the fifth. Five expensive cars stolen in the last six, seven weeks. Always done the same way, but nobody could hurt before this one. Somebody always does sooner or later. You recover any of them? Not one. I got a vague description of one of the thieves a couple of weeks back. Young punk wearing glasses. Might be the same kid. Doesn't sound like a kid taking a car for a joyride. They usually abandon it by morning. I know. Looks like somebody's building up a real sweet racket for himself. He's able to get rid of them so fast that you can't find them. The kid's probably not playing a lone hand. Yeah, that's the way I figured. After I talked to the sheriff tonight, I contacted Austin. It was headquarters idea we worked together. Let's get back to your office and call Austin. That pair of glasses looks like our lead. At Captain Mavis' office, I put in a call to the Bureau of Identification and Records in Austin. I asked them for all pictures of teenage boys wearing glasses who might be possible subjects for investigation in this case. The pictures came down on the morning plane. Captain Mavis and I started calling on optometrists in Corpus Christi as there were none in Harding. It was almost noon when we found an optometrist who recognized one of the pictures. From his records, he definitely identified the glasses as a pair he had made. The prescription of the unbroken lens was identical. Subject's name was Larry Vale, age 17. He'd been picked up in September of the previous year for investigation of car theft and was released for lack of evidence. Larry Vale lived 18 miles outside Corpus Christi in a rural area. We headed out there with a search warrant. Doesn't look like much of a place, just a shack. Think maybe he's in there, hiding? It's possible. What do you want to do? Let's take a look around back. They got chickens back there. Maybe somebody around. Might have left these parts after last night. Ought to be someone here. Kids don't usually live alone. You'd imagine we'd find his folks around. Look, Chase. All that feed on the ground. Chickens haven't had time to eat it all. Couldn't have been fed more than a few minutes ago. Who's that out back? There is somebody in the house. Come on. You been in here all the time, mister? Oh, a ranger. No, I just come in. I've been feeding the chickens. Didn't you hear us knocking on the front door? No, I didn't hear nothing. Come on in. I'm Tom Vale. I'm Ranger Pearson. This is Captain Mavis, Highway Patrol. Howdy. Yeah, do you want to see me about something? Larry Vale live here? Why are you asking about Larry? I just want to talk to him. What about? Just tell the Ranger where he is, mister. Well, he ain't here. Was he here last night? Well, no, he went fishing. Does every once in a while. Stays away a few days at a time. Oh, excuse me. I better turn down the fire on those beans. You any kin to Larry? Yeah, I'm Larry's brother. Why? He in trouble? Maybe. Where does he go fishing? Oh, all around. He was gone when I come home yesterday. Got any idea where we can find him? Maybe a rock port or port of Aransas. Likes to fish off the jetties. Might even be on a shrimp boat. Does it once in a while. Pick up a couple bucks. How about a can of beer? No, thanks. Me either. Uh, about your brother. Doesn't he have a steady job? Larry? No. He used to work in a packing plant, ice and vegetables. Didn't like it, though. Rather go fishing. Makes spending money selling his catch. Still like to know what you want him for. We think your brother stole a car last night. Knifed a man pretty bad. Where? Port Aransas? Harding. Oh, it must be some mistake. Larry wouldn't do nothing like that. Besides, I know he went fishing. We want to have a talk with him about it, anyhow. Okay, but I know you got the wrong guy. Larry's a good kid. He wouldn't cut anybody. He was investigated for car theft last year, wasn't he? Well, yeah. They said he took a car. It was just a bunch of kids. You know how it is. But they couldn't hold him because he wasn't guilty. You can't hold that against him. Mind if we take a look through the house? No, why should I? Thanks. Where's your brother's room? That one right there. Okay to go in? Help yourself. I still say you make a big mistake. 
I'd say he likes baseball from all those pictures on the walls. Yeah, he's nuts about it. That's all he talks about, that and fishing. <laughs> Want some coffee? Not for me. No, thanks. Well, if you don't mind, I got to get that pot off the stove before it boils over. Sure. Go ahead. I'll be right back. What do you think, Chish? Well, we know Larry didn't go fishing. I'll look through these drawers. How about checking that closet, Levi? Okay. Awful lot of junk in here. Saves everything, just like my boy. Levi, where's Howard Memorial Ballpark? Not around here. Why? Find something? Maybe. Four baseball tickets. Let's go there often. With the spread and the numbers on them, I'd say they were bought over quite a period of time. Think it means something? Could. I'm gonna jot down these ticket numbers. Kid sure crazy about baseball. Uh, that brother's coming back. Yeah, I'm finished. Well, did you find any knives or any hatches or anything? No, we didn't find anything like that. Well, look all you like. I think we've seen enough. Mm-hmm. Well, come back any time. You're always welcome. Thanks. We may take you up on that. We went back to highway patrol office and put out an APB on Larry Vale. We learned that Howard Memorial Ballpark was located in Meade, Texas, 150 miles away. I followed a hunch and called the manager of the ballpark to check on the dates of the ticket stubs found in Larry Vale's room. Come here, Levi. I want you to see this. Your hunch pay off? Uh-huh. I think we got something. A car stolen here May 9th. The kid sees a ball game in Meade May 10th. Car stolen May 23rd, kids in Meade the 24th. Same routine June 6th and 7th, and again last week. And Meade's right on the border. You think those cars are being run over into Mexico? Wouldn't be surprised if the pattern holds up. Larry Vale's due to see that game tonight. And so am I. In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Medical science now knows that there are about 21 well-recognized types of heart disease. One of the leading heart authorities, Dr. Paul D. White, declares that the classifying of heart disease into various types is one of the greatest medical advances of our time. This is only one of the great advances such as new surgical techniques, new drugs, new methods of care, prevention, and treatment, which have brought new hope to millions of hearts. New Hope for Hearts is the slogan of the Heart Fund of the American Heart Association and its affiliates. Your contribution will help our doctors to continue their fight against heart disease, this nation's leading cause of death. Do your share because it is your fight. Send your contribution today to Heart, H-E-A-R-T, Heart, in care of your post office. And now back to Tales of the Texas Rangers. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and our authentic story, Bright Boy. I radioed Ranger Clay Morgan and asked him to meet me in Meade. I figured I could get there before the game started and we'd be able to spot Larry Vale entering or leaving the ballpark. I was 30 miles from Meade when it started to rain. By the time I pulled into town, it was coming down hard. Clay was waiting for me at the hotel coffee shop. Might as well sit down and have a cup of coffee, Jase. Why? What's up, Clay? Well, I hate to tell you, but the game's been called off. Mm, I was afraid of that. Could I have a cup of coffee, miss? Any other ideas where we can find him? Mm, there's better than 60,000 people in this town. Might run into quite a job picking him out. Yeah. Thank you. Got a mug shot of him? Yeah, a couple. Here's his picture wearing glasses, taken last year. Just a punk, isn't he? Uh-huh. Here he is again, without his specs. He sure must need him the way he squints. Probably having a rough time now that he's lost them. Unless he had another pair made. I don't think he's had time for that yet. Many optometrists in town, Clay? Four, four, five. He could be having a maid here. I think we'd better start making the rounds in the morning. Yeah, 
How about it, Jase? Reckon we might have been wrong? Still got a chance. There's another optometrist up ahead. If he's not getting his glasses in this town, we'll have a time finding him. Yeah. Nobody here, Jase. Probably in the back. Hit the call bell. Yeah. Just a minute. Good morning, Rangers. Seems every time I go in back, somebody comes in. I'm sorry if we... Oh, that's all right. I'm used to it. I ought to move the lens grinders up front. What can I do for you, gentlemen? I'm Ranger Pearson. This is Ranger Morgan. Glad to know you. I'm Doc Heath. We're looking for a kid about 17. Figure he might have come here for glasses. Here's a picture. It's about a year old. Just a second. I put my glasses on. This young fellow you're looking for in trouble? He's wanted for questioning. Yeah. Yes, sir. He was in yesterday morning. You positive? Oh, absolutely, Ranger. It's the same one. Matter of fact, it's his glasses I'm working on now. Order the same kind of frames like in this picture. You know where he's staying? I've got his address right here on the order. 128 Junket Street. The name's Sam Jones. Okay, thanks. He'll be back at three to pick his glasses up, doing a rush job for him. Says his eyes were killing him. Been a lot of help, Doc. Much obliged. Glad to be your service, Rangers. Anytime. If we don't find him by three, we'll be back. Ranger Morgan and I went to the address given us by the optometrist. Larry Vale, alias Sam Jones, wasn't there. It was an empty field. Thought for a minute that shack was it. No, he just pulled that address out of his hat. Happened to be this field. Yeah, well, we'll have to pick him up at the optometrist. Go on, get in, Jace. Maybe we shouldn't pick him up, Clay. What do you mean? I got an idea. Suppose you tail him and let him know he's being followed. What's your plan? I'm going to try and get friendly with him. Look at it this way. Larry Vale's just a kid, 17 years old. He steals cars. Four of them we're pretty sure of. He brings them to the Mexican border each time. He can't be in this alone. We've got to find out who's with him. You think you can get into the kid's confidence? I'm going to try. You better watch him, Jace. He knows how to handle a knife. Yeah. A man in the hospital told me. We drove to the local highway patrol office. They arranged for me to borrow a cheap suit that looked like somebody would slept in for a week. I put it on and we drove back to the optometrist's office. We got there a few minutes after two. Clay parked the car out of sight while I went in to see the optometrist. Hello, Doc. Howdy. Oh, didn't recognize you in them clothes. Boy been here yet for his glasses? Uh, no, uh, no, he hasn't. Uh, expect him pretty soon now. Huh? Well, we'll be outside watching. Don't let him know we've been here. Well, I'll try. I'm sure I'll try, Ranger. Well, what's the matter, Doc? Oh, I'm just a little edgy, I guess. I'll just keep calm. We'll do the rest. After Clay parked the car, he walked down to the bus stop at the corner and stood against the wall reading a newspaper. I picked a little hash house directly across the street from the optometrist and sat by the window. We waited. By three o'clock, I was on my third cup of coffee. Larry Vale showed up ten minutes later and went into the optometrist shop. Fifteen minutes after that, he came out, wearing his new glasses. He walked east. Clay followed close behind him while I kept pace with him across the street. The next corner, I crossed over and fell in step beside Larry Vale. You want to spend the best five bucks you ever spent in your life, bud? Huh? What do you mean? Shake that ranger that's tailing you. What? He's been on your tail the last half hour like a flea on a hound dog. Where? Back a ways. Don't look around. Oh, you're crazy. Why'd a ranger tail me? He's got no reason. Why don't you tell him to stop following you? Well, you're not kidding me, are you? Stop by this window. You'll see his reflection. I don't see him. There he is. Back by the building. Anybody knows a tale I do. I had to learn it the hard way. Did you see him? Yeah. How'd I know he's following me? Maybe he's after you. Yeah, they don't follow me long. I watch my back trail too close. He's been following you, and I've been following him. I'll tell you what. I'll show you how to shake him and include that in the price of the five bucks. Come on, let's walk. Not so fast. Take it easy. You ain't a cop, are you? Huh. That's a good one. I should walk along helping you duck a guy with a badge if I was a cop. Use your head, kid. Yeah, that's right. Just doing you a favor, because I can use the five bucks here around this corner. He's still coming. I don't like this. Of course not. I wouldn't either if I was you. I'm getting out of here. Don't be a chump. I'll be caught before you get a block. This way, in this ten-cent store. Why'd you want to come in here? Just take it easy. I'll mosey along towards the back. 
Here he is. Came in behind us. There's always an alley behind these 10 cent stores where the trucks unload. There should be a back door here somewhere. Come on. Yeah. Hey, you, wait up! All right, let's move. There's a cab stand on the corner. Uh, okay. Cab sitting there. Hey, is it coming? Don't bother looking. Just keep going. Go on. Get in. All right. We're in a hurry, driver. Go straight ahead and step on it. Just keep going till I tell you to turn. You see, boy? There's nothing to it. An hour later, I was still with Larry Vale. We left the cab after a short ride and walked the last three blocks to the small hotel where he had a room. He insisted on buying some peanuts on the way. I told him my name was Steve Jarvis and let him do most of the talking. Good peanuts, Steve. Want some more? No, it'll spoil my appetite. No. Boy, I want to tell you I'm the luckiest guy in the world, meeting up with you, and I did. How many times could something like this happen? Hmm. It was good goobers. Wished I'd bought some more. You know, often you run into somebody your age already knows the score. Yeah, I guess that's right. <laughs> you hot too, Steve? You don't think I'm bumming around because I like it, do you? Right now, I need a steak to get me on my feet. Oh, I owe you some money. <laughs> sure was worth a pin, what you did. No, I don't want your dough, kid. I need some real dough. Got to find a good deal. Hey, Steve. I got an idea. Why don't you work with us? Yeah? Who's us? Me and the, the boss. We need another guy. I was going to ask my cousin. As long as we need somebody, might as well be you. No reason why I wouldn't go for that, is there? Maybe. Depends. What's the deal? Hot cars. Cars, huh? Yeah. We lift them mostly around Corpus. Drive them over here. He's uh, bringing in another one today. What do you do with them? Drive them across the border? No, we don't. He's got a Mexican comes up from. But now we're bringing two cars each time. We need another driver to take him across. Well, what do you say, Steve? Mm, maybe he won't like the idea of taking in a stranger. That's what you did for me. He'll go for it. Uh, well, can I meet your boss? Oh, any time now. I'm supposed to meet him at a cafe. Come on, let's head down there. Okay, kid. Hey, wait. How about that ranger? Yeah, don't worry about him. He's easy to shake. We took a taxi to a small cafe in a tough district just off the main drag. I spotted Clay behind us. He was doing some real trailing now. Larry and I went in and sat in the rear booth. That's where we were to meet the boss. You'll be here any time now. Good food, huh? Not bad. What kind of price you get for the cars over the border? Better in here? Oh, sure. Always a grand over the regular price. Mm -hmm. Sometimes more. Sounds all right. You got a regular contact there? Yeah, Mexican. You got a garage in Rio del Sur. Hey, waitress, how about some coffee, huh? This um, Mexican, he takes them down to Mexico City. Ever run into trouble on this end? Oh, I did this time. A guy almost caught me. Taught him a lesson, though. <laughs> I cut him up real good. <laughs> you should have seen the look on his face. Yeah. I'll bet he almost died laughing. Hey, that's good. <laughs> hey, where's that coffee? You sure this boss is coming? Oh, don't worry. He'll be here. I'll tell you what, Steve. How about us going to the ball game next Saturday? You and me, huh? Sure. We'll get good seats right behind home plate. And then... We'll... Here he comes now. Where? In the front door. Boy, when I tell him what you did for me, he'll sure be glad to meet you. I bet he will. Hi, Larry. Everything all right? Hi, Tom. Want you to meet Steve Jarvis. Howdy, Jeff. Beat it, Larry. What? Hold it, Bale. Beat it, Larry. Here's a ranger. Ranger? Hey, grab the kid. Let's go, Let's go you dirty. Oh. Drop the gun. I'll break your wrist. Drop it. Please, let me go. Let me go. Put out your hands, Vale. Uh, you okay, Jason? Yeah. I, I didn't mean to do it, honest. You got his knife? Yeah, exhibit A. You stupid punk. I didn't know he was a ranger, Tom. How was I to know? A lot of things you don't know, son. Maybe someday you will. Uh, 
In just a moment, we will tell you the results of the case you have just heard. Hello, friends. This is Jack Parr. I'll be with you later this evening with the $64 question, but right now I'd like to remind you about some of the other great shows this evening on the NBC radio network. In just a few minutes, you'll hear the big show with Tallulah Bankhead and a big array of guest stars. And, of course, Meredith Wilson will be on hand to direct the big show orchestra and chorus. You will hear 90 minutes of scintillating comedy and music today on the big show. And then, right after the big show, stick around for the Phil Harris Alice Fay Show with Frankie Remley, Julius Abruzio, Brother William, and the entire Harris household. It's a program that's sure to please you. Later today, Theater Guild on the Air will bring you stars from Hollywood and Broadway in an exciting Broadway play. And right after Theater Guild on the Air, I'll be back with a pocket full of money and the $64 question. I'll be talking to a lot of contestants tonight, and maybe you'll hear one of your neighbors. So why not stay tuned right now to the NBC for a whole evening of great entertainment. I'll be looking for you in our radio audience tonight. And now, let's get back to the tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, here are the results of the case you have just heard. Larry Vale was found guilty on four counts of auto theft and one count of armed assault. He was sent to the state school for boys at Gatesville until he became of age. His brother, Tom Vale, pleaded guilty to contributing to the delinquency of a minor and to five counts of auto theft. He received a 20-year term at Huntsville. Mexican authorities cooperated with the Texas Rangers in apprehending the others involved in these crimes. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae will soon be seen in San Francisco Story, a Warner Brothers release. The cast included Tony Barrett, Sam Edwards, Whitfield Connor, Paul McVeigh, and Herb Ellis. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Bernard Ederer and Robert A. White. And the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. Hal Gibney speaking. Next, The Big Show brings you drama, comedy, and music on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Can Death. It is 1.15 a.m., January 26, 1940. Bob Farragut, a rancher, comes awake slowly. As his eyes open, a wave of nausea sweeps over him, and he breaks into a cold sweat. He throws back the covers, staggers to his feet, noticing that his wife has left her place beside him. Uh, May? May? Where are you? May? What's the matter? Why are you out of bed? Oh, Bob. I feel so... so sick. Yeah, I feel kind of funny myself. I was 
just putting some water on my face. What's the matter with me? You're as white as a sheet. You better get back and lie down. <laughs> Funny, I can hardly stay on my feet without holding on to something. You're all perspired. Oh, Bob, what can it be? I don't know. Unless we're all coming down with the flu or something. Kids acted kind of funny before they went to bed. I was up with them about 11 o'clock. They were complaining about stomach aches. Wait. We better go have a look at them. If they feel like we do, I'm going to call the doc. Are they, they seem to be all right now. Both sleeping. Better close the window by Petey's bed. Janet's got covers kicked off. I'll put a quilt over it. We better get back to bed ourselves. Have Doc out in the morning. Oh, I never felt so sick. Bob! What is it? What's the matter? Oh, Janet's face. It feels so funny. Bob, she isn't breathing. She feels the cold. Now, don't go getting yourself excited. I'll wake her up. Janet? Janet? Wake up, baby. Janet! Wake up, baby! Wake up! Petey! Wake up, Petey! Um, Petey! Oh, what's the matter with him? Doc. Gotta call the doc right away. Stop! Don't leave me! Stop! Me! Me! Hey. Gotta get him. Get somebody to help. Gotta get downstairs to the phone. Hey. Discovered two days later when a neighbor noticed Farragut's milk cows wandering in pain as the result of not being milked. The sheriff was summoned, along with a medical examiner who made a preliminary diagnosis of poisoning. The bodies were moved into town for autopsy, and the sheriff called for the aid of a Texas ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. Everything in this medicine cabinet seems to be innocent enough, Jase. Your deputy checked the garbage cans and refuse bins? Yeah, no empty bottle of any kind, just a few cans, vegetable peel and stuff like that. I'll need some wrapping to pack these bottles in so they can be flown to the lab for examination. Probably find what you need downstairs. Jase, I've been in office nine years, and this is the dirtiest killing I've ever had. You seem pretty sure this wasn't an accident. Not with kids being affected. Farragut's were mighty careful people. Car pulling up outside. Yeah, it must be the doc with the autopsy report. No, Sid Mag. Farragut's partner in this range. Who did it, Sheriff? Sid, if I knew that, I wouldn't be standing here. They gotta do something about this. I don't want anybody getting away with it. You can post a five thousand dollar reward for the killer in my name. Make it ten. Make it anything I got. Take it easy, Sid. I know how you feel. Uh, Sheriff tells me you own half this place. That's right, Ranger. How come you haven't been out here in a couple of days? Well, I don't live on the place. It was just an investment to me. I got a hardware store in town, living there. I see. You know anybody who was packing a grudge against the Farragut's? Against Bob and May and those kids? It'd take a madman to want to hurt them. Oh, Jace, that's Doc's car coming now. Good. Oh, why does everything take so long? Everybody's standing around waiting instead of doing something. There's no point in doing anything until you know what you're doing. And Doc tells us what killed the Farragut's. We'll have something to trace. Oh, I'm sorry, Ranger. It's all right, Mr. Mag. Howdy. Howdy, Doc. You know Sid. This is Ranger Pierce. Hello, Sid. Hello. Hey, Ranger. Yeah, the results of the autopsy is kind of surprising, Sheriff. Death in all four cases is accidental. Well, accidental? Accidental. No doubt about it. Deaths were caused by botulism. What's that? It's the result of improper home cannon. Stomach content showed the Farragut's had made their last meal on green beans, potatoes, and canned sausage meat. There's nothing in that to kill them. Yes, there is, Mr. Mack. The doc's right. Cannon meat at home is tricky business, Sid. Should be done under steam pressure at high temperature. If it isn't, uh, bacteria forms and it's plenty deadly. You sure that's what killed him, Doc? Bacteria was unmistakable, Sheriff. It was the sausage meat. Nothing else. 
I uh, guess we should be thankful in a way. It's nice to know it wasn't murder. Dead. Just from sitting down to a meal. And they're all dead. Well, Jace, looks like I brought you down here for nothing. I don't know, Sheriff. Looks like we've got a real job on our hands anyhow. What do you mean, Ranger? The Sheriff and I have fine-combed the house. There's nothing in there that's home canned and no equipment for home canning. Sure, that's right. All we did find was one cannon jar on the kitchen drain board. Must have been washed out along with the dishes from the last meal aid. Are you sure of that? Wasn't even a steam boiler big enough for home canning. And a woman doesn't just put up one jar. She cans in batches, and the whole batch might be contaminated. Women do pass out samples of their home cannon to neighbors and friends. That jar must have been a gift. Quite a gift. Like a stick of dynamite with a lighted fuse. Somebody around here must have a pantry full of poison, and they don't know it. You mean what happened to the Farragut's could happen to somebody else? It will happen to somebody else if we don't find out where that sausage meat came from and fast. Sheriff, you better get all your deputies and a bunch of volunteers out here right away. We'll need them to make direct contact with anybody in the area who can't be reached by phone. We've got to warn anybody that may have given the Farragut's that sausage meat. I'll call them right away. And ask the phone company to put on a staff and make calls to every listing. Right, Jase. Is there anything I can do, Ranger? Well, you've got your car. You can take an area when the sheriff and I map it out. I can help you there. I'd rather use you in another way if you don't mind, Doc. Drive into town, go to the newspaper and the local radio station, ask him to get out a warning. Right. You want me to come back, then? No, you better stand by in town and pray that we don't bring in another case for the hospital or the morgue. <laughs> Five days and nights, we covered the territory, the shacks and farms and ranch houses without phones, and then doubled back on the phone listings that hadn't answered, running down the whereabouts of people away on business trips or vacations, but we couldn't locate the source of the contaminated meat. If only somebody would come forward and admit that they can to stuff the Farragut's ate, we'd know we were safe. Uh, they may be afraid of being held responsible for the deaths. Well, it is something to wonder about. Yeah, we're almost back to my office. Maybe one of the other men has left a report. What time is it? Almost midnight. Yeah, here we are. Oh, howdy. Uh, howdy. You Sheriff Keenan? That's right. This is Ranger Pearson. Hello. What can I do for you? My name's Burton. I just came down from Dallas. I'm an investigator for the Midland and Frontier Insurance Company. We understand that you're still investigating the death of the Farragut family. Well, we're trying to find the source of the stuff that killed them, if that's what you mean. Then this isn't a criminal investigation? No. Deaths were accidental. What's your interest, Mr. Burton? Well, Ranger, it is unusual for an entire family to be killed, except for a highway accident or a fire, some natural calamity. And the Farraguts were all heavily insured by my company. I'm just making a routine check up before we pay the beneficiary's claim of $30,000. $30,000? You say your company insured all the Farraguts? That's right. $10,000 each on Farragut and his wife, 5000 each on the children. All the Farraguts are dead, though. Who is the beneficiary? Mr. Farragut's partner, Sid Mack. Sid Mack? How long ago were those policies written, Mr. Burton? A uh, little over a year ago, when the partnership was formed. That's the main reason my company wanted to make certain about your investigation. It's a matter of routine for partners to insure each other, but... Uh... But this involved Farragut's whole family. Yes. However, since there's no criminal investigation, we'll have to honor Mr. Mack's claim. Uh, thanks for your time, sir. Uh, just a second, Mr. Burton. Yes? If I were you, I wouldn't recommend payment of that claim just yet. But the sheriff just said that there's no criminal investigation. There wasn't a minute ago, but there is now. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Chase Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Can Death, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. In the morning, Sheriff Kingman got a search warrant for Sid Mack's house. Mack had already left for the hardware store, but we were admitted by his hired girl. She was young and frightened. She watched us in silence as we started our search and then disappeared. Nothing in here, Jase. Eh, nothing in the pantry either. Let's try the attic. Mm. That girl scooted mighty quick, didn't she? Eh, she's probably told Mac what we're doing by now. Should have kept her here until we were through. 
Well, doesn't make any difference. He'd know sooner or later. And if anything's here, he won't be able to stop us from finding it. In this door here. We're not going to find anything, Jase. If there was more of that contaminated food, he'd be stupid to have it around. And if he did kill the Farragut, he's not stupid. Oh, this whole job is too clever. No job is perfect. There's always a slip someplace. Let's move those crates. Okay. Uh, nothing in these things, Jase. Better look in those barrels, too. Yeah. Hey, hold it. Somebody's coming upstairs. Mac, I reckon. You and the ranger up there, Sheriff? That's right, Mac. What's the idea? Just having a look around, Mac. We've got a search warrant. Maybe you're going to need more than a search warrant. I had a call from an insurance man named Burton this morning. Yeah, we had a call from him last night. That's why we're here. I've got a legitimate insurance claim, but you've stopped it from being paid. It'll be paid in due time, if it should be paid. Is that so, Ranger? Well, let me tell you something. I think the way you stopped that claim constitutes slander. You think of any reason why I shouldn't slap a lawsuit on the two of you? No, Mac. Not any more than I can think of a reason why you insured Farragut's wife and two kids. Then maybe I'll give you the reason, Sheriff. Farragut knew I had them all insured. You can't insure somebody without them knowing it. The company will tell you that. Farragut was my friend. You understand that? My friend. Sure, I insured his wife. If he'd lost her and been left with the two kids, he'd need somebody to take care of them. And that cost money. Farragut could have insured her himself. So I did it for him. And I loved his kids. I don't have any, and they, they were like my own. The policies I had on them weren't just life insurance policies. They were endowment policies, too, to pay for the education. Now, what's wrong about that, Sheriff? Nothing wrong, man. If what you're saying is true... Ask the insurance man. Ask him. Out at the ranch, before we found out what killed the Farragut's, when we thought they'd been murdered, I offered to put up everything I have as a reward, didn't I? Well, didn't I? Yes, Mac, you did. I'm glad you mentioned that, Mac, because it brought something to my mind. Something that's been trying to register, and you just brought it out. What do you mean? How long you been in the hardware business? Uh, Eleven years. Why? Because when Doc told us the Farragut's died from food poisoning, from food that wasn't canned properly, he had to draw you a blueprint. You didn't seem to know anything about it. I don't know anything about it. No? Don't you sell canning equipment at the hardware store? Well, uh... we can go over to the store and have a look, Mac. All right, so I sell canning equipment. Any hardware store does. What does that prove? Companies that make canning equipment usually put out instruction booklets, too, telling how the equipment should be used. And those booklets contain a warning about the possibility of food poisoning. Maybe they do. I never read one of them. Don't kid me, Mac. man who's been handling a line for 11 years has to know the answers when customers ask about the stuff he's selling. If he doesn't, he doesn't last 11 years in the business. You're covering up, Mac. That doesn't look good. So, it doesn't look good. All right, Sheriff. What are you going to do about it? Arrest me for telling a lie? Don't be smart, Mac. I don't even know why I'm bothering to talk to you. You got your warrant. Go ahead and search. But you're not going to find anything here. No canning equipment and no canned sausage meat. So go ahead. Search your heart out. Mac wasn't hedging anymore. Having him out in the open made me feel uncomfortable. He was too defiant, too sure of himself. We finished our search, but we found nothing. Started back for the sheriff's office. He knows something about those deaths, Jase. Radically told us so, right to our faces. I know. We can't prove anything. Yeah, he could have brought cannon equipment home from the store. Could have taken it any place. Then ditched it when he was finished. He'd need more than just the equipment, Sheriff. What? Hog meat? Might have bought a hog. I had one butchered at some farm around here. But... Which one? We checked every house in the territory once, warning them about the meat. I reckon we'll have to check them again from a different angle. Be a job. Some folks off in the backwoods keep a hog or two. We'll check them all. I'm towing a double horse trailer. We can load your mount in with charcoal in case we need them for the woods or hill country. Matter of fact, places off the beaten trail might be our best bet. I know it's going to be done, Jase, but even if we find a place, can't jail them for buying hog meat. Just the same, it's our next step. And it might be the step that starts Mac on his way to a cell. It was work. Grim, routine, discouraging work. The game of questions and answers without ever getting the right answer. In three days, we checked all the spots that could be reached by car. Then we switched to the horses and rode into the backwoods. 
These backwoods people are kind of tight mouths, eh? Yeah, so I've noticed. I guess they figure the world doesn't want to share the trouble, so they hold up back here. You see what I mean next place we come to? Crazy Annie. Crazy Annie? That's what to call her. She isn't really crazy, just kind of strange. Has a son, feeble-minded. They had him at the state asylum for a while, but he was harmless, so they let him go. Old lady came into the woods with him and... Well, they've been here ever since. They got hogs? Yeah, hogs, a couple of chickens. That's about all they have got. Oh, yeah, they got one other thing. The meanest dog in the state of Texas. Keep your eye open for him when we ride up. Don't they keep him tied? Yeah, yeah, but he chews loose. Hates everybody but the old lady and her son. Place is just through this clump of trees. Hey, hold it, Sheriff. Woo, woo, Charlie. Woo, woo, woo. Woo, woo. Yeah, look at that. Mound of earth covered with rocks and a cross sticking up at the head. Looks like a grave. Uh, reckon Luke did that, old Annie's son. Always burying dead birds and things. Gives them all first-class funerals. Oh, now get up, Chuck. Oh, come on, boy. Uh, there's Luke now. Luke! Yeah. You scared him. He took off for the woods like a jackrabbit. Yeah, never know how he's going to act. I don't see any dog any place. No, first time I come here that he hasn't tried to sample my pants. Oh, there's the old lady coming out of the shack now. Yeah, I see her. Oh, who? Who, Charky? Howdy, Annie. You frightened my Luke. Why do you come to frighten him? We don't mean him any harm, ma'am. We just came to see you. Where's your dog, Annie? I don't want him sneaking up on me. The devil came for him. He's dead. And Luke cries for him. He's afraid in the night without the dog. Maybe you're just as well off, Annie. That hound might have turned on you sometime. Uh, how are the hogs coming? See, the sow has a new litter. Yeah, those sucklings ought to make good canning. Uh, maybe you got some canned meat that I could buy. I ain't got nothing canned. Not until we butcher. That's true, Jace. Ford checked her shells when we were warning everybody. I see. You ever give any canned sausage meat to the Farragut's? I never give them nothing. Why are people always asking me that? You know the Farragut's are dead, don't you, Annie? Yeah. If you never gave anything to the Farragut's, did you ever give or sell any canned sausage to Sid Mack? Or any hog meat, or even a live hog? Well, did you, Annie? You've got a right to sell what you own. I don't know the man you talk about. Now, don't lie to us, Annie. We're friends. You know that, don't you? I never sold him nothing. I never did. He never come up here. All right, Annie. Want to write on, Jace? No sense trying to catch Luke when he's scary like he is today. He can't even talk. Yeah, let's go. Goodbye, ma'am. Goodbye, Ann. Up, Charlie. Up, boy. Of course, it's hard to tell with anybody like that, Jace, but she seemed to tighten up when you mentioned Sid Mack. She did. Her hands started to work. Nerves. And the boy Luke ran when he saw me. Of course, he's done that before. If they can give us any information, it isn't going to be easy to get. I got an idea. May be a wrong one, but it's worth a shot. Let's turn back for town. Come on, Charlie. Come, Come on, boy. Come on. You gonna tackle Mac again? No. I want to see the doctor. Well, there's a complete chapter on botulism in this book, Jace. Now... What was it you wanted to know? This food poisoning from improper canning, Doc, does it always happen? I mean, if the batch wasn't cooked the proper length of time, or if it wasn't sealed under the proper steam pressure, would it necessarily be poisoned? No, not necessarily. It could be all right. I just wanted to make sure. Well, what's your point, Jase? Uh, if Mac put up that contaminated meat, he'd have no way of knowing it was bad without testing it. So since he wouldn't test it on himself... He didn't test it on anybody else, either. There'd have been another death or somebody sick enough for Doc to know about. Mac wouldn't have gambled on the Farragut's just getting sick. He wouldn't have even gotten the food to him unless he was sure it was deadly. Well, he could have tested it on an animal. Would an animal eat that food, Doc? Well, the meat would seem all right by taste or smell. Yes, yes, an animal would eat it. That's all I wanted to know, Doc. Sheriff, we're going for another ride in the woods. I think I know what for. Shouldn't take two guesses. We're going to dig up Luke's dog and send it to the lab at Austin. I want to know what that dog died from. We took Deputy Ford with us to stay on guard and keep old Annie and Luke from leaving their shack. 
We dug up the dog and sent it to Austin. The answer fit. Death by food poisoning. Sheriff and I rode back to the shack in the woods. Old Annie was white and shaking and her son huddled in a corner. His eyes enormous and frightened, his lips numb. Annie, believe me, nobody's going to hurt you or Luke, but you've got to help us. You had no reason to harm the Farragut's, we know that. But we're after the man who did have a reason. I don't know, I don't know. All you have to do is tell us, was Mac here? Did you sell him anything? Or can anything under his direction? I guess it's no use, Jace. Yeah, we can try again when we get to town. Annie, you and Luke will have to come with us. We're taking you in. I don't want to come back. Luke, Luke, listen to me. We're only taking you into town. I wouldn't have to do that if you or your mother would answer my questions. They're lying, boss. They want to take me back there. Mr. Mac says they take me back. Mac says? Wait a minute, Sheriff. Where did Mr. Mac say they were going to take you, Luke? You know where... The place where they took me before. They ain't gonna take you, Luke. I won't let him. Yes, I think he means the asylum. That's what he does mean. That's the key to why he won't talk. Wait, I got a hunch. Luke, Mac isn't a good man. He killed your dog. Well, he did, didn't he? No. He was always giving me stuff to feed him. My dog died. He died. You're getting to him, Jace. We don't want to send you away, Luke. Mac lied. He's the one. He wants to send you away. No. He tried to help me. He told me who was trying to help me send back there. It was Mr. Farragut. That's who. Don't tell him, Luke. Don't say any more. You better let him talk, Annie. Because if Mac didn't kill the Farragut's, then Luke did. He didn't. He didn't mean to. He didn't know what he was doing. Mr. Mac said I should be nice to Mr. Farragut and his wife. Then they wouldn't send me away. What do you mean by telling you to be nice? He said I should go and bring him a present. He gave me the present to bring. Something nice for them to eat. Something in a jar? Something canned? Yeah. The same kind of stuff he always kept giving me to feed my dog. My dog died and Mr. Farragut and his lady and the little babies, they died too. And that's it, Jace. Making him an accessory to the murder of four people. I know. But with Luke's background and with a smart defense attorney in court scaring him and confusing him, Luke's story wouldn't hold up. Mac would get away with it. But what else can we do? We gotta find the rest of that food and prove it passed through Mac's hands. He had a batch of it. Kept feeding the dog samples until he found a jar that was deadly. Annie? Your boy's in trouble. You know that, don't you? Leave him alone. How much of that stuff did Mac bring up here? A lot. He kept it hid someplace in the woods, except in what he fed the dog. He didn't tell us why. And after the dog died, that's when he got the jar from his hiding place for Luke to take to the Farragut's, wasn't it? Luke never knowed what killed the dog till after. No. Mr. Farragut, he thanked me and he gave me a half dollar. And the lady, she, she smiled at me, pretty. Luke. Do you know where Mac hid that food? Did you see him digging any place? Did you follow him? I, I never know where he kept it. He always went over the hill, way over where it's all rock. That rock formation across the gully, Jace, about a mile from here. Think he left the stuff there? Yeah, it wouldn't be safe for him to cart around. He had to leave it someplace. Come on. We're going to need more men, Sheriff. We may have an all-night digging party. Warren! Yeah, Sheriff. Just watering the horses. Well, hop on your throttle and head for the nearest ranch. Get on the phone and call for deputies. Tell them to bring shovels and keep their mouths shut about where they're going. I want them up here right away. We dug by flashlight and torchlight. Finally, we found it. A burlap sack loaded with jars of sausage meat. Canned death. We rushed back to town, and just after dawn, a fingerprint crew flew in from Austin. I held my breath. All we needed was a print. One fingerprint belonging to Sid Mac. We got it. More than one. There were sets on every jar. By that time, his store was open and we went for him. Well, Sheriff and the Ranger, what uh, bright ideas have you got this time? Got an idea? We're going to lock you up, Mac. You can drop that smile, Mac. Luke was just as scared of us as he was of you. We know the whole story. Well... Guess fellas with your mentality might believe, Luke, but a jury won't. You know what the law says about a reasonable doubt? We also found a few buried samples of your canning, Mac, with your fingerprints all over the jars. Just yours. 
So? Like you once said, I sell cannon equipment. And I handle the stuff I sell. So my prints were on the jars. Smart, isn't he, Sheriff? Regular genius. Thanks. Sorry I can't return the compliment. You're just like all the smart ones, Mac. You just made one mistake, and it was a real stupid one. About those prints. You had to put them on the jars after they were filled, when the canning was completed. Any prints that were on before would have been boiled off. You go back, back. claw hammer, Mac. Don't make me put a bullet in you. Because heaven knows, Mac, I'm tempted. Wait a minute, Sheriff. I'm not resisting. I'm not touching anything. All right. Move. Better lock the door, Mac. You won't be coming back. Sid Mack was brought to trial on August 3rd, 1940. He was convicted of premeditated murder. And on April 19th, 1941, he died in the electric chair. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Paul Fries, Virginia Craig, Will Wright, Ken Christie, Joe Forte, Edmund McDonald, and Don Diamond. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Gordon McRae sings for you tomorrow evening as the Railroad Hour presents a melodic adaptation of the dramatic opera Madame Butterfly. Gordon's guest for this Railroad Hour presentation is lovely soprano Nadine Connor. And your Monday of Music tomorrow also includes a concert by the voice of Firestone with guest artist Eugene Conley. Bill Baker asks the $64 question next on NBC. Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. dates and places in the following story are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Music means all things to all people. Music is relaxation, adventure, Elysian fields of dreams come true. And at this joyous holiday time, music is Christmas. We of NBC feel proud of our Monday evening lineup of truly fine music programs. Tomorrow means more fine music on NBC with the Railroad Hour featuring Gordon McRae and Lucille Norman in The Happy Prince, a special Christmas Eve production to add to your listening pleasure. Also tomorrow, there's The Voice of Firestone with guest Eleanor Stieber. Later, there's The Telephone Hour with guest soloist Blanche Thiebaum. And tomorrow, enjoy the Christmas program of the Mario Lanza Show with Mario Lanza, lovely Giselle McKenzie, and Ray Sinatra's orchestra. Yes, Monday is your invitation to music over most NBC stations. Make a program note to hear the Railroad Hour, the Voice of Firestone, the Telephone Hour, and the Mario Lanza Show tomorrow. Monday means music on NBC. Hear it on this station. And now, from the files of the Texas Rangers, the case called Christmas Payoff.
It is 4 p.m. on the afternoon of December 25th, 1940, in the small West Texas town of Rockfield. In his office, Dr. Edward Hartley and his nurse are just clearing up after treating an emergency case, which has taken the doctor away from his family on this Christmas day. Doctor, before I leave, would you like me to stay? Alice, I would just like you to scoot on home where you should have been hours ago. And what about you? I think it's a shame. The one day in the year family should be together and you have an emergency. Well, anyway, old Mrs. Thompson will feel a lot better now for the holidays. Pretty nasty infection. Mm -hmm. This doctoring is the one business can't be run by a time clock. And nursing's a part of doctoring, so I leave when you do. (laughs) Trapped. Sure would have loved to spend the whole day with the youngsters, though. No, they probably won't even let you back in the house. Well, Christmas got them so excited, I don't think they even know I'm gone. Oh, by the way, you sure you won't have supper with us? I'd love to, Doctor, but... Oh, no. Huh? What's the matter? Doctor, you come over the window for a minute? Not another patient. I think so. Uh-huh. Well, guess the Christmas tree can wait a little longer. Who is it? I don't know. Here, look. That man just getting off the car. I recognize him. That arm must be in pretty bad shape. Bandage clear to the elbow. And why didn't he come in two hours ago? Huh? What do you mean? That man was sitting in that car two hours ago. Only he was parked in front of the house next door. I wonder... Come away from there. What, Doctor, what... I don't want him to see you. Now, go on. What else? Well, just an hour later, when I took Mrs. Thompson out to her car, he was still there. And he meant it. He really meant it. Doctor, what is it? Alice... Now, listen to me. Don't ask any questions. I want you to get in the supply closet and stay there. What? Whatever you do, don't make a sound. No matter what happens out here, don't give yourself away. You understand me? Your life depends on it. What is it? Why don't we call the sheriff? I'm going to. Now, hurry. Hurry into the closet. Now, remember, not a sound. I should have known it had come. I didn't know when. Come on, come on. Operator, this is Doc Hartley. Listen carefully. I have to speak quietly. Get the sheriff to my office as quick as you can. And don't call back. Just get him out here. I can't stall any longer. Come in. Just a minute. Here he goes. Yes? You, Doc Hartley? That's right. Well, can I come in? Oh, of course. Come in. Uh, no, that, that's the supply closet. My dispensary is this way. Now, if you'll just get up on the table. Uh, Would you like to lie down? More comfortable for that arm. I'll sit. That's a lot of bandaging. What did you do to that hand? I think maybe I sprained it. You're the doc. Suppose you tell me. Hmm. Always work this slow, doc? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Where's your nurse? She's gone home a long time ago. Not even supposed to be working today. This is Christmas, you know. Yeah, I know. Why don't you pull the last of the bandage off, Doc? Don't you want to see my hand? I know what's in it. Then I'll do it myself. Yeah. See? There's your Christmas present, Doc, in my fist. Nice 38. Don't you want it, Doc? Why are you doing this? Why? Maybe I shouldn't give it to you. You guessed what it was. Spoil my surprise. Nah, you look like a nice guy. I'll give it to you anyway. Look at me, Doc. You know what it's for. You get your... Merry Christmas, Doc. Sheriff Lon McGill, on arriving at the scene of the crime, found Dr. Hartley dead and Nurse Alice Leonard in a state of physical collapse. He immediately asked for the help of the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned, joining the sheriff at the doctor's office a short while later. Photographer will be out of your way in a minute, Jace. The nurse I told you about is in the other room. Maybe you want to talk to her first. Yeah, thanks, Sheriff. She's still as bad off as she was. Oh, she's some better now. It's a rough thing for a woman to have to go through. Yeah, plenty rough. In here, Jace. Uh... Alice. Alice, this is Ranger Pearson. It's Alice Leonard, Jace. Been Doc Hartley's nurse for six years. Howdy, ma'am. I, I, I'm sorry. I just can't seem to get a hold of myself. But it was so horrible. 
I know how you must feel, ma'am, but you'll be helping a lot by answering a few questions. I had tried. Fine. Sheriff here has given me what you told him, so I won't put you through that again. Just want to clear up a few things. You know of anyone who might have wanted Doc dead? Oh, what sort of person would want that? Doctor was a wonderful man. Never had an enemy in his life. Sheriff, he'll tell you that. That's right, Jace. Doc was a real popular man in this town. I never heard a word against him. Friend didn't put him where he is now, Sheriff. Ma'am, you say you saw the killer's face? Yes, through the keyhole. You think you'd recognize him if you saw him again? Yes, I'm sure I would. Good. Now, from their conversation, would you say the doctor knew this man? No. Yet when he saw him through the window, he made you hide in the closet. Yes, that's right. He say anything at all about the man? No. Wait. Wait, I remember now. He said something about... He meant it. He meant it? Yes. What is it, ma'am? I just remembered something. A note. What note, Alice? Well, a few weeks ago, the doctor got a letter. I opened it because I take care of his mail. Go on. The inside was just a piece of paper with words cut out from newspapers, pasted to it. It said the payoff is soon. What did the doctor say when he saw it? Well, he just laughed. Said it was some sort of joke. But I caught him sitting and staring at it a few times after that. You know where that letter is? Well, I think it's in his desk. Miss Leonard, you remember anything about the car this man drove? No. Just that it was black, a sedan. Oh, and the front fender had a big dent in it. I remember I could see it from the office window. I think that'll do for now, ma'am. You go home and try and get some rest. Uh, tell the deputy I said to drive you home, Alice. I will. I hope you find the man that did this. I hope you find him. Oh, poor woman. She was mighty fond of the doc, Jason. Must have spent some bad minutes in that closet. Yeah, the doc had a couple of bad minutes, too, Sheriff. Uh, the photographer must be finished in there by now. Let's take a look. Nothing's been touched in there, Jace. Everything's just the way we found it. Thought you'd want it that way. Thanks, Sheriff. Let's have a look at the doc. Yeah, I'll just whip the sheet off him here. Mm. He shot at close range, all right. Powder burns. The angle of the shot seemed to bear out the nurse's story. Ballistics will fill us in later. Let's have a look at this desk. Okay, Jace. Mm. There's not much on this side, Jace. What's the matter? Drawer full of Christmas candies. It'll be a nice Christmas for those poor kids. Hey, wait a minute, Jace. I think this is what you want. And that's it. The payoff is soon. No envelope with it? Mm, I reckon Doc threw that away. It'll be a tough one to trace. Cheap paper, the message in newspaper captions. And it's used a lot for blackmail because it's so hard to run down. Well, where to now, Jace? Has the doc's wife been told about this yet? No. Been holding off. I sure don't relish it, none. Those kids and all. Let's tell her together then, Sheriff. It's a little easier that way. Thanks, Jace. Anything more we can do here? No, but before we go, I want to check on that black sedan with a smashed front fender. See if it's on the stolen car list. Sure thing. If you can spare a couple of deputies, Sheriff, I'd like them to do a house-to-house -house on this street. Maybe somebody else got a look at that car or the killer. It's a good idea, Jace. There's not much to go on, is there? There's enough. They always leave enough. And this is one killer I want, Sheriff. I want him bad. Black sedan with a smashed front fender was on the stolen car list. We finished our calls and left. Fifteen minutes later, we stood in front of a large, neat house on a well-kept street. Staring at the front door, Doc Hartley would never open again. Through the parlor window, we could see three laughing kids and proud grandparents around a Christmas tree. It was a rough doorbell to ring. Oh, I'm sorry. I was expecting my husband. Oh, Sheriff McKill. Howdy, Miss Hartley. Can we come in? Oh, of course. Please do. 
I imagine you want to see Ed. I'm I'm sorry he had an emergency, but if you like, Mrs. I can... Mrs. Hartley, this is Ranger Pearson. Howdy, ma'am. <laughs> Hello, Ranger. Pleased to meet you. Ma'am, can we speak to you privately? I mean, in another room, away from them. Of course. Come in here. Well, what is it? Ma'am, it's best to say it quickly. Your husband, he's been killed. Oh, no. Here, you, you, you better sit down, Miss Hartley. Yeah. I'm sorry, ma'am. How, how did it happen? He was shot, ma'am, by a man who came in asking for treatment. I want to find that man, Mrs. Hartley. I, I know how you feel at a time like this, but if you could answer a few questions, it'd help. I'll try. Has anyone threatened your husband that you know of? Did he seem worried lately? No. Did anyone call him today beside the woman he went to treat? Just a man. What man? A little past noon, the phone rang. Some man asked for my husband. I told him he was at the office on an emergency, and he just hung up. You recognize the voice, Mrs. Hartley? No. Just one more question, ma'am. Do you know of anyone who had a grudge against the doctor who would have wanted this to happen? No. Nobody. Nobody except... Except who? Oh, I was thinking of that man, the, the one he sent to prison. Sent to prison, ma'am? I think I can explain that, Jace. Uh, you mean that Nixon thing, Miss Hartley? Yes. Well, it happened a couple of years back, Jace. A fellow named Al Nixon robbed the payroll of a gas-cracking plant about 40 miles from here. Shot during the getaway, though. Came through here and forced Doc Hartley to treat him at gunpoint. You know what kind of stretch they gave him, Sheriff? No, I don't remember. You see, that was before I was Sheriff. I was living at the other end of the county then. Well, anyway, it seems Doc somehow sneaked a phone call while he was treating Nixon, and the police got him. I isn't that right, Miss Hartley? Yes. They sent him to Huntsville. Mrs. Hartley, I'm sorry to put you through this. We're going to leave now. Is there anything we can do for you? Nothing. There's nothing anyone can do. How will I tell the children? Call from KTXA ought to be in any minute now, Sheriff. I still don't see why you ask him for that rundown on Nixon, Jace. You thinking maybe he's out? I don't know, Sheriff, but I sure want to find out. Nixon's got a real good motive for this killing. Well, I got to go with you on that. But... KTXA, hold it, Sheriff. Unit 10. That's KTXA it. KTXA to Unit 10. Unit 10 to KTXA. Go ahead. I have information you requested. Al Nixon, sentenced life term, Huntsville Penitentiary, December 1937. Money from gas cracking plant payroll never recovered. 10 4, unit 10 clear. KDXA Austin. Well, that kind of kills that, don't it, Jace? Man with the best motive of all is serving life at Huntsville. Uh, still too good to pass by, Sheriff. What do you mean? Look, Nixon may be in Huntsville for life, but that doesn't change his motive. It's still good. So good, I want to see him. I'm going to Huntsville in the morning. In a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Who catches tuberculosis? The young? Yes, but so do the old. And so do people of any race or nationality. Half a million Americans are afflicted with TB. 40,000 a year die from it. Yet TB is preventable and curable. It can be controlled. How? One way is through Christmas seals. 
Christmas seals are the sole support of the 3,000 voluntary associations affiliated with the National Tuberculosis Association, which are fighting to wipe out TB in their communities. The greater the Christmas seal sale, the nearer we are to ending the scourge of tuberculosis. If you haven't already purchased your Christmas seals, you can still buy and use them. Be glad of this easy, inexpensive way to help others. Be grateful for the opportunity to help safeguard your own home against the dread white plague. And now back to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and our authentic story, Christmas Payoff. Next morning, I left Nurse Alice Leonard with the sheriff to begin the long job of trying to pick a killer's picture out of the gallery. Then I headed for Huntsville. I wasn't in the visiting room five minutes when Nixon was brought in. A brutal-looking little man who shuffled forward and sat across the table from me, waiting for me to talk. My name's Pearson, Nixon. Ranger Pearson. Uh, what do you want, a medal for remembering your name? I want some answers. <laughs> And if I don't give them to you, you'll have me arrested, huh? <laughs> you remember Dr. Hartley, Nixon? Yeah. Yeah, I remember him. Look around. Ain't this good reason to remember him? He didn't put you here. You put yourself here. Hartley put me here. Oh, but don't you worry ahead about me, Ranger. I'll make out. Yeah. You worry about Hartley. Hartley's dead, Nixon. You, you mean that? He's dead. Shot to death. <laughs> Something funny, Nixon? <laughs> sure, sure. Don't you get it? He put me in here, now he's dead, but I'm still alive. <laughs> oh, you cops, you're all so smart, ain't you? Sure, sure, you got me, but you never got the money. And best of all, Hartley is dead. You're in the right place, Nixon. Uh, uh, so that's why you're here, huh? Maybe I killed him, huh? <laughs> Sure, sure. I'll confess. I just walked through the walls, knocked them off, and flew back like a bird. <laughs> yeah. One call for you, Ranger. You can take it in the office. All right, guard. Thanks. Is Rose Nixon? <laughs> yeah, you can have him. This way. Hey, Ranger, arrest me. I killed him. I killed him. In there, Ranger. Thanks. Hello? Sheriff McGill, Jace. How are you making out? Old trail, Sheriff. Nixon's no help. How'd you come out? Nurse picked out a picture, Jace. Swears it's him. A fella named Lou Crowley. You run a make on him? I sure did. He did the last two years in Huntsville. Released a week ago. Beginning to fit, Sheriff. Any more on that car? I was just coming to that. They found it about a hundred miles from here. Abandoned in some brush just outside of Crest City. I want to see that car, Sheriff. Tell him to hold it where it is. As soon as I talk to the warden, I'm heading for Crest City. Want to meet me there? Sure thing, Jace. Meet you at the hotel. Never can tell what's coming, Sheriff. That cold trail's all warmed up again. I had my talk with the warden and then met the sheriff in Crest City. As we headed for the spot where the abandoned car had been found, I kept thinking of Doc's wife and her three small kids. I was getting closer to a killer, and I liked it. No, oh, I don't know, Jason. No matter how I figure it, there's always a couple of loose ends. Well, then try this, Sheriff. Al Nixon is doing life for a payroll robbery, and he's convinced it's Doc Hartley's fault. Now, that payroll was never found because Nixon hid it someplace before they got him. Yeah, I follow that far, Jason. In Huntsville with Nixon was Lou Crowder. Now, Nixon knew he wasn't ever going to get to use that money, so suppose he made a deal with Crowder. Crowder could have it if he killed Doc Hartley. But what was to stop Crowder from just digging up the money and not killing the Doc? Well, Nixon's too smart for that, Sheriff. Probably set it up so he'd let Crowder know where the money is after he was sure of Doc's death. Yeah. It figures all right. But how would he let Crowder know? By letter, Sheriff. The warden told me Nixon's already written Crowder three times. What good would that do? All mail coming out of Huntsville is censored, Jay. I know, but the two men had plenty of time to rig a code when they were together in the pen. Mm, then a letter could be the answer. That's right. Yeah, the highway patrol car up ahead must be where the car is. Yeah. Yeah, this is it. Howdy. Uh, 
Uh, howdy, fellas. It, there's a car, Jace, just behind this brush. Jace, even if your figuring's right, what do you reckon this car is going to tell us? Just one thing, Sheriff. That's it. I don't get it, Jace. You will. Look, would Crowder want to hang around a town he'd killed a man in? No, reckon not. But if he's expecting a letter from Nixon, he's got a light someplace to get it. What are you driving at? Put this together. This car's still in running order. Crowder didn't have to leave it. That makes Crest City a pretty good bet for the place the letter's going to be picked up. But what if Crowder's already picked the letter up? Uh, it's not likely. Nixon didn't even know about the killing until I told him today. And he'd want to be sure before he paid off. What if Nixon double-crosses Crowder? Suppose he don't send the letter telling where the money is. He'll send it, Sheriff. I got a good look at Nixon's face when I told him Doc was dead. He'll send it. Back in Crest City, the postmaster agreed to notify us the minute he got any letter postmarked Huntsville without giving it out. The very next day, the letter was there. And a man had come in for it, but was told it hadn't arrived. The postmaster noticed the man was driving a car with a horse trailer attached. I got my horse trailer, and we set the trap in the post office the next morning. Well, that's Crowder, all right, Jason. He got the letter. Shall we take him? No. Hold it, Sheriff. What's the matter? I don't want to take a chance. He's probably armed. Some of these people may get hurt. Well, what are you going to do? Give him a lead and tail him. All right, let's move up the front door and see where he goes. I've been expecting a catalog if you want. He just got in that car, Jace. Yeah. The one with the trailer. He's pulling out. Come on. You reckon he'll head straight for that money? Yeah, there's no doubt about it. He's not pulling that horse trailer for nothing. He must be heading someplace. He can't use a car. Yeah. That's all right with me. We'll get him, Sheriff. Wherever he goes, we'll get him. For almost three hours, we trailed Crowder by car, never getting too near him, just pinpointing him. When the country got rough, he left his car and switched to the horse he'd been pulling. So did we. We gave him a bigger lead and just followed his tracks. Awful rough climb, Jace. You sure we're following him? I don't see any tracks. We're following him, all right, Sheriff. Didn't you just see that turned rock moist on one side? The hoof did that. Beats me how you spot him. Hold it, Sheriff. Oh, oh, oh. It's a drop-off just ahead. I want to look. See anything, Jay? Shh. Hold it. He's just over the drop, about 20 feet. Is he digging, Jace? Better than that, Sheriff. He's found it already. Now look, Sheriff, he's in a dead-end canyon. I'm going down after him. You cut along this ridge and close in from the base. All right, Jace, but be careful. Come on, boy. Crowder! Get your hands up. You'll never take me, copper! That's a warning, Crowder. Next one will be through your head. Now throw your gun away. All right. All right, don't shoot. You see, my hands are up. Keep him there. Look, look Ranger. There's 30,000 bucks here. I'll make a deal with you. Take half the money. Just give me a chance. Like the chance you gave, Doc? You're not going to get that money. No, you don't. <laughs> give me that knife. <laughs> oh. Oh. You all right, Jay? <laughs> yeah. I'm all right, Sheriff. You were taking an awful chance that way, Jay's Hobo. Yeah, I know it, Sheriff. <laughs> I had a bad minute there when I saw his knife glint in the sun. Thought you'd have to gun him for sure. I didn't want it that way. I had to take Crowder alive, Sheriff. He's my Christmas present to the warden at Huntsville. In just a moment, we will tell you the results of the case you have just heard. With Christmas just around the corner, we at NBC hope that you all will have a joyful, happy holiday season. With the program scheduled on the NBC radio network, we will try to add to your listening pleasure as you relax and tune for your favorite entertainers. 
Special programs are planned by all of our NBC shows, and we know that you'll want to hear as many of them as you possibly can. To put it in musical form, here is a holiday wish from the NBC Chimes. Happy holiday, happy listening, happy holiday, happy listening, NBC wishes you a season of good cheer, a merry, merry Christmas, and Yes, from all of us at NBC to all of you throughout the country comes this sincere, hearty wish for a Merry Christmas. And now, here are the results of the case you have just heard. On February 3rd, 1941, Al Nixon was removed from Huntsville Penitentiary to stand trial along with Lou Crowder for the premeditated murder of Dr. Hartley. Both men were found guilty. The sentence, death in the electric chair. This is Joel McRae, folks. I just want to say I hope you'll all have a happy holiday season and many more to come. See you next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. The cast included Tony Barrett, Lillian Byam, Whitfield Connor, Lou Krugman, Michael Ann Barrett, and Farley Bear. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Anthony Barrett, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gipney speaking. Next, it's The Big Show. All this and Tallulah, too, on NBC. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. dates and places in the following story are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. You know, when Thursday rolls around, it'll bring more top radio entertainment to you over these NBC stations. Thursday starts right off in high gear with Robert Young starring as heroic and harassed Jim Anderson of Father Knows Best. The Andersons are just like your family, but funnier, for the head of the household can get himself involved in situations that take the concerted effort of wife and progeny to get unraveled. And usually Jim rises from the battle bloody but unbowed, and still firmly convinced that father knows best. For adventure fans, Thursday holds the promise of top mystery listening also, as NBC presents Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons, who matches his deductive reasoning against the violence and murder of crime. Later, join Jack Webb as Sergeant Joe Friday of Dragnet, the true story of your police force in action. Father knows best, Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons, and Dragnet. Hear all these and more Thursdays on NBC. Now back to Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, from the files of the Texas Rangers, the case called Clip Job.
It is 10 o'clock on the evening of January 24th, 1950. A bitter wind whips through the streets in the North Texas town of Bolton. As the clock in the town hall strikes the hour, an elderly woman makes her way toward a lighted drugstore. Oh, thank you, Mr. Darrow. Thank you. Uh, good night. Can I help you, ma'am? Are you Mr. Crandall? Yes, ma'am. Some people told me you know everybody here in town. Well, ma'am, I reckon I do. I've had this drugstore 23 years. Do you know a man named George Colley? Colley? Colley. No, ma'am, I, I don't believe I do. Um, uh, what does it look like? Well, he's a big man. Kind of stout, with gray hair. He's in the oil business. Well, ma'am, I might be wrong, but I don't recall anybody who looks like that by the name of Collie. Of course, he could be new around town. Oh, no. He said he's lived here for years. Have you asked anybody else in town if they knew? Yes. I've asked all day. Hmm. And you're sure you got the right town? Mr. Collie said Bolton. He told me he lived on Corsi Street. That's right, ma'am. We got a Corsi Street here. I went to the address he gave me. People there never heard of Mr. Carley. I guess I've come a long way. From nothing. I'm sorry, ma'am. You've been very kind. Oh, not at all. Anything else I can help you with? I'll just look around a little, if you don't mind. Why, well, sure, sure. Just take your time. I'll go ahead wrapping up these orders. Mr. Crandall. Yes, ma'am? That bottle up there, how much does it cost? Uh, this one? The large one, just above it, with a red label. Oh, that bottle's not for sale, ma'am. We sell it by the ounce. How much is it an ounce? dollar and a quarter. But it's poison, ma'am. You'll need a prescription to buy it. Prescription? Yes, ma'am, from your doctor. Oh. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> You feeling all right, ma'am? Yes. I'm all right. Well, you don't look so good to me, ma'am. You better come over here to the soda fountain and sit down. I'll, I'll, Please I'll leave get... me alone. Uh, uh... Ma'am! Ma'am! Operator! Operator! Uh, get me Doc Holmes and hurry! <laughs> The woman was taken to the county hospital where she was found to be in the first stage of starvation. Some letters in her handbag identified her as Mrs. Agnes Howell of Minden. Early the next morning, she regained consciousness and was able to talk. Upon hearing a story, Sheriff Ted Dreyer asked for assistance from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned and joined the sheriff at the hospital shortly after 8 o'clock. Sure glad you got here so quick, Jace. This one's a little too rough for me to handle. Well, give me a fill-in before we see Mrs. Howell. Well, Jace, I could, but I'd rather have you hear it direct from her. It, no, down this way. They had to put her in a charity ward. Didn't she have any relatives up in the town where she came from? Minden? Nope, I checked. Her husband died four months ago. She didn't have nobody else. You know, Jace, that poor old lady hadn't eaten in 48 hours. No money? When I went through her pocketbook for identification, I found 13 cents. Here we are. Ms. Howell's a third bed down. Morning, Ms. Howell. Uh, Ms. Howell, this is Ranger Pearson. I'd like you to tell him everything you told me. What's the use? He can't get my money back. Six thousand dollars. All I had in the world. Gone. Somebody stole your money, ma'am? I didn't know he was going to steal it. Mr. Collie, he seemed like such a fine man. Everything he said, I believed. Oh, I'm so ashamed. Oh, no, 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 now, now, Miss Howell. No, I'm sorry. I'm all right now. This Mr. Collie, do you know his first name? George. He seemed like the kind of man you could trust. Big and sort of stout with nice gray hair. When he come to the house, he said he'd been a friend of my husband's. How long ago was this, ma'am? Well, a month, I think. When I told him my husband was dead, he seemed so upset. He said he had a check for my husband. Five hundred dollars. 
was the profit from one of Mr. Carly's oil wells. Had your husband ever said anything to you about investing in an oil well? No, but lots of people around men and have made money from oil. I didn't think there was anything wrong. Did Mr. Colley give you the check? Well, no. He said he wanted to do me a favor. Said he'd double my $500 in three days. When he came back, he told me he'd done even better. He had $1,200 for me. And then he said if you'd put the rest of your money to it, he'd make a lot more. Is that it? He told me I'd get at least $50,000. How did you know? I just had an idea. You gave him the money, didn't you, ma'am? Yes, I did. He promised me $50,000. Seemed like such a lot. It is, ma'am. And so's your 6000 When did you first get suspicious of Mr. Colley? About two weeks after he left. He said he'd be back in a week. When he didn't show up for a month, Miss Harold decided to come over here to Bolton and look for him. I had to. There wasn't any more food in the house. I was ashamed to go to the neighbors. Our life savings. I was such a fool. I'd like to get my hands on this Collie fellow for just five minutes. I hope I can oblige you, Sheriff. Mrs. Howell, when Collie was in your town, did he stay at a hotel? Yes, he did. The Fuller Hotel. It's the only one in Minden. Mr. Collie seemed like such a nice man. I still can't believe it. That's just what he counted on, ma'am. Come on, Sheriff. Let's take a ride over to Minden. Turn right at the next corner, Jace. Four hotels at the end of the block. Uh Uh-huh. You know, there's one thing I can't understand. How did this Collie know to come right to Ms. Howe? It's an old racket, Sheriff. He's what we call a hearse chaser. Scouts around till he finds a widow with a little bit of money, and then he goes to work. But how did he happen to find Ms. Howe? He didn't just happen. Probably used the local newspaper. Checked the obituary columns for a few months back and picked out his victim very carefully. The rest was easy. Yeah, too easy. Sounds like he really knows his business. If he's the one I think he is, he's one of the smartest. We've been after him over a year. Haven't been able to get close to him, huh? Not yet. Most of the women he swindled don't come to us till months after it's happened. Mm, that makes it tough, all right. Here's the hotel, Jason. Yeah. You sure were doing right coming over here to Minden? Seems like a mighty cold trail. No trail's ever cold, Sheriff. Not as long as it's a trail. And this is one I want to follow right to the end. Hmm. Clerk don't seem to be around. I reckon that'll bring somebody. Sorry, gents. I was just having a bite of lunch in the back. Oh, Sheriff, I didn't recognize you at first. Um, this is Ranger Pearson. Howdy, Ranger. Anything wrong? We'd like to get a little information from you. Well, now, I'd be right proud to answer anything you've got to ask. Always glad to help out a ranger. Do you remember a man named George Colley? Stayed here about a month ago. Well, that's real funny you asked about Mr. Colley. Oh? Kind of stout fella, gray hair, smokes big black cigars all the time. He the one you mean? You ain't seen him around here lately, have you? Nope. Uh, but me and my wife was talking about him just last night. Anything special made you remember him? Hmm. You bet there is. Ain't often a man keeps a big wad of cash in my safe like Mr. Collie did. Six thousand dollars it was. Brought it in the last day he was here. How'd you know it was six thousand? I made him count it before he put it in the envelope. All hundred dollar bills it was. I asked him why he didn't put that much money in the bank. Said he didn't trust banks. How long did Mr. Collie stay here? Two, uh, no, three days. Yep, three days. Oh, I never forgot. There was something else he put in the safe. What was that? A gold ring with a diamond big as the end of your thumb. I said to him, sort of joking, now, Mr. Collie, you act like we got crooks here in Minden. And he answers real serious. You never know. Just like that. You never know. We have a look at his hotel bill. Uh, Mr. Collie done something wrong? Better just go ahead and get what the ranger asked. Hmm? Oh, sure. I didn't mean to get nosy. i have it for you in a minute. What do you want with Collie's hotel bill, Jace? Sometimes they're like diaries, Sheriff, and this one might give us the lead we're looking for. Here you are, Ranger. $21.50. Paid in full. Cash. It's a pretty big bill for three days. Well, he had some cleaning and laundry done. Rush, so it was actually... You can see it right here. Mm Mm-hmm. 
This item number four, 230 for telephone. Is that for local calls? No, we don't charge for local calls. I reckon Mr. Colley must have phoned out of town. Any idea who he phoned? Uh, that might be real hard to say, Ranger. We just get the charges and put them on the bill. Thanks. Come on, Sheriff. Hey, where are we going, Jace? Down to the phone company. Think we might be on to something? I don't know, but it could be Mr. Colley left us a little message without knowing it. <laughs> At the phone company office, we learned that Collie had called a Miss Sally Ronson in Dallas. The number belonged to a fancy roadhouse near town. I left the sheriff in Bolton and headed for Dallas. On the way, I radioed Company B and asked them to have somebody locate Sally Ronson and keep her under surveillance till I arrived. When I pulled up in front of the roadhouse at 10 that night, Ranger Clay Morgan was waiting for me. Over here, Jase. Hello, Clay. I got your message, Jase. Cap wants me to work with you on the rest of the case. Good. You got a line on Sally Ronson? Uh-huh. She tap dances in the floor show inside. Just watch the end of her act. She's got another show tonight. Let's go in. Sure. Jace, you think this girl is mixed up in the Hearst chasing racket with Collie? Mm, it's hard to say. But he called her long distance. That's enough to start on. Mm-hmm. The manager said her dressing room was down at the end of the hall. How much did Collie get from the old lady in Minden, Jace? Six thousand. Everything her husband left her. Mm-hmm. She must have been an awful easy mark. Maybe, but Collie's a pretty sharp article. Is this Sally Ronson's dressing room? Yeah. Just a minute. She sounds a little tired. Yeah, she's a little frayed at the edges. How much is... Oh, I thought you was the kid in the drugstore. I'm Ranger Pearson, ma'am. This is Ranger Morgan. All right, if we come in for a few minutes? Why not? Excuse me for not having shoes on. I'll go get my slippers. It's all right, ma'am. We just want to ask you a few questions. I'm getting so I never want to have shoes on when I'm not dancing. You know how bad it makes you feel when your feet get tired. Yes, ma'am. Sit down. No, thanks. Seems like I'm tired all the time now. <laughs> uh, seven years of dancing in places like this. What kind of questions do you want to ask? You know a man named George Colley? No, should I? He phoned you from a town called Minden about a month ago. <laughs> Lots of men phone me. They get the idea I'm glamorous because I'm a show gal. Huh. Glamorous with swollen feet. You sure you don't remember hearing from George Colley? Ranger, look, I'd like to help you, but I don't even know him. Well, let's try again. He's a middle-aged man, stout, gray hair, smokes strong cigars. Oh, him. Well, why didn't you say so? The oil man. But his name's George Connor. Is that what he told you it was? Yeah, I guess he's got two names. Or 20. Why did he call you? To make a date. He always takes me out when he's near where I'm playing. Makes me tired with all his big talk, but he buys a good dinner. He in trouble? Yeah. You seen him recently? Uh, a week, maybe 10 days ago. You expect to see him again soon, Miss Ronson? Look, Rangers, I can't afford to get mixed up in nothing. Bad publicity would ruin my bookings. We'll see you don't get mixed up in it. When are you supposed to see him again? Tomorrow. Club's closed and I don't have to work. He's coming in town. Said he'd pick me up at my place at 6. Want me to call you when he gets in? No, ma'am. If you don't mind, we'll wait there with you. This is one date we're all going to keep together. In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Here's an important message about a serious problem. During the last four infantile paralysis epidemics, a total of $79 million was spent by the March of Dimes Fund in caring for those stricken with this dread disease. These were the four worst infantile paralysis epidemics in history. The funds are now gone. This is a crisis, and it can become a disaster. Unless you help more generously than ever before, thousands of crippled children might never walk again. Imagine the feelings of the young parents of a three-year-old when they hear the terrible diagnosis verdict, your child has infantile paralysis. Thousands of parents heard those words last year. By contributing to the March of Dimes, you can speed the day when those words need never be spoken again. You, by your contribution, can speed the research, research which is now pressing forward so hopefully toward an early solution to polio. Join the 1952 March of Dimes today. Send contributions to your local March of Dimes headquarters. Remember, this fight is yours. And now, back to the Texas Rangers. (laughs) 
We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and our authentic story, Clip Job. We put out a bulletin on George Colley with instructions to pay special attention to the area around Dallas. The next day, we staked out in the lobby of Sally Ronson's hotel on the chance that Colley might show up early. A little after five, we joined her in her room and waited for Colley to keep his six o'clock date. At 6.30, he hadn't arrived. Sally made coffee for us on a hot plate she kept in her room. Can't understand why he don't show up. He's never missed a date with you before, has he, Miss Ronson? No. Here's your coffee, Ranger. It's not very strong, but it's hot. Thanks. Thanks, ma'am. I wish I'd never got mixed up with him. I didn't know he was a crook. Eh, it's not your fault. Suppose he puts up a fight when he sees you here. He might have a gun. Men like Kali don't often carry guns, ma'am. No need to get upset, Miss Ronson. You just relax and let us worry about Collie. Yeah. You got a coin for the radio, Ranger? Hmm? Oh, sure. Here. Thanks. You've never been this late before. Jace, you don't think he spotted us when we came up here, do you? I doubt it. He probably doesn't have any idea we're after him. Ranger, I can't help it. I'm getting scared. Couldn't I go somewhere and let you wait for him here? I'm afraid not, ma'am. We can't take the chance of him seeing you on the street. But if he comes... Answer it, ma'am. It might be him. What'll I say? Just what you would ordinarily. Don't let him think there's anything wrong. I'll try. Hello? All right, operator. Hey, turn off the radio, will I'll you? get the radio, Jason. Well, hello there. Oh? Well, if it can't be helped. Uh-uh. No, it's all right. Yeah. That's so long. It was him. Said he had some business and can't get to Dallas till day after tomorrow. Did he say where he was calling from? He didn't, but the operator said the call was from Wilford. Wilford? I see that's about 150 miles from here. Uh-huh. Oil country. Chances are Collie's working another clip job. Chase, you figure we might be able to pick him up there? We'll give it a try. Call headquarters, Clay. Get them to cover this hotel. We're going to head for Wilford. <laughs> arrived in Wilford late that night. A check of the hotels failed to locate Collie. Early the next morning, we went to the local newspaper office. We learned that a man answering Collie's description had been in a week before going over back issues. We checked the obituary columns of the same issues and got the names of four newly widowed women who might qualify as Collie's intended victim. We called at their houses and made inquiries. Just before noon, a Mrs. Helen Petrie gave us the break we were looking for. Why, yes, I know the man you're talking about, but his name's not Collie, it's Sanders. How long have you known this Mr. Sanders? Well, I've only known him a week, but he was a good friend of my husband's. Did he tell you that, ma'am? Yes, he did. And he's the most honorable man I ever met. He brought me $500 he said he owed my husband. From an oil investment? That's right. And he was so disturbed when he heard my husband had died. Said he just had to do something for me. He took the $500 away with him, didn't he, ma'am? Well, yes, but three days later he was back, and you know he had $900 with him, all for me. Did he say anything then about you investing more money so you could make an even bigger profit? Indeed he did. Matter of fact, I've got a check ready for him now, $5,200. Ranger, how do you know about all this? This may come as a shock to you, ma'am, but your Mr. Sanders is one of the slickest swindlers in Texas. Swindler? Why, well, that's downright ridiculous. Mr. Sanders is one of the finest men I ever met. I don't believe any of these things you're saying about him. I'm afraid what Ranger Pearson says is true, ma'am. We know of at least one woman who's already lost all her savings because she trusted him. But Mr. Sanders wouldn't do a thing like that. You're sure you're not mistaken, Ranger? There's no mistake, ma'am. This man's a criminal. Well, I... I don't know what to say. It makes me feel weak all over. Mr. Sanders, he seemed so kind and, and so honest. I know, ma'am. And we're sorry to have to tell you that he isn't. Well, what can I do? He's coming to pick up the check. When? Two o'clock today. I, I just don't know what I'm going to do. We'd like you to see him, ma'am, and we want you to give him your check. Just the way you planned to do. Well, I don't understand, Ranger. Would he... you give us permission to set up a hidden microphone in this room? Well, of course, but whatever for? We want to have a record of this man at work, just for our own use. You mean you want me to talk to Mr. Sanders like, like nothing's happened? That's right. And don't worry, ma'am. We'll be right in the next room. Oh, it's not that. It's... Well, I, I'm not sure if I can face him knowing what I do now. 
I never was much good at acting. Just do your best, ma'am. That's all we can ask. Clay? Yeah, Jace. How about pulling the car into a side street where it can't be seen and bring the tape recorder back with you? Sure. Better step on it. We've got a lot to do before two o'clock. Sorry to be moving your furniture around, ma'am, but I have to get this microphone set. It's nearly two o'clock, Ranger. Yeah, I'm just about finished. Uh-huh. Well, we'll try a test with Ranger Morgan in the next room. Testing, Clay. Wrap on the wall if I'm coming through. All right, Mrs. Petrie. We're ready for your visitor. Oh, I've never been so nervous in all my life. You'll do all right. Just be as natural as you can. Ranger, you sure now you want me to give him the check? It's very important that you do. Oh, I wish I wasn't so nervous. I better get into the next room. Uh, Ranger, I think that... Good luck, ma'am. All set to record, Jase. Mrs. Petrie is scared as she sounds. Yeah, she's pretty nervous. You think she'll be able to carry it off? Yeah, it's a chance we have to take. Boy, you didn't get in here with any time to spare. Yeah. Give me that other set of earphones. Here you are. Thanks. Why, uh, hello, Mr. Sanders. Howdy, ma'am. Good to see you again. Uh, won't you come in? Well, thank you, ma'am. I've got the check all ready for you. Oh, there's no hurry on that, ma'am. Mostly I just stopped by to have a nice, friendly chat with you. Listen to that, oh. Jesse. Yes. Well, uh, won't you sit down? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, sure is nice to sit a spell in a warm house on a cold day like today. Oh, brother. Yes, yes, it is cold out. Ma'am, if you don't mind my saying so, you don't seem like yourself today. I, I don't. No, ma'am. Seems like you're upset about something. Oh, yeah. no, no, I'm, I'm perfectly all right. Now, ma'am, don't try to fool me. I might not be much of a hand with the ladies, but I do know when a friend's feeling upset, and I reckon I know just what's troubling you. You do? Yes, ma'am. It's that business deal we were talking over yesterday. Now you just put your mind at ease. If it's going to worry you, we'll forget the whole thing. Oh, no, no, no. I I want you to take the chance. Well, ma'am, you won't regret it for sure. Another month's time, you'll be a rich woman. But I understand how you feel. And you know your husband was such a fine fool, I'd hate to think of his widow worrying over money. Oh, oh, it's all right, Mr. Sanders. I'm not a bit worried. Sure you are, and I don't blame you. Probably seems like a right lot of money to let go of, even if it is only for a short time. Well, I'll uh, tell you what. If, uh, well, if you feel like you can't afford it right now, you just tear up that check. Oh, he's playing it real no, smart. Uh, no, I, I thought it over and my mind's made up. I, I do want to go into your business. Well, all right, ma'am. But only if you're sure you want to. Well, the check's in my desk. I'll, I'll... Oh, what a shame, ma'am. Such a pretty face. Oh, I'm so clumsy. I better clean up the pieces before somebody gets Oh, you, you just let me handle that, ma'am. I'll have it up right away. Thank you. I'll go get the check in the meantime. He's crazy if he hasn't noticed something wrong by now. Uh-huh. There we are, ma'am. And here's the check, Mr. Sanders. $5,200. Well, Mrs. Petrie, now that you have made up your mind, I can tell you you've made the what? Ma'am, your hand's shaking. It's nothing. I... You know, ma'am, I just got a hunch we shouldn't do business today. I'll be back to see you some other day. Mr. Sanders! Casey's taking off. Goodbye, ma'am. Come on. I'm sorry, Rangers. I just couldn't... That's all right, ma'am. Let's stop him, Clay. Right. Jace is in his car. Hold it, Carly! You got his tire, Jace? Yeah, let's go. Don't move, Carly. You're covered. All right. Get out of the car. What's this all about, Rangers? You might have killed me. It would have been too good for you, Collie. What are you calling me Collie for? My name's Sanders. You must have a tough time keeping track of all your names. Put out your hands, Collie. You're under arrest. Arrest? What for? Swindling. Me? You're making a mistake, Ranger. No, Collie. You made the mistake when you swindled Agnes Howell over in Minden. Agnes Howell? I don't know anybody by that name. I think she'll know you. Come on, Collie. She spent a long time looking for you. Let's not keep her waiting any longer. In just a moment, we will tell you the results of the case you have just heard. 
There's more good radio listening Wednesday night on NBC. Wednesday, come to Ivy College in the town of Ivy, USA. Yes, walk the pleasant campus of Ivy College with Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman as Dr. and Mrs. Hall of Ivy. There's adult comedy and heartwarming human philosophy in each sparkling broadcast of the Halls of Ivy. Then, P.V., Gildy, Judge Hooker, Leroy, and all the gang bring you a half hour of mirth and music with the one, the only, the great Gildersleeve. Later, Groucho Marx is your genial paymaster of ceremonies on You Bet Your Life, radio's merriest quiz show. There's prize money for lucky contestants and fun for everyone as Groucho Marx asks the questions and provides the laughs. And for High Adventure on Wednesday, hear both Big Story and Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. Yes, Wednesday means top entertainment on NBC. Stay tuned to the NBC Radio Network. Every day of the week, the finest entertainment is as close as this station. And now back to Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, here are the results of the case you have just heard. George Colley was brought to trial on March 13th, 1950. During the two months preceding his trial, Agnes Howell and three other women from various parts of the state filed charges against him for fraud. Of the $6,000 Mrs. Howell had lost, $3,800 was recovered and returned. On April 26, 1950, George Colley was sentenced to 20 years in Huntsville Penitentiary. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. cast included Tony Barrett, Ken Christie, Virginia Gregg, Parley Bear, Ernie Newton, Herb Ellis, and Lillian Byam. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Charles E. Israel, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Next, it's the big show. All this and Tallulah 2 on NBC. the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. Dates and places in the following story are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Later this evening, great entertainment continues on the NBC radio network with such stellar programs as The Big Show, The Phil Harris Alice Faye Show, Theater Guild on the Air, and The $64 Question. Immediately following Tales of the Texas Rangers, you'll hear The Big Show with Tallulah Bankhead and all of her guest stars, along with Meredith Wilson and The Big Show Chorus and Orchestra. The Big Show brings 90 minutes of enjoyable listening, and then Phil Harris and Alice Faye step before the NBC microphones to bring you mirth and music in their own inimitable manner. Later, it's Theater Guild on the Air... And then, too, you'll be happily entertained by Jack Parr as he asks the $64 question. So keep tuned here for continuous great entertainment. And now back to Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, from the files of the Texas Rangers, the case called Cold Blood. It is 7.30 on the night of April 22nd, 1935. In a shack in a poor section of Lundy, an East Texas town, a young widow feeds her baby. 
As the room grows dark, she gets up and crosses to an oil lamp on the table. Now you hush, honey. Don't you be crying. We'll have us a nice bright light in just a minute. There. You see, honey? I told you I'd get rid of the shadow. Who's there? It's Eli, Nelly. Open up, quick. Eli? But you're doing off the farm on a weeknight. Don't stand talking, Nelly. Let me in. Lock it. Lock the door. Eli, you're hurt. You got yourself in trouble, ain't you? Let me sit down. I got a rest. A rest. Nelly, put out the light. All right, Eli. What kind of trouble you in? I run all the way from the farm. All the way. I'm your sister, Eli. I got a right to know what kind of trouble. Nelly, I, I'm scared, Nelly. I'm scared bad. Oh, honey, don't. You sit right there. I'm going to get some water. I'll wash the blood off your face. Don't light the lamp. Don't you worry. There's some light from the street. I see pretty good in the dark anyhow. Hush, baby. I'm busy now. Now, this will hurt some, Eli. There. <laughs> You're a good sister, Nelly. She always was a good sister. Oh, still. You going to tell me about it? Miss Dean. She dead. Miss Dean? Mr. Dean say I kill her. He come down to my shack. Say Miss Dean dead and I kill her. Say my coat was in the room where she's dead. He beat me, Nelly. You fight him? No. He's all right. I tripped him. He fell on the floor and I run away. All the way from the farm I run. Eli, you ought to go to the shack. I can't. You know that. I go into town. I know. I got to hide. I got to hide fast. What good is that going to do? They'll get you. They'll get you sure. I got to hide. A few days they don't find me, maybe I can get out of the state. Then they'll never find oh, me. Oh, they'll find you. Where are you figuring on hiding? You know that old shack in the swamp? Place we used to play when we was kids? It ain't good enough. They'll find you sure. But you're right. You got to hide and you got to have food. Nelly. Uh-huh. There's something you ain't asked me yet. Now, look, here's a loaf of bread and some smoked meat. It ain't much. But it'll keep you going, Spell. Nelly, you ain't asked me if I did kill Miss Dean. I don't have to ask, Eli. You're my brother, and that's all I need to know. You're a good sister. If you're gonna hide, you better get out of here. Yeah, they'll be here looking for more. Let them come. They ain't gonna hear nothing from me. You be careful, Eli. You be awful careful. I will. Maybe when I get away, I can write you. Let you know where I am. You don't write me nothing. You hear nothing. I'll let me know the car first. Go ahead now. So long. So long. Honey. God bless you. Oh. 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 The sheriff was notified by Ralph Dean, a farmer, that his wife had been murdered. He hurried to the scene of the crime and then requested assistance from the Texas Rangers. Shortly past 10 p.m., Rangers Jace Pearson and Clay Morgan arrived at the Dean farmhouse. The sheriff met them at their car. Howdy, Sheriff. Well, howdy, boys. Howdy. Body's in the bedroom. I left everything just like it was. Her husband's still around? Yeah. He was going to take off, but I figured you'd want to talk to him. He's waiting in the front room now. Come on. Where'd he want to take off for? Hey, you know how it is, Jace. Dean says it was his hired hand killed his wife. He's boiling mad. He wants to go out looking for the boy himself. What's the hired hand's name? Eli Wilbur. Been with Dean near five years. We haven't been able to locate him since the murder. Uh, Ralph? Uh, Ralph, this is Ranger Pearson and Ranger Morgan. I do, Mr. Dean. We're sorry to hear about your wife. Yeah. Glad you're here, Rangers. Maybe you can talk some sense into the sheriff. Now, you look here, Ralph. You look here, Sheriff. I told you when I called you, Eli Wilbur killed my wife. What are you waiting for? Why ain't you got a posse out tracking them down? Because I'm handling this my own way, Ralph. Your way. Man be pamming around like this. Why, he's probably miles away by now. He's got to be killed, I tell you. Just the way he killed my wife. If he's guilty, we'll get him. You'll get him. I'm telling you one thing, Sheriff. If that boy ain't taken care of, I'm going to see to it. You ain't elected again. Listen here, Ralph. He ain't taking threats from you nor nobody else. Why, you... Just a minute, both of you. Sheriff, take Clay into the bedroom where he can have a look at the body. I want to ask Mr. Dean a few questions. All right, Jace. Yeah, right through here, Clay. Yeah. What makes you think Eli killed your wife, Mr. Dean? Think? I know. His coat's in there, isn't it? Ripped in half, pieces still in Ethel's hands. She, she must... Ethel, she's dead. She's dead, Ranger. 
What time did you find your wife's body? Oh, b- about six. When I come in from the fields and went out pulling stumps till then. Wasn't Eli with you? No. He played sick today. Well, I don't need no one. Did Eli come into the house often? Of course not. Only when I called him. Thanks, Mr. Dean. That'll be all for now. Are you going to get the sheriff to organize that posse? That won't be necessary. Well, then I'm going to organize one of my own. I've got these friends here. That boy ain't going to get away with this. We're going to catch him and... You let us handle this. We'll get the person who killed your wife. All right, Ranger. There's no law against us taking a little trip into the swamps to hunt gators, is there? Take my advice, Mr. Dean. Don't interfere with the law. Yeah, she was strangled, Chase. Must have put up quite a fight from the look of the room. Uh Uh-huh. These bruises on her neck are pretty bad. man who put them there must have had strong fingers. Yeah, I've had a good look around. Aside from that coat she's holding, there's not much in the way of evidence. The coat belongs to the boy, all right. I'd say it looks mighty bad for him. He can't get far away. We'll put out a bulletin on him. If he's gone into those swamps, all the bulletins in the world ain't gonna do no good. Has he got any relatives in town? A sister, Nellie Johnson. My deputy was there early this evening. She wouldn't tell him nothing. Don't believe you'll get much information from her. We'll try our luck anyhow. Come on, Clay. Yes, sir. You Nellie Johnson? Yes, sir. We'd like to talk to you. Oh, come in, sir. You too, sir. We're looking for your brother, Nellie. Can you tell us where he is? He didn't do it, Mr. Ranger. I know he I didn't kill Miss Dean. How'd you know Miss Dean was killed, Nellie? That gentleman who worked for the sheriff, he come here early tonight looking for Eli. Say Miss Dean was dead. I, I told him Eli didn't do it. Maybe he didn't. But he shouldn't have run away. If he run away, it's only because he's scared. Have you seen Eli tonight? No, sir. I ain't seen him for a full week. He stay out to Miss Dean's farm. Do you have any idea where he might be hiding? Oh, no, sir. Can't say as I do. Nellie, if Eli killed Mrs. Dean, we're going to catch him. He'll be punished for what he did. But if he's innocent, we're going to protect him. You understand that, don't you? Yes, sir. Then you know we have to find him. We can't help him if we don't. Mr. Ranger, you've got to believe what I say. I don't know where Eli is. I, I just don't know. You're sure he wasn't here earlier this evening? Oh, yes, sir. I'm real sure. Nellie, these two spots here by the table leg, you know what they are? I... No, sir. I, I don't know. They're fresh bloodstains, Nellie. You want to tell us how they got there? Well, sir... Oh, yes, sir. I remember now. When I was fixing supper, I I cut my finger. Where'd you cut your finger? Show us. I... Oh, Mr. Ranger, please. If you didn't cut your finger, somebody else must have left those blood spots. He was here tonight, wasn't he, Nellie? Eli was here. Mr. Ranger. Why don't you tell us what you know? It'll be better all the way around. I don't want him to get hurt. My baby brother, I know he didn't do nothing. I don't want him to get hurt. He won't get hurt, Nellie. We can promise you that. He was here, wasn't he? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He was here. When? About 7.30, just after he ran from the farm. Why'd he run away? He found out Miss Dean was dead, and he was scared of Miss Dean, and scared the people in town do something to him. You know where he is now? Yes, sir. He's hiding in the shack in the swamp place we call old Moccasin Shack. Oh, please, Mr. Ranger. Don't let nothing happen to Eli. Don't let nothing happen to him. Don't worry, Nellie. We'll see Eli gets a fair deal all the way through. By the way, how did he get hurt? Hurt? Well, he must have been bleeding when he came here. How did it happen? You won't tell Mr. Dean I told you? Just tell us how it happened, Nellie. Well, sir, Miss Dean come after Eli. Say he killed Miss Dean, he beat Eli. Make Eli's face bleed. All right, Nellie. Thanks. You know, Jace, she might have been telling the truth about how Eli got hurt. But it could be Mrs. Dean scratched him while they were struggling. I don't think so. There would have been skin under her fingernails, and there wasn't. Yeah, but if Dean did beat up Eli, it means he saw him after the murder. Uh-huh. If he did... It's something he forgot to tell me. Mm-hmm. And maybe we ought to have another talk with him. We will, after we pick up Eli. Let's find out how to get to Moccasin Shack. The 
sheriff wasn't in his office, but his deputy told us how to reach the shack Nellie had described. We drove to the edge of town, unloaded our horses from the trailer, and rode toward the swamp. We reached it about nine that morning and started in. Shouldn't be far now, Chase. There's the three oaks and the willow the deputy told us about. Uh Uh-huh. Shack ought to be about a hundred yards in from here. Not exactly the kind of place I'd like to spend a vacation. Well, I never heard anybody advertising it as a resort, but... Oh, Charlie, oh. Clay, listen. Sounds like we're not the only ones out after Eli this morning. Yeah, reckon Dean didn't take my advice after all. Let's get going. That could mean a lot of trouble. At least they don't seem to know where Eli is. Let's hope we do. I got a hunch Nellie was telling the truth. If Eli hasn't heard those dogs and taken off deeper into the swamp, we ought to find him. It won't take us long to know. Chase, there's a shack. Oh, full charky. Oh, that's full. Stay on your toes, Clay. He's liable to make a break. Yeah. thought it was at first, too. Huh? This piece of rotten flooring. All right, Eli. Come up out of there. You, you arranged it. Thank God. Oh, thank God. Well, I'll be under the floorboard. Please, please, don't let them get me. Please. Nobody's going to get you, Eli. You're coming back to town with they us. They catch me, they won't listen to nothing I got to say. I hear them the whole night. They got dogs. Crawl up, Eli. Yes, sir. Please don't let them hurt me, Mr. Ranger. They want to kill me. I know they want to kill me. Don't worry. If anybody's going to get you, he'll have to get us first. In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. None of us would knowingly betray our country or endanger our loved ones and homes. Yet each of us betrays all these when we are tolerant of or don't fight back at group prejudice. When we stand for such hate, we're doing the very thing that communists want us to do. They'd like to see us divided. Christian against Jew, white neighbor against colored neighbor, or native born against foreign born. If our enemies could divide all the small groups that make up this country... Then we would be weak and could be easily overcome. Now, as probably never before, we need to be united as an example to our allies who look to us for hope and as a warning to our enemies that we are truly a united States of America. Work for understanding. Accept or reject people on their individual worth. Refuse to listen to or spread rumors against a race or religion. Speak up, wherever you are, against prejudice. And now... Back to Tales of the Texas Rangers. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and our authentic story, Cold Blood. We got Eli out of the shack and onto my horse. As we started for town, we could hear the sound of dogs and men getting closer. When we reached solid ground and came into a clearing, we saw them ranged across the path we had to take. There were eight of them on horses with Dean at their head. A group of men was silent as we stopped at the edge of the clearing, 30 yards away from them. They look pretty mean, Jase. They're all armed. They're going to get me. I know they're going to get me. Take it easy, Eli. What do you say, Jase? We'll go through. Walk your horse slow and don't say anything unless they speak to us. Eli? Yes, sir. There's a fight and something happens to our horse. Stay close to me. Yes, sir. You reckon they'll be crazy enough to try anything? Won't be long till we find out. Pick up Charky. Don't look like they're going to move, Jish. Maybe not. Morning, Rangers. Morning, Mr. Dean. If you don't mind, we'd like to get past. Sure, Rangers, sure. Just thought as how since we all met out here, we'd have a nice, friendly talk. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned it, because I want to have a talk with you. Right now, I'm a little busy. Yeah. Got yourself a prisoner, I see. We didn't do so good in our hunt. Whole night at it, and we're empty-handed. Too bad. If you and your friends would get out of the way, we'd like to get our man back to town. Expect you would. Wonder how it would be if we helped you. Be a shame if he got away after you took so much trouble getting him. We'll manage. All right, Ranger. 
Open up there for the Rangers, boys. Thanks. I meant what I said about that talk. We'll be out to see you this afternoon. Sure. Anytime. And Ranger. Yeah? Just make sure that boy there gets the kind of trial he deserves. I believe he will. Now. It was past noon when we got Eli back to town and into a cell. He was still scared, but recovered enough to eat a good-sized meal. At one o'clock, we went up to question him. The sheriff led Clay and me along to the cell block. Well, one thing, Chase, you can be sure Eli's going to get all the attention we can give him. He's the only prisoner we got now. Yeah, probably better that way. Don't know what Dean and his gang might try. Ah, oh, damn. Clay told me you had a little trouble on the way in, mm-hmm. but I don't expect him to try much now. Bunch of blowhard. You no, know, the same. I wouldn't like to have been Eli if they'd have caught him out in that swamp. Yeah, that's different. But here in the lockup, me and my deputy's on the job. Yeah, I'll be down the corridor. Holler when you want me. Thanks, Sheriff. Hello, Eli. You feel better now? Yes, sir. Much better. Not so scared now. Good. We just want to ask you a few questions. Yes, sir. Eli, did you kill Mrs. Dean? No, sir. Your coat was found in her hands. Mr. Ranger, I don't know how come my coat got in Miss Dean's hands, but I didn't kill her. Did you tell Mr. Dean you were sick yesterday afternoon? Sick? No, sir. I'd never been sick a day in my life. Mr. Dean said that you told him you were. Wonder how come he said that? He knowed I wasn't sick. Sent me out in the field with the mule, told me to pull stumps. And you went out there? Yes, sir. I was out there all afternoon. Come in toward evening. Mr. Dean with you? No, sir. He stayed in to the house. Say, Miss Dean, she don't feel so good. She didn't sound like she was sick, though. How do you mean? I come up to the house after lunch to find out what I got to do the rest of the day. I hear Miss Dean talking pretty loud to Mr. Dean. Could you hear what she was saying? No, sir. I don't listen much no more. Miss Dean, she always speaks right sharp to Mr. Dean. Yes. Uh-huh. Eli, when did you see Mr. Dean last? When he come to my shack after I come in from the field. Well, why did he come to see you? Because Miss Dean was dead. Mr. Dean say I done it. He wouldn't listen to nothing. I didn't kill Miss Dean. I swear I didn't. Did anybody else see you out in the field yesterday afternoon? Well, no, sir. Don't reckon nobody did. Eli, were you working all afternoon? Yes, sir. I was working the whole... No, sir, I forgot. I quit one once. What for? I stopped to kill me a rattler. You what? There was a big rattler curled up in the sun next to a stump. I didn't see him till the mule squealed. Then I picked up a rock and let fly. Killed him right off. Did you leave the snake line where you killed him? Yes, sir. I got no use for no rattler dead or alive. Eli, this is important. I want you to tell me exactly where you killed that rattlesnake. Well, sir, it was someplace in Mr. Dean's north field. But so much happened since yesterday, I don't recollect just where. Reckon we'll have to stage our own private snake hunt. Uh Uh-huh. Some folks say it's bad luck to kill a rattler, Mr. Ranger. Appears like mine's already started. Don't worry, Eli. Killing that rattler might bring you more good luck than anything you ever did. found the dead rattler where Eli said he'd killed it, in Dean's North Field. We took the remains of the snake with us, figuring our lab could tell us approximately how long it had been dead. Then we decided to call our hand with Dean, but he wasn't home. We headed for town. It was 5.20 when we pulled up in front of the sheriff's office. He was standing outside. I could tell something was wrong even before he reached the car. Chase, Clay, I was just going to call your headquarters and have them get you fellows on the radio. What's wrong? Somebody just broke in the jail. They took Eli away. Holy... Who was it, Sheriff? That's just it, Jace. I don't know. I'd swear it was Ralph Dean and his bunch, but I don't know. Well, how'd it happen? Well, everything was quiet. There wasn't even nothing you could feel in town like you sometimes can. I went home for supper and left my deputy here. They broke in then? Yep. Got my deputy just as he was coming down from taking Eli's supper. Slugged him and got the keys. He didn't even get a look at him. I never should have left. Uh, you couldn't have known. The thing we've got to do yeah. now is uh, somebody awfully excited about something. Why, Ernie Matthews. Sure. I've been trying to call him. Well, what is it, Ernie? Let me catch my brother's safe. That boy had not jail. Yeah, what about him? They got him. Who? Scum, nothing but scum. Ralph Dean, the rest of his crowd. They're crazy, Sheriff Plum, crazy. Where were they heading? I don't know. I was out cutting wood back in my place, saw him riding past, got the boy. They're crazy. Are they going away from town past your place? Yeah, yeah. Probably Graham Woods, Jason. Come on, Sheriff. Show us where it is. The Sheriff drove ahead and we followed. 
When we got as far as we could by road, we unloaded the horses, and the sheriff pointed out Graham Woods. Clay and I started out. Five minutes later, we were entering the woods. It was just getting dark as we picked up the trail. Tracks seem to lead right into the woods, Jason. Yeah. Hope we're not too late. At least we won't have any trouble getting the ones who did it. That's not enough. We've got to save that boy's life. Oh! Jase. Over there, to the left. Yeah. Get up. Come on. We ride in as close as we can, then make the rest of it on foot. Wouldn't it be faster if we went all the way on horses? Yeah. But if they hear us coming, they'll kill Eli and take off before we get there. They're probably too busy to hear anything. They won't take the chance. This will have to be close enough. Whoa. Whoa, Whoa, Jack. Whoa. Whoa. Flashlight. Go easy, Clay. Yeah. Please listen to me. I didn't kill me, Pete. You gotta listen to me. All right, she's like the boys want you to have your last day, Eli. All right? Go ahead. those guns. That's better. Now all of you stay where you are. Untie Eli Clay. Get him down off that horse. Right. All right, Ranger. You stopped us. What for? He's gonna die anyhow. He never had a chance to prove his innocence, Dean. He's a murderer, ain't he? He killed my wife. I'm not so sure of that. You found his coat in Ethel's hands. What more do you want? It could be Eli didn't leave that coat. What are you talking about, Ranger? Let me see your hands, Dean. What for? Let me see them. No, the backs. How'd you get those bruises on your knuckles? Well, uh, they're from pulling stumps yesterday. You sure they didn't get bruised from beating up Eli? You're crazy. I never beat him up. Maybe you waited till Eli came in from work, accused him of killing your wife, beat him up and let him get away so you could get your gang of hoodlums after him. Uh, that's he... a lie. I never seen Eli. I was working in the fields all afternoon. Alone. Eli says he was the only one working in the field That's yesterday. True. Oh, That's he does, eh? Well, whose word are you going to take? Mine? Wait a minute, Dean. We might be able to prove Eli was in the fields. Oh. He said he killed a rattlesnake. We found it where he said it would be. If our lab says it was killed yesterday afternoon, it's pretty good proof. You trying to railroad me? You know better than that. But you got to prove where you were yesterday afternoon. What I got to prove anything for? Because if you don't, you got a murder charge against you for killing your wife. You hear that, boys? You're going to stand here and let him take sides against us? No. The only side I'm taking is the law of Texas. Come on. You're going back to town. I ain't going nowhere. I said, come on. You ain't taking me. No. Get up, Dean. All right, the rest of you. Come on, stop moving. Go. Get up. Hey. You're going to get something you tried to keep Eli from having. A fair trial. Go on. Eli? Yes, sir? You walk with me. Yes, sir. In just a moment, we will tell you the results of the case you have just heard. There's fine entertainment every day right here on the NBC Radio Network. Monday through Friday, you'll find interesting daytime programs on this station, too. There's fun with Walter O'Keefe as he quizzes his contestants on Double or Nothing. Listen, and you'll find this one of the funniest programs on the air. And make it a note to hear the program of the heart, Strike Strike It Rich. You'll hear people from all over the country on Strike It Rich and on Welcome Travelers, too. Maybe your neighbors will be the next guests on these fine programs, so keep listening every day Monday through Friday on NBC. In the Mad and Merry department, we bring you the Ralph Edwards Show on most NBC stations. Listen as Ralph plays Truth or Consequences with his contestants and brings you enjoyable listening. And Dave Garraway brings you 15 minutes of music and humor each weekday. It's all for fun and fun for all when you tune to NBC Daytime Radio. So make it a day to brighten your household chores with the fine program sent your way every day on this station of the NBC Radio Network. And now, back to Tales of the Texas Rangers. (laughs) 
And now, here are the results of the case you have just heard. Laboratory investigation of the rattlesnake upheld Eli Wilder's story. Faced with this and other evidence, Ralph Dean confessed to killing his wife after a violent quarrel over money. The seven men who assisted in the attempted lynching were tried before a jury of citizens of their own county and given prescribed jail terms. Dean, convicted of murder, was sentenced to life imprisonment at Huntsville. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Cast included Tony Barrett, Vivian Baber, Bob Davis, Parley Bear, Herb Ellis, and Bill Johnstone. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Charles E. Israel, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Next, the big show brings you drama, comedy, and music on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, conspiracy. It is 2 p.m. the afternoon of October 17, 1926. Captain Clint Stinson of Texas Ranger Company B is seated in his office. Across the desk from him sits a woman sobbing bitterly. <laughs> they killed him, I tell you. They shot him down in cold blood the way they shoot a dog. <laughs> now, get a grip on yourself, Mrs. Wendell. Oh, help me. Please help me. Ed was a good man. Our baby's only seven months old. Now Ed is dead, and the man who killed him is walking the streets of Crescent as though nothing happened. Crescenta? Yes, in Ames County. That's where I came from. I see. Some pretty funny things have been happening in Ames County. Who was the man who killed your husband? A man named Ray Thorpe. It happened four days ago. But he wasn't even arrested. The grand jury said that according to the evidence, he killed Ed in self-defense. Any witnesses testified to that? Yes, three of them. But they were lying. They were lying. My Ed never carried a gun in his life. Are you sure of that? A wife doesn't always know. I knew. Why can't you help me? What kind of a world am I living in? What kind of a world am I bringing my baby up in when his father could be killed without anybody even lifting a hand? <laughs> now, now, just take it easy, Mrs. Wendell, please. Yes, Captain? Get me a sheriff porch at Crescenta in Ames County. Yes, sir. What are you calling him for? I want to help you, Mrs. Wendell. If there's anything that calls for help. You won't get the truth from Sheriff Porch. You said yourself that funny things are happening in Ames County. Funny things are liable to happen in any county where there's a big oil strike. <laughs> Drifters and floaters crowd in. You can't always condemn a sheriff for what happens. <laughs> you mean it's just too bad if a man gets murdered. I didn't say that, ma'am. Yes? Sheriff Porch, Captain. Go ahead. Hello. Hello, Captain Stinson. How are you? Fine, Sheriff. I'd like a little information. Sure thing. What about? Man named Ed Wendell. 
shot and killed in Crescenta by a man called Ray Thorpe. Well, ain't much I can tell you, Captain. Thorpe killed Wendell in self-defense. Wendell's always been, well, sort of a hothead, troublemaker. Started a fight with Thorpe and pulled a gun on him. Thorpe had to kill him to save his own hide. I understand there were witnesses. There sure were, three of them. And one of the three was my deputy. Open and shut case. I see. Well, thanks, Sheriff. Just checking. Uh, what brought the case to your mind? Uh, you have, uh, some sort of a complaint? Wendell's wife thinks he was murdered in cold blood. Well, Captain, you know women. Can't believe anything wrong about the men, folks. That happens. Thanks, Sheriff. Anytime. Goodbye. Goodbye. You don't have to say anything. I know what he told you. Mrs. Wendell, I'm sorry, but there's nothing much I can do. He left the house smiling, waving to the baby. And he never came back. And they wouldn't even let me see him again after he was killed. What's that? <laughs> Mrs. Wendell, are you telling me that you never saw your husband's body after he was dead? No, they wouldn't let me. They said it was a law because of the way he got killed. There's no law like that. Are you sure you're telling me the truth? Why would I lie to you? You never saw the body. No, I tell you, they buried him in the county cemetery the day after he was killed. Do you know if an autopsy was performed? I don't know. I see. Mrs. Wendell, if I can get an order to have your husband's body exhumed, will you give your permission? Yes, but... Oh, they won't let you do it. They're not going to know it's being done. Yes, Captain? Put out a call for Jace Pearson. Tell him to report to me immediately. And bring Steve Clark in, too. Then get me headquarters at Austin. By late afternoon, Captain Stinson had a magistrate's authorization to exhume the body of Ed Wendell. Later the same night, Texas Rangers Jace Pearson and Steve Clark, accompanied by a medical examiner and Mrs. Wendell, were at the Ames County Cemetery, three miles from the county seat at Crescenta. Box lid is almost clear, Jace. All right, Steve, hold it. See if we can get the top off now. Want to flash that light down here, Doc? Oh, yeah, sure, Jace. Mrs. Wendell. Yes? Maybe you better go wait in the car, ma'am. No, I'm all right. She'll have to identify the body anyhow, Jace. I guess you're right. All right, Steve, let's get the cover off. Right. Yeah, that's got it. Just lift it up over the edge of the hole. Yeah. Uh, the body's completely covered with a sheet. Yeah. We'll lift it out to you. I got this in. All right, lift. Yeah. Uh, uh, I can get a hold now. Yeah, I'll help you. Uh, all right, that does it. Boost me, Jason, and I'll pull you up. Right. All right, now grab my wrist. Got it. Hey, we'll have to replace the cover and shovel the grave in again. We can do that as soon as Mrs. Wendell identifies the body. I hate to ask you like this, ma'am. It's all right. I know he's dead. What can it matter? Uh, Jace, you got a pocket knife. Have to slit this sheet. Yeah, here, Doc. Yeah. Well, Mrs. Wendell? Yes. (laughs) Don't look anymore, ma'am. Better take it to the car, Steve. Come on, ma'am. There's nothing more you can do. Just a sheet on him. Didn't even bury him with his clothes. It wasn't even embalmed. There's something strange here, Jace. Here. Let me roll the body over. Pull that sheet down further. Sure. No marks in the head and the chest. Uh, here. Here's what we're looking for. Yeah. This man was shot, all right. Shot in the back. The medical examiner took the body into the funeral parlor, and Steve Clark took Mrs. Wendell home. It was after 2 a.m., but what I had to do couldn't wait. I located the home of the county attorney, Lou Morrison, a ranch about 10 miles out of Crescenta. I got him out of bed. Oh, what's on your mind this time of night, Ranger? Official business. Seems to me you could have waited and come to the courthouse in town in the morning. A few men I'm after might be disappearing from town by morning. I had to wake you up. I need some warrants. Warrants? Is somebody in Crescenta? Yeah. The first one for a man named Ray Thorpe. 
On what charges? The murder of Ed Wendell. Thorpe killed Wendell in self-defense. He's already been exonerated by the grand jury. Look, Mr. Morrison, I've just come from the cemetery. We exhumed Wendell's body. The body can't be exhumed without an order? We had an order from a magistrate at the other end of the county. And Wendell's body proves Thorpe couldn't have killed him in self-defense because Wendell was shot in the back. That's impossible. Did you see the body before he was buried? Well, no, I didn't. But, but there were witnesses. The witnesses lied. Mr. Morrison, I want a murder warrant for Ray Thorpe. All right, Ranger. You seem to have some evidence. I can go into my office and write them up. We can get Judge Padgett to sign them. Thanks. I'll have to dress. You, uh, said that you... You wanted several warrants. That's right. Three more beside Thorpe's. For who? For the witnesses who claimed that Thorpe shot in self-defense. On what charge? That's a funny question from a county attorney. A charge of perjury before the grand jury. I got the warrants, but Morrison's attitude told me they weren't going to be easy to serve. I'd arranged to meet Steve Clark at an all-night cafe in Crescenta. He was waiting there. Get the warrants? Yeah. Chase, there's something funny about this town. It smells to high heaven. And say that again. There's more to this than just a murder. The county attorney didn't want to cooperate. And one of Thorpe's witnesses is a deputy sheriff. Yeah, it looks like the law is trying to cover Wendell's death. And I think I found out why. Yeah. Mrs. Wendell spilled it when I was taking her home. Said that her husband was planning on having some kind of a meeting at his house on the night of the day that he was killed. She say what kind of a meeting? Yeah, it's about the county elections coming up next month. What about him? Uh, Sheriff Porch and County Attorney Morrison are both running for re-election, but nobody's running against them. Both unopposed candidates? Yeah, that's why Wendell called a meeting. He didn't like it. He was fixing to stir the town up for a writing vote. How come Mrs. Wendell didn't mention that before? I guess it didn't seem to have any connection with her husband getting killed by Thorpe. You finished with your coffee? Yeah. Well, let's get those warrants served. This town's going to get awful hot. Thorpe works on a ranch out beyond the oil fields. I'll go out there and pick him up while you... Hit the ground, Steve! Where'd it come from? Caught a flash from the corner across the street. There's something moving in the shadows there. Let him have it! He's, he's mounted, Jace! He cut through the alley. The field's behind town. Can't get a shot at him now. Come on, let's get our horses out of the trailer. Right. Keep back, everybody. Keep, Keep back. back. Come on, Sharky. Come on, Come on, Come on, Come on. Get up! Get up! Get up! Ah. There he is, Jace, topping the rise. Not gonna go far. His horse is breaking stride. Looks like he's gone lame. Yeah, must have picked up a stone. He'll have to leave him soon. He's out of sight now. Be careful after we cross the rim. He may run on foot and keep going, or he may drop into cover and try and pick us off. Anyway, he wants to play. It's all right with me. Okay, here's the top of the rise. Hunch low in your saddle. There's his horse, Chase. No rider. Yeah, he's dismounted. Pull up fast and drop. Whoa, whoa, Chase. Whoa, Longhorn. He's in that clump of mesquite. Yeah, I know it. Keep flat. The moon touches the top of that brush beside you. Reach over and nudge it. Draw fire. Right. You get him? I don't know. The skeet seems bent over like there's some weight on part of it. Crawl toward it. Keep your gun ready. Better stay a few feet apart. No sign of movement. We'll know in a minute. I can see a boot sticking out of the mesquite. Must be laying out flat. He's hit all right. We can get up. No more trouble with him, Jason. Right between the eyes. (laughs) Some shot for hitting a man you couldn't see. I knew he was firing a rifle. He had to be drawn a sight, so I just fired a little above and to the right of the flash. Wonder who he is. We'll find that out later. Better get his horse. We'll have to lead him back. Yeah. Easy, boy. Easy now. Come on, we'll fix where it hurts. Turn him a little, Steve. Let the moon hit this side of his saddle. Yeah. Around, boy. What do you see? A couple of letters burned into the leather. Yeah, look like initials. Hey, R.T. Yeah. R.T. I guess we can tear up that warrant for Ray Thorpe.
listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Conspiracy, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. It was sunup when we got back to the main street of Crescenta. The town was waking up for the day, and shopkeepers and morning crews headed for work in the oil fields followed us to the funeral home. I was unstrapping Thorpe's body from my saddle when Sheriff Porch came through the crowd. Let me through here. Let me through. Well, howdy, Rangers. Howdy. Hello, Sheriff. Uh, see, you got Thorpe all right. About time somebody got him. Yeah, I know. County attorney told me what you found out. Could have knocked me over with a feather. I'll bet. All right, Steve, grab his feet and let's carry him in. Right. Uh, I'll get the door for you. Put him down there. All right. Sure is heavy. He tried to fight it out, huh? Tried to ambush us, you mean. And somebody better explain how he knew we were after him. Reckon you can blame me for that, Ranger. What do you mean by that? County attorney called me right after Judge Padgett signed your warrants for you. I knew where Thorpe was hanging out when the hot spots outside the town. Thought I'd go out and pick him up for you. When I told him you was after him, he sort of caught me off balance in Bolden. Kind of convenient, Sheriff. Especially since you let him out once before. After he'd shot a man in the back. I didn't know that. I never looked at Wendell's body. I, well, I was home, sick. My deputy handled the case. Same deputy that said Thorpe shot in self-defense? Yeah, same one, Joe Slade. I got a warrant for him, too. I know. That's why I got him locked up in a jail right now. You're getting mighty cooperative, Sheriff. Well, Slade was right with me when I heard you wanted him. I know my job. I'm trying to help you. How about the other two witnesses Thorpe had? Rollo Kane and Arthur Sampson. I still got warrants for them. You'll find them out in the oil field, I reckon. They got two operating wells and they're drilling a third. Just past the old stockade north of town. You'll need horses. The road's too muddy for a car. I'll ride out with you. Thanks, but we can handle it. You need a rest. You've been working too hard. They're not drilling, Jace. They're just pulling the drill stem out of the hole. Yeah, probably jumped a pin on the bit. Funny thing, Kane and Samson being mixed up in this Wendell killing. You think a couple of oil men with producing wells would be on the side of the law? Something behind this we haven't hit yet, Steve. Man by the tool shed's watching us. Oh, yeah. Doesn't seem to be doing much work. Maybe he's one of our boys. Won't take long to find out. Be able to ask him in a second. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. Whoa, boy. Whoa, 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 whoa. Howdy, Rangers. Howdy. Hello. I'd like to talk to you for a minute. Mind telling your crew to knock off? Sure thing. Hold it, boys. Cut far. Now, oh, what's on your mind? What's your name? Kane. Rollo Kane. Arthur Sampson around? That's him. Up on top of the dirt, greasing the crown shift. What's the matter down there, Rollo? Tell him to come on down. All uh-huh. right. Rangers want you to come down. Uh, uh, send a hook up for me. Uh, just a second. Look. What's this all about? I got warrants for you and your partner. Oh? What for? Perjury before the county grand jury. <laughs> you must have the wrong names, Range. I never testified for a grand jury. Who are you trying to kid, mister? Records will show whether you did or not. So if you didn't, you got nothing to worry about. Now get your partner down here. All right. All right, boys. Send a hook up. Look, you uh, mind if I get my coat right there in the two shed. Go ahead. I can watch you. All right, thanks. Get out, Jake! Oh. Cut that power! Hey, drive clamps fell from the top of the derrick. Yeah. Hit right where we were standing. Thanks for the push. Yeah. Hey, you, you heard, Rangers? That come close to being nasty accident. It came close to being nasty, but I don't think it was close to being an accident. What do you mean? You know what I mean, Kane. Pretty convenient time for you to step into that tool shed. Oh, I'm just lucky, Ranger. Starting right now, your luck's running out. All right, Samson, you can climb down. I'm sorry that happened, Ranger. I just knocked it off, reaching for that hook. If anything else falls from that, Derek, you're going to come with it. Oh, come on now, climb down. All right, climb down. No, man can't be too careful if he wants to live, Ranger. These oil fields can be dangerous. There's something else can be dangerous too, Kane. Something you're going to find out about. Yeah? What's that? Breaking the law in the state of Texas. We herded Kane and Sampson back to Crescenta and marched him into the jail. 
All right, boys, step in. Go ahead now. See you right to the cell. Uh, you know the law, Ranger. Got to check your guns here in the office if you come inside the cell block gate. Unbuckle them and hang them in the cabinet. All right. I want to talk to your deputy, Joe Slade, anyhow. Steve, you better take care of the horses. Right, well to meet you. Uh, we can eat at the cafe in about an hour. Okay, Chase, I'll see you later. All right, Sheriff. Go on, Kane, move. You too, Samson. All right, we'll move. You know, you're not going to keep us here long, Ranger. We'll see. Your charge won't stand up. Into the tank with Slade. Was wondering when I was going to get company, Sheriff. If I knew you wouldn't let your star deputy die lonesome. Shut up, Joe. Get out of the gateway and let these men in, Slade. Well, sure, Ranger. Sure, come in, fella. I want to talk to you, Slade. Why, sure. You're Jace Pearson, ain't you? You got a reputation for being pretty good at the gun. I'm still alive. Why did you lie to the grand jury? Me? Well, you got the wrong boy, Ranger. Oh, it's my office phone. Are you going to give me the same story I got from your two pals? That's right, Ranger. Same stuff. Sure. Slade never appeared before the grand jury either. It's all your imagination, Ranger. If the three of you have one brain to go around, you'll tell the truth. You're not in here without evidence. The grand jury records are being subpoenaed. Listen to the man, fellas. He knows all about the law. You're in for a few surprises, Ranger. A few big surprises. Seeing the three of you sent to Huntsville isn't going to be a surprise to me. A Ranger. Yes, yeah, Sheriff. What? Oh, I see you got a gun, Sheriff. You're not supposed to bring a gun past the cell block gate either. It won't do no harm. You don't make me use it. You see, Ranger? Surprises, like I said. Back away from that cell gate, Ranger. All right. Now you get in there with him. What's the idea? You're under arrest, board or the county attorney. For what? For the murder of Ray Thorpe. The sheriff was showing his colors openly now. He was part and parcel of all that was crooked in Ames County. I was dumped into a cell with three men who would gladly kill me if I gave him the chance. Don't stay off in the corner by yourself, Ranger. That's far enough, Slade. I'm keeping this side of the cell for myself. Don't come past the middle, any of you. Who's going to stop us? Sheriff is gone for the day. Yeah, and since I'm in here, thanks to you, there ain't nobody on guard. I didn't come to this town alone, you know. If you're counting on help from that other Ranger, don't get too happy about it. Probably somebody breathing down his neck right now, just like we're breathing down yours. Be too bad if you got to brooding about the way you killed Thorpe. Sheriff forgot to take your belt away, you might hang yourself. If you got real broken up. Sure. I might even stab myself with this. Hey, he's got a knife. Lousy pocket knife. You think you're going to scare three of us with that? No, not three of you. But I'm figuring it's good enough to scare one of you. The one who comes at me first. You better get together and figure out which one of you it's going to be. Because he's the one who's going to get killed before I do. I didn't dare sleep. I had to watch every move they made. There was no sign of Steve Clark. In the morning, the sheriff came in. He took Kane, Samson, and Slade out for the arraignment before the judge. When he came back, he didn't bring him back with him. Here's some food for you. Stop playing, Sheriff. You know I'm not going to eat anything you give me. Suit yourself. You may be here a long time. Longer than most of your prisoners stay. What happened to him? If it's any of your business, Judge Paget released him. No evidence. You call grand jury records no evidence? Seems like the grand jury records have been misplaced. I suppose the county attorney took care of that. This town's going to come down around your ears, Sheriff. You can't... What's that? Maybe what I've been expecting... What happened to Steve Clark? Well, how, how should I know? You mean you don't know whether your men got him or not? Well, you couldn't have gotten away. Watch your hurry, Sheriff. All right, now, keep your hands away from that gun cabinet, Sheriff. Captain Spencer. Jace! I'm all right, Steve. Have you out in a minute, Jace. Take the keys, Steve. You can't let him out. He's my prisoner. We've got a rick for him. And to keep the record straight, Sheriff, you're mine. I don't see Howdy, him. boy. Glad to see you, Steve. I was afraid you caught one in the back. Ah, uh, no, not quite. They tried to take me after I left here, but I got away on Longhorn and outrun them. Had to ride cross country most of the night to get to a phone. Let's go. We got a lot to clean up. Yeah. 
Captain's got a lot of information on what there is to clean up. Yeah, I sure have. Things that Porch could have told you, Jace. Porch is a rich man, aren't you, Porch? Well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about bank accounts all over the state. Big, fat accounts belonging to you and to County Attorney Morrison and Judge Paget. I've been checking on you for two days. You can't prove nothing wrong about that. Yes, we can, Sheriff. We've just come from the courthouse. Your friends didn't have time to burn all the records. You're getting a little pale, Sheriff. It was just business, that's all. Nice business. You and others like you forming a combine to rob the people of this county. We can convict you on 50 conspiracy counts, along with complicity in Wendell's murder. Killing Wendell wasn't my idea. Morrison ordered it when Wendell started to raise a fuss about the administration. That's all I wanted to hear. Jace, you and Steve go after Morrison. He's not in town. Must be at his ranch. What about the others? Well, we had a shooting match with Samson and Kane as we left the courthouse. They were making a run in the car. Some of our boys took him to the hospital for patching up. Uh, how about Joe Slade? No trace of him, but I got a hunch we'll find him with Morrison. Morrison's accounts show Slade's on his payroll, probably burning more papers out at the ranch. Let's go. <laughs> On the ride to County Attorney Morrison's ranch, Steve Clark gave me the insight on the gigantic racket that had been working in Ames County. Yeah, Jace, Catton dug it all up. When the oil strike came, Morrison's crowd bought up county land at auction, but no auctions were actually held. Of course, Morrison and his pals didn't take the land in their own names. They turned it over to men like Kane and Samson, strong-arm boys who'd give them a kickback. But there must have been some of the townsmen known what was going on. Uh, sure they did, but they were scared stiff. Didn't always take force to do it either. How can you fight a crook when he's in control of the law you had to fight him with? A couple of men who wanted to run for office were beaten out of the idea. That's why Morrison and Porch had no opposition. There's Morrison's ranch up ahead. Yeah, I see it. Hey, Jace, look. There's a car coming down the ranch road. Really raising dust, too. Step on it. Block them off the intersection before they get on this highway. We'll beat them to it, all right. Hey, they spotted us. Car's turning. And we're almost the ranch road. Keep low. You get cut, Jace? No. Get their tires when I turn in after them. Yeah. Good shot. Hey, they turn turtle. Come on. Out. Look out, Steve. That slave breaking for the trees. I'll get him. You dig Morrison out of the wreck. Right. You miss, Slade. I won't miss again. You're going to have to step out and take better aim than that. I got Morrison, Jace. You're up, Slade. We'll lick. You better listen to him, Slade. Huh? All right, Ranger. Guess it'd be crazy to shoot it off. I'm coming. I'm dropping my gun. Both hands up. Get that arm from behind your back. I can. I hurt my arm and my back when the car turns. Watch him, Jake! Oh! Come on, Morrison. Uh, still had one rattlesnake trick left, didn't he? Yeah. His last one. We'll send somebody out for his body. All right, Morrison, let's get back to town. My company should have all your friends rounded up by now, including that phony grand jury you stacked. You won't keep us long. I wouldn't bet on that, Morrison. You won't be handling the prosecution this time, and the judge won't be one of your partners. Get moving, mister. You've got a long way to go. James County conspiracy was smashed and 12 key men were convicted and sentenced to jail terms ranging from 10 to 50 years. Since then, Ames County has become a model American community. And now here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. Texans are mighty proud of their state, and the story that best illustrates that pride has made the rounds for many years. It was started by an old Texas ranger whose son was going off to war. In parting, the ranger gave him this advice. Son, you're going to be with fellows from all over the world. There's one thing you must never do. Never ask a man where he's from. If he's from Texas, he'll tell you. And if he isn't, don't embarrass him by asking. Good night, folks. See you next week. <laughs> Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel 
McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Lillian Viaf, Herb Ellis, Ken Christie, Byron Kane, Tom McKee, Lamont Johnson, and Herb Vigran. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Mercott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Tomorrow evening, Gordon McRae sings for you as the Railroad Hour presents a melodic adaptation of One Touch of Venus. Gordon's guest for tomorrow's Railroad Hour production is Ginny Sims. The Telephone Hour tomorrow brings you celebrated contralto Marian Anderson as featured artist. Miss Anderson will offer a group of spirituals and operatic selections accompanied by Donald Voorhees and the orchestra. Phil Baker asks the $64 question next on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Deadhead Freight. It is shortly before midnight, August 27, 1938, at the Santa Fe Freight Yards in Lubbock, Texas. A deadhead freight hauling empties back to the west coast from Galveston has just pulled into the yard. The brakeman and a railroad detective are making a routine check of the cars for free-riding hobos. If I was a yard dick, I'd be snoozing in the roundhouse. You ain't found a free rider in months. Yeah, so what? I get paid to check and I check. Oh, you know, bows on the freights always hop off before we pull into the yards. You ever think one of them might fall asleep in a car and not have anybody to wake him up? Well, could be. Yeah, flash your light in this one. Okay. Hey, see? Nobody. Mm. Now, the car up ahead is the last of the boxcars. I walked the flats and gondolas while we was rolling, so I know that they're clear. Hey, hey, why's the door rolled shut on this one? Well, I don't know now. It shouldn't be. Now, let's get her open. And throw your light around. Yeah. Mm. Nobody riding, huh? <laughs> Come on. All right, Bo, on your feet. And throw that light right on him. Yeah. Well, no wonder it didn't move just an old duffel bag. Yeah. Uh, what's a duffel bag doing on a deadhead freight? Hey, there's something in it, huh? Hey, hey, come here. Feel this. All right. Feels like a body. Hey, you got a knife on you? Yeah, here. That's a good thing we didn't pass this car. The top of the bag sewed up tight. I'll have to cut right through the side. Yeah, it's a young woman. Yeah, stabbed to death. And throw that light around the car. Well, what are you looking for? There's no blood any place. She wasn't killed on the train. Somebody must have loaded the body on to get rid of it. Yeah, so the murder can't be pinned down to any definite area. It, where'd you stop last, before you pulled in here? A siding west of Sweetwater? The body must have been put on some place between there and Galveston, then. We better call the police. Eh? They can notify the Texas Rangers. After a brief but penetrating study of the situation, Ranger Captain Stinson had the body removed to a Lubbock funeral parlor. He then requested Texas Ranger Jace Pearson to take over the case. 
Well, there it is, Jace. Pretty brutal job of stabbing. You figure it happened a good piece from here, huh? Couple of reasons for that. Here's a map. Shows the route the freight train took. Spot circled in red shows where it made stops. And at what time. I see. No stops after it left the siding outside Sweetwater, huh? Right. And most of the stops were made much further east. Hmm. Well, according to the time of these stops, body must have been loaded on the train between Presby here and Turner City here. Well, how do you arrive at that? Train made all its night stops between these points. Isn't likely the killer loaded the body on by daylight. Too much chance of being spotted by the train crew. Well, that's good reasoning, Jace. You may be right. You said the body was sewed up in a duffel bag. Yeah. You better look at it before I send it on to the lab. Mm. I have the undertaker lock it in this cabinet and give me the key. Yeah, here it is. Regular opening at the top of the bag is sewed up tight. The draw cord is missing. See? Uh Uh-huh. Good thing the man who found the body cut into the bag instead of ripping out those new stitches. Yeah, I see what you mean. Kind of funny stitching. It may have been made by somebody with a special trade where that kind of stitching's used. Lab gets a look at it, may be able to tell us what trade. Well, I hope so. The bag itself won't help much, I'm afraid. Uh, probably picked up in war surplus. Could belong to anybody. Hey, look at this. The bottom of the bag. It's kind of soiled. Whoever carted it around with a body in it must have set it on the ground to rest. He sure did. On reddish brown earth. Blood seepage made some of it stick. Let's have a look at that train map again. I think that earth stain kind of narrows down our search, Captain. Oh? How come? I know the country that train passed at night. I've been over it plenty. Only place I've seen earth that color is right around this area and a few stream beds. Cotton Belt runs parallel to the railroad for about 40 miles through there. Well, I've seen all I want to see, unless you have something else. Nope. Let's go. I'll get this bag off to Austin. Body going to be held here for identification? Yeah. If she isn't identified, we'll see if we can run down something by her clothes. Any laundry marks or anything on them? Afraid not, Jace. Homemade and home laundered. No dental work to help us either. And her fingerprints aren't on the file. I have a man check on the shoes she was wearing. They weren't homemade. Yeah, we'll try it. You got any ideas about what you're going to do? If it's all right with you, I'd like to take a crack at that cotton belt area. Tow charcoal down on the horse trailer and then ride parallel to the railroad tracks and see what I can find. Well, that's a lot of territory. How about Steve Clark riding with you? Good deal. We get anything from the lab, I'll let you know. I'll radio Clark and assign him. Then you can pick him up on the way. Good luck, Chase. Thanks, Captain. You'll hear from me. Clark. We drove down to the beginning of the area I wanted to check, left the car, and used our horses for the long ride along the rail bed. By noon of the next day, we'd covered 15 miles. Horses are getting tired, Jase. I know. But there's a siding a little ways ahead. Freight stopped there. Yeah. Look, another covered coming up. Yeah. Uh, bank's pretty steep. Watch your horse. All right. Careful, boy. Easy, charcoal. Careful. Easy. Steep climb out of here, Jase. Maybe if we ride... Hey, what are you looking at? Oh, the ground, huh? Yeah. Same reddish-brown color we've been checking for. Well, don't see anything else, though. Want to ride through it a ways? Yeah. Come on, Charcoal. Oh, boy. I don't want to be a killjoy, Jace, but we've done this in a dozen creek beds. Yeah, but none of the others were as close to a train stop. Siding's only about 50 yards further up the... Ooh, ooh, Charcoal. Ooh, boy. Ooh. Find something, Jace? Yeah. Come here. Well, what is it? Yeah, marks in the sand. Trace of a couple of footprints, not enough to make a cast, but look at this other mark. A round impression. Yeah, what made it? Might have been somebody setting that duffel bag down. Yeah, well, that would account for the dirt you found on the bag. We'll find out. Get a glass jar from your saddle pack, will Okay, you? gonna cut a core around that mark? Yeah, lab contested for blood trace. Earth this color, we can't tell anything by sight. Well, here's the jar. Thanks. A few empty cans around here, Jace. Those marks might have been made by a hobo. I don't think so. Bindle stiffs travel light. They don't carry duffel bags. And what's the nearest town to here? Uh, Bullville, about a mile further on. Well, let's get there. We can phone for a highway patrol car, and they can drive you back and pick up our car. All right. You going to check around Bullville? With a fine-tooth comb. 
cotton crop around Bullville was good, too good. Migratory pickers were jamming the town. I had photos of the dead girl and tried to find somebody who might have seen her. No, no, Ranger. Never saw her around the gin here. Town's full up, though. It's possible one of the pickers saw her someplace. You know anybody who comes in contact with a lot of the pickers? No, no. Afraid you have to tackle them crew by crew. That's what I was trying to avoid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Must be a couple of thousand migratories around. You mind if I ask your man at the weighing platform to check with the haulers when they bring cotton in for ginning? No, it's all right with me. Thanks. Oh, uh, uh, Ranger, yeah. hold it a second. Uh, just happened to think. There is somebody who gets to see a lot of the pickers. Who? A Mexican woman. Name's Old Rosie. Drives a junky old truck around peddling soda pop in the fields. You know where I can locate her? Yeah, haulers give you lift out to the fields. And somebody will steer you out to her. <laughs> Everybody knows old Rosie. Somebody killed that poor girl, huh? That's right, Rosie. You ever see her? You find who killed her, you're going to put him in a jail? That's my job. How about it? You ever seen her around here? She, one time. Where? At the bus station in the town. She was with a man. You know who the man was? No, senor. Why'd you hesitate? Is that the truth? Why should I tell a lie, senor? I don't know who the man was. She described the man, a vague, stumbling description that might fit anybody. And while she described him, I had a feeling she was lying. A feeling that was strengthened by a faint odor of whiskey coming from the truck. Whatever business Rosie was in, it wasn't limited to the sale of soft drinks. I pretended to swallow her story, then I got a lift back to town where Steve Clark was waiting with our car. Better hop in, Jase. Just had a call from Austin. Yeah, they checked the earth sample we sent in in the jar. Yeah, blood trace, all right. Same type as the victims. They got a line on a few other things, too. The shoes on the dead girl have been traced through the manufacturer to a store in Sheffield. Here, I wrote down the name of the store and the address. We better get over there and see if we can establish identity. Yeah, shoes will be waiting at the Sheffield airport. It isn't likely that a shoe clerk is going to remember who he sold them to, though. I saw the shoes. They've been repaired recently. Whoever fixed them might remember. Well, that's a chance. Any information on that duffel bag? Uh, yeah, a lab ties it in with a seaman. How? Oh. Well, stitches used to sew up the bag are the kind seaman used to mend a torn sail. Hmm. Chase, you look like that throws you. It does, a little. I was beginning to have a sneaking suspicion about an old Mexican woman. But she's no seaman. <laughs> what made you suspect her? She said she saw the dead girl with a man. She gave me kind of a phony description. Not only that, but she's supposed to be selling soft drinks to the field hands from an old truck. It reeked of liquor. Oh, bootlegging, huh? Hey, that could mean something. What? Well, a report from Austin mentioned liquor stains on that duffel bag. Naturally, they just figured that a bottle had been broken in the bag at one time or another, but... Yeah, but it could be something else, too. Yeah? That bag might have been used for hauling moonshine. Stop the car. Hey, Jace, what's the matter? Slide out. I'm going to Sheffield alone. You stay here. Okay, Jace. What do you want me to work on? Tail old Rosie, the Mexican woman, while I'm gone. Check on any special contacts she makes. Whoever she sees, find out who they are. See if you can run down any who've worked as seamen. I burned up the road to Sheffield. The clerk who'd sold the shoes couldn't help, but I got the information I was after in a repair shop. My show, show, I fix it is, all right? Look, here's who I sold the broken strap, you see? Uh, I remember because of something else, too. I never get a pay for the job. Whose shoes are they? Mrs. Watson. She's a live two blocks up at Brownwood House. Mrs. Watson, huh? Is her husband around? Oh, no, no, no. It's a go away a month ago. That's why she got no money for pay for the shoes. I know you bother her. She lived with her mother and a little baby. She's a one-year-old. Any idea where her husband went? Oh, no. Sometimes she says to go away for work or someplace with the cotton. Sometimes to Galveston to work for the boats. Oh, you've been a sailor, huh? Sailor, everything... Whatever he is, is he'll not send the money. Last week, she come in. She says she's going to meet him, and she's going to pay me when she's come back. But she's not come back. Hey, just a minute. Why are you asking me all this thing, eh? And how come you got it, the shoes? Because Mrs. Watson doesn't need him anymore. She's dead. <laughs> You
You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Deadhead Freight, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. It wasn't the kind of news you enjoy breaking to a dead girl's mother, and the girl's baby crying in the next room (laughs) didn't help it any. You see, they'd split up about a month ago. And then last week, her husband wrote to her from Bowville. He said he was sorry and he wanted my daughter, Helen, to come to me. I thought she was there with him. Looks like she was for a while. Oh, he promised Helen everything in the letter. Said he had a lot of money for her and their baby. He was never any good. And now the baby's left to me and I'm just too old. I'm sorry, ma'am. Can you give me your son-in-law's full name and his description? Herbert Watson is his name. They call him Bud. Herbert Bud Watson. (laughs) About how tall would you say he was? You better pull yourself together, ma'am. Somebody's at the door. I'll call out the wind and send him away. I I don't want to see anybody now. What is it, ma'am? What's the matter? Oh, somebody! Open the door! It's him. My son-in-law, Bud. All right, ma'am, open the door and let him in. Go ahead. Well, what took you so long? Where's Helen? You know where she is. What did you do to her? What did you do to my girl? Are you crazy? What's the matter? Let him go, ma'am, and stand back. What? Ranger, what? Get your hands up and turn around. You killed her. And you got the gall to come here with your own baby cry. Ranger, what is this? Kill who? (laughs) Helen. Where's Helen? Where is she? Don't you know, Watson? Or did you think she'd never be identified? Helen's been murdered? Oh, no. No! You did it! You did it! No, no, Mom, no. I I gave her money. Told her to come back home and I'd meet her here today. We was going to take the kid and make a fresh start. How much money did you give your wife? A thousand dollars. That's a lot. Where'd you get it? Come on. Uh, I was bootlegging to the pickers. How long you been getting away with that? Started it last season. Did old Rosie sell any of this stuff for you? Huh? How did you know about that? I didn't for sure until now. Come on. We're going back to your place of business in Bowlville. Hi, Jay. Steve. And I got your message to meet you here. Rosie's over there. Want to get her off the truck? Yeah, she can talk from there. Come on. You too, Watson. Okay. Bud Watson, murdered girl's husband. Been bootlegging here. Rosie's been moving some of the stuff for him. Oh? Huh? Why you keep me from my work, senor? Your work isn't as legal as it could be, Rosie, so sit tight. Uh... Yeah, you ever seen this man before? You know she's seen me before. They didn't ask you. How about it, Rosie? Si. All right, Rosie. Now, is he the same man you saw at the bus depot with the girl whose picture I showed you? He, he's the man. At the bus depot? But that ain't so. I was never with Helen at the bus depot. You didn't meet her when she came down here? No, I tell you. I didn't know what bus she was coming in on. Or even if she would come after she got my letter. First I saw her, she turned up here at the shack. Well, how about when she left to go home? Uh, she only stayed two, three hours, all told. I let her go back to the bus depot alone because... Well, it was getting dark. Near time for the pickers to be coming there to buy drinks. You hear that, Rosie? That means one of you is lying. Rosie, tell the truth, senor. You don't always tell the truth, Rosie. The first time I asked you about the man you saw, you said he was a stranger, a man you'd never seen before. I forget, senor. Mm. I see a lot of people every day in the fields. Yeah, you trying to kid me? You've been selling liquor for this man. You couldn't mistake him for a stranger. But I do, senor... I make mistake. You wanted help, I give you help. Rosie tell you all she knows, that's all. Now it was obvious that Rosie was lying, just as I'd suspected her of lying the first time. There had to be a reason for it. We took Bud Watson into Bowlville jail and then went back to search his shack. I can't figure something, Jason. Why won't Watson admit it if he was at the bus station with his wife? 
That wouldn't hurt him. No, it wouldn't. That's why I think he's telling the truth. Well, Rosie must be covering up for something. Covering up for somebody's a better guess. She might have done it herself. No, I don't think so. She's too old to cart a body across the country to the railroad. Well, then you figure she really did see Mrs. Watson at the bus depot with a man, huh? Yeah. The man who killed her to get the $1,000 Bud Watson had given her. Well, then what's Rosie's angle and lying to us? Well, that's an easy one, Steve. Shakedown. Hey, Chase, you're right. Couldn't be anything else. Why, it'd be worth the cut for her to forget seeing the man and say it was Watson instead. Only one thing wrong with it. What? Well, I watched her while you were gone. She didn't make any suspicious contacts, nothing that could have been a payoff. She might have gotten her payoff right after I showed her the Watson girl's picture and told her she'd been murdered. That was before you started a tailor. Yeah, I didn't think of that. She had time. Well, we combed this shack, Jace. Nothing here. What do we do now? Go back to Taylor and Rosie again. If she squeezed hush money out of the man once, she's liable to try it again. They all do. We'll start by watching her house when she comes in from the fields tonight. We staked out near Rosie's adobe hut, but it got dark and she didn't come in from the fields. I left Steve on watch and went out to look for her, keeping an eye out for her old truck. I found it about five miles out, surrounded by a group of men carrying torches. Hey, what's going on here? Uh, oh, Ranger! Uh, oh, Rosie! You better come! Yeah, what happened? Uh, we was walking into town. We saw the truck here by the side of the road, thought maybe it broke down, so we started to call for old Rosie. Then one of the boys spotted the blood on the ground. What blood? I'll show you over here. Must be old Rosie's, I reckon, because we found her over here in the cotton row. She's dead, Ranger. Somebody cut her throat from ear to ear. Old Rosie had tried to shake down a killer once too often with the usual payoff. I sent a rush call to Steve Clark to tow his horse out and join me. We followed the trail which led to a deserted picker shack way off in a field that looked like it hadn't been cultivated for years. The shack had been occupied, though, recently occupied. But whoever had been there was gone. There's a lamp there, Steve. Light it. Yeah. It's clean as a whistle, Jake. Yeah, it's too clean. That floor's been scrubbed mighty hard for a shack like this. It sure has. Especially for a place nobody's living in. Must have been cleaning up blood. Yeah. And there are two other things. What's that? Whoever was hiding here was mighty handy with a knife. Look at the inside of the door, circle drawn on the wood. Wood chipped where somebody practiced throwing a knife at it. Yeah, good aim. All the marks are right smack inside the circle. Now, what else? Take a look at the lamp you just lit. The cord it's hanging by. Uh, it's just an ordinary hunk of rope. Except for the knot holding the lamp, a running bowline. So the light could be raised or lowered toward the table. A running bowline is a seaman's knot. Yeah, and that cord is just about big enough to be the draw cord from a duffel bag. Our seaman was here, all right. Well, it couldn't have been Watson, Jace. He was safe in jail when Rosie was killed. Yeah. Whoever Rosie saw with Mrs. Watson at the bus depot must have met the girl after she left Watson, after she had the money. Yeah? Married woman on her way home to her baby isn't liable to leave a bus depot with a stranger, is she? Chances are it was somebody she knew. Well, Watson's been a sailor. Think it might have been an old shipmate of his? Let's go see if he remembers one who was handy with a knife. You say somebody killed old Rosie? Yeah. The same man who killed your wife. Now think and think hard. Yeah. The killer was a seaman. We got reason to think it could be an old shipmate of yours who knew your wife. Oh, but Helen knew shipmates of mine all along the Gulf. I introduced her to lots of them. The one we want had a habit of throwing a knife. Yeah, he drew targets on a door. Never missed. <sighs> Matt Corbett. It was Matt Corbett! How do you know? Any reason for him to be around here? Yeah. He was my partner last year. Bootlegging here. Business got bad and he left. I wrote to him months ago, asking him to come back for this picking, but he never answered me. Did Rosie know him? Sure she did. From last year. That's it, Clark. Rosie'd seen Corbett with Mrs. Watson. That's why he couldn't run with the money after he'd killed her. He had to wait to see if the body was found and identified. And when we moved in and she knew about the murder, she really had him pinned down. He right. used to be my best friend. A sneak. Well, never mind that now. Where would he run to? I don't know. He was always Roman, like me. Hey, you wrote to him someplace, you said. You must have an address. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, General Delivery at Port O'Connor. 
There's an old bait shack there. He lived in it whenever he had enough money to stop moving for a while. He's got enough now. What he got from your wife. Come on, Clark. Let's get him. We headed for Port O'Connor. Made it by morning and found the abandoned bait shack. Nobody inside, Jase, can see through the window. He isn't here. Yeah, he's probably traveling by freight to avoid being spotted. He couldn't have beaten us here. We rolled too fast. Going to stake it out and wait? Yeah. Our car's out of sight where we left it. He won't spot it coming along the wharf. Come on, let's go inside. <clears throat> yeah, it looked like Matt Corbett's the man we're after, all right. Same trademarks here we found on that picker shack at Bullville. Yeah. Knife marks in a circle on the door. Same running bull and holding the lamp. Draw that burlap sack across the window. That'll make it pretty dark in here, Jase. You want it dark when you're throwing a surprise party. Hey, Steve. Steve, wake up. Huh? What? Shh. Somebody coming along the wharf. It's dark. What time is it? A little after midnight. Steps are coming closer. Yeah, it must be Corbett. Nothing to bring anybody else this way at this time of night. He's heading for here, all right. Yeah. Let him get all the way inside. And remember, he's got that knife, and he's handy with it. I know. All right, Corbett. Hey. Never mind that lamp. What's the knife, Dave? Yeah. Stand clear of the light, Steve. Can you handle him? Oh, stop your struggling, Corbett. You Don't stink it. Uh, my arm. Uh, you broke my arm. Uh, all right. Just wrench your shoulder, Corbett. Uh, Keep you from throwing that knife for a while. Come on, get up. Better light the lamp now, Steve. It's a good thing you jumped him, Jace. I felt that knife pass in my ear. Look, buried in that wall a good inch. Hey. Rangers, I thought you were a couple of crooks. What's you doing here? Just dropped in to arrest you for the murder of Helen Watson and old Rosie up at Bullville. It'd be nice if you could prove it. I haven't been near Bullville. I think we can prove you were. My marks you left on the door and a few other things. How'd you come back, Freight? Are you kidding? No, I'm serious. You should have rode Pullman. Get your shoes shined on a Pullman. Would have taken that reddish-brown earth off your shoes. Our lab can match that with Bullville. Watch out for that shoulder. Yeah, that's better, Corbett. Want to cuff him, Jace? No. I think he'll come quiet. All right, Corbett. Let's move. Herbert Bud Watson served the required term for his bootlegging activities, and Matt Corbett was tried and convicted of murder. The sentence of the court was carried out on February 20th, 1939, when at Huntsville Penitentiary, Matt Corbett died in the electric chair. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae, with another interesting story about the Texas Rangers. In the early days of Texas, major disturbances were not infrequent. It was a lusty, brawling, growing territory, and as happens in such a territory, there were days when the streets were not safe for the good citizens. An Easterner, happening into a Texas town at such a time, found shelter in the house of a minister. Everything will be all right soon, he was assured. Later that same afternoon, the minister, who'd been looking out the window, said, Well, friend, the streets are safe now. You may go about your business. The Easterner looked out the window... But all he saw was a lone figure riding casually down the main street on a horse. What makes you think it's safe for me out there now, he asked in bewilderment. The minister pointed to the horseman. Because that feller on the horse is a Texas Ranger, he said. Only folks that aren't safe in this town now are the ones who started the trouble. And when he finds them, they'll wish they'd been peaceable. Good night, folks. See you next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the MGM production, Stars in My Crown. 
Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Herb Ellis, Tom Holland, Byron Kane, Tom McKee, and Lillian Byer. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keats. Al Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, death by adoption. It is 9.45 p.m. on a Saturday night, September 1937. The business district of Central City, Texas, is dark, except for the office of Harry Cashman's used car lot. Cashman is pacing the small office in agitation. A man in a leather windbreaker crosses the lot, slipping between the cars for sale, and knocks at the door. Well, how day, Mr. Cashman? Uh, Glad to see you waited for me. All right, spit it out. What do you want this time? I'm kind of short on folding money. Thought you might be a pal and help me out again. You know what this is, don't you, Stryker? The Lord called it a shakedown. I gave you $100 two weeks ago and another 100 the month before. So I need more. Well, you're not getting more, not from me. Why, it's too bad. I'm sorry you feel that way, Mr. Cashman. I kind of thought you were a nice guy. Oh. The kind of guy I'd like to see raise my baby. As long as I can't raise him myself. Now, you leave the baby out of this. Now, you can't expect me to forget about her, Mr. Cashman. After all, she's my own flesh and blood. She belongs to me and my wife, legally, by adoption. Yeah, but you keep forgetting one important thing. I never signed no papers letting you adopt her. Your wife said you were dead. She thought I was dead. But my being here proves I ain't. And if we ever have to take this into court, Mr. Cashman, I'm baby Ann's natural father. I got my rights, you know. All right, how much? Reckon a hundred will see me through again. I'll give you five hundred. Why, it's better. Now, just a minute. I'll give you five hundred if you sign a paper waiving all rights to baby Ann. I ain't signing nothing. I like our arrangement just the way it is. It's working out fine. If you think... Well, go ahead, Mr. Cashman. Answers. may be business, and I'd like to see you do a good business. For the baby's sake, you understand? <sighs> Hello. Harry, why aren't you home? It's almost 10 o'clock. Oh, I, I'll be home in a little while, Hazel. Uh, something came up. You sound worried. Is anything wrong? No, 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 no. Of course not. Well, the baby wanted to wait up for you. I let her stay up till late 30, but by then she just kept rubbing her eyes and her nose and saying, where's my daddy, till she couldn't hold her little head up. Well, I, I'm sorry, Hazel. Uh, give her a kiss for me. I, I'll be home in a little while. Harry, are you sure there's nothing wrong? You sound like you're upset about something. Oh, it's it's nothing. I'm just tired. I'll see you in half an hour. Well, all right, dear. Goodbye. Goodbye, honey. That your wife? Yes. Never did meet her. Maybe we ought to all get together, have a little talk. Huh? Stryker, if you try that, it's the last talk you'll ever have. What are you trying to do? Your baby's got a home, a good home, and we love her. We've been married 15 years, never had a child of our own. And now we've got her, and she's ours. Why, if we ever lost her, we'd have nothing to live for. Haven't you got a heart? Well, 
I can see I made a big mistake, Mr. Cashman. I should have started seeing you a lot sooner and a lot oftener. Now, what do you mean by that? That from now on, I'll be around every Saturday night to pick up my hundred dollars. And I'll take tonight's payment right now. Why, Don't you... be a fool, Mr. Cashman. I'm younger and a lot stronger than you. Now, don't get yourself hurt. Now, how about my money? All right, Striker. There's your hundred. And it's the last you're getting. Now, get out of my sight and don't ever come back. Because if you do, I'll go to the police. I'll spend every dollar I've got fighting you. I'll prove what you are. I'll prove you're not fit to have custody of Anne. Mr. Cashman, I do believe you mean that. I swear before heaven I mean it. So this is your pardon gift to me, eh? Not much considering the size of the role you peeled it off, huh? All right. All right, I'll leave you alone. I'll take my payment in full right now. Dig that roll out again. Toss it on the desk. Oh, I see. Now it's a gun, huh? You see it, and I know how to use it. How could Anne have a father like you? She couldn't have, not you. You've never proved you are her father. <laughs> You're getting real bright tonight, Mr. Cashman. I get the money up on the desk. I'm not going to give you another dime, Striker. All I'm going to give you is what you deserve. Get away from that phone. I'm going to call the police. You ain't calling any police. Rot. Maybe I'm stronger than you think. Uh, but you ain't stronger than me. Uh -oh. Now, give me that money. Oh, no. Maybe you should have been fighting your way. You see, you're still the only one who knows about me, and you ain't never going to tell anyone else. Thanks for the final payment. At 11 o'clock, after three more calls to her husband's used car lot, Hazel Cashman was disturbed by the busy signal and her husband's failure to come home. A phone company check showed the line was not in use. Hazel Cashman called the police. They found Harry Cashman's body and requested aid in the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. He arrived at the lot shortly after 2 a.m. I'm afraid that's all the information I can give you, man. Oh, uh, howdy, Ranger. You must be Jace Pearson. That's right. You in charge here? Yeah. Uh, Dan Simmons, chief of police. Uh, fellas, I'll talk to you later. All right. Okay. I see you've already lifted some fingerprints. Huh? How'd you know? Oh, dusting powder on the glass top here. Uh, yeah, crew just left. Ah, uh, prints aren't going to be much good, though, I'm afraid. Too many people coming in and out of a place like this, signing papers on that desk. What's that over there, Chief? What? Oh, that yellow spot on the carpet? Yeah. I noticed that before. Seems to be a piece of chalk that was stepped on. A few little pieces not quite ground in. I don't see a blackboard or anything around here. Any of the for sale signs on the cars marked with chalk? No, no. They're all marked with cardboard cutouts. Well, the floor is pretty clean otherwise. Waste paper basket's empty. Yeah. This place was swept out after the day's business. That chalk got ground into the rug last night after the place was cleaned. Yeah, I can see that now. And the phone hanging off the hook like that when you got here? Uh-huh. Cashman struggled with whoever killed him. Must have been trying to make a call. Oh, I don't know, Jace. Body's just where we found it, a good eight feet from the phone. Yeah, he might have staggered over there and fell, but the fight started right here by the desk and the phone. Uh, got some reason for being so sure of that? The desk was moved a little in the fight, Chief. Look at the carpet. Deep worn spot where the desk usually rested. Carpet's bunched up around the base, showing the desk was pushed, not lifted and moved for any reason. Ah, you're right. I can't see that it helps us any, though. Gives us a little picture of the action, that's all. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get some of this yellow chalk in an envelope. Uh, you're going to send that to your lab at Austin? That's right. They can analyze it. Maybe come up with something. That's worth a shot. Doesn't seem to be much anything else to help us, though. Robbery motive for murder is usually the toughest one to crack. Can Cashman make a habit of carrying a lot of money? Yeah, had to in this business. People selling cars in a hurry need a fast dollar. He usually had a couple of thousand on them. All we found in his pocket was 86 cents and change. Uh, you finished here? Yeah. I'd like you to put a man to work on that filing cabinet. Get a record of all sales. We've already checked that. Every car Cashman had's accounted for. Nothing's been stolen from the lot. I wasn't thinking of a stolen car. I just want a list of recent customers. Oh. Somebody might have bought an automobile he wasn't happy with and come back to get even. Uh, could be, but I'm afraid that's a blind alley too, Ranger. Cashman gave a mighty good guarantee on everything he sold, and he stood behind it a hundred percent. Just the same, let's check it. 
I want to examine every reason he might have been killed. A hundred percent. I sent the ground yellow chalk through to Austin. There was nothing that could be done that night, but the next morning, Chief Simmons and I went to see Hazel Cashman, the dead man's wife. <laughs> we don't like to ask you questions at a time like this, Mrs. Cashman, but... I, I understand, and I want to help you if I can. Probably isn't much you can tell us, but any little thing might help. Your husband ever have trouble with anybody? No. Aside from the money he carried, do you know of any reason why anybody might have been out to get him? No, there was never anybody who didn't like Harry. What am I going to tell the baby? How am I ever going to make her understand that her daddy won't ever come home again? Would, would you answer that for me, please? I, I don't want to talk to anybody now. Why, sure, ma'am. Maybe for us, anyhow. Had to leave this number at headquarters. Hello? Yes, yeah, Simmons speaking. Go ahead, I'll write it down. We, we were going on a picnic today. Last night, I made the sandwiches and everything. We, we were going to leave right after church. I knew something was wrong when he didn't come home. I knew it. Take it easy, ma'am. All week long, Harriet was teaching Anne how to say picnic. She was just learning to pronounce it. No. You've got to get a grip, ma'am, for your baby's sake. Yes. Yes, I know. All right. Thanks. We'll be in soon. I better get back to headquarters, Jace. Uh, unless you have something else to ask Mrs. Cashman. No. You shouldn't be alone, though, ma'am. Especially when your baby wakes up. I called a neighbor just before you came. She'll be here in a few minutes. That's good. Goodbye, ma'am, and thank you. Goodbye, Mrs. Cashman. Goodbye. Find out who killed my husband. He never hurt anybody. Never. We'll do our best, ma'am. It's the rush back to headquarters, Simmons. One of my boys pulled in a suspect, Jason. Oh? Fellow who worked for Cashman, a cleaning man named Moe Smith. What do they got on him? Well, he cleaned the office last night at about 8.30 or 9 o'clock. Cashman usually closed before then on Saturday nights, but Smith admits Cashman was still there when he cleaned up. Well, he's not trying to hide anything there. No, no, but there's something else. Moe Smith was on the town last night, threw a big party and threw a lot of money around. Still had a few hundred on him when he was picked up. And, uh... My man checked on that, Jace. Smith is usually dirt poor. I see. He's going to be worth talking to. You can say that again. I'd have told you inside the house, but I didn't want to say anything in front of Mrs. Cashman. That was best. How old is their baby? Mm, just two years old, Jace. Why? You look kind of funny. How old are the Cashmans? Well, I'd say Harry was about 55. Guess Mrs. Cashman must be in her 40s. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, the baby's an adopted child. I thought they were a little bit old to have a child of that age. Yeah, they never had any of their own. A couple of years ago, they took in a poor girl who'd lost her husband. Anne was her child. Cashman's took to the kid right off. Then the mother got sick, and when she knew she was dying, she agreed to let the Cashman's adopt the baby. No kid ever got a better break, believe me. I gathered they were pretty crazy about her. Plenty crazy. Why, if that kid even sneezed, Harry Cashman would be ready to charter a plane and fly at a Mayo Clinic. They wrapped their lives around her, just like she was their own. When you feel that way about a kid, it is your own. Loving them is what makes them belong to you. Yeah, you can say that again. Say, any messages from my headquarters in that phone call you took? Oh, Jace, I forgot. I, I was too hot about my man picking up Moe Smith. Your lab phoned in a report on that chalk. Any lead? Well, I, I don't know under the circumstances, but it wasn't an ordinary piece of chalk. Analysis showed that it's a special type that surveyors use for marking. Surveyors, huh? Yeah. Isn't likely that a janitor would be carrying the kind of chalk used by surveyors. Oh, it might have come from any place, Jace. A customer might have dropped it. It was dropped and stepped on after the office had been cleaned. Maybe our case against Moe Smith isn't going to be as strong as it looks. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Death by Adoption, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. At the city jail, Moe Smith was being held in an ante room. The day was cool, but beads of sweat stood out on his forehead. If he was innocent, he didn't look at I began to forget about the surveyor's chalk. Come on, Mose. Where were you last night? I was at a party, Mr. Simmons, at my own house. And where were you before the party? 
I was working for Mr. Harry Cashman at the used car lot. Everybody knows I work there. What time did the party start, Mose? Uh, after 10 o'clock, sir. And later we left my house and went a few other places. With you paying all the bills? Well, well, is that right or isn't it? That's right, sir. I don't remember much about it. Next thing I knew it was this morning and a policeman woke me up and brought me down here. What time was it when you left the car lot last night? Oh, I worked almost 9 o'clock, sir. Cleaning up like I always do. Was Mr. Cashman all right when you left the lot? No, sir, he wasn't. Mr. Harry was always mighty nice to me, but somebody called him on the telephone. He didn't say much to whoever it was. Then he slammed the phone down real mad, and he hollered at me to hurry up and finish. He ain't never done that before, sir. Then when I got done and was ready to leave, he told me he's sorry he yelled at me like that. What'd you do then? I, I, I did some shopping for the party. Got some food, a couple of jugs of Sweet Lucy. Where'd you get the money? Spill it, Mose. Cashman was robbed, and you had almost $300 on you this morning when you were picked up. It was my own money, so honest. You never got that kind of money working on a used car lot. Three days ago, you were broke. You borrowed $2 from your landlady. You better count for that money, Mose. Where'd you get it? Well, from the numbers. Numbers? You mean you've been gambling on the numbers racket? Yes, sir. And yesterday, my number hit. 424. I got my $500. That, that's how come I got money. You expect us to swallow that? Who paid you off, Mose? I don't know, sir. I don't know who he was. Are you trying to tell us you gambled on numbers without knowing who you gave your bets to? Please, sir. If I tell you who it is, Mr. Simmons is going to arrest him. And everybody will know I told. And if I don't find out, you're going to stand trial for murder. Everybody will know that, too. Oh, no, sir. Please. I never hurt Mr. Harry. Oh, I got the money from Jonas. One of the pen boys at the bowling alley. Jonas been booking numbers on the side? No, sir. He just worked for somebody for a little cut. All right, Mose. We'll check on your story. And it better be true. I told the truth every word. Well, he sounded on the level, Jace. And if he is, I'll be able to smash a hole in the numbers racket. Yeah, you can do that, all right. But we'll still be shy of murderer. <laughs> Simmons staked out the bowling alley where Jonas worked as a pin setter. Moe Smith had told the truth, all right. The pin boy confirmed it when he was arrested for possession of slips made out by betters playing the numbers. We were back to a single clue again, the yellow chalk. We've checked the only surveying crew in the city, Chase. Every man working on it had an alibi. All surveyors aren't in the city. That killer could have come from any place in the county. No road building projects underway and... Only other survey and crew we've been able to trace is a mapping crew down in the Big Bend. Not going to be easy to get to. I'll get to them. Wherever this car won't take me, the horse and the trailer I'm towing will. Huh? You leaving right away? As soon as I can drop you at your headquarters. I drove to the Big Bend to where the roads ran out, and I had to cut cross country to reach the mapping crew. I unloaded charcoal from the trailer. The crew was deep in wild country. Almost a full day's ride before I reached him. All right, Chucky. Easy, boy, easy. Anybody here? Hello, over this way. Come on, Chucky. Well, howdy, Ranger. Howdy. Saw marks of a camp here, but it looked deserted. Well, it is. We moved in another couple of miles. I just come back with the birds to haul the last of our stuff onto the new camp. I was just tying a pack on this last one. You the crew foreman? Yeah. I'll ride on away with you. Keep you from getting lonesome. Glad to have you. I got company, though. One of my men just went on ahead a few minutes ago. We'll catch up to him on the way. Hey, you want me to take one of those lead ropes? No, they're good burrs. They won't give me no trouble. All right, let's go. Up, Chuck. Up, boy. Come on, you long-eared scavengers. You've had enough grazing. You must be covering a lot of ground in here. Ah, oh, plenty. Now, sprawling country like this... Ranchers lose sight of their boundaries when the land ain't fenced off. Hey, you, uh, after somebody in here, Ranger? Maybe. How long you fellas been working through here? Oh, been almost two months now. You ever pull out to go into town? Well, we got horses, of course, but it's a long ride to a road and transportation any place of any size. <laughs> I just decided to grow me some whiskers and stay here till the job's done. Any of your men ride out? Oh, yeah. You of them go out weekends to Central City or someplace like that for Saturday night. Then they got to turn around and spend all day Sunday coming back. 
Family men usually stay and just keep on working, pile up overtime. How many men you got working? Oh, I got 11. Any of them away last weekend? Yeah, four of them. You know where they went? No. Hey, I reckon Bill Stryker can tell you, though. Who's he? A fellow with other burrows. Ah, there he is, just topping that rise about a quarter of a mile ahead. He one of the ones who left camp? Yeah, they all went off together. Let's catch up to him. Okay, come on, boy. Get up, bird. Get up, charcoal. We rode after the man named Bill Stryker. On the way, I saw the surveyor's marks I'd been following for miles. Cloth markers nailed to trees. Yellow chalk marks on rocks. Within a few minutes, we caught up to him. Well, yeah, Ranger. We was away for the weekend, like Tracy told you. Me and three other fellas. Where'd you go? Central City. Only place worth going we'd get to in time. What did you do up there? Well, just fool around. All of us together. Well, you were only there for Saturday night. You must have done something special, something you remember. I saw one of the boys mention the dance, Striker. Well, well, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Squad dancer, Alamo Ballroom. You spend the whole evening there? Yeah. Like I said, we were all together. All evening. And four stags at a dance drift around. Hard to keep an eye on each other all evening. He, yeah, I reckon we could lose sight of each other for a minute or two. You fellas take time out to do any shopping? Well, what could we buy that we could bring back here? I thought maybe one of you might be saving some money, maybe enough to make a deal on a used car. Uh, we, we rode a bus both ways after our horses got us from here to Landon's Junction. Oh, that's too bad. If you'd been shopping around a used car lot, you might have been able to help me. You might have gotten a look at a man who killed a dealer named Cashman in Central City on Saturday night. Killed? Hey, Ranger, you got a reason for being here. Hey, you think one of my crew killed that man? I'll know better when we see the other three who went to town with Stryker here. Let's get on to the camp. It didn't help. They all told the same story. There were gaps, times during the evening when they drifted away from each other, but they couldn't pin it down to any specific time on the clock. I didn't have anything to take them in on, singly or together. They knew it, and I knew it. I camped with them overnight, then headed back to Central City Police Headquarters. Oh, hi, Jason. How'd you make out? No good, Chief. Uh, we haven't turned up anything new either. Just a chance armed robbery, Jace. That's what it must have been. My feelings still buck at that, Simmons. Mose told us that Cashman was upset about a phone call. Stayed at the lot long after he should have gone home. There must have been a reason. Like what? Like somebody who wanted to see him, telling him to wait there. Yeah. Mose said the call made Cashman mad. Why'd they wait for somebody he was mad at? Maybe because they had some kind of a club they could use to make him wait, whether he liked it or not. You're still digging for something deeper than an armed robbery motive, then. That's right. Well... Nobody's given us anything to back up any other motive. I know, but a man doesn't make a telephone appointment to be robbed and murdered. He makes it for something else. I'm going out to see Mrs. Cashman again. When you called your husband last Saturday night, it was almost ten, you said. What makes you think he was upset? When you're married to a man for 15 years, you just know that's all. But he said there was nothing wrong. Anything like that ever happened before? His not coming home, I mean, acting upset? Yes, it did. Twice before. Once was almost two months ago, then a couple of weeks ago. Those other times. You remember what day they happened on? I mean, can you remember if it was always on a Saturday? Yes. Always, all three times. But I don't know why. I don't know what was bothering him. Oh, how do you react? He was nervous, irritable. It surprised me the first time. Harry had never been that way with anybody. He snapped at me, the hired girl. Apologized later, but the only one he didn't snap at was the baby. He just seemed to want to hold her in his lap. Just sit there and rock back and forth, holding her. And then during the night, he kept getting up, going to a crib to look at her. I see. Ma'am, did your husband ever say he was worried about somebody trying to take little Anne away from you? Why, no. Who could take her from us? Both her parents were dead. Her mother agreed to the adoption before she passed on. You ever know the baby's father? Ever see him? No, he died before Anne was born. Killed in an accident. You're sure of that? Well, that's what Anne's mother told her. She couldn't have lied. Have you got a copy of the baby's birth certificate? Yes, right in this drawer. With a copy of the adoption papers we got from the court. Here's the court order. And the paper signed by Anne's mother, Dorothy Stryker. Stryker? Was the father's name Bill or William Stryker? 
Why, no. Here it is on the birth certificate. His name was Arthur Stryker. Came from Fort Worth. Ranger, what is it? I think I know who killed your husband now. And I'm beginning to figure why. You'll hear from me, ma'am. I headed for the Big Bend, making a radio check with KTXA, asking the station to contact the Fort Worth police on possible relationship between Arthur and William Stryker. The answer fit. They'd been brothers. But William Stryker had a criminal record. It was late afternoon when I mounted charcoal for the ride into the surveying camp. I reached it at about 3 a.m., dismounted, and slipped into the office tent. Tracy. What the... Shh, quiet. It's me, Pearson. Oh, you scared me. Shh. Why'd you come back? Not all your boys were square dancing at Central City. Where's Stryker sleeping? Oh, Stryker, huh? That's right. I'm back. Near where the horses are hobbled. Well, you better be careful, Ranger. He's got a gun. Good. A test can give me the final proof I need if it's the same gun that killed Cashman. I'll come with you. If he wakes up before I get to him, you hit the ground and stay there, no matter what happens. Don't worry. I'm a surveyor, not a hero. There, under that tree. Branches in the moon got it all in shadow, though. He's not here. Somebody's trying to get away with one of the horses. Come on. Oh, he must have seen you out in the moonlight crossing to the tent. Get away from that horse, Striker. You're in the light now. I can see you, too. There's something you won't say. Oh, Ranger, you're oh. hit. Drop. Got him. Be careful. It might be a trick. Are you other men? Stay down. Don't move. Oh, it's no trick, Ranger. Oh, he's hit more than once and bad. Uh, I don't want to die. Don't let me die. <laughs> Better get whatever first aid stuff you have. It. Try and patch him up. You're gonna need some work too. I'll be all right. You men can get up now. Need a couple of you to make a letter. I need it to take him in. I easy, Ranger. I got you. Oh, men will have to make two letters. You need one yourself. William Stryker lived long enough to confess his masquerade as the father of his dead brother's child and the murder of Harry Cashman. He was pronounced dead shortly after arrival at the nearest emergency hospital. Jace Pearson had three bullets removed from his body. They matched the bullet taken from the body of Harry Cashman. Six weeks later, Jace Pearson reported back to his company, ready again for duty with the Texas Rangers. Now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. There's a story about one of the first Texas Ranger captains whose outward appearances seemed to be little more than a boy. One of the Rangers in his command, a big, raw-boned, muscular fellow noted for his complete lack of fear, was asked by a townsman, how come a big fellow like you takes orders from him? Why, he ain't even got enough of a beard to need shaving. The Ranger looked at the townsman. Maybe he hasn't got much of a beard, the Ranger admitted. But when we go out after a gang of bandits with him outnumbering us three or four to one, I never yet heard the captain say, go get them, boys. He always says, come on, men, follow me. Good night, folks. See you again next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Joe Kearns, Tom McKee, Roy Glenn, and Barbara Luddy. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keats. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Coming up next on NBC, it's genial accordion-playing master of ceremonies, Phil Baker, back at his old Sunday night stand asking America's favorite question. What's that? Why, the $64 question, of course. 
The chimes are your invitation every Sunday to all the fun and prizes and excitement of everybody's favorite quiz game, the $64 question. Tomorrow, hear the Railroad Hour. Right now, it's the $64 question on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, death in the cards. It is 11.30 p.m. on the night of January 26, 1947, at the ranch house of Chester Gentry in Reeves County, Texas. Chester is on the telephone as his stepson, Will, hey, enters. No sign of him, huh? All right. Call me when you find him. Thanks, Sheriff. Where you been, Will? Just out having a beer. That Sheriff Bennett you were talking to? Yeah. Your friend Tovich telephoned you a while ago. Tovich? Oh, you didn't tell the Sheriff about Tovich. I sure did. Sheriff just called to say he located Tobich's rooming house over in Biggestown, but Tobich wasn't there. But I've told you a hundred times it's the worst thing in the world you could do. Tobich finds out to kill me. Will, I... Maybe he has found out, you told the sheriff. Maybe he's on his way here right now to get me. Look, you've got to give me the money to pay him off now. No, Will. No more money. Do you know what you're saying? He'll kill me if I don't pay him. He told me so. Now you listen to me, Will. I've reached the end of my rope in this whole rotten mess. I'm through. And I couldn't get another dime from you. I've done everything I can for you, but... You're just no good. Please, Dad, I need that donut. You shut up and listen to me. When your ma died, I promised her I'd do everything I could for you. And I have. I treated you like you was my own son. I've given you a home. I've given you money. A lot of money. And what have you done with it? You've thrown it away to a slimy gambler named Tobich. But, Dad... For two months it's been going on. For two months you've been bleeding me white to pay off that gambler. I told you to stay away from him, but you didn't. Now it's high time for me to meet him and tell him face to face to stay away from you. No, Dad, no, no. If you just give me the money this once more, I'll straighten out. I promise you. Your me. promises ain't worth a bill of straw. That's what you said last week. You'd straighten out. I told you then I'd give you just one week to do it, and if you didn't, you'd get no more money from me now or ever. Dad, you don't mean Oh, that. don't I? You got yourself into this mess, you get yourself out of it. Tovich can bluff you, but he can't bluff me. Dad, Dad. Huh? What's the matter? Window. Tovich, I just saw him at the window. What? Dad, now he's gone. He's probably heading for the front door. All right, let him. Turn off the lights, Will. But, Dad... Turn them off. What are you doing? Get my gun. I'll give this Tobich a reception he ain't looking for. No, Dad, no. Uh, front door, huh? No, look, stay away from that door, Dad. Don't open it. Please don't. Uh, can't see a thing. Now, look, Will, you... Will. 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 Chester Gentry lay dead at his own front door. Will immediately notified Sheriff Bennett's office. The sheriff requested help from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. He joined Sheriff Bennett at the Gentry Ranch. Yeah, looks like an open and shut case, Jace. Tovich came here to get Will, but it was Chester who opened the door and collected the slugs instead. Where was the body, Sheriff? Lying right across the front doorway here. How long ago did the shooting take place? A couple of hours ago. Chester notified me earlier in the evening he'd gotten a call from this Tovich. The call came from Biggerstown, so I went over there to see if I could find him. 
I located his rooming house, but he checked out. Looks like while I was there, he was here. You say Tovich had been bleeding Will and Chester for some time, huh? Yeah, about two months, according to what Chester told me on the phone. Well, let's talk to Will. Oh. Oh, Sheriff, come on in. Uh, this is Ranger Pearson, Will. He'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Well, sure, Ranger. How long have you known this Tovich, Will? A couple of months, I guess. And where'd you first meet him? Pete's place, down the highway. That's a roadhouse, Chase. Mm, that where you did your gambling? No, no. Tovich would call me from time to time and tell me he had a game lined up. So I'd meet him at his rooming house in biggest time. Who else was in the games? A couple of other fellas, different ones each time. I didn't know any of them. Didn't even know their names. You kept losing to Tovich, didn't you? Yeah, I did. But you kept on playing cards with him. Well, I, I kept thinking my luck would change. Your luck never changes when you're up against a professional gambler. Guess I know that now. It's too bad you didn't know it two months ago. Your stepfather might still be alive. Ranger, there just isn't a thing you can say to me that I haven't already said to myself. I've been sitting here for two hours thinking about it. Knowing if I had the guts to straighten out, this wouldn't happen. There's only one thing I hope right now. I hope somehow Dad knows how I feel. All right, Will. What does Tovich look like? Well, pretty ordinary-looking fellow. Kind you never notice in a crowd. About my height, I'd say. Black hair, regular features, nothing to really set him apart. Mm, that's pretty general. I guess it is, but it's the best I can do. Okay, better get some sleep. You find any tracks outside, Sheriff? Nope, my deputy scoured the yard, but it's too gravelly to hold any kind of tracks, car or foot. Will, uh, do you remember hearing a car pull away from here after the shooting? Why, no, Ranger. Now, come think of it, I, I didn't even hear one come up. Hmm. Okay. When it gets light, we'll ride around a little in the back of the ranch, Sheriff, and see if we can pick up any footprints. All right. In the meantime, let's take a run over to Biggerstown and talk to Tovich's landlady. Maybe she can give us a better line on him. Afraid I can't help you much on a description, Ranger. I only got a good look at Tovich once. That was when I rented this room to him two months ago. Mm, it's pretty strange that'd be the only time you saw him, Mrs. Packer. Well, he came and went by night. I'd hear voices in his room sometimes in the evening. A couple of times a woman's voice. But as far as seeing him around, I didn't. You said he checked out earlier tonight. Didn't you see him then? No. He just left an envelope under my door with his key and the money he owed on the room. You think you'd recognize him if you saw him again, Mrs. Packer? Well, I might. I don't know. But to sit down and describe him to you, I'm afraid I can't be much help there. I don't like it, Sheriff. Man's been living in this room for two months. Take a look around you. It's clean. Too clean. Nothing here to give us any line on. Hey, wait a minute. Have you cleaned this room since Tovich checked out? No. I ain't gotten around to it yet. I was figuring on giving it a good swamping out in the morning. I'd like to save you the trouble. What do you mean? I'd like to have one of our men from the lab vacuum the room for you. Well, <laughs> it's my back the way it is. I sure ain't gonna say no. You figure on having the contents of the dust bag analyzed, Jase? Yeah. Tovich has covered his tracks pretty well so far, but... Maybe he doesn't know you can sometimes pick up a lot besides dust with a vacuum cleaner. Mrs. Packer, if you should ever see Tovich again, I'd like you to get in touch with me right away. Well, you can count on that, Ranger. Say, I don't hanker to have any killers running loose around my room in the house. Dawn came, and the only thing new on the case was the publicity. Papers were carrying the story with pictures of Chester and Will. The sheriff and I started scouring the country in back of the gentry ranch on horseback. This is hunting weather, Jace, with all that frost on the ground. Yeah, so far the hunting hasn't been good. Let's see, we're right in line with the back of the ranch house now. Yeah, maybe we better split up and go around. Hey, ooh, hey, oh, oh, hold it. Oh. Take a look on the ground there. Yeah, foot tracks. Coming from the back of the ranch house, too. And judging from the distance between the tracks, he was in a hurry. Come on. Heading straight north for the river, Jace. 
He could be trying for the New Mexico border. Could be. You know, one thing, should be pretty easy to follow the tracks in the frost. Yeah. There's something funny about these tracks, though. What do you mean? I don't know yet. Can't just put my finger on it, but we'll keep trailing. See if we can put our finger on Tovich. Come on, Charcoal. Yeah. Can't understand why you don't want to cross the river, Jace. Tracks led smack into it back there. Uh, I know it, Sheriff, but let's just keep looking along the bank on this side. Okay, but he probably waded along a spell and kept going on the other side. What's on the other side? Santa Fe track, about 15 miles away. And what's between the river and the tracks? Just open country. That's what I mean. I don't think Tovich would risk 15 miles of open country. Yeah, I see your point. Yeah, we'll keep looking along this side, then. Well, we don't have to look any farther, Sheriff. Look, there they are. Ooh, oh, oh. ooh, Charky. Hey, they... They sure are. Packs coming up out of the river and heading back the way we came. But there's still one thing I don't understand. What's that? The shooting took place about 11.30 last night. Tovich could have been halfway across that open country on the other side of the river by dawn. Now, why did he double back? I think I've got an answer for that, Sheriff. I told you a while back something was bothering me about those tracks. I finally figured out what it is. Oh? Look at the tracks, and then look at the hoof marks of our horses. Well, they look just about the same to me. Hey, they both cut down through the frost. Yeah, that's the point. What time you figure the frost formed on the ground this morning? Mm, between four and five, maybe. And those tracks were made after the frost formed. They cut through it. If they'd been made before the frost, it would have formed over them. Wait a minute. Maybe Tovich realized he killed the wrong man. Maybe he hid around the ranch trying for another crack at Will. And now those tracks are heading toward the ranch again. Come on, Sheriff. We better get back there in a hurry. <laughs> Followed the tracks back to the highway a mile below the ranch and lost them there. Then we headed for the ranch house. There was no sign of life around the place. I don't see Will outside anywhere. Well, his car's in the driveway. I hope we're not too late. Uh, Will! Will! Oh, morning, Sheriff, Ranger. <sighs> well, that's a relief. Oh, come on in. Well, something the matter? We thought there might be. Can I use your phone? I want to call my office and see if there's anything new. Help us out. Back in the hall. Okay, thanks. Ranger, what's the sheriff mean about being relieved to see me? Well, it's possible Tovich hung around here at the ranch last night after the shooting. What? You see or hear anything after we left? And it wasn't my imagination. What do you mean? Well, after you fellas left, I locked up tight. About three or four this morning, a sound woke me up. What kind of a sound? Oh, like somebody walking around outside. You think it could have been Tovich? I don't know. Well, I've got Dad's gun. If Tovich ever shows up around here again, I'll handle it. Law enforcing's our business, Will. Don't try and take it into your own hands. Yes. Yes, Sheriff. Now, what is it? My deputy just told me that landlady, Miss Packer, phoned the office for you about an hour ago. Mrs. Packer? Yeah, they told her to call out here. Will? Yeah. Did a Mrs. Packer phone me... Oh, a woman phone didn't leave a name, but she did leave a number. I got it written down right here. Thanks. Operator, 2734J. How long ago did she call, Will? Oh, about an hour ago, I guess. she leave any message? No, just said to ask you to call her. You told her to get in touch with you if she ever saw Tovich again, Jace. Yeah, I know. Hm. No answer. Come on, Sheriff. We better get over to Biggerstown and find out what's on Mrs. Packer's mind. Hmm. She must have gone out. Her door's unlocked. Mrs. Packer. Mrs. Packer. R- look, Jason. On the table there by the phone. Hmm. Newspaper. Folded to the story of the killing. Yeah, well, she can't have gone very far. Coffee's boiling on the hot plate. Hmm. 
pot's just about boiled dry. Come on, let's take a look in the next room. You know, it's funny. She'd call and then be... Jace. On the bed. Yeah. Mrs. Packer. Strangled. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Death in the Cards, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We were getting nowhere fast on this case. First Chester Gentry, then Mrs. Packer. We questioned all the rumors, but none of them had seen a thing. Then we went back to the sheriff's office. And, Jace, there's no doubt about it at all. Miss Packer was trying to tell you something about Tovich, but he got to her first and killed her to shut her mouth. Yeah, we know who the killer is, all right, but the big question is, where is he? It's just like the earth opened and swallowed him up. Well, every sheriff's office in the state's been alerted. Highway patrol's on the lookout, too, so sooner or later we're bound to... Yeah. Excuse me, Jason. Sheriff Bennett speaking. Oh, yeah, just a minute. Your headquarters, Jace. Captain Stinson. Thanks. Hello, Captain. Just got a report from the lab on those vacuum sweepings you had them take from Tovich's room in Biggestown, Jace. Now, what'd they find? Only items of interest were two or three women's hairs. Red. Hmm. A lot of redheads in Texas, Captain. I'm afraid that's not much help. Maybe more than you think. This hair wasn't naturally red. It was a henna dye job. And judging from the distance between the roots and the dye, the lab figures it was dyed about a week ago. Well, now that's a horse of a different color. Well, thanks a lot, Captain. I'll keep you posted. Sheriff, we haven't had any luck finding Tovich, have we? We sure haven't. Okay, now we're going to start looking for Tovich's girl. His girl? How many beauty parlors do you figure there are in Biggerstown? Oh, I don't know, six or seven, maybe? Before the day's over, we'll know exactly how many there are. We're going to visit them all. The sheriff had underestimated the town. There were ten of them. We had no luck on the first seven, and then, just at dark, we hit number eight. There we found an operator who remembered giving a henna dye job to a girl named Thelma Parrish about a week ago. We learned that Thelma was a waitress in a coffee shop, so I parked my car around the corner and we dropped in on her. Well, you men look like you could use a nice cup of coffee. Nothing I'd like better right now than having a pretty red-headed waitress pour me one, ma'am. <laughs> Why, thank you, Ranger. Coming up. What do you think, Jace? I think maybe. Cream? Uh, black, please. Yeah, black here, too. Well, here you are. Thanks. Uh, seen your boyfriend lately? Boyfriend? Tovich. Who? Tovich. You must have me mixed up with somebody else, Ranger. I don't know anybody by that name. Are you real sure about that, ma'am? Well, of course I am. A girl sure who she does know and who she doesn't. Well, either I'm mistaken or you're lying to me. Look, I don't know what this is all about, but I do know better than lie to a ranger. I hope so. Well, come on, Sheriff. You better be getting back to your office. Okay, Jay. Here's for the coffee. Thanks. Sorry I can't help you any about what's-his-name. So am I. This way, Sheriff. Where are we going? Across the street. Yeah, but the car's on this side, around the corner. Keep walking. She's watching us from inside. Oh. Think she was lying? That's what I want to find out. Well, she seemed pretty sure of herself. Okay, we're out of her line of sight now. Let's get in this doorway, quick. Good. Now we're in the shadows here. She can't spot us from across the street. Now we just keep an eye on the front of that coffee shop Jeez, and... look. She's coming outside. Uh-huh. False alarm. She's just washing the windows. Yeah? Well, that's the fastest wash job I've ever seen. She's heading inside again. She came out to make sure we'd gone. Come on. 
We'll work away along the sidewalk until we can see across the street into the coffee shop. Yeah, but she may spot us. Hey, hold it. She's on the phone with her back to us. She was lying, all right. Probably calling Tovich right now. Sheriff, how about slipping into the drugstore and tracing that call? Mm -hmm. I can keep an eye on the front of the shop from my car. I'll meet you there. The sheriff disappeared into the drugstore. I waited in my car. A couple of minutes later, he came over and got in, wearing a very puzzled look. Uh, must be some mistake, Jason. Yeah, what do you mean? That waitress, she just telephoned the Gentry Ranch. I don't think there is any mistake, Sheriff. And right now, it doesn't surprise me much. Yeah, but as far as we know, the only one at the Gentry Ranch is Will. Yeah, but Will's going to have company as soon as we can make it there. Wait a minute. You trying to say that Will Gentry... Sheriff, it looks like there is no Tovich and never has been. I guess the boy we've been up against right from the start is Will Gentry. I radioed KTXA to set up a roadblock on the highway 10 miles each way from the Gentry Ranch in case Will should take off before we could get there. And I jammed the gas pedal to the floor and held it there. I'll relay information. Jace, you're leaving me way behind. Will Gentry. Looks like I was way behind for a while, too. But looking back on it, it all falls into place. We know Will was always after money from his stepfather, Chester. And he invented the story about a gambler named Tovich as an excuse to get that money? He even went so far as to rent a room in Biggerstown under that name. But when Chester cracked down and threatened to disinherit him, Will used the same Tovich device to kill Chester. That way, he'd get all Chester's money. So when Chester opened the front door thinking Tovich was outside, there wasn't anybody there at all. And it was Will who plugged him. KTXA to Unit 10. Unit 10, go ahead, KTXA. Unit 320, stationed at Tucker's Junction. Unit 256, stationed at Biggerstown, turn off. Unit 10, 10-4. KTXA, clear. Well, we got the roadblock set up. Tucker's Junction's about five miles the other side of the Gentry Ranch, isn't it? Yep. And with another highway patrol car back of us at the Biggerstown turnoff, looks like we got Will bottled up tight if he makes a run for it. There's no side roads off the highway for six or seven miles along here. Good. As soon as we get the top of this rise, we ought to be able to spot the Gentry Ranch. Yeah, ranch house only a mile or so from here, Jace. It was Will who made those tracks in the frost then, huh? He heard me say we'd start trailing in the morning. I guess he figured on giving us something to trail. Yeah, and that explains Miss Packer's murder, too. She must have seen Will's picture in the paper, recognized him as Tovich, so she tried to phone you. And when she called the ranch house, Will knew he had to shut her mouth for keeps. He probably got back from killing her just before we showed up at the ranch house after the trailing. There's the ranch house, only a half mile more. Now wait, the taillight's swinging out on the highway. He's making a run for it. What kind of cars he drive? Gray sedan, isn't it? Yep. Unit 10 to all units in roadblock. Subject, Will Gentry, attempting getaway. Proceeding east on Highway 19 in gray sedan. Unit 10 pursuing. Unit 203 to Unit 10. Unit 10. Go ahead, Unit 203. Unit 203 on Highway 19, three miles west of Tucker's Junction. That's only a couple of miles east of us, Jace. Proceed west on Highway 19, Unit 203. Unit 203, 10-4. Unit 10, clear. Yeah, we got him bottled up for sure, Jace. We're backstopped at both ends, and we're coming at him from both ends. It's a squeeze play. I sure hope so. Unit 10 to Unit 203. Unit 203, go ahead, Unit 10. Have you sighted Gentry's car yet? Not yet, Unit 10. We'll report contact. Unit 10, clear. I don't get it, Sheriff. We should have spotted Gentry by this time. We're almost together. Here, watch it, Jace. Sharp bend in the road just ahead. Just past this drive-in movie here. Yeah, I see it. The only way Gentry could get off the highway is to ditch his car, and I don't think he'd do that. Hey, a red light coming at us. That must be Unit 203. He's stopping, too. But where's Will? No sign of Gentry? None, Jay. No, but there aren't any side roads at all. He couldn't have vanished into thin air. Hey, wait a minute. That drive-in movie we just passed. You think he turned in? It's the only place he could have turned in. Come on. <laughs> We went back to the drive-in theater, stationed the highway patrol car at the exit, then the sheriff and I talked to the theater manager. He remembered a gray sedan pulling in there a few minutes before. He'd sent it to the rear aisle, so the three of us circled around the theater on the outside of the fence and then came in through a small gate in the rear. But Gentry's car wasn't in the back row. 
But he's got to be in this back row, Ranger. That's where I sent him. Look, there's a vacant spot in the row. The one in the next row ahead. He could have wormed his way forward a few rows. Yeah, that's right. A lot of people do that trying to get a better spot. About 200 cars in here. It's going to be like looking for a needle. Hey, hold it. Three aisles up, near the side. Yeah, that's his car, all right. Going to take him now, Jason? I can't. There's too many cars around him. It's a cinch he won't come peacefully. Somebody might get shot. If we could only get the car on each side of him to get clear... I could make an announcement on the public address. No, that's no good. He'd probably start shooting. I can't warn the car on each side. Will would spot me. Same goes for you, Sheriff. Want me to do it? You? Oh, I don't know. It'd be pretty... Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, I think I got it. You go up to the car on this side of Will. Tell him to clear out in exactly one minute. Then go to Will's car. Tell him you're checking the reception on those speakers they hang on the side of their cars. And then go to the car the other side of him. Tell them to clear out in two minutes. Good idea. That way, maybe Will won't get suspicious. Thirty seconds after the second car leaves, turn on all the lights. Okay. I'll give it a whirl. See you after it's all over. I hope. watched the manager go along the line of cars. He worked his way to Will's car, then passed it to the one beyond. Then he headed for the projection booth. So far, so good. Seconds ticked by. At the end of the first minute, the car this side of Will pulled out. Another minute went by. And the car the other side of Will got going. He's out in the open now, Jason. Yeah. Twenty seconds till the lights go on. Come on. John, you came to the Get just a little closer. I'll take him from this side. Hey, Jace. He's starting up. He must have got suspicious. He won't get far. You hit his car. Will, come out of that car with your hands in the air. There go the lights, John. That's coming out all right, Ranger. Look out, Jace. Oh. Come on, Sheriff. You okay, Jace? Uh, yeah. Hey, you sure knocked him down, Tonto. Uh, uh, hit him in the shoulder. Why didn't you finish me off? That's up to the state of Texas, Will, not me. But I think they'll oblige you, all right. Will Gentry was tried and convicted of the murders of Chester Gentry and Leona Packer. On the morning of April 12, 1948... He was executed in the electric chair at Huntsville Penitentiary. And here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae, with another interesting story about the Texas Rangers. Although the Texas Rangers is a highly organized law enforcement agency, the men themselves are rugged individualists. One ranger in particular that I know of carries his six shooters with only five shells in each gun. One day he was asked why he did this. If the hammer's resting on an empty chamber, he said, the gun can't be fired accidentally. But, said his interested friend, with only five bullets instead of six in the gun, aren't you endangering your own position? Maybe so, he said with a grin, but if you can't hit your target with five shells, the sixth one won't do you much good anyhow. Good night, folks. See you next week. Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Bill Johnstone, Farley Bear, Jeanette Nolan, Byron Kane, Mike Barrett, and Ernie Newton. This story was transcribed and adapted by Bob Reif, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Remember all the delightful troubles that beset Mr. Blandings when he built his dream house? Well, starting next Sunday afternoon, you can hear the further adventures of the beleaguered Mr. Blandings and his wonderful wife, Muriel. It's top listening for the entire family next Sunday and Sundays thereafter when Cary Grant and Betsy Drake star as Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. Stay tuned for the $64 question. Tomorrow, hear the symphony on NBC.
The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. From Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Death Plant. It is 11 o'clock on the night of September 18th, 1946. 14 miles east of Pembroke, Texas, on State Route 70, stands the First Community Church. Each Wednesday night, members of the congregation have been donating their services to the construction of a recreation hall. The evening's work is just over, and Tom Peters, a farmer, stands in the parking area, waiting for his wife to catch up to him. Shelby! All right. And don't forget, Mrs. Weezy, will you mix the flour and be sure you blend it first with a couple of tablespoons full of... Shelby! You going to stand there at John the whole night? Oh! Oh, that man, I know what you've got. No more patience than a bull in fly time. I'll call you tomorrow. Yeah. What makes you always in such a hurry? Somebody in this family's got to be in a hurry. Leave it to you and never get anywhere. Oh, now, Tom, you know you don't. Yeah. Tom, you left the motor running. I sure left it running. Told you I was going to. Battery's almost dead. Oh, yes, I forgot. Yeah, that no good will Fenton. Sell me a heap like this and corner it a pickup truck. <laughs> Ah, it's getting so a man can't trust nobody nowadays. You know what I'm going to do, Sylvie? I'm going to take him to law, just like I told him tonight. You'll do no such thing, Tom Peters. Will, too. Man still got some rights around here. Gotta let people like Wasn't Will Fenton... Wasn't that know... a pretty dress she had on tonight? Uh, who? Will Fenton's wife. Oh, she's such a pretty little thing, anyhow. He sure is good to her. Hmm. Why, well, I bet that's the third new dress she's had in four months. There, you see what I mean? Goes around cheating on his people so as he can buy dresses for his wife. Tom, Tom, hmm. now, don't take on so. Hmm. You know how hard trucks are to get, and we waited Not a long... for this piece of junk. I tell you, Sylvie, I'm going to take him to court. <laughs> oh, you've told him that every day since you bought the truck. Then I'll do it, too. And see if I don't. You oughtn't argue with him like you did tonight. At least not so close to the church. Mm. Well, here's the outer gate already. Don't take long when you got something to ride in. <laughs> Maybe I better get out and open the gate so you can keep the motor no, running. No, 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 I'll open it. You just sit there and... Now, look what it's gone and done. Died on me. I told you. You didn't tell me no such thing. Well, I reckon maybe you did. Oh, you get it started again. No good, Will Fenton. Well, reckon I better get out and open the gate. If I can push over that little rise, we can coast down the slope and maybe she'll catch. Now, you be careful, Tom Peters, pushing trucks at your age. Just don't you worry about me. Tom? Yeah, what? There's a funny sound in here, like something ticking. Oh, it's just the engine cooling off. You women. You never understand nothing. I got to get me a bumper gate one of these days. Business getting out every time you oh, want to open. Oh, this don't sound like no engine cooling off. Now, Sylvie, I told you it was just... Ah! Oh. Oh. Sylvie! Sylvie! <laughs> The explosion of the truck kills Sylvie Peters immediately. Her husband was found unconscious and taken to the Pembroke Hospital where his condition was pronounced serious. The sheriff investigating the case requested the help of a Texas Ranger, 
and Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned, joining the sheriff at the scene of the explosion a little after 2 a.m. Yeah, there's the truck, Jace. What's left of it? Not a very pretty way to die. Murder's never very pretty, Sheriff. The gate, was it open when you got here? Yeah, Tom must have got out to open it. That's how he missed getting killed. This bomb, Jace, you reckon it was tossed at him? Not likely. The way the cab of the truck's blown, I'd say the bomb was planted in there. We'll have to... You see something? Yeah. Here, hold my light, will you, Sheriff? Sure. You're right on that spot. Mm -hmm. Here's part of your bomb, Sheriff. Why, it's just a hunk of split lead pipe. That's right. Plumbing pipe from the looks of it. How do you know that's part of the bomb? Tom might have been carrying lead pipe in the back of his truck. Look at the way it's split down the seam. The powder burns. Move the light around a bit, Sheriff. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Hold it. Here's something else. What is it, Jason? A mainspring out of an alarm clock. I'll call Austin and get a lab crew to give this place a good going over. At least we know what killed Sylvia Peters. A homemade time bomb. We went to the hospital and waited. A little after seven that morning, Tom Peters was conscious and strong enough to answer questions. He was covered with bandages, but he opened his eyes when we walked into his room. Hello, Tom. Uh, Tom, this is Ranger Pearson. He'd like to ask you a few questions. Mr. Peters. Oh, now easy, Tom. Sometimes, when I'd be working out in the fields and it was hot, She'd come all the way out just to bring me a picture of him. <laughs> oh, now, Tom, you don't have to talk about it. Thirty-two years. We've been married. Thirty-two years. Mr. Peters, do you have any idea who might have done this? <laughs> Will Fenton is the one that just... <laughs> Now, oh, easy, Tom. Easy, boy. What makes you sure Will Fenton set that bomb? I, I was going to take it to court on the gun in that truck he stole me. That's why he blew it up. So I couldn't prove nothing. But, Tom, Will Fenton wouldn't try to kill you just because he was scared of going to court. How long ago did you buy that truck, Mr. Peters? Five. Six days ago. <laughs> Fenton lived far from here, Sheriff. Ten miles. A little less, maybe. You gotta get it, Sheriff. You gotta make it. Don't worry, Mr. Peters. If Will Fenton set that bomb, we'll get him. <laughs> We drove out to the Fenton farm and found an attractive young woman in the kitchen whom the sheriff introduced as Vern Fenton, Will's wife. She told us Will was expected any minute. We settled down over some coffee and waited. Mrs. Fenton had already heard about the death of Sylvia Peters. I just can't understand it. Who'd want to do something like that to poor Sylvie? That's what we're trying to find out, Miss Fenton. She was so sweet. When we moved here, she was the first one to come visit us. You and your husband aren't from around here then, ma'am? No. I was raised on a ranch about a hundred miles east. Will worked on a ranch near us. How long have you had this place? Since right after we got married. Not quite a year now. Ranger, you haven't said why you wanted to see my husband. We just want to ask him a few questions about last night. But I don't understand he... Hi, Sheriff. Howdy, Will. Yeah, this is Ranger Pearson. He wants to have a little talk with you. All right, sure, sure. Glad to oblige. You want some coffee, Will? Yeah, don't bother, honey. I'll pour it myself. I'll do it. Uh, sit down. Thanks. Yeah, Ranger, what can I do for you? Mr. Fenton, I suppose you heard about what happened to Tom and Sylvia Peters last night. Yeah, yeah, I heard about that. It's an awful thing. It's awful. It makes me feel real bad. 
I I sold Tom that truck. We heard there was a lot of hard feelings between you and Tom about that truck. Tom says you cheated him, Will. Says he was going to take you to court about it. Well, that's crazy, Sheriff. Tom knew that truck was in bad shape when he bought it. But you did have some hot words over it later, huh? Well, you know, Tom gets a little excited, that's all. You were at the church last night, weren't you? Sure, sure, me and Vern both. Did you stay inside the recreation hall the whole time? Yeah, I don't remember. Maybe I stepped out for a little air. Not sure. I think you'd better try to remember. You saying I set that bomb in Tom's truck? I'm not saying anything yet. But how did you know it was set there? It might have been thrown in when Tom stopped at his gate. Yeah, well, that's what everybody's saying. It was a time bomb. Look, Ranger, I admit Tom and I had a few words, but you don't think I'd kill him, do you? There's been a murder. It's my job to ask questions. Oh, sure, sure. You're only doing your job. <laughs> you're barking up the wrong tree if you think I killed him. You better find somebody who really hated Tom. That's just what we're going to do. Don't go too far from your farm, Mr. Fenton, because we might be back to see you. <laughs> We spent the rest of that day and half the night checking on people who knew Tom Peters and his wife. It was about 2.30 the next morning when we decided to turn in. The sheriff suggested a cup of coffee at the diner across from the courthouse. Uh, man, I know one thing, Jace. I sure am tired. Yeah, I could use a little sleep myself. Howdy, Sheriff. Ranger, what'll it be? Coffee for me, Eddie. Ranger? Same. Two coffees. You fellas up pretty late tonight. Working on that Peters bombing? That's right. Well, it shouldn't be too hard to find the fellow that did that. How do you mean? Well, now, I don't want to be talking behind nobody's back, but it appears like everybody in town knew old Tom was feuding with Will Fenton about the pickup truck Will sold him. I wouldn't want Will to be sore at me. Hey, excuse me a minute, Jen. Yeah, looks like everywhere we turn, we get the story about the fight between Will Fenton Eddie's and Tom. Down. Must have heard it 20 yep. times already. Yeah, just yeah. Go we'll head out there again in the morning. Have another talk okay, with Okay, I'll Fenton. get him for you. The phone operator wants you, Sheriff. Says it's right important. Oh, thanks, Eddie. How's old Tom, Ranger? Heard he was hurt pretty bad. Well, he'll Sheriff, pull through Sheriff. all right. The doc said tonight he was oh. out of danger. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure glad to hear it. Old hey, Tom, you know, he blows off a mite of steam, but... What? He don't mean nothing. We'll be right out. I ain't sure gonna miss Sylvie, though. Hey. All right. Jace, come on. We're not going to get to sleep yet. What's the matter? That was Will Fenton. He just found a bomb under his house. In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Whatever you drive the car... There is always an unseen, unwelcome passenger with you. That passenger is danger. The danger of a traffic accident. Unfortunately, every person seems to have the absurd notion that he bears a charmed life, that no traffic accident can happen to him. But it can, and too often it does. So when you're behind that wheel, don't take chances. Obey all traffic rules. Drive safely for life, your life, and the lives of others. We continue now. With Tales of the Texas Rangers and tonight's case, Death Plant. An authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. The sheriff and I rushed out to the Fenton farm. We spotted Will standing in front of the house in a bathrobe. When we pulled up, he came running over to the car. Where's the bomb, Mr. Fenton? It was in a box. It's ticking like a clock. Where is it? I'll show you. I moved it away from the house out in that field there. Yeah, it's a good way to get your head blown off. My wife, she's still asleep. I didn't want to scare her none. Uh, there it is by that mesquite over yonder. All right. You stay here with the sheriff. What are you figuring to do, Jace? Deactivate that bomb. Yeah, well, now, don't be crazy, Jace. It won't hurt nobody where it is. Let it go off by itself. I need it for evidence. Do you want some help? No, thanks. Be careful, Jace. Yeah. How are you making out? It's all right now, Sheriff. Sure now, Ranger. You sure that thing's out of commission? Well, it should be. I pulled the wires and stopped the clock mechanism. Another homemade job, Jace? Yeah. Hey, 
know, if I'd have thought of that, I, I probably should have dumped it in a pail of water and saved you all that wrist ring. That's the worst thing you can do with a bomb, Mr. Fenton, unless you know what it's made of. It might have chemicals in it that get set off by water. How'd you happen to find it? Oh, yeah, well, I, I, I woke up uh, maybe a few minutes before I tried to get you... Uh, I thought I heard somebody walking around outside the house, and I come out to How look. How come you don't keep a dog out here, Will? Uh, well, kind of my wife, Sheriff. She's scared of him. Exactly where'd you find this bomb, Mr. Fenton? Right under where our bedroom is. You think of anybody who might have planted it there? Uh, I don't have to think. I saw who did it. You what? Yeah, I saw his car when he drove away. I knew that jalopy anywhere. It was Clint Mockler. Who's Clint Mockler? Young cowpoke I used to work with before I got married. He's no good. Never was. Used to bother Vern all the time, and he stole a diamond ring from the boss. His wife got sent to, to Huntsville for two years. How long ago was that? Uh, maybe 15 months. Probably out on parole, Jason. Uh-huh. You sure it was him here tonight? Well, I saw him, I tell you. Uh, and a little over a week ago, when I was coming back from town, he was parked in his jalopy a mile or so down the road. Just, just sitting there, looking up toward our house. Did you tell your wife about that? Oh, no, no, no. I'd get her all upset. I see. Then tonight was the second time you've seen him around here. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Only way I can figure it is, when he got out of jail, he heard about Vern and me being married, made him sore enough to want to kill us. You sure you didn't see him around church Wednesday night? No, no. Uh, well, that don't mean he couldn't have been there. I've been thinking like you, Jace, but it just don't make sense. If this fellow was mad at the Fentons here, why would he want to kill old Tom and Sylvie a- unless he was crazy? I don't think he was crazy, Sheriff. Got a hunch he just made a mistake. How do you mean? Don't forget, Sheriff, Tom Peters only bought that pickup a week ago from Mr. Fenton here. Yeah? Oh, then it was the Fentons he was after all the time. Only he didn't know the truck had changed hands. Could be. Yeah, you gotta get this Markler, Ranger. He's no good. He tried to kill us again. Maybe next time we make it, you gotta get him. We have to find him first. Uh, he's working over at the Williams Ranch now. Place about 50 miles from here near Dalby. Well... Something wrong? Oh, Vern, honey. Thought she was asleep. I heard you talking. What's that thing? We had a little excitement, ma'am. It's all right now. Honey, I... I don't want you to get upset, but... I reckon I have to tell you sooner or later. Might as well be now. Clint Markley tried to set this bomb under a place. Clint? But... But he couldn't have. He's in jail. Not anymore, Miss Fenton. But don't you worry. We'll get him. He couldn't have tried to kill us. I don't believe it. Honey, you don't know him the way I do. I work with him. He's no good. He's rotten clear through, like I always told you. Well, Jace, I reckon we better get going. Yeah, I want to get this bomb to Pembroke for the lab crew to check over. Then if we hurry, we can make the Williams Ranch before breakfast. At the ranch, they told us our best bet for finding Clint Markler was to take horses and look for the foreman, Hank Snyder. He described Clint and told us he was at a loading pen near the Santa Fe tracks. As we approached, we saw several men loading cattle into the cars. Reckon that's him over there, Jace, to straddle that fence. Yeah, we'll soon find out, Sheriff. Whoa. Whoa, Charky. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, you. Yeah? You Clint Mockler? That's right. What you want? Come here a minute. All right. Shove up next empty, will you? Uh, what you want, Ranger? The sheriff and I want to talk to you. What about? You been over to Pembroke lately? Maybe. Why? Did you see the Fentons? Hey, what's all this about? You're still on parole, aren't you, Clint? So what? Ain't against the law to go to Pembroke. Why did you want to see the Fentons? Vern's an old friend of mine. Guess I just want to talk to him. Did you talk to him? No. Why not? Oh, when I got out of jail, I wrote Vern a letter. She didn't answer, but last week I decided to drive over anyway. What kept you from seeing her? Nothing. But after I got there, I started thinking maybe she didn't want to see me. Then Will drove past in his truck, and I knew when I saw him it wouldn't be any good for me to go up there. Did Will stop and talk to you? No. Slowed down, just looked at me. Look, Ranger, what's all this about, anyhow? Somebody put a bomb in that truck. It killed a woman named Sylvie Peters. We figured the killer meant to get Will and his wife, because last night he put a bomb under Will's house. Well, did Vern get her? No, she's all right. What about you? You were seen driving away from the Fenton farm early this morning. That's a lie. I wasn't anywhere near. Where were you? In town. Anybody with you? No. What time did you get back to the ranch? I don't know. Maybe three. Out till three in the morning and got to get up at five? What are you trying to hand us, boy? I don't need much sleep. 
I got plenty of it down in Huntsville. How about Wednesday night, Clint? Where were you then? Wednesday? Well, I, I drove over to see a friend about 15 miles south of here. What's your friend's name? I want to talk to him. Uh, it won't do any good. Why not? Because when I got there, it wasn't home. I think you better come back to Pembroke with us. On this range, I didn't have nothing to do with it. Come on, Clint. Let's go. Look, Ranger, how long I got to stay here? I told you everything I know. I'm afraid it's not enough. Unless you can prove where you were the last two nights. Why can't I prove it? Nobody saw me. You know why, don't you? Because you're lying. The first night you were over at the church, planting a bomb in the Peters truck. I don't even know the Peters. Of course you don't, but you know Will and Vern Fenton, and it was them you were trying to kill. That ain't so. Why would I want to kill Vern? How long have you known Vern, Clint? Going on four years. You know her pretty well, didn't you? I was crazy about it. We're going to get married. Would have, too, if, if you had... hadn't gone to jail. Yeah. I don't blame her, though. Not wanting to wait for a jailbird. Sure, I got a little sore when I heard you married Will, but I wouldn't kill her. You got to believe that. Are you still in love with her, Clint? Yeah, I guess I am. And you didn't try to kill her? No. No, somebody's trying to put the finger on me, just like last time when they said I stole a diamond ring. What about the ring? I never took it. Somebody must put it in my pocket. Didn't even know it was there till they searched me. Now you're trying to put me away again for something I didn't do. You were seen driving away from the Fenton farm just after the bomb was planted. Who saw me? Will Fenton. Oh, I did. Wait a minute. Now I'm beginning to get it. What? What a dope I am. All the time I was in a pen, I tried to figure you planted that ring on me. Now I know. It was Will Fenton. Making up lies won't help you none, Clint. Why would I want to lie now? I served my time for stealing a ring, didn't I? But I didn't steal it. Will Fenton did. What makes you think so? That ain't hard to figure out. He was always jealous of me and Vern. Wanted for himself. That's why he got me out of the way before, and that's what he's trying to do now. Sheriff, you got somebody we can leave Clint with for a while? Deputies in the next room. Take him in there, will you? Yeah. Come on. Look, you see, he's trying to frame me again, Ranger. That's what he's trying Hold to do. Hold this fellow for a spell, will you, Charlie? You ready to file charges against him, Jase? Not yet, Sheriff. What's the matter? You don't believe the stuff he was handing us to you? I don't know. There's still a few things that don't feel right. Like what? Like Will telling us where Clint Mockler worked. How did he know? Well, he... probably from that letter Clint wrote to Miss Fenton. Yeah, that's probably the way he found out. But I got a hunch he opened the letter and she never saw it. What makes you think that? Because she didn't even know Clint was out of prison. What does this all prove, Jace? That maybe a husband's jealousy is behind the whole thing? How would you say Clint felt about Will's wife? I'd say he was still pretty sweet on her. So would I. And if he is... Why would he want to kill her? Are you saying Fenton planted that bomb under his house himself? I'm not saying yet. Then there's something I don't get. If that's true, it was Will Fenton who killed Sylvie Peters. Uh-huh. But that don't make sense. It does if Fenton wanted Clint to have a real murder to answer for. Get him out of the way for good. He'd have to be awful smart to plan it that careful. What's our next step, Jase? Talk to Mrs. Fenton. Find out if she still cares anything about Clint. And if she does? And we'll see what makes a jealous husband tick. Oh, howdy, Ranger. Sheriff, sure. Will. Come on in. Did you pick up Clint Mockler? Your wife around, Mr. Fenton? Yeah, sure. Do you mind calling her? Oh, sure, sure. Vern, honey? Yeah? Come on, come in here a minute. I still don't see why you want her. What is it? Oh. I'll answer your question now, Mr. Fenton. We picked up Clint Mockler today over at the Williams Ranch. Oh, that's fine, Ranger. Yeah, we can all breathe easier knowing he's behind bars now. You mean he did it? We don't know yet, ma'am, but we're holding him for investigation until we get this bombing business straightened out. But he wouldn't do it. I, I know he wouldn't. Looks pretty bad for him, Miss Fenton. Honey, I've been telling you all along. You don't know him. He's just no good. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. Mr. Fenton, when you saw Clint's car down the road about a week ago, did you stop and speak to him? Mm, no. Why should I? Then how did you know he was working over at the Williams Ranch? Well, I don't know. I, I, I could have heard it in town. We understand that Clint wrote your wife a letter after he got out of prison. 
Could you have learned it from that? Clint wrote me a letter? That's what he says, ma'am. How about it, Mr. Fenton? Did he? I suppose he did. I suppose I opened it. Nothing wrong with a husband protecting his wife against a criminal, is he? What do you mean, opening my letter? It's no good, honey. I tried to tell you. I only took that letter so you wouldn't get upset. That's not it. You kept his letter from me because you were afraid. Honey, will you listen to I've me? I've listened to you long enough telling me not to wait for Clint, talking me into marrying you when I didn't love you. Honey, You I... told me I'd learn to love you. Well, I didn't. And you know why? Because I still That's love you. That's Talk about our private affairs when we're alone. Uh, anything more you want from us, Ranger? We'd like to search your house, if you don't mind. Yeah, what for? I think we might find some things that'll help us clear up this case. Suppose I say no. Maybe this warrant will change your mind. Okay. What do you want to look at? We're looking for any pipe or wire you have around. Sure, sure. I got some sewer pipe and bailing wire out in that shed. You're welcome to see it. That's not what the ranger means, Will, and you know it. Lead pipe and electric wire. The kind they use to make a bomb. <laughs> what would what, it prove if you found it? Nothing till we get it to the lab. Then we could tell if it was the same kind used in both bombs. Yeah, there's none of that stuff around here. How about the pipe and the I closet? told you once before, Ranger, I tell you again, you're barking up the wrong tree. Well, you just have... how about the pipe in the closet? How about it, Mr. Fenton? Oh, that, that stuff, that... that... That ain't what you're after. I'd like to take a look at it. I'll show you, Ranger. Closet's right this way. I I know the pipe she's talking about. That ain't what you're after, Ranger. Let the Ranger be the judge of that, Will. Uh, Sure, sure. It's in here, Ranger. Saw it last week. It's right in here. One large and... Now, wait a minute, honey. I know where it is. Women don't know anything about pipe. She... Look behind these boxes. Here it is. Right here. Hold it. I'll kill you. Hold it, I said. I'll kill her. Drop that pipe. Let me get her. No. Let me go. Let me go. As soon as I get these cuffs on you. Uh, no, I... no, you're all right, Miss Benton. Just crack. I want to kill her. I can't have her, neither can he. I'm a killer. I... You've done all the killing you're going to do, Fenton. Now it's the state's turn. Faced with the laboratory evidence against him, Will Fenton made a full confession to the murder of Sylvie Peters. On October 16, 1946, he was tried and convicted. On November 22, 1947, at Huntsville Penitentiary... He died in the electric chair. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Cattle Drive. The cast included Tony Barrett, Virginia Gregg, Bill Johnstone, Parley Bear, Charlotte Lawrence, and Lamont Johnson. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Charles E. Israel, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Now, enjoy the big show with guest stars including Gene Carroll, Ed Archie Gardner, Ann Southern, Hildegard, Robert Cummings, and your glamorous hostess, Tallulah Bankhead. Then it's mirth and music with Phil Harris and Alice Faye. Later, Theater Guild on the Air co-stars Brenda Marshall and William Holden in the exciting story of The Lost Weekend. The big show, the Phil Harris-Alice Faye show, Theater Guild on the Air. Hear all three on NBC. Next, it's The Big Show. All this and Tallulah, too, on NBC.
from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Death Shaft. It is 9.30 a.m., November 18th, 1941, in the Big Bend country of West Texas. J.C. Wilford of the Bureau of Mines and Fred Blaisdell are winding up a narrow dirt road toward Blaisdell's abandoned mine in Black Hawk Canyon. How long did you say it's been since you operated your mine, Mr. Blaisdell? I never have operated, Wilford. It was left me by my brother when he passed on. Oh, I see. I always understood there was ore here if you had the money to get it out, but... I didn't. So I just let her sit here. Haven't even been near the place for oh, two years anyway. But lately I've been reading that the government's anxious to get some of these mines going again. Mm-hmm. So I got in touch with you at the Bureau of Mines to see if you think it's a worthwhile proposition. Well, if it looks promising at all, we can make a thorough survey, do a little diamond drilling and see what we've got. And then if it looks good, you think the government will loan the money to operate it? Well, that's something I can't answer. All we at the Bureau do is make the recommendation. Hey, pretty desolate country around here, isn't it? Yeah, I see. Hey, here we are. Oh, uh, is that the entrance to the mine ahead? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Mm, all boarded up. And padlock. Guess my brother put that door on the entrance to the shaft when he quit working the mine. Yeah, I got my key. That's funny. You know, what's the matter, please? The key doesn't seem to fit. Well, you sure it's the right one? Yeah. Uh... Hey, this isn't the same lock on here. What? Well, there was a master padlock on here before. Now it's just a cheap one from a dime store, looks like. That's strange. Who'd want to switch locks? Why? I don't know. Somebody must have been snooping around up here. Wait. Piece of iron bar line over here. See if I can find that lock on. It's a fairly new lock by the look of it. Yeah. There. Okay, let's open her up. Yeah, I got the flashlight. I better go first. Okay, weapon. So wet in here. Yeah. These drifts collect a lot of moisture when the mine's not in use. Please do. What's the matter, Wilfred? Look, they're on the ground in front of us. Holy smoke, a skeleton. The clothes just about all rotted away. And a, a different padlock on the entrance. Looks like somebody didn't want this skeleton found, Wilfred. Yeah, and if you'll take a look at the skull, you'll see why. Hey, it's all bashed in. It sure is. The club or a rock by the look of it. Yeah. Whoever that was, looks like he was murdered. <laughs> Two men notified Sheriff Benson, who requested help from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case, joining the sheriff and two men at Blaisdell's mine. Hmm. Pretty damp, Sheriff. Sure is. You men touch anything in here? Uh, not a thing, Ranger. After I pried off the new lock, we come inside. But just as soon as we saw the skeleton, we got out in a hurry and called the sheriff. Isn't that right, Wilford? Yeah, that's right, Ranger. Well, there it is, Jace. Yeah. Skull sure is bashed in. It'd be pretty hard to tell how long he's been dead, Jase. Yeah, remains would deteriorate pretty fast in this dampness. And as far as telling who it is, clothes are all rotted away, so the same would go for any papers he might have been carrying. Just a minute, Sheriff. Hmm? Look. 
And these loose rocks on the side here. All right. Looks like a leather wallet. It is. Pretty well preserved, too. Sure, sure. It was a little higher than the skeleton up out of the wet. Yeah. Pretty lucky for us. Looks that way. Any money in it? No. Just some papers. Hmm. Might have been robbery. Killer took the money, then tossed the billfold away. Can you make out the writing on any of the papers? Gilbert W. Madden. Madden? Uh, name mean anything to you, Blaisdell? I was just trying to think. No, no, I don't I don't remember ever hearing it before. How about you, Mr. Wilford? Being from the Bureau of Mines, you probably spend a lot of time around this part of the state. You ever hear the name before? Madden. It sounds a little familiar, but I, I can't seem to place it, Ranger. I'm sorry. Okay. I guess that'll be all for now. Let's get back outside. We want signed statements from you. You can drop around the sheriff's office and make them. I'll be in this afternoon, if that's okay. Sure. See you then, Blaisdell. Come on, Wilfred. I'll give you a lift back to town. All right. You through here, Jase? Not quite. Take this broken padlock along. I want to look at this hasp on the door. Uh, I doubt if you can tell much from that. It's all scratched up where Blaisdell pried off that padlock. Yeah, I know. There's one thing sort of puzzles me a little, Sheriff. What is it? This new lock isn't rusty enough to have been out here in the open for very long. Well, what do you figure that means? I won't know until I can get some idea of the approximate time of death. Come on, let's get back to town and start checking on Gilbert Madden. See if we can find out how long ago he was murdered. <laughs> Back at the sheriff's office, I checked through the missing persons reports and found one on Gilbert Madden, filed by his wife eight months before. Mrs. Madden was promptly notified and requested to meet us at the sheriff's office for routine questioning. Have a seat, Ms. Madden. Thank you, Sheriff. I'm sorry to be asking questions at a time like this, ma'am. That's all right, Ranger. I don't suppose there's any doubt it was Gil. I'm afraid not, ma'am. We found his wallet, and the lab confirmed the identification by means of the teeth. Well, I've felt for some time that Gil must be dead. In a way, it's almost better knowing instead of wondering. I know. Mrs. Madden, our lab's trying to establish the time of your husband's murder. Now, according to our information, you filed this missing persons report on last March 23rd, a little less than eight months ago. That's right. What were the circumstances surrounding your husband's disappearance? Well, uh, Gilbert was a mine broker. He made trips in the mining country every now and then. He planned to be away for two or three weeks, so I decided to visit my relatives in Kansas while he was gone. I see. When was that? Right around the first of March, as I remember. And how long were you in Kansas? Three weeks. Did you hear from your husband during that time? Oh, yes, I did. I got a letter from him just a couple of days before I was to return home, saying he would meet my train. But he wasn't at the depot when I arrived called all over town trying to locate him, and then when I couldn't, I got worried. The next day, I filed a report with the police. Well, let's see. That'd make it about the 20th of March when you got that last letter from your husband. That means he was alive up until the time he mailed it, anyway, which would be about the 18th of March. Come in. I left my statement with your deputy, Sheriff. Be anything else? Oh, I reckon not. Mrs. Madden, this is Mr. Blaisdell. How do you do? Miss Madden? Mr. Blaisdell owns the mine where your husband's body was discovered. Oh. Uh, sorry to make your acquaintance under this sort of circumstance, Miss Madden. Uh, Sheriff, I'm sure you told me where this mine was over the phone when you notified me, but what with the shock, I don't seem to remember. Oh, my mine is over in Blackhawk Canyon, Miss Madden. Blackhawk Canyon? Uh, that mean anything to you, Miss Madden? Oh, Willie. Who? Uh, oh, Willie. He lives up in Blackhawk Canyon somewhere. Look, Mrs. Madden, who is this old Willie? Well, he has a mind up there. He's a strange old man. He's very eccentric. Well, what makes you think he had anything to do with this? Because in that last letter I got from Gil, but he mentioned something about old Willie pestering him again. I didn't pay much attention to it at the time. I still don't get the connection between your husband and this old Willie, Mrs. Madden. Well, you see, about two years ago, my husband made a business trip into that region. I went with him. This old Willie was hanging around a little store where we stopped for a cold drink. When he found out my husband was a mine broker, he became very excited. Said he had a valuable mine he wanted Gilbert to look at. Did your husband inspect Willie's mine? No, because the storekeeper broke in and told us Willie's mine was worthless. Willie became furious and finally the storekeeper threw him out. I see. Did Willie threaten your husband, Mrs. Madden? 
Well, he wrote a few crazy sort of letters to Gilbert, accusing him of being a spy of what he called the big companies. Hmm. Mr. Blaisdell, have you ever heard of this old Willie? No, I haven't, but that doesn't mean anything. I'm not acquainted with anybody in that area. Jase, I sure think this old Willie is worth questioning. So do I, Sheriff. We'll head back to Black Hawk Canyon and see if we can find him. Right now, he sounds like a first-class murder suspect. In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Here's great news for all of you Western fans. Beginning next Friday on most NBC stations, Roy Rogers, the King of the Cowboys, and Dale Evans, the Queen of the West, will bring you the new Roy Rogers Show. Yes, beginning next Friday, be sure to listen for Roy Rogers, Dale Evans, and Trigger in New Adventures in Paradise Valley. It's the Roy Rogers Show, Friday, on most NBC stations. Be sure to listen. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and tonight's case, Death Chef. An authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. As a matter of routine, I checked up on Mrs. Madden's story of her visit to relatives in Kansas and quickly confirmed the fact that she was there during the period she had stated. Next, Sheriff Benson and I drove to the small general store in Black Hawk Canyon and questioned the storekeeper. Oh, Willie... Sure, I know him, Ranger. Comes in here once a month regular for supplies. Crazy as a coot. Where does he live, Price? Oh, about 20 miles up the canyon. He's got a no-count mine up on East Rim. Of course, he thinks it's just chock full of ore. <laughs> Mr. Price, I want you to think back about two years ago. An incident involving old Willie and a mine broker named Madden is supposed to have taken place here in your store. You remember anything about it? Sure do. Willie started giving this mine broker the usual jaw wagon about his mine being valuable. <laughs> so I figured I'd better stick my oar in and tell the fellow Willie's mine wasn't worth a dad burn cent. What happened then? Oh, Willie flew off the handle in his crazy way, started spouting a bunch of threats and other loony talk, so I finally had to kick him out of the store. Well, Jay said sure checks with what Miss Madden told us. Yeah. Mr. Price... Can you give us directions for finding Willie's place? We'd like to pay him a visit. Well, pretty rough country up there. And we got horses in the trailer outside. Oh, well, in that case, you can make it all right. Hey, you'll find the trail leading north off the road up ahead about um, five miles. Stick to the trail until they cross a dry creek. Uh, then you'll see another trail taken off up the side of the canyon. And the second trail leads us to Willie's mine, huh? Yep. Of course, uh, may not find him there. Why not? He's pretty skitterish about visitors. That's just why I want to pay him a visit. See if he's got anything to be skitterish about. We should be just about there, Sheriff. Yeah, by a climb. Looks like we're directly across the canyon from Blaisdell's mine. Listen, Burl. Must be Willie's. We're close, all right. Once we get around this bend in the trail, yeah. It looks like some diggings up ahead there. And just take a look at that shack there. Some place. Galvanized iron, tar paper, cardboard. I wonder what keeps it up. Probably that stovepipe sticking up through the center of the roof. Yeah, it's smoking, too. Willie must be home, all right. Ooh, ooh, charcoal. Oh, oh, boy. Would you look at the junk he's got hanging on the outside wall? Pieces of barbed wire, tin cans, keys, bottles. Oh, looks like Willie's part pack wrap. Hmm. The door's open. Nobody inside. Inside looks like the outside. Only more so. Wonder where... Hold it. Hmm? Look, over there in the bushes. Yeah. Something moved, all right. Willie! Come out of there! Willie! Hey, somebody's coming out all right. Sure don't look very friendly with that rifle. What do you fellas want? You throw that rifle down and we'll tell you. You got no call to come poking around my property. You're wrong there, Willie. This is Sheriff Benson and I'm Ranger Pearson. 
We want to ask you a few questions. Now drop that rifle and come over here. You think I'm going to tell you about my mind, don't you? Yeah, and I'm not. Now, just a minute, Willie. You want to get it away from me just like all the rest. You spies for him, that's what you are. You come poking around here. Trying what are you to get... talking about, Willie? Spies for whom? For the big companies. They all want my mind because they know it's right smack dab on the biggest vein in the county. That's why they send spies snooping around here, like you two. I don't know, Jace. Willie... Have you ever been near the Blaisdell mine across the canyon from here? It ain't as good as this it is. Answer my question. Have you ever been near there? Yeah, maybe. How long ago? Oh, a couple of days. What were you doing over there? Patrolling. What do you mean, patrolling? Oh, I patrol all over. Gotta watch for the spies. Hmm. Ever hear the name Gilbert Madden? He ain't gonna never get my mine. All I need's a little money to operate. I asked you a question, Willie. Have you ever hear of Gilbert Madden? You heard him, Willie. Yeah, maybe I have and maybe I ain't. You fellas come up here spying just like he... Just like who? Madden? <laughs> Think you're pretty smart, don't you? But you're not going to trap me. He had his chance to get me money for the mine, but he wouldn't. That why you killed him? <laughs> yeah, you think you're going to get me confused with your smart talk, don't you? Well, you ain't. I ain't got too much on my mind patrolling to worry about killing anybody. Yeah? I wonder. We got a witness that you had a fight with Madden. And furthermore... Just a minute, Sheriff. What is it? Just happened to notice something hanging on the outside wall here. Just a bunch of old rusty keys. Yeah. But this one isn't as rusty as the rest. Well, let me see. Jace. That key's the same make as the lock Blaisdell pried off the entrance to his mine. That's right, Sheriff. Come here, Willie. Hey, what you want? Where'd you get this key? Say, that's a good one. You want to trade some? Where'd you get it? I saved key. Quit stalling, Willie. Where'd you get it? Coming around here asking me all kinds of questions. You got no call to... Put that padlock back in my office, Chase. I'm sure interested to see whether this key fits it. So am I. Come on, Willie. Get your burrow. We're going to take a ride. Making me come down here with you fellas. You think I'm not wise, do you? Padlock's in my desk here. You get me down here while one of your other spies snoops around my mind, takes all samples. Here it is. Let's have it. Okay, now I'll try this key in it. Fits. It sure does. Well, I guess that does it all right. Uh, can I go now? No, Willie. I don't think you'll be going anywhere for quite a spell. The sheriff booked Willie, but we were unable to get any sort of coherent statement out of him. Finally, we locked him up and went back into the sheriff's office. Well, regardless of whether or not he gives us a confession, I suppose we could get a conviction all right. Maybe. Unless they find him mentally incompetent. Even so, they'll put him away. Yeah, that's just what I was thinking. It'd be pretty rough on him if he happened to be innocent, wouldn't it? You be innocent? Now, Jay. Yeah, I know. You have two witnesses to the fact that Willie threatened Gilbert Madden. That's right. Mrs. Madden and the storekeeper. But what clinches it is a padlock on Blaisdell's mind, Jace. That key we found at Willie's shack fits it. That's about as solid evidence as there is, seems to me. I wonder. What do you mean? A couple of things about this don't feel quite right to me, Sheriff. Well, what, for instance? Well, near as the lab can figure, Madden was murdered about eight months ago. That's right, last March. But the lock Blaisdell broke off the mine entrance was hardly rusty at all. And neither was the key we found hanging out in the open at Willie's shack. What's wrong with that, Jase? Willie broke off the original lock when he hid Madden's body. But Madden died eight months ago, and that second lock couldn't have been on the hasp that long. Well, maybe Willie didn't put the lock on right away. Maybe later he got to worrying about somebody discovering the body and, well, that's when he put it on. Sheriff, the time you're most worried about a body being discovered is right after you've killed a man, not several months later. Sure, that's the way a sensible person would react. But remember who we're dealing with, old Willie, who's not exactly what you call a sensible man. I know, Sheriff. But then there's the part about the key hanging right out in plain sight at Willie's shack. Now, Jase, you said yourself Willie was part pack rat. 
Remember all the other junk he had hanging around the shack? Sure I do, Sheriff. I also remember what Willie said when we showed him that key. Say, that's a good one. Just like he'd never noticed it before. What are you getting at, Jase? Maybe Willie did kill Madden, but it seems to me there's a bare chance he didn't. Then how'd he get that key? Oh, he could have found it, or it could have been planted there. That'd be awful tough to prove either way, Jase. Sure it would. As long as it's a possibility, we're not closing the case. Come on, let's talk to Mrs. Madden and see if she can give us a line on anybody besides old Willie who might have a reason for killing her husband. We drove out to the Madden house, but Mrs. Madden was unable to give us any new information. She suggested we go through her husband's business records, which were in a spare room he'd used for an office. So the sheriff and I started in. But an hour later, the only things we found just made it look all the worse for Willie. Hmm. What do you got, Jase? Uh, a bunch of letters written on wrapping paper. Addressed to Madden. Crazy, threatening letters. Who wrote them? You guess. Willie? Yeah, Willie. Listen. You better watch out. I ain't gonna let you steal my mind. Mm. That's Willie, all right. Rest of them like that? Yeah. All six of them. Well, yeah, Jase, it looks all the worse for Willie now. We've been through just about all Madden's records and papers. And he's threatened letters are all we come up with. Yeah, and from the looks of it, Madden kept records of just about everything. Well, we might as well put these papers back, I guess. Okay. What do you got there? Uh, a pile of canceled checks. Hand them over and I'll stick them here in the drawer. Okay, just thumbing through them. I guess there's nothing here I... Hey. What is it? Sheriff, look at this check. It's dated two years ago. Hmm? Let's see. Well, what about it? It's just made out to cash and signed by Madden. Yeah, but take a look at this pencil writing up in the corner. Pencil writing? Let's... Well, I'll be. So will I. Come on. Gonna make an arrest? Not yet. I need more proof, and I think I know a way to get it. Just go along with whatever I say. Sure, Jay. Anything that's in help in Gilbert's papers, Range Pearson? I think we did, Mrs. Madden. You said you accompanied your husband on his business trip into the Black Hawk Canyon area two years ago. That's right. Why'd he go there? Well, just to size up the situation, find out what mines were for sale. I see. He didn't actually transact any business, though. No. Of course, this Willie wanted him to come up and see his mine, but when the storekeeper told us the mine was no good... Yeah, and you stayed right with your husband the whole trip? Yes. Okay. Thanks, ma'am. You say you found something in Gilbert's papers? Well, we don't know for sure, so I'd like to give you a receipt for these canceled checks. I want more time to examine them. Here you are. Canceled checks? Yeah. It looks like one of them's going to take the wrong man out of jail and put the right man in. Come on, Sheriff. I see. Well, I'm glad to hear it. If there's anything more I can do... We'll let you know, Mrs. Madden. Goodbye. She's lying, Jason. Like a trooper. What now? We'll watch her. Have one of your deputies keep an eye on him. We don't want him to get away, but we don't want to pick him up yet, either. Okay, I'll call my office from the drugstore. I'll wait in my car around the corner. Meet me there. <laughs> The sheriff made his call and rejoined me. We sat in my car, waiting. Then a little after dark, Mrs. Madden's car pulled away from our house, heading out of town. We followed, keeping well back. Two miles out of town, she pulled off the highway, parked behind another car, got out and headed into the brush. The sheriff and I worked our way slowly and quietly in the direction she'd taken. Should be around here somewhere. Yeah. Keep it as quiet as possible, Sheriff. Reckon she'd come out here to meet him? Looks like... Listen. Yeah. I hear him talking. Look, in that clearing ahead. Yeah, let's ease up a little. You little fool. You must have overlooked something when you went through those records. No, I'm sure I didn't, Fred. I found the entry he made where you paid him for appraising your mind two years ago. I tore it out. There's nothing in those records to show the two of you knew each other. You're wrong there, man. Anyway. Hold it real steady, Blaisdell. Pierce. Yeah. So the two of you didn't know each other until I introduced you, huh? You've been in it together ever since you met two years ago. Clary, you little fool. You were tricked into coming out here so they could catch us together. They didn't have any proof of anything. I got proof right here in my pocket that you lied when you said you didn't know Madden, Blaisdell. Yeah, what kind of proof? Something you overlooked, Mrs. Madden. A check made out to cash. What? 
You didn't notice the pencil writing on it. Pencil writing? Your husband made a notation that the check was to cover expenses of a trip he'd made to appraise Blaisdell's mine two years ago. You told me you were with your husband the whole trip, so you lied about not knowing Blaisdell. Clara, you stupid Ranger, lizard. you gotta listen to me. I, I didn't want any part of it, but Blaisdell forced me to What's it. What's that? I'm in the clear. I was in Kansas when it happened. Blaisdell killed my husband. Oh, that's how you stick by me, is it? Why, you little... Hold it, Blaisdell. You're not going to get away free, Clara. I guarantee that. Sure, I killed Madden Ranger, but it was her idea. That's a lie. I, right from the start, it was her idea. How to go about it. Put the body in my own mind and change life. He's lying, Ranger. Plant the key at Willie's shack, pretend she and I didn't know each other. Then produce the body so she could collect on the insurance. All of it was her idea. You shut up. You shut up. I'm not half finished yet. Got a weird shot on me, will you? Wait till I get through spilling. Shut up, you little little right. Shut up. You know, Sheriff, strikes me we've only got one problem left. What's that, Jase? Getting them to talk slow enough so a stenographer can get it all down. Come on, both of you. Fred Blaisdell and Clara Madden were indicted and placed on trial for the brutal murder of Gilbert Madden. For her part in the crime, Clara was sentenced to 50 years in the women's prison at Gorey. On the morning of May 3rd, 1942, Blaisdell was put to death in the electric chair. And now, here's the star of our show, Joel McRae. Hello, folks. First of all, we want to thank you kindly for the many wonderful letters and cards we received during the summer months. It's mighty heartwarming to know we have so many good friends. As a matter of fact, the Rangers themselves have received quite a few of your letters, too. And like us, they certainly appreciated hearing from you. I'm sure that most of you will recall reading about a great Texas Ranger captain who retired from active duty on July 31st of this year. Some of our stories have been based on his exploits. He's the famous Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez, whose favorite guns are engraved with the code he has always lived by in his colorful career. Never draw me without cause, nor shield me without dishonor. Tomorrow, it'll be exactly 31 years since Lone Wolf was sworn in as a Texas Ranger. And as in the past year, so in the years to come, we are proud to have him as our technical advisor. Congratulations, Cap. See you next week, folks. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Cattle Drive. The cast included Tony Barrett, Bill Johnstone, Lamont Johnson, Ken Christie, Betty Lou Gerson, and Brad Brown. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Bob Reif, and the program is produced and directed by Stacy Keats. Hal Gibney speaking. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Today, hear the glittering premiere program of The Big Show, broadcast from London and featuring Sir Lawrence Olivier, Fred Allen, Beatrice Lilly, and your unpredictable hostess, Tallulah Bankhead. Then join in the fun with the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show as they launch their new comedy season. And later, Theater Guild on the Air brings you Joseph Cotton and Joan Fontaine in Main Street by Sinclair Lewis. Ladies and gentlemen, the program You Can't Take It With You, starring Walter Brennan, is now heard at a new time and day. That's Friday on most NBC stations. Stay tuned for The Big Show and Tallulah on NBC, the national broadcasting company.
Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. dates and places in the following story are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. I'd like to talk to the ladies for a moment. We can't eliminate your work for you. I wish we could. But if your job is keeping a home in order, we'll try to lighten the load with a series of wonderful weekday radio shows on this same NBC station. Walter O'Keefe is your genial host on Double or Nothing, and O'Keefe's okay. Set your dial to double or nothing, and the laughter will add a bit of brightness to your day. Another friend of yours is radio's Warren Hall, who daily presides over Strike It Rich, the program with a heart. The program that can give you a lift while bringing financial happiness to a contestant. Dave Garraway is another gloom chaser in NBC's daytime schedule. And Bob and Ray, this year's Peabody Award-winning comics, make subtle fun of radio in a rib-tickling way. So be sure to include them in your listening, too. Yes, as I said before, I wish we could eliminate your housework, but since we can't, maybe listening to these fine NBC shows will help to pass the time more quickly. Why don't you try it out, tomorrow and every day this week? Now, Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, from the files of the Texas Rangers, the case called Double Edge. It is 11.30 on a Monday morning in June during the early 1920s. In the town of Holden, Texas, an elderly woman puts through a telephone call to the bank. That's right, operator. A 423J. Now you be quiet, baby. You know your mother doesn't like you to cry. Hello? Mr. Van? Yes? This is Agatha Winford. How are you today? Oh, just fine, thanks, Miss Winford. Uh, say, would you hold on a second, please? Uh, just a minute. Mm. Here's your bank book, uh, Miss. Uh, fine, fine. Uh, now... What can I do for you, Miss Winter? Oh, well, I'm over here. Miss Johnson's minding her baby while she's marking, and I thought she wouldn't mind if I used her phone to call you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, well, I just got a notice from you this morning, and I want to tell you the bank's made an awful mistake in my account. What is the mistake, Miss Winter? Well, I know I've got $43 left in my checking account, but that notice you sent said I've only got 23 Now, that's just not so. Now... We're very careful here, ma'am. Maybe you made some kind of mistake in your dish. No, I didn't. Uh, would you please excuse me, Miss Winford? Can you hold on while I take care of a customer here? Well, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. What can I do? Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll be with you in a minute, baby. Baby. <laughs> baby, I saw... Oh, well. <laughs> now, baby, don't you cry. <laughs> That's a good baby. Now, you just be nice while I finish talking to Mr. Vance here. Mr. Vance? Now, look, mister. Give me all the money you got. Still busy. Put it in this paper bag. All right, now, wait a minute. Here, here. Give me the rest. In the back of the drawer. Huh? Uh, I don't have any more. You want your brains blown out? Give me that money. Oh! All right, all right. Here you are, mister. Mr. Vance? Keep a quiet back Mr. There. Vance? You know talking. Oh, uh-oh. Uh, that's all I got, mister. Who are you kidding? Go over that other drawer and clean it up. Oh. Yes, sir. <gasps> what am I going to do? What's this phone doing off the hook? Uh, I don't know. Oh. Hang it up. Yes, sir. Oh. Oh. Oh, this is awful. Operator. Operator. Oh, why don't you answer? Operator. Operator. <laughs> Mrs. Winford notified the sheriff that the bank was being held up. Within a matter of minutes, the sheriff raced to the scene, only to find that the holdup men had already made a getaway. After a preliminary survey, the sheriff requested assistance from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned and arrived at the bank 15 minutes later. Over here, Jace. Howdy, Sheriff. I'm glad you could get here so fast. I was only about 10 miles away when my headquarters contacted me. The fellas that held up this place sure had a lot of nerve. How many were there? Only two, as far as I can gather. One of them kept the customers in the back. The other one got the money from the teller. 
took nearly $6,000. Anybody able to identify them? Nope. They were both wearing bandanas over their faces. How about their getaway? Anybody see them after they left the bank? Not a soul that I could find. Seems like they just disappeared into thin air. We did get one break, though. What's that? Well, the teller keeps an extra $200 in his drawer just in case the bank is held up. Ten twenties with a special marking. How are the bills marked? There's a green dot inked in under the first letter of the serial number. Naturally, the bank's got a record of the numbers. That'll help us some. We'll get out of circular. By tomorrow morning, every bank and police officer in Texas will have a copy. It beats me how these fellows had so much nerve. Had it planned right down to the last move. They even took into consider... Oh, there's Jim Vance coming out of that office. He's a teller. Reckon he's bringing that list of serial numbers. Uh Uh-huh. Got that list of numbers for us, Jim? Yes, sir. Right here. But there was something else I want to see you by. What's that? Well, now, I forgot all about this in the excitement. The man who was holding the customers in the back, he passed me on his way out. Yeah? Seemed to be having trouble with his bandana. It slipped down a little just as he got alongside my window. You mean you got a look at his face? Oh, no, sir. Not exactly. But I did say one thing. Remembered it while I was writing out those numbers just now. He had a, a, a mole under his eye. Pretty good size one, too. Which eye was it under? Right. Uh, no, 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 I got it twisted. I was facing him, so it must have been his left eye. Well, at least we got some information for that bulletin, Jace. Yeah, let's put it on the wires. We broadcast the list of serial numbers and a vague description of the bank robbers. The first day brought no results. On the morning of the second day, I received a call from Sam Crane, constable in the town of Compton, 30 miles from the scene of the robbery. He told me the bank in Compton had reported receiving one of the marked bills the day before. The sheriff wasn't free at the moment, so I went to Compton alone. Ten that morning, I entered the constable's office. Well, Jay. Howdy, Crane. Good to see you again. Real good. It's been a long time since we worked together. Over a year. What about that marked bill? Bank tell you who brought it in? It took the bank a little while to find out. Had to go through all their deposit slips from yesterday. Finally told me it was the owner of a hardware store here. A man by the name of Allen. They're sure about that? Yeah, and we might be lucky. It was the only 20 in his deposit for yesterday. Well, haven't you checked him yet? Well, no. I thought it might be better if you did it. See, Allen and I don't get along very well. Don't think he'd be too cooperative with me. And this thing's too important to take a chance. Uh-huh. Tell me where his place is. I'll go see him. It's just down the street. I'll go along with you, Jace. But if you don't mind, I'll let you do the talking. Sure. You figure this Allen could have been involved in the robbery himself? Him? Oh, no, Jay's Old man Allen's over 60. How come you two don't get along? Well, about a year ago, I bought some tools from him. No good, any of them. The old buzzard never would let me have my money back. I sure hope he can give us something to go on. Well, if Allen does remember who handed him this bill, my guess is it'll turn out to be somebody who just passed through Compton. Maybe so. Constable. Oh, howdy, Miss Palmer. Constable, have you had any luck? Well, to tell the truth, I've been pretty busy since you came in this morning. Anyhow, I was sure your husband would be back by now. Please not. I told you he went out yesterday afternoon right after he got that phone call. Jeff never stayed away like this without saying where he was going. Now, Mrs. Palmer, he'll turn up. But he didn't even take the car. Whenever he goes away, he always takes it. Maybe he's over at his brother's place. Bet you haven't even called there, have you? Well... No, I haven't. Well, why don't you go home, then? He's probably been trying to reach you. But it's 20 miles over to his brother's house. He couldn't get there without the car. Well, maybe he got a ride. Now, you run along home before he gets worried, wondering why he can't reach you. Well, all right, Tom. You're keeping you busy, huh? Yeah. <laughs> that husband of hers is always taking off. Are you sure he's not missing? Nah. Jeff Palmer takes a notion to go somewhere, he goes. He's only been away one night. Uh Uh-huh. I swear it never rains, but it pours. For three weeks, nothing's happened here. Now I got more work than I can handle. Well, here's the hardware store. Hope old man Allen's memory's better than I think it is. Oh, it's you, Constable. Thought I told you I didn't want to do business with you no more. Don't worry, Allen. I wouldn't think of buying anything from this store. Ranger Pearson here wants to ask you a few questions. Well, all right. What's on your mind, Ranger? Let me have that bill, Crane. Uh, Sure, Jase. Mr. Allen, you deposited this bill in the bank yesterday. Uh, What's the matter, counterfeit? It's part of the money that was stolen from a bank in Holden. Oh, you mean on that big robbery over there on Monday? That's right. That's so. I read about it in the paper. This was the only 20 you deposited yesterday. Do you remember who brought it in here? Let me see No, Ranger, don't reckon I do. I was afraid he wouldn't, Chase. Just what do you mean by that, Constable? Now, wait a minute, both of you. I'm sorry, Ranger. Just give me a second or two. Maybe I can remember the fellow that brought it in. Take your time. See, now, it's been... No, it's no use. I just can't bring him to mind. Do you have any idea if it was yesterday morning or in the afternoon you got the bill? Couldn't say. 
What time do you take the money to the bank? About 2.30, same time I always do. I see. And how much cash do you usually have on hand when you open the store in the morning? Oh, maybe $25, $30, just enough to make change. If somebody handed you a $20 bill any time before noon, it would pretty much clean out your cash drawer, wouldn't it? Yeah, I reckon it would. Well, then isn't it a pretty good chance you received the bill sometime between noon and the time you went to the bank? Well, I never thought of it that way. But I still don't... Oh, wait a minute. Yep, it's coming back to me now. I'd just finished eating, and this fella came in and bought a box of shotgun shells. He was the one that gave me the 20. You sure about that? Yes, I'm sure. Did you know the man, Mr. Allen? Oh, I've seen him around town. I don't know his name. Could be he lives in one of them farms outside Compton. Could you give us a description of him? Well, I ain't much of a hand at telling people what other people look like. Well, do you remember if he had a mole under his left eye? Mole? I'll tell you the truth, Ranger, I'm just not sure of it. Maybe he did, but I can't swear one way or the other. All right, Mr. Allen. Thanks a lot. Uh, one thing I'll say, if I was to see this fellow again, I'd know him. I hope we can show him to you soon. Come on, Crane. Let's get back to your office. I still think the old man made a mistake, Jace. That bank job wasn't pulled by any local boys. Maybe not. There's no doubt one of the men we're after was around here. We've got to see if he's still around. Oh, well, Miss Palmer, what are you doing here? I'm sorry to make a pest to myself, Constable. That's all right. I called Jeff's brother, and he isn't over there. I don't know where he is. Now he'll turn up. Something's happened to him. I know it. Ranger, maybe you can help me. Isn't there anything I can do to find my husband? Well, you could have the constable file a missing persons report. That way all the police in the state would be on the lookout for him. Will you do that, constable? Oh, sure, Miss Palmer. But I think before you do that, you ought to give Jeff a little longer to show up. I can't wait any longer. I couldn't sleep all last night. I know something's happened to him. All right, I'll file a report. It's so long since I filled one out, I'm not even sure I've got the form. I got some in the car if you need them. Oh, here's one. Now, Mrs. Palmer, you're all upset. Why don't you go on home? I'll fill this out myself. I don't forget, Crane. Mrs. Palmer has to sign the form. Oh, yeah. Probably be better if she fills in the description, anyhow. What kind of a description do you need, Ranger? Well, the usual description. Height, weight, color of hair and eyes. Anything we can use to identify him. Well, Jeff looks just about like anybody else. Now, no two people are alike, Mrs. Palmer. There must be something that's different about him. I can't think of anything, except maybe a mole. What's that? He's got a mole under his left eye. In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. As a civilian at home, what is your obligation to a soldier in a foxhole in Korea? Maybe you haven't considered that question. If you haven't, it's understandable. A foxhole in Korea is pretty remote, after all, from your everyday life. And it wouldn't help if you were constantly worrying. But if you have stopped to consider it, the least we can do here at home in the States is to help keep America financially strong. That's the best way to back up the men in the Army, Navy, and Air Force. One of the best ways to help keep America financially strong is to buy United States defense bonds regularly. If you think you can't afford it, Look into the payroll savings plan where you work. You'll probably change your mind. You can have any amount you specify saved from each paycheck. When there's enough for a defense bond, it is purchased and turned over to you. And remember, today defense bonds offer you more interest, a quicker return on your money. They're now even better. Invest more in defense bonds. Now, Tales of the Texas Rangers. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and our authentic story, Double Edge. I was fairly sure now that Jeff Palmer was one of the two men we were after. Continued questioning of his wife convinced me she knew nothing of the bank robbery. We put out an APB on Palmer. Three days later, I had a call from the sheriff. A man whose description matched Palmer's had been found dead in a creek near Compton. The quickest way for me to get there was on horseback through two miles of brush. When I reached the creek, I forded it and headed upstream to the spot where the sheriff and his men were waiting. Howdy, Sheriff. Well, it's a good thing you had your horse, Jake. Saved you 20 miles of driving. Yeah, whoa, whoa, Charlie, whoa, boy. Huh? Who 
found the body. Those fellows over there, they were out fishing. Spotted a man's arm sticking out of the water. Body'd been wired to an old log, but it looks like one of the wires worked loose. Uh-huh. Let's take a look at him. Yeah, right over here, Jason. Pretty sure it's Palmer? Well, description checks with the one his wife signed, so I reckon it's him. Here we are. Yeah. Shot four times. The fellow who did it must have been standing right next to him. Somebody really wanted to make sure he was dead. I wonder why Palmer was killed. Well, there's only two reasons I can think of. Either to shut him up or keep him from getting his share of the money. Maybe both. Sounds reasonable. If we find the second man in that bank robbery, we'll probably have the one who killed Palmer. There don't seem to be much to go on. One thing we can be pretty sure of, he was killed right here. How do you figure that? Tent's been made to cover it up, but you can still see quite a bit of blood on the ground here. Yeah, I noticed that, but I thought he could have been killed somewhere else and brought here. And then there wouldn't be all this blood. Not much bleeding after death. Well, it would have been smart of the killer to do the job here. Certainly not many people around. No, we'll have to go over the area. You check that cabin up on the hill, Sheriff? Where? Through those trees. Oh. No, I didn't notice it before. The person who lives there could have heard the shots. We'd better talk to him. Okay. Opening in the brush. We can go up through here. Uh-huh. And it's pretty much trampled from here on up the hill. Somebody's come down almost to the spot where Palmer was killed. In the past few days, too, from the look of it. You think whoever lives in that cabin had something to do with this business? Could be. Yeah, they might have been hiding out here together and then... We... Hey, Jace. A man just ducked behind that tree up there. Yeah. Look, he's starting up the hill. Hold it right where you are. Hold it, I said. Please, Mr. Ranger. I, I ain't done nothing. <clears throat> Nobody's saying you have. What's your name? Dan, Dan Bolton, sir. You live in that cabin up there? You, you, yes, sir. Stay around there pretty much, do you? Most of the time. Except about once a week, I take my mule and go into town. You heard any shooting around here in the last couple of days? I, yes, sir, I have. When was this? Oh, uh, reckon it's about four days ago. I, I was smoking some meat back at the cabin, and I hear some shooting. Did you come down the hill to see what it was? Now, Mr. Ranger, please don't ask me no more questions. Dan, it's very important we find out what happened. You could help us. Well, well all right, sir. As soon as I hear the shots, I, I come about halfway down the hill. Could you see anybody? Uh, I seen a man bending over another man on the ground. I ducked down quick here and hear his brush... I was scared if he'd see me, he'd shoot me, too. Did you see his face? Yes, sir. You know who he was? Uh, no, sir. I don't think you're telling us the truth, Dan. Mr. Ranger, I, I just live here in my cabin, and I don't hurt nobody, and I don't want nobody hurting me. Dan, tell us who the man was you saw down here the other day. I can't, Mr. Ranger. I'm scared. Nothing's going to happen to you. I can promise you that. Well, like I say, I was hiding here in the brush. I, I I didn't see this man's face good till he picked the other man up and carried him over to the creek. Then I see him real plain. Who was it, Dan? The, the constable in the Compton, Mr. Sam Crane. We questioned the old man further. He was absolutely sure it was Constable Sam Crane he had seen. We took Dan back into town with us. When we arrived at the mortuary where the dead man's body had been taken, we put Dan in an office next to the morgue. And I phoned the constable and asked him to come over as quickly as possible. The sheriff and I stayed in the room with Palmer's body. Five minutes later, Crane walked in. I got here as quick as I could, Jace. What's this all... Oh, Sheriff. Howdy, Crane. You wanted me for something? I found the body of a man. It could be Palmer. I'd like you to identify him. Well, sure, but why me? Why didn't you get Miss Palmer? We wanted to be sure we were right before we call her down here. There's no use getting her any more upset than we have to. Well, I didn't know him very well, Jace. Didn't you? Funny, I got the idea you did. Is that the body over there? Yeah, better take a look. Where'd you find him? In a creek about ten miles from here. Pull the sheet back, will you, Sheriff? Sure, Jace. Well, Crane? Oh. You can cover him up again. It's Jeff Palmer. Who killed him? I thought maybe you could tell us that. Me? Where were you at 11.30 Monday morning? Monday? Uh-huh. Where were you? Well, I don't know, Jace. Reckon I was in my office working. I reckon you weren't, Crane. Look, How what? about Tuesday? 
The day after the bank was robbed in Holden. The afternoon that Jeff Palmer disappeared. Jace, why are you asking me all these questions? Because we think you and Palmer robbed that bank in Holden. What? The morning after the stick-up, you got the circular saying some of the money was hot. Now, wait a minute, Jace. You went out to warn Palmer. When you found out he'd already spent some of the money and would probably be traced, you had to shut him up. You took him out the creek and killed him. You're crazy, Jace. If I did that, you think I'd have reported finding one of the stolen bills? You had to do that. If you hadn't reported it, the bank would, and you knew it. That's a pretty serious accusation you're making, Jace. I wouldn't be making it unless I was pretty sure of what I was saying. How can you be so sure? Come into the next room with us, Crane. What for? You'll find out. Better take his gun, Sheriff. Look, you. Hold still. That's better. Now, come on. Fine friend you turned out to be. You think I like doing this? Dan? Yes, sir. Who's this? Dan, take a look at this man. Yes, sir. Do you know him? Uh, yes, sir. You sure you know him? Uh, yes, sir. He's Mr. Sam Crane. Where'd you see him last? Mr. Ranger. Just tell us where you saw him, Dan. Uh, out the creek at my place. You lie. Hold it, Crane. Dan, when you saw him out at the creek, what was he doing? He, he takes some man off the ground and put him in the creek. That's a lie. Jace, I've known you for ten years. You're going to take his word against mine? Yes, I am. Without giving me a chance? You had your chance when Palmer's wife came in and reported him missing. You tried to brush her off. You're a liar. I didn't know why you were so lax then, but I do now. You were afraid we'd find your partner's body. Why, Jace? I'll kill you, you liar. I don't think you will. Uh, uh, Try that again, Crane. You, You can't railroad me like this. I'm still a police officer. That's something I've been ashamed of for the past three hours. Come on. During the ride to the county jail, Crane said nothing, but the hate and bitterness showed in his eyes. We booked him for murder and locked him up. We searched his house and found the money from the bank robbery sewed inside a mattress. Two months later, Crane was tried in the district court at Holden for armed robbery and murder. As the arresting officer, I was subpoenaed and took the stand against him. The trial lasted a week. When the jury left the courtroom, I went outside and stood on the courthouse steps. After a while, the sheriff came out and walked toward me. Well, it's all over, Jace. Mm. The jury recommended the chair. They didn't seem to have any trouble deciding he was guilty. No, I reckon not. I didn't know you'd walked out till after the jury came back. Sorry you didn't get to hear the verdict. It's all right, Sheriff. I wasn't anxious to hear it. Jace, if you don't mind my saying so, you're, you're taking this thing too hard. Yeah, maybe so. Crane is no good. He's rotten clean through. You ought to be glad you helped him get what he deserves. Somehow I can't feel that way. It's bad enough sending the man to the chair any time. Somebody you've known and worked with. Yeah, I reckon I understand how you feel. You oh, owe the deputy to bring him out now. I was hoping I'd see you before they took me away, Pearson. Hello, Crane. Wait a minute, boys. I got a few words to say to Pearson here. Never mind what you got to say. Charlie, take him on Just back a here. second. What were you going to say, Crane? You think you're pretty smart, don't you? Testifying against me like you did. I only did what I had to. Yeah? Well, listen, Pearson. I'll get you. I'll get you of the last thing I do. Sorry you feel that way. You hear me, Pearson? I'm going to get you. Take him away, boys. I'll get you, Pearson. I'll get you. Dirty scum. He ought to have his face pushed in. Come on, Sheriff. Let's go get some coffee. I went back to headquarters. A week later, on the day Crane was to be taken from the county jail to the penitentiary, I received a message saying the sheriff wanted to see me. I drove to Holden and went to the sheriff's office. Sorry to bring you all the way back here, Jace. I hope you're not going to be sore at me. What's up? Well, it's about Crane. I I was supposed to leave for Huntsville with him two hours ago. No trouble, is there? Oh, no, not a bit. Matter of fact, ever since he was sentenced, Crane's been a changed man. How do you mean? Well, his whole attitude's different, Jace. He even asked the judge to move up his electrocution date. Said he wanted to get it over with as quick as possible. Then he asked to see you, Jay. What for? Uh, You've got no idea how sorry he is for the way he acted last week. When he begged to see you, why... Well, it was one favor I just couldn't refuse him. I'm glad you didn't. Where is he? I got him locked up back here. We're all set to leave. You want to wait till I bring him out? I'll go with you. I just can't get over the way he's changed. I reckon it's knowing he's going to die that did it. Well, whatever it is, I'm happy to hear he has changed. You know how bad I felt about this whole thing. Yeah, and last week I thought you were wrong. Now I'm ready to eat my words. Here we are. Crane? Okay, Sheriff. I got a hold of Jace for you. Oh, thanks, Sheriff. Hello, Crane. 
Jace, I... I don't know how to say this. Don't worry about it. I understand. No, I, I've got to say it. I, I figured out a dozen ways of telling you, and, and none of them seems right. I reckon the best way is just to say I, I'm sorry. That's all right, Crane. I, I've been thinking about it the way I blew off at you. I, I was wrong. You just did what you had to do. Jace, will you shake hands with me? Sure, I will. All right. Reckon we better get moving, boys. Would you do a favor for me, Jace? If I can. There's a, a girl over in Compton. We've been going together a few years. Might have been married someday. You want me to go see her? Would you, Jace? Drop in on her every now and then and see if she's getting along all right. I'd be glad to. I, I'd like to show you a picture of her. Sheriff, is that my satchel over there? Yeah. All packed and ready to go. There's a picture of my girl in it. Could I have it? Sure, Crane. It, it's right on top. I feel real sorry for her, Jace. All the publicity. This it in the leather frame? Yeah. I never deserved a girl like her in the first place. Here you are. Thanks. What do you think of her, Jace? Pretty girl. You bet she is. Here. Let me get it into a better light. Now you can see what I wanted you to see. Jace, he's got a razor blade. Yeah, I, I told you I get Just a little late. My, my arm, my arm. Drop that blade. Oh. Drop it. Oh. Now, put the cuffs on him, Sheriff. Yeah. That dirty louse. Shut up. Should have known better than to trust him. Where'd you get that razor blade anyhow? I had it hidden in the picture frame. Say, your hand's bleeding, Jace. Did he get you bad? Oh, just nick me a little. Shut up in your throat. I told you to shut up. Oh, come on, Crane. The last favor you'll get from me. Get your lousy paws off me. Come on. Sheriff, I hope you got room in your car for one more. This boy needs lots of company. In just a moment, we will tell you the results of the case you have just heard. Monday means music on NBC. And tomorrow evening, you're invited to relax in your favorite easy chair or outdoors where you can catch a breath of a breeze and listen to the finest in musical entertainment on NBC. The Railroad Hour once again will bring you an original operetta by Jerry Lawrence and Bob Lee with music composed and conducted by Carmen Dragon. Your Railroad Hour host, Gordon McRae, will be joined by lovely Lucille Norman to bring you Starlight. Later, the Telephone Hour will present the brilliant young pianist, Nicole Henriot, as the special guest of the evening. And, of course, Monday's musical entertainment wouldn't be complete without the Voice of Firestone. Tomorrow evening, the Voice of Firestone presents soprano Roberta Peters and the music of Howard Barlow and the Firestone Orchestra and Chorus. Yes, Monday night is truly a night to relax and beat the heat by finding the coolest spot available and listening to NBC's great musical programs. Be sure to hear them all tomorrow. Now, the conclusion of Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, here are the results of the case you have just heard. Sam Crane was taken to Huntsville Penitentiary and confined in the special cell block set aside for condemned prisoners. Ninety-three days later, still defiant, he died in the electric chair. Next week, Joel McRae and another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of... The Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen in San Francisco Story, a Warner Brothers release. The cast included Tony Barrett, Virginia Gregg, Frank Gerstle, Parley Bear, Paul McVeigh, and Robert Bice. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Charles E. Israel, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Tales of the Texas Rangers is heard each week overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Hal Gibney speaking. Tonight, hear the Hollywood Bowl concert on NBC. Tales 
of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. dates and places in the following story are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Before we bring you today's Tales of the Texas Rangers, let's turn on our microphones down the hall in Studio A here at NBC's Hollywood Radio City, where rehearsal for the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show is in progress. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's the way we'll do it on the show. It sounded great, fellas. Phil, uh, would you like to talk to the listeners during this break and rehearsal? Yeah, Bill, I'd love to. Folks, I'd just like to take a few seconds here to remind you about part of the fine lineup of entertainment for the rest of the evening right here on NBC. Right after Tales of the Texas Rangers, listen to the big show with Tallulah Bankhead and all of her darling guest stars. I know you'll want to hear the music and comedy. The big show is lined up for you today. And then we come on to keep you entertained with our show, starring Alice Faye, Frankie Remley, Julius Abruzio, and some band leader, Phil, uh, what's his name? Well, well, please, will you slow up a minute? <laughs> it's the Phil Harris, Alice Faye show, right after the big show today, and I hope you'll listen, folks. And now, let's return to Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, from the files of the Texas Rangers, the case called Dream Farm. It is 7.40 p.m., June 12th, 1941. On a deserted stretch of highway through a thinly populated area of Texas, a sedan pushes to the southwest, towing behind it a small, heavily loaded two-wheeled trailer. In the front seat of the car, there are three people... A man, his wife, and their 12-year-old son. Don't seem to be much in the way of people out here. Wide open country, all right. I think we're going to like it here, Ethel. Oh, I hope so. You just wait and see. Why, last month when I was out here to close the deal, I swear I just wanted to start plowing right off. I got a feeling this farm's going to be lucky for us. Well, I just hope we can make a go of it, that's all. Now, Ethel, we've been all through that. I know, John. But you can't blame me for being a little worried. After all, we spent our lives in Iowa. Here we are, moving to a strange place where we don't know a soul. Well, we'll make friends soon enough. Texans are nice people, real friendly, you'll see. Pa, I'm hungry. <laughs> well, that's one thing that ain't changed much from Iowa to Texas. Uh, we ought to be coming to a town soon, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, a town called Coronaville, not too far from here. We'll find a restaurant pretty soon, Bobby. Just hold on a while longer. We gonna keep driving all night, Pa? Well, I figure it might be best. Rather get to the farm in the morning so as we can move in by daylight. Can I sleep on the back seat tonight? <laughs> sure you can. Hey, what's that? What? There's some fella signaling up ahead. Why, yes, there is someone. Now, what do you suppose? Looks like he's having car trouble. You're not gonna stop. Well, sure, why not? Will you look at that rear wheel? Gee, that must have been some blowout. You need some help? Yeah. John, I'd just as soon you kept going. Now, Ethel, where's your Texas hospitality? Sure, it's all right, Ma. How about a ride in the next gas station? Sure, glad to take you. Get in the back. Never mind that. What? Yeah. What'd you say? You heard me. Get out of the car, Holly. Hey, that a real gun? Bobby, be quiet. Yeah, Bobby, be quiet. You won't get hurt. All right, out you go. No, no, no. Get out on this side, you. Oh, we're getting out. Be careful with that thing. Yeah, yeah, I'll be real careful. What are you going to do? Shut up. You, empty out your pockets. Me? I ain't talking to no one else. Well, I... I, I don't get you, mister. I, what are you going to do with us? Ain't you figured it out yet? Come on, lady, give me a purse. <laughs> now you, throw everything you got in your pockets on the front seat. Hurry it up. John, do what he tells you. Well, I... I... Uh, that's more like it. All right, now back away from the car. You're just leaving us out here? What do you think? You ain't going nowhere with my car. John, be quiet. I won't. Everything we got in the world's in there. Be quiet, John, please. Yeah, yeah, do what the lady tells you. I'll show you what I'll do. You can't get away with you this crazy... Take our car with you. Oh, no, Paul, stop, Paul! You should listen to him. You shot my Paul. You shouldn't have shot him. You didn't have to 
kill him. You didn't have to kill him. I said it's your lesson. <laughs> now I gotta kill you too. No, please. Ma! Ma! <laughs> At 1.20 the following morning, the three bodies were discovered by a state highway patrolman. The two adults were dead, but the boy, although unconscious, was still alive. He was rushed to the hospital in Coronaville, and Sheriff King of Corona County was notified. The sheriff requested aid from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. Is that you, Jace? Yes, Sheriff. Oh, I don't mind telling you. I'm glad to see you. It's a bad one. Yeah, I heard. Why are they? Oh, come on. I'll show you. J.P. been out yet? Yeah, he ought to be along soon. Well, there they are, Jase. Not very pretty. No, never is. You been over the area yet? Yeah, didn't find much. Went over the car for prints. Looks like there might be a couple of good ones there. Well, our lab crew will be out pretty soon. They'll check them. Uh, hold your flash on the body, Sheriff. I want to have a look. How's that? Okay. Powder burns on the clothing. He was shot from pretty close up. Yeah, same with the woman, Jase. The boy, too. You talked to him yet? The boy? Last I heard, he was still unconscious. Well, is he going to be all right? That's hard to tell you. Doc says he may come through okay. Uh, it's a tough break for the kid. These his folks? Yeah, I reckon they are. Well, aren't you sure? Not exactly. Hospital found this wallet in the boy's pocket, but these two had nothing on him. No papers, driver's license, nothing. No money either, I suppose. Yeah, that's right. Let's see what you got from the kid. A library card from Clinton, Iowa, made out to Robert Elwood. And here's a card from the Boy Scouts, Troop 47, Clinton, Iowa, made out to Robert Elwood. I already notified the Clinton police, Jase. They're trying to find out if the boy was traveling with his folks. Mm-hmm. What about this car, Sheriff? I noticed it's got Texas plates. Yeah, it's on the hot car list. Stolen night before last in Rhineville. Killer could have taken their car when this one broke down. Rhineville, you said? Mm-hmm. Up north. Figured the killer's heading south, Jase? Up to this point, he was. I think I'll go into town, Sheriff. The boy's conscious. I want to talk to him. I have to talk to him myself. I'll go along. On the way to the hospital, Austin radioed that the murder victims were probably the Elwoods. The Clinton police had learned from a former neighbor that the family was moving to Texas. The Iowa Division of Motor Vehicle Registration supplied the make and license number of the Elwood car and trailer. We relayed this information to all Texas law enforcement agencies. It was 3.40 a.m. when the sheriff and I arrived at the hospital. Robert Elwood was out of his coma, but was still very weak. Robert, we want to ask you some questions. This is Sheriff King, and I'm Ranger Pearson. Texas Ranger? That's right. Tell me, son, do you remember what happened last night? Yeah. A man killed my pa. Where's Ma? I want to see her. Well, you can't right now, Robert. Why? I want to talk to her. Can you, can you tell us what happened, son? He had a gun. He made Pa take everything out of his pocket. Then he was going to take the car. And pa tried to stop him. Was it just one man? Uh huh. You think you'd know him if you ever saw him again? I think so. Was he a tall man? Oh, he was about as tall as Pa. It'd be about five eight, Jason. How about his hair, Robert? What color was it? It was dark. Kept falling in front of his eyes. Did you notice anything different about him? Any scars or anything like that? No. I don't remember any. Do you remember what he was wearing? Uh-uh. Well, there's just one more thing, Robert. What about his voice? Was it high or low? I don't know. Kind of in between. He was real with me. I want my mom. I want my mom. I 
reported Robert Elwood's description of the killer to headquarters and then turned in for some sleep. Two hours later, a phone call from Austin woke me up. The Elwood car had been found abandoned on Highway 346 near Burton, Texas, about 100 miles away. Sheriff and I were there by 845. Patrolman Hartnett reported that when he'd found the car at about 7, it was out of gas. The trailer was missing. We started checking. I think I'll take a look through the glove compartment. What do you suppose he did with that trailer, Jason? Uh, must have been slowing him down so he unhitched it. I expect it'll turn up in the brush somewhere between here and Coronaville. Yeah, I reckon so. That patrolman said when he found the car, the motor was still warm. Yeah. Killer must have left it around 6.30, maybe a little later. Yeah, well, he's only a couple of hours ahead of us then. Hmm. Find something? Yeah. A bank book from the state bank in Clinton. Account was closed just four days ago on the 9th. Six hundred eight dollars and forty cents. Hmm. Figure Elwood had the money with him? I know he had it with him. And the killer's probably got it. Hey, look at this slip. It was stuck in the bank book. Yeah. List of numbers. Serial numbers, record of traveler's checks. It's supposed to be filled out and kept in a safe place in case any of the checks are lost. Hey, he had ten fifties, five hundred dollars. Yeah, but you can see where he's checked off the top two numbers. Elwood probably cashed those checks himself. Yeah. And the killer still got $400 worth. Mm. Jace, you don't think he'd take a chance and try to cash him? He might. $400. It's enough to tempt a man who'd shoot three people in cold blood. But he'd have to sign Elwood's name when he cashed him. Match the signatures already on the checks. Well, he might even need identification. He's got identification. Don't forget the killer took Elwood's wallet. As for the signatures, well, a lot of people can be fooled. Yeah. One yeah. thing's certain. If he's going to cash him at all, he'll try to do it in a hurry. He's not going to hang on to him any longer than he has to. Then you reckon he's already got rid of him? I don't think so. He hasn't had much of a chance. Well, why not? He could have cashed him anywhere between here and Coronaville. Uh, he'd have a hard time cashing $400 worth of checks in an all-night restaurant. Bank's his best bet. Yeah, but what bank? There'll be 50 of them in this county opening in five minutes. If he left here at about 6.30 and got into Burton around 7.00, he might just wait for the banks to open there. We better get to Burton. And fast. There were two banks in Burton. At approximately 9.10, I dropped the sheriff at the Burton National and headed for the Burton Loan and Savings Bank a block away. The cashier there told me the checks hadn't come in, so I left instructions for him to contact me if any turned up. And I went back to the Burton National for the sheriff. Sheriff? Hey, Chase, come here. Find anything? Oh, I sure did. That was a mighty good hunch you had. The checks turn up? Cashier's getting them for me now. She says a fella came in at 9 o'clock as soon as the door opened. He had the checks, all right, all $400 worth. Could she give you a description of the man? Description? She knows him. A fella named Al Walker says we can find him at the sales bar in a couple of blocks away. <laughs> In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Every minute of every day, someone, somewhere, calls on the Red Cross for help. Last July, the nation's most devastating flood since 1937 smashed through four Midwestern states. Property damage in Kansas and Missouri alone exceeded $1 billion. Tens of thousands were made homeless. When the floods came, the Red Cross was ready with rescue teams and first aid stations. For the homeless, the Red Cross set up shelters and feeding points. But the biggest job came when the waters receded. Then began the rebuilding and repairing of homes, the rehabilitation of broken lives. The total cost of relief in this operation was almost $14 million. This was only one of the 300 domestic disasters in which the Red Cross gave aid last year. To answer the call when help is needed again this year, the Red Cross needs your support. Give and give generously to the 1952 Red Cross Fund campaign. And now back to tonight's adventure with the Texas Rangers. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and our authentic story, Dream Farm. We found Al Walker at the sales barn a couple of blocks away. Sign over the entrance read Al Walker, proprietor. There was no loft, and all the feed was neatly stacked at one end of the building. 
A small glassed-in office was at the other end. Walker was watering a couple of horses in the corral at the rear. Howdy, gents. Be right with you. All right. Blonde hair, Sheriff. He doesn't fit the description Robert Elwood gave no, us. No, but he had the checks. And he was in an all fired hurry to cash them. Uh, might be best not to mention the killing, Sheriff. Well, that's what I was thinking. Now then, gents. You're Al Walker? It's me, all right. Can I help you? You can answer some questions. All right. This is Sheriff King. I'm Ranger Pearson. Oh, right pleased to meet you. Come on in the office, gents. What kind of questions? You cashed some traveler's checks at the Burton National Bank a little while ago. Yeah, that's right. Four hundred dollars worth. Something wrong? Where'd you get them? Oh, a fellow brought him in this morning. He come in about eight o'clock, just as I was opening up. Have a seat, Ranger, Sheriff. No, thanks. Did he say his name was John Elwood? Well, yeah, that's what he said. Can you describe the man, Mr. Walker? Well, I reckon so. He's a big fella. Big? About your height, anyway. He's kind of heavy, too. What color was his hair? Oh, he had... Uh... Well, let me see now. He had light hair. Would you say it was as light as yours? Yeah, he'll call, come to think of it, it was. Uh-huh. What time did you say he came in, Mr. Walker? Just about eight. You always open that early? Oh, I generally open at six. Sell a lot of feed to the farmers around here, and they do business pretty early. Went to a lodge meeting last night, though I was out of town. I stayed out late, so I kind of overslept this morning. What time did he leave here? Oh, it was uh, 8.30 or so. I closed up about 20 minutes later so as I could go down to the bank and cash the checks. He was here about a half an hour then. That's right. It take you that long to cash the checks for him? Uh, well, he, he, he bought something. He come in here to buy a horse. To keep a little stock, you know. Sold him a saddle and bridle, too. What did his bill come to? It was uh, $150. You got a record of the sale, Mr. Walker? Well, uh, no, no. As a matter of fact, I, I didn't have time to enter it in my book. What about the rest of the checks? Well, after he paid me for the stuff he bought, he asked me to cash some other checks. I give him 250 in cash. You had that much cash at 8 o'clock in the morning? No, I always keep a few hundred dollars overnight on account of opening up before the bank does. Mr. Walker, did he sign those checks in front of you? Well, uh, well sure, he, he signed them in front of me. Uh-huh. Let me see the checks, Sheriff. Yeah. Here you are, Jase. See the two signatures on this check, Mr. Walker? Yeah. They don't match very well. They don't? What's wrong with them? Well, take a look. You see the difference here and here? Well, it look all right to me. I couldn't tell the difference. You mean it ain't, it ain't his right signature? The checks were stolen, Mr. Walker. This isn't John Elwood's signature at all. But stolen? How tall did you say that fellow was? What? Oh, he, he was a big fella. Well, how big? I don't know. He's six feet, maybe taller. You mean these checks are no good? I ain't gonna lose my $400, am I? Reckon you will, unless we catch up to the fellow who's got it. What color hair did you say he had? It was light-colored, blonde. How was I to know they were stolen? You should have checked the signatures. He did sign them in front of you, you said. Well, yeah, yeah, sure he did. Oh, excuse me, Ranger. Hello, Walkers. What? Oh, yeah, yeah, he's here. Just a minute. It's for you, Ranger. Pearson speaking. What time did they come in? All right, we'll be right over. Thanks. Mr. Walker, we'll have to pick up our conversation a little later. You stick around. Well, sure, I ain't going nowhere. Come on, Sheriff. What's up, Jase? It's a highway patrol. Austin identified a fingerprint from the car found at the scene of the killing. Yeah? Whose was it? A fellow named Sam Bradley. I got his mug shots at the patrol office. Bradley's description fit the one given us by Robert Elwood. A set of photographs had already been sent to the sheriff's office in Coronaville, and a deputy took them to young Elwood at the hospital for positive identification. A short time later, at the highway patrol office, I telephoned the boy. Yeah, Ranger, I got the picture right here, right in front of me. All right, Robert. Do you recognize any of the men in the pictures? Yeah, this is the man who did it. This is the man who killed Paul. Which one is it, Robert? This one. The name on the back, it says Sam Bradley. Thanks, Robert. You've been a big help. What'd he say? It's Bradley, all right. The boy picked his picture out of half a dozen the deputy brought up to the hospital. Well, that settles it then, but what about Walker? The description he gave us sure doesn't fit Bradley. 
case you know he was lying. Yeah, but I can't figure out why. His only stake in this is $400 worth of traveler's checks. He tried to cash them openly, so it's a cinch he figured they wouldn't bounce. I don't think he knew they were stolen. Maybe not, Jace, but he knew the man who gave him the checks wasn't John Elwood. Now, why'd he lie about that? I'm just as puzzled as you are. Come on. Well, where are you going now, Jace? Out to Walker's. I still want a written statement from him. You want to bring him back here? Uh-huh. Well, I reckon I'll mosey around town in the meantime. Maybe I can find someone to saw Bradley go into Walker's barn. Good idea. I'll meet you back here. I want to see if Walker's going to stick to his story. When I got to Walker's, the barn was closed up tight. I got his home address from a telephone book in a store nearby and walked back to the barn. By the time I got to my car, Walker was just driving up. Walker? Yeah? I thought I told you to stick around. Where you been? Well, uh, there's no place, Ranger. I uh, had to make a delivery. In your car? Not much room there to haul feed. Oh, it was just a sack of oats, that's all. I want you to come down to the patrol office with me. What, what for? To get your statement about the fellow who gave you those checks. Oh, well, what about the barn? I mean, you know if any customers come. They'll have to wait a while. You know where the highway patrol office is? Yeah. You can take your car. I'll follow you. At the station, Walker's story began to change slightly. His statement said that the man who cashed the checks was about five feet, ten inches tall. Earlier, he'd told us that the man was over six feet. It was 12 noon when the stenographer completed typing the statement, and I took it into Walker to sign. Here's the statement, Mr. Walker. You sure you don't want to make any changes before you sign it? No. No, I, I, I've been telling you the truth, Ranger. Uh-huh. Oh, one more thing. Before you sign it, I want to show you some pictures. Pictures? Yeah. Look at them carefully, Mr. Walker. Here are pictures of three men. Was one of these the man who cashed the checks? No. No, it wasn't any of these fellas. How about this one? Could he be the man? Uh, no, no, no. The fellow who cashed the checks was an altogether different kind of man. This, this, this ain't him. Mr. Walker, this man's already been identified by one person as the man who killed John Elwood and his wife. What'd you say, Ranger? Elwood was the man the checks belonged to. He was killed last night. Killed? First stealing, now killing. You didn't say nothing before about a murder? Two murders. This man, Bradley, killed two people and wounded a 12-year-old boy. He stole two cars that we know of. Well, I... I didn't know about all them things. Uh-huh. What about the picture? Is this the man who cashed the checks? No. No, that ain't him. I'm sure it ain't. All right, Mr. Walker. Sign the statement. Walker was afraid. He couldn't miss it. But I didn't know what was bothering him or why. After he signed the statement, I let him go. A few minutes later, the sheriff came into the office. He had a newspaper in his hand. Jace, is that Walker I just saw pulling away? Yes, Sheriff. He signed a statement, so I let him go. Well, we'd better get him right back again. Take a look at this newspaper. Uh, Burton Herald. What about it? But did Walker identify the picture of Bradley? No. Well, take a look at that item I marked. It'll tell you why he didn't. Mrs. Nancy Walker, wife of Al Walker, proprietor of Walker Sales Barn, is in Fort Worth visiting her sister... Mrs. Walker is the former Nancy Bradley. Get it, Jase? I checked around as soon as I got a load of this item, and it fits. Mrs. Walker has a brother named Sam Bradley. Walker's his brother-in-law. We raced out to Walker's sales barn, but it was still closed. So we headed out toward his home located in a farm section west of town. Half a mile from there, we spotted Walker's car turning into the driveway and saw him rush into the house. We parked a short distance away and covered the rest of the ground on foot, approaching the house from the rear. Let's move up to that open window, Sheriff. Right, Sheriff. It was food. Nothing in the house to eat. Sam, you fool. Where you been? I've been looking all over for you. I took a bus over to Hazel. Bought me a new suit. What's bothering you, huh? You're already spending my yeah. money. Listen. Well, I don't care. You can take the money, but you just got to get right out of here as fast as you can. You now, wait a minute. What do you mean, spending your money? I thought you told me you got them checks from a friend of yours. Why, sure. What about it? You and your stories. It's just like I told you, huh? 
We were playing cards last night, and the place was raided. This fellow was afraid if he showed himself, he'd get caught. That's why he asked me to cast a check. I knew you wouldn't mind. So that's it. Damn, don't you lie to me. You didn't have no friend. You signed them checks. They were stolen. Stolen? I know all about it. I lied for you at first because you told me you and your friend Elwood was ducking a gambling raid. Then I find you stole the checks. Now I find there's a couple of killings besides, and I'm mixed up in it. Now you get out of here. Look who you've been talking to. There's been a ranger out asking questions. That's who. You tell him anything? Not yet. But if I didn't have to lie to save my own hide, I'd have turned you in, brother-in-law or no brother-in-law. All right, you didn't Sheriff. Tell him. Cover me no, through this window. I'm going in. Get out of here right away. I'll tell you all good. I'll leave tonight when it's dark. You get out of here right now. I'm not getting myself hung for you. But you know I can't go. All right, Bradley, don't move. Sam, it's the ranger. What? You turn into a fucking gang behind the Stop table. Stop that gun, Bradley. Oh, my arm. My arm. Throw your gun over here. All right, all right. Okay, Jase? Yeah, I'm okay, Sheriff. Ranger, oh. it ain't my fault. I swear I didn't know nothing about the killing. I swear I didn't. Save it, Walker. The jury will want to know why you didn't tell us where he was. Come on, get up, Bradley. You better have some of that $400 left for a good lawyer. You'll need one. In just a moment, we will tell you the results of the case you have just heard. This is George Hicks reporting. I'm now in New Hampshire for NBC. The names are Taft, Eisenhower, Truman, Kefauver, and Stassen. We'll bring you the report soon on this first state presidential primary. This evening, NBC will present a broadcast of great interest to you in this election year. This is W.W. Chaplin inviting you to follow the campaign of the next president on NBC. Yes, from Concord, New Hampshire, the scene of the important New Hampshire primary election, NBC brings you surveys, reports, and comments by New Hampshire voters and party leaders. NBC is going to bring you full coverage of the New Hampshire primary, a primary which will not only decide the delegates to the Republican and Democratic National Conventions, but also give a pretty good indication as to the strength of the leading presidential candidates. This is Leon Pearson inviting you to follow the campaign of the next president on NBC. Hear the New Hampshire primary special broadcast tonight on NBC. And now, back to the Texas Rangers. And now, here are the results of the case you have just heard. For harboring a fugitive from justice, Al Walker received a five-year suspended sentence. Sam Bradley was identified by Robert Elwood as the man who shot and killed John and Ethel Elwood. Ballistics confirm that Bradley's gun was the murder weapon. He was convicted of murder in the first degree. And on August 4th, 1942, was electrocuted at Huntsville Penitentiary. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae will soon be seen in San Francisco Story, a Warner Brothers release. The part of Robert Elwood was played by Richard Beale. Ethel and John Elwood were Barbara Luddy and Tom Tully. Tony Barrett was Sam Bradley. And Barney Phillips was Al Walker. Ken Christie played the part of the sheriff. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Shelby Gordon. And the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Next, The Big Show brings you 90 minutes of drama, comedy, and music on NBC. of the Texas Rangers starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. Names 
dates and places in the following story are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Beginning today and continuing all week, there are many new programs returning to the NBC schedule. And you'll find a couple of your old favorites in new time periods as well. Today, Theater Guild on the Air returns for the fall season on NBC with a special dramatization of The Wisteria Trees, co-starring Helen Hayes and Joseph Cotton. Later, Dragnet, the authentic stories of your police force in action, begins a new series of Sunday evening broadcasts. On Tuesday, NBC's own Red Skelton returns to the fold to bring you 30 minutes of his hilarious antics. And the same day, Tuesday, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis also begin a new series on the NBC radio network. Thursday evening, you'll find truth or consequences on a new day at a new time, too. So better check your local newspaper for the correct time of all these wonderful programs on this NBC station. Remember, today, hear both Theater Guild on the Air, co-starring Helen Hayes and Joseph Cotton, and Dragnet for action-packed listening on NBC. Now, today's Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, from the files of the Texas Rangers, the case called Drive-In. It is 9.45 on a Saturday night in July 1947. At a drive-in theater three miles outside Corvell, Texas, a boy in his late teens walks between the rows of cars on the darkened lot and approaches an old convertible park near the exit. In the driver's seat of the convertible, a 15-year-old girl sits watching the movie. What's that? Don't Did say it. Did you already leave? You turn it I off. Turn it off. Turn it off. Mr. Turn it off. Mr. Oh, no time to be watching a movie now. You might have to start driving any minute. They're really getting ready to leave, huh? I don't know. You should have left 20 minutes ago. Oh, maybe they want to see the show again. It's a good picture. Oh, my God. Hey, sure, it's a pretty car they got. They ought to have a lot of money. What do you think I picked it? How much money do you reckon we'll get from her? Well, how do I know? You said if we used to get $100, we could get married. Yeah. Maybe if we used to get 200 we could go to Dallas for a honeymoon. Could we, Al? Sure, baby. Because I've never been at Dallas. Uh, you got your gun ready to use on there? Will you quit your yapping? Okay, okay. Don't you try to make sure everything go good? You sound like you don't even want me here. Yeah, sure I do, baby. You know that. Done nothing but yell at me the whole night. I've been trying to think. This thing has to go off just right. Now, you know what you got to do. Sure. Reckon you shoot them people? Maybe. To get me out of trouble. Wish I could be there when you use the gun. You'll scare them so bad they won't know. Here they come. Oh, sure it's them? I've been watching the car, haven't I? Hey, this excitement. I can hardly wait. Now, don't forget, baby. Uh-huh. Pick me up at that spot I showed you. And uh-huh. remember, don't drive too close behind us. Okay, Al. Hey, mister. Mister. Uh, what's the trouble? Uh, my, my car's out of gas. Can you give me a ride to the nearest filling station? Well, I reckon we can. All right with you, Ruth? Oh, sure, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Hop in the back, son. We'll take you. Oh, thanks a lot, mister. Well, sure glad you stopped me. My girl and me, we've been waiting 20 minutes for someone to come out. Oh. <laughs> Did you like the picture? What? Did... Oh, 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 yes, ma'am. Real good. We thought so, too. We almost stayed to see you a second time. I reckon I can turn on my headlights now. Eh, the way they make you keep your parking lights on on these drive-ins, I almost miss seeing you standing there. Sure lucky for me you didn't. My girl's supposed to be home early. Gosh, I feel like kicking myself letting the car run out of gas. Uh, maybe oh. we can bring you back to the filling station. Might be a long time before you get a ride otherwise. Oh, you don't have to do that, mister. Oh, we'll be happy to do it. Oh, we, honey? Oh, of course you will. <laughs> I remember how it was. My wife's folks were always reading the ride act to me for bringing her home late. <laughs> we didn't have driving movies, Shut ain't up, it? mister. Hmm? What? Why when you this? get to the crossroad, turn left, away from town. What? Huh? Do like I say. You don't, I'm going to put a bullet right in your head. Oh, Jim. Now, Jim, look here, Quit that talk. Uh-huh. Now, turn left. Oh. Just so you know, I ain't fooling. I'm clicking his hammer back. Oh, you hear it, mister? What is it you want? You find out. You won't get away with this, son. I told what? you to quit talking. You're making a big mistake. Why don't you... Shut up! Jim, don't argue with him. Do what he says, please. He's right. <laughs> you won't live, you do just what I say. Now, drive faster. I said Faster. How much further you want me to go? I'll tell you when to stop. <laughs> you, you have to press that gun so hard in the back of my neck. I'm keeping it right where it is. Jim, please don't argue with him. This is far enough. Stop. <laughs> now we're all getting out. 
Not this sad, lady. I'm <laughs> young. I still got this gun cock, mister. Now throw your wallet and purse into the car, both of us. <laughs> throw them in, I said. Okay. Now start walking down the road. You look back once and I'll plug you. Oh, Jim, I think I'm going to... Now, 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 just hold on my arm, honey. You'll be all right. Keep walking. Half an hour later, the couple stopped the passing truck, which took them into the sheriff's office at Corvell. The sheriff, who was in another part of the county, was notified. He ordered an all-points bulletin to be sent out on the stolen car and requested the Texas Rangers to begin the investigation. Upon arrival at the sheriff's office, Ranger Jace Pearson began taking statements from the two victims. Now, I'd just like to go over a few things to make sure we have them straight. Mr. Harper, you say you had $37 in your wallet? Yeah, that's right, Ranger. And uh, Ruth had five in her purse. Oh, five and some change, Jim. It was closer to six. Uh, the boy who robbed you, all you remember about him is that he was heavy set and not too tall. Well, I know he was shorter than Ruth, and she's five foot eight. Uh, wish we could tell you more, but it was pretty dark the whole time he was with us. Couldn't get a good look at his face. Ranger, I just remembered something about him I forgot to tell you before. Don't know if it'll help. Anything will help, Mrs. Harper. Well, I did notice that he had his sleeves rolled up right to his shoulders like he was trying to show off his muscles. I see. Now about this girl the fellow said he was with. Did you... Oh, hello, Sheriff. Well, howdy, Jason. Folks, I'm sorry I wasn't here sooner, but at least I got some good news for you. Oh, what's that, Sheriff? They found your car just a few minutes ago. Oh, that's a relief. Where'd they find it, Sheriff? A couple of miles from where the holdup took place. Just got it on the radio as I was driving up. I told him I'd relay the message on to you. Well, can someone take us out there? Well, that won't be necessary, Mr. Harper. They're towing it in right now. Towing it in? Yes, ma'am, so they won't destroy any evidence. Well, I'm sure glad we've got it back. The fellow that held you folks up, was he working alone? Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Harper think there was a girl in it with him. That's right. But like we told the ranger, we didn't see her. She probably followed and picked him up after he ditched your car. That sounds like the tow truck coming in now. Yeah, that's him. I expect we better get out there. I sure hope that little rat didn't get my typewriter. Typewriter? Yeah. I was bringing it home to do some work over Sunday. Put in the back seat of the car when Ruth picked me up at the office. Well, it won't be long before we know if he took it. <laughs> that boy seems so nice at first. Oh, it's just no telling about people, is there? No, ma'am. <laughs> Especially <laughs> that one. Back of my neck still hurts where he was pressing the gun against it. Oh, that kid's vicious. Real vicious. We'll do everything we can to catch him before he gets rough with anybody else. Uh, the car is right over there. I'll make you out a receipt for it. Well, you have to keep it here? Only for tonight, till the lab has a chance to go over it. Uh, we'll see that you get a ride home, folks. Uh, thanks, Sheriff. Uh, let me see. Oh, wait a minute, I... Mr. Harper. Hmm? Don't touch the door handle. It hasn't been gone over for prints yet. Oh, oh sorry, Ranger. It's all right. I'll just shine my light through the window here. Oh, just what I was afraid of. Typewriter's gone. Oh, Jim. I don't suppose you know the serial number. No, but I reckon I've got it at home with a guarantee. We'll alert dealers and secondhand stores in case he tries to sell it someplace. Uh, honey, didn't you have a package in there, too? Oh, why, yes. I almost forgot about it. Uh, a couple pairs of stockings I bought this afternoon. Where'd you buy them, ma'am? Hugger's dress shop. You mind telling us the brand and size? They were Mo Judd, size ten and a half long. You know if any other place in town carries that brand of stockings? No, I'm sure they don't, Ranger. Thanks, ma'am. I reckon we can let you folks go home now. Mr. Harper, will you phone us as soon as you find out that typewriter number? Sure will, Ranger. I'll get my deputy to give you a ride. Uh, Sandy? Yeah? Would you take Mr. and Ms. Harper home in your car? Right. Uh, thanks. Come on, honey. Oh, I sure will be glad to get home. What do you want to do tomorrow, Jace? Check with the manager of the drive-in theater? Yeah, I'd also like to talk to the owner of the shop where those stockings were bought. Well, Jace, I can understand why you wanted that typewriter number, but why did you want to know all about the stockings? It's just possible that the girl in that hold-up team will come in and try and exchange the stolen stockings for a different size. She wouldn't have to change them if she wears the same size as Mrs. Harper. I don't think she does. The boy who robbed the Harpers is short. From what they said about him, I doubt if he's the type who'd go with a girl taller than he is. Certainly not one as tall as Mrs. Harper. Well, suppose the girl is short. She could still take a large stocking size. Yeah, but the ones Mrs. Harper bought were ten and a half long. Nobody but a tall person would want to wear them. You could be right, Jason. I'll phone the woman who owns the dress shop first thing in the morning. It's only a chance, but I believe it's worth a try. The following...
following morning was Sunday. The lab crew had completed its work and found nothing that would help us. At 10 a.m., the sheriff called Mrs. Herger, the owner of the dress shop, and asked her to come down and open up her store. She agreed to meet us in 15 minutes. We went there and waited. Main Street sure is quiet Sunday mornings. Uh-huh. You'd never believe this street was chock full of cars yesterday. Did Mrs. Herger say she was coming right down? Sure, Jace, but you know how women are. She'll be along. Sure hope she'll be able to locate the sales slip on those stockings. Yeah, we're lucky today's Sunday. If the girl does try to exchange them, she won't be able to do it till tomorrow. I believe that's Mrs. Herger's car now, coming around the corner. Yep, that's her. Hello, Sheriff. Well, howdy, Miss Herger. Huh? Excuse me for being late, but Amory took off in the car and I had to wait till he got back. That's all right, ma'am. That Amory. Every time I need the car, he's got it. I'm sorry we had to trouble you in the first place. Oh, no trouble. Uh, you wanted to see the sales slip I made out for Ruth Harper on those stockings. Is that right, Ranger? Yes, ma'am. Well, let's go in the store. Uh, let's see, where's that key? Yeah. Oh. oh, I always forget that burglar alarm. Here, let me get my other key and turn that thing off. <laughs> oh, lucky I got a couple of police officers with me. Somebody had me arrested for breaking in my own store. Would you like us to wait here while you look up that slip? Uh, no. Uh, come on over to the counter. It might take me a while to find it, seeing as how Mrs. Harper doesn't have a charge account. I'll just get my sales book. She came in here about 4 o'clock yesterday, didn't she? I believe she said it was about 5. Uh, yeah, yeah, I remember now. Uh, you know what size she bought? Ten and a half long. Let's see. No, no, that's medium length. Ah, well, here it is. Two pairs of ten and a half long. She gave me a $10 bill. What's the number on the sales slip, Mrs. Herger? Five o four o. You want to take it along, Ranger? No, ma'am. We just want to remember it. A girl may come in and try to exchange those stockings. If she does, we'd like you to phone us and keep her here till we come. Well, how am I going to do that? We leave that up to you. But it's important that she stays in this store till we get here. Well, when do you figure she'll show us? Maybe tomorrow. Maybe the next day. Maybe not at all. You think you can handle it? Well, I, I never tried anything like this before. But I'll do my best. <laughs> When we left Mrs. Herger's store, we went to see the manager of the drive-in theater. He didn't recall seeing anyone who answered the vague description of the boy which the Harpers had given us. But he did tell us the names of a number of people who had been at the theater the night before. We questioned them, and several remembered seeing a boy with his sleeves rolled up to the shoulders. He'd been with a young girl in a convertible. We took statements from these witnesses. Around 2 o'clock on Monday afternoon, we had them come into the sheriff's office to sign their statements. Here you are, Mr. Hammer. Oh, thank you. Sign all six copies, please. Yep. Uh, Miss Lindsay, here's your statement. Are you sure where to sign it, Sheriff? Uh, sure, Jason. Uh, I'll get it. No. Ranger Pearson. This is Mrs. Herker. I can't talk loud. What is it, ma'am? There's a girl here with the same stockings I sold to Mrs. Harper. She wants to exchange them. We'll be right over. Well, I, I don't know how long I can keep her, Ranger. You better hurry. <laughs> Two or three girls in there, Jace. Any of them could be the one we're after. Yeah. I don't see Miss Herger. There she is now, coming toward the front of the store. Ranger. Ranger. Where is she, ma'am? Look over my shoulder, straight down the counter. See the one at the end with the mousy hair? Uh huh. Where are the stockings she brought in? On the counter, right next to where she's standing. Sales slip is there too. Thanks, Miss Herger. Hey, you were right about her not being tall. I think she's got an idea we're coming after her. Yeah, looks nervous, all right. Don't think she'll try to run for it, do you, Jean? Mm, one direction she can go, right out this way. Excuse me, miss. Hey! We'd like to see those stockings. They're mine. If you don't mind, we'll take a look at the sales slip. Now, there it is on the counter, Jase. I'll get it. You leave them stockings alone. Sales slip checks out 5040. What? Give me them stockings. Just a minute, young lady. Where'd you get them? They're mine. We think they were stolen. Well, I didn't steal them. Maybe not, but we'd like to hear all about how you did get them. Come on, miss. Mr. 
In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We often hear the phrase, the American way. But do you ever stop to think just what that means? Of course, it means many things. Our traditions of freedom, our democratic government, and our system of justice. But a fundamental part of the American way is our economic system. Our economic system is not perfect. That's a simple historical fact. But the American economic system has brought greater material means for happiness to more people than any other system the world has ever known. Especially in these critical times, all of us should work to defend and improve this system. And the best way to defend and improve our economic system is to learn how it works. You can get a free booklet explaining our economy by writing to Box 10, Times Square Station, New York City. Just write to Box 10, Times Square Station, New York City, and ask for your free copy of The Miracle of America. Now back to Tales of the Texas Rangers. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and our authentic story, Drive-In. We took the girl with us. In the car, we learned that her name was Grace Maud Compton. She lived in a house in the outskirts of town with her mother, who worked as a waitress in an all-night diner. When we questioned Grace Maud about Saturday night's robbery, she was sullen and denied knowing anything about it. We decided to take her out and discuss the matter with her mother. On the way, we tried to talk to her some more. Her sullenness changed to hysteria. I didn't steal no stockings, and I didn't rob nothing from no people in the car. Your boyfriend did, and you helped. I ain't got a boyfriend. Where were you Saturday night, Grace Maud? I keep telling you I was home. But you can't prove it. Why do I have to prove it? Why'd you keep picking on me? Nobody's picking on you. You are so. Everybody's always picking on me. Your mother's not going to be very happy when she finds out you're in trouble. I ain't in trouble. Besides, you can't talk to Ma. She's sleeping. I'm afraid we'll have to wake her up. Ma, I don't like to be woke up. She gets sore when she's woke up before getting up time. That's your place up ahead? Yeah. Nice little house. That's dumb. Bet your ma works hard to keep it up that nice. Don't start preaching at me. Everybody's always preaching at me. Go ahead, Grace Maud. I ain't going in there. I ain't. Come on. No. She'll start yelling at me. She'll pick on me just like you're doing. Come on, let's go. No. Oh. Now look, Grace Maud. If you haven't done anything, you don't have to be afraid. I ain't afraid. Well, then we'll just have a little talk with you and your mother. Ain't nothing she can tell you. We'll see about that. Come on now. I told you I couldn't do nothing. I ain't afraid of you or her. All right, to go in? Yeah. Joy's unlocked. All right, go get your mother. I didn't know she... That's you, Grace Mob? Yeah? Who's out there with you? I want to talk to you. Who is it? Police officers, ma'am. I'll be right out. You see, I'll catch you. You woke her up and I'm going to catch you. Do you have anything you want to tell us before your mother comes out? There you go picking on me again. Why are you want to... All right, Grace Mom. <laughs> She's the way I look. I worked all night and I was sleeping. I'm sorry we had to wake you up, ma'am. What's this all about? I didn't do nothing, Be Ma. quiet, Grace Mom. What's the trouble, Ranger? We think your daughter might have had something to do with a holdup on Saturday night. I didn't, I tell you, I didn't. Hold up. What makes you think Grace Maud mixed up in anything like that? She tried to exchange a couple of pairs of stockings in a store in town today. They were stolen along with some money and a typewriter. But I didn't steal them. Don't let them tell you I stole them, Maud. You be quiet. Are you sure they were stolen? There's no doubt about it, ma'am. Well, I've tried to bring her up right. I haven't been with her as much as I should be, working like I do nights. But I can't believe she'd do anything real bad. I didn't, Ma. We think she helped her boyfriend in the robbery. Boyfriend? <laughs> You've been going out with that Al again? No, Ma. I thought I told you to stay away from him. I ain't seen him in a long time. I swear I ain't. What's Al's last name, Mrs. Compton? I don't know. He worked on one of the ranches near here. I didn't like the way he acted with Grace Maud. He's too old for her. Been around too much. Why, she's just a kid. I ain't a kid. I'm already grown up. You're too young to be running around with men. Well, you go around with men, don't you? Why, you... If I ever hear you talk to me like that again, I'll slap your head off. You hear me? You hear? (laughs) There you go. You're picking on me again. What's Al's last name, Grace Maud? You're lying. I'm not. I don't know his last name, and I ain't been out with Maybe him. not, but you're not going out of this house again at night until I tell you. Oh, that ain't fair. You promised me I could go to the double feature I don't tonight. care what I promised. You're not going. Oh. I'm sorry, Ranger. You wanted to ask me some questions? Mrs. Compton, we don't want to hold your daughter if she's innocent. 
But she hasn't told us where she got those stockings. We hoped you'd make her understand how serious this is. Grace Maud, I want you to tell me the truth. Where'd you get those stockings? You wouldn't believe me. Where did you get them? I want the truth. I found them. Where'd you find them, Grace Maud? On the street, outside the drugstore. Why didn't you tell us this before? Because I know you'd think I stole them. Are you telling the truth? Sure, I'm telling the truth. That's what I get for trying to be nice. Nice? What are you talking about? I was going to give them to you for your birthday. I found the stockings. They're so big for you, so I was trying to change them for your size. I'm sure you weren't getting them for yourself. No, I wasn't. I was just trying to surprise you. I never had no money to buy you a decent present. Well, you might if you got a job once in a while. All I was trying to do was give you something nice for your birthday and nobody believes me. Grace Maud. Were you really going to give me those stockings? Sure I was. And something else you don't know. I've been looking for a job. All this week I was looking. Grace Maud, Ever I... since I found them stockings this morning, I've been thinking how you were going to like them. You don't have no pretty stockings. You don't even believe me now. I don't know, Ranger. I think she's telling the truth. I am. I am. I think she is too, Mrs. Compton. Looks like we could have made a mistake. Well... You had no way of knowing. We didn't mean to cause either of you any embarrassment. Forget it, Ranger. Grace Maud, I'm sorry I yelled at you before. I I appreciate you thinking about my birthday. I'll get you something real nice. You just wait. Ma? Yeah? Can I go to that double feature tonight? I promise I won't ask you to go again until I get a job. Can I, Ma? Well, all right. I'll drop you on my way to work. Gee, thanks, Ma. I reckon we'll be going, ma'am. Come on, Sheriff. Bye, Ranger. Bye, Grace Maud. We didn't believe a word Grace Maud had said. She'd fooled her mother, and we wanted her to think she'd fooled us. We are pretty sure her plans went beyond seeing a movie that night, and we hoped sooner or later she'd lead us to her boyfriend. We waited near the house in our car till a little after seven that evening. Grace Maud and her mother came out and got into an old jalopy. We followed him into town. Mrs. Compton let Grace Maud out in front of the theater. We parked half a block down the street and waited. I reckon we got ourselves a lot of time to kill before she comes out of that picture show. Uh-huh. What if she doesn't try to get in touch with her boyfriend tonight? Uh, we just keep watching her until she does. Maybe I could get a couple of deputies to stay. Chase? She didn't go in that movie house after all. No, she's starting down the street. Yeah, right toward us. If she sees us, we're Get finished. down in the sea as far as you can. Yeah. <laughs> Lucky you haven't got your horse trailer hooked on back or she'd spot us sure. Yeah, let's just hope she doesn't see the radio aerials. I can hear her now. Sounds like she's still heading this way. Yeah. Keep it low, sure. Yeah. Boy, I was sure she'd notice us. Where's she going? Well, she just turned the corner into a side street. Come on. You reckon she's going someplace to meet him now? It's hard to say. I've been thinking about this Al fella Grace Maud's mother mentioned today. Wondering if he's the one we're after. So have I. I didn't want to ask too many questions about him. Watch it going around the corner, Sheriff. Hey, Jace. With that fellow in the convertible, it's her. They're pulling away. Stay here and watch where they go. I'll get the car and pick you up in a few seconds. By the time I picked up the sheriff, the convertible was out of sight. The sheriff thought they'd headed toward the main highway leading out of town. He was right. We spotted them just past the town limits. After three miles of hard driving, we began to gain on them. Five minutes later, we were 100 yards behind the convertible. They see us, Chase. He's stepping it up a little. That's yeah, just what we're going to do. Want me to try a shot at their tires? I don't think so. We'll pull alongside of them. We're making it. Yeah. Yell at them to pull over. Pull over, you! Pull over to the side. Don't be crazy, Tyler. Watch yourself. He's going to shoot. Sorry, that dirty little... Hang on, Sheriff. We'll force him over. He's making a break for that brush. Stay with the girl. I'll get him. Watch out, Al. Watch out. You keep quiet, Grace Mullen. Drop the gun, you. Isn't what I think of you, Ranger. I'm warning you. If you don't want to get hurt, come out of that brush with your hands up. I don't want to hurt you, son. Drop that gun and come out with your hands up. This is your last chance. Yeah! Oh, my shoulder. Give me that gun. Now get up. Oh, my shoulder. Get up. 
Let's go. Oh, he's hurt. He's hurt. Oh, listen to that. Always he happens. Shut up, you big mouth. Come on. Oh, your shoulder's weak. You're so... Oh, you touch on real quick. Handcuff them together, Sheriff. I wish there was something I could do for you. It's not enough. I wish I had my gun. I'd put a slug right through your stupid head. <laughs> Come on, Sheriff. Let's get these two back to town. In just a moment, we will tell you the results of the case you have just heard. NBC means comedy. And Tuesday's the day this week for you to start laughing with Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis and Red Skelton. That's right. This Tuesday evening, you'll hear both these great comedy programs when they begin the new fall season on NBC and this station. Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis will have Rosemary Clooney as their guest this Tuesday evening. And Miss Clooney will sing her popular version of Botchamy. Red Skelton promises a visit from Junior, the mean widow kid, and Deadeye, America's favorite cowpoke. Thursday evening, don't be surprised when you hear truth or consequences, for this popular program has switched days and is now a regular Thursday evening feature on the NBC Radio Network. And today is Sunday. There's more big news for listeners. Theater Guild on the Air returns today with Helen Hayes and Joseph Cotton co-starred in the Theater Guild production of The Wisteria Trees. Another important program note is this one. Dragnet has moved to Sunday. Yes, hear Dragnet tonight on NBC. Now back to Tales of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> And now, here are the results of the case you have just heard. A typewriter identified as the one stolen from Jim Harper was found among Al Bennett's possessions. Bennett confessed to the robbing of Harper and his wife, naming Grace Maud Compton as his accomplice. Grace Maud was sent to the state school for girls at Gainesville. Al Bennett was convicted of armed robbery and is now serving a 25-year term at Huntsville Penitentiary. Now, here is an important announcement from the star of our show, Joel McRae. Folks, tonight marks the concluding performance, for a while at least, of Tales of the Texas Rangers. We've really enjoyed bringing these stories to you and hope that someday we'll be back with you again. To NBC and its affiliated stations, to Colonel Homer Garrison, Jr., Chief of the Texas Rangers, to Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez, our technical advisor, and to all the Texas Rangers and members of the Department of Public Safety, our grateful thanks. And we're particularly grateful to those of you who've taken the time to send us your cards and letters. After all, they are the only sure way of telling that you liked our show. Thanks, folks. Thanks a lot. Good night. You have just heard Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Charles E. Israel, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keats. Hal Gibney speaking. Tonight, attend the premiere of Theater Guild on the Air over NBC. The Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. dates and places in the following story are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record.
In this election year, this station is making it possible for you to follow the campaign of the next president on NBC. Tuesday, July 1st, be sure to hear another of NBC's pre-convention broadcasts. This program is called Convention City. It will offer you a complete description of the arrangements being made in Chicago, the host city of both the Republican and Democratic conventions this year. Jim Hurlbut of NBC Chicago will serve as your host. The program will include interviews with Chicago officials in charge of the convention arrangements. You will hear the unusual problems resulting from the almost gigantic task of entertaining the two major party conventions. We're sure you'll find this a fascinating program. So consult your local newspaper for broadcast time and join us Tuesday, July 1st for Convention City. This is another special program brought to you so you may follow the campaign of the next president on NBC. Now, Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, from the files of the Texas Rangers, the case called X-Con. It is 10.30 on the morning of September 14th, 1940. Ten miles outside the town of High Point in southwest Texas, a thin, worn-looking woman sits in the back room of a rundown house. She is sewing a patch on a pair of child's dungarees when she hears the front door open. Who's that? It's me. Tom? What you doing home this time of day? Where are the kids? Out playing somewhere. Why ain't you down at the packing house? Didn't the new job work out? Oh, it worked out real good for an hour. For a whole hour, they let me clean up the place. Nice something to do with that, now wasn't it, Liz? What happened? Same thing that's happened before. I seen somebody whispering to the boss and pointing at me. Tom. I could see this guy's fat mouth making the words killer, ex-con. Same words everybody always whispers when they look at me. And the boss comes out and says he got somebody else for my job. Did he pay you? Yeah. Here. Seventy cents. Get some meat and milk for the kids, and don't forget to put what's left in the bank. Talking like that ain't gonna help, no. You don't know what helps. And quit nagging. I'm sick and tired of it. Telling me what I should and shouldn't do. Tom, why now, don't shut you... Shut up, shut up, I tell you. Oh. Liz. Oh, Liz, honey. Tom. I didn't mean it, honey. I'm sorry. I know, I know. It's just... Everything's all wrong. I don't know what I'm going to do. I got a feeling everything's going to be all right. But there was even a man here looking for you this morning. What kind of man? He had real good clothes on and a pretty car. Maybe he's got some work for you. Could be that fellow from over at the brickyard. He almost gave me a job when I got out of the pen. Yeah, that's who it must be. Maybe he's got a job for me loading bricks. He must want you awful bad way he was talking. Loading bricks ain't bad work. I ought to get a whole buck an hour. Easy, maybe a buck and a quarter. Sure you will. And we won't have to worry no more about what we... Ain't that somebody outside? Sounds like it. Oh, I can't let him see me in these dirty clothes. It won't make no difference. Do I, do I look all right? Just fine, Tom. Run your hand over your hair and smooth it down a little. Yeah. There. Oh, you look just fine. I got a funny feeling in my stomach. Now, don't be nervous, honey. I'm coming. I'll be right there. Sorry to keep... Oh, it's you. I want to talk to you, Dawson. Just a second. I'm going outside, honey. Don't you want to bring him in? How many times I got to tell you to stay away from me? Now, look, It Dawson, ain't enough that... you come clawing around me in town. Now you got to come up to my house. I'm only trying to offer you a job. I come to your farm for a job. You turned me down. Well, that was different. But it's okay to ask me to do your dirty work, huh? Well, don't look at it that way, Dawson. We're, we're just helping each other out. I told you before, I don't go for killing. Suppose I give you a thousand for the job instead of five hundred. Why? Now wait a minute. There's a business proposition, Dawson. I know you can't get a job. I'll get along. They even fired you down the packing house. You never get a job around right here. You let me worry about that. Well, you're already worrying plenty. I can see that. Now listen, there's an old lady in a town north of here, and all you got to do is get rid of her. Why'd you come to me? Because you're the only one I know can do it. I ought to beat your lousy face. Now will you look? Cut out that stuff. This is business. Thousand dollars for easy job. How about it, Dawson? I... All right. 
Well, that's more like it. Now, look. Here's a name and address on a slip of paper. And here, here's a gun. I don't care how you do it. Let's try and make it look like robbery. Huh? What about the money? Here's a hundred now. Get the rest when I read about it in the papers. Where are you going to be? Away with friends for a few days. I'll need money to get up there and back. All right. Here. There's another hundred. Now, don't waste any time getting started. I want to be reading good news in the papers soon, here. Dirty, lousy. Did you get the job? Here's some money. A hundred? You ain't even started work yet. How come he'd give you a... Never mind. I take the money. But... Will you shut up? I got to go up north for a day, so... Not going to work at the brickyard? No. And quit asking questions. What'd you just put in that sack? Nothing. I want to see... Now, keep away from here, Liz. Keep... What are you going to do with that gun? I told you to keep away. You're going to do something bad. You're going to get in trouble again. Get out of the Don't way. Don't do it. You'll go back to the pen, and this time they won't let you I'm out. I'm in a hurry, Liz. Think about the kids. You want them to grow up knowing their father's a good... Yeah, go ahead. Say it. Knowing their father's a con. Well, they're right. Three years in a pen and you get the name for life anyhow. That ain't so. We'll make out. We will, Tom. I'll see you as soon as I get back. No. No, Tom, please. Leave me alone. Oh, Tom, don't do it. Come back. Come back, please. Ten minutes after Tom Dawson left the house, his wife took the children to a neighbor's. At noon, she appeared at a Texas Ranger Company headquarters. The distressed woman told her story to Ranger Jace Pearson. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ranger. I don't mean to keep bawling like this. That's all right, man. Tom ain't bad. Nobody knows that better than me. I didn't want to come here. But I gotta keep him from getting locked up again. We'll do everything we can to help. Now, about this man who came to your place this morning. You say you never saw him before? Well, this morning was the first time. And you don't know what he paid your husband to do? No. But it must have been something bad. Else he wouldn't have given Tom a gun. You sure your husband said he was heading north? I'm sure of that. Tom never fooled with a gun before. He wouldn't hurt nobody on purpose, but... But he's got an awful bad temper. I'm afraid we already know that from his record, ma'am. The trouble he got into before, that was an accident. He didn't mean to kill Bob Peters. Bob wouldn't give him his wages, and Tom got mad and hit him. He served his time for that, Mrs. Dawson. Our problem is to keep him from getting into any more trouble. I don't know what I'll do if he has to go to jail again. It was so awful the last time. Oh, Ranger, you got to stop Tom from doing something bad. You got to. We will, ma'am, if we can find him. I put out an all-points bulletin on Tom Dawson, then took Mrs. Dawson home. Sheriff Sims in High Point agreed to help me in the search. We decided on the bus station as the first likely place to check. At 2.15 that afternoon, we entered the Trailways bus depot and walked toward the ticket window. Yeah, you'd think a fellow like Dawson would have learned enough to keep out of trouble. What do you figure he's up to now? There yeah, might be anything, Sheriff. Burglary, stick-up, even a killing. Whatever it is, I hope we can get to him before it's too late. I sure hope we can get a lead here. Can I help you, Ranger? The sheriff and I'd like to ask you a few questions, miss. Sure. Oh, excuse me a second. I got to announce that bus. Oh, sure, I'm glad when that 2.30 bus leaves. Means I only got another half hour to work. Uh-huh. You mind taking a look at that photo? You seen this man in here today? Well, I think I have, yeah. He was in here, bought a ticket from me. Where to? See, now, it was somewhere up north. I'm sorry, Sheriff, but I don't remember just where. You're sure he was here, though? Oh, I'm sure of that, all right. The reason I'm so positive, he gave me a hundred-dollar bill. When I gave him change, he pretty near cleaned out my cash drawer. What time was this? Well, I know it was sometime afternoon, but I'm not too sure when. 
What buses do you have going north in the afternoon? Just two, the 130 and the 415. All right, miss. Thanks a lot. Well, if he bought his ticket before that 130 northbound lift, he could be on it, Jake. Yeah, I figure it's going to take us just about two hours to find out if he is. We drove north and overtook the 130 bus after it had traveled a little over 100 miles. Dawson was not aboard. We checked the 415 bus. He wasn't on it either. By 11 the next morning, we'd combed all of the towns where he could have stopped off. Still no trace of him. We gave up the search and headed back toward High Point. By noon, we were just coming into town. I'm really beat, Jason. When I get to bed, I'm not going to move for two days. Yeah, sure been a long night. Worst part of it is we didn't accomplish a thing. We can be pretty sure whatever Dawson got paid to do, he's probably done it by now. I sure feel sorry for that wife of his. If Dawson gets sent up now, it's going to be for a long, long time. What are you stopping here for? Over there, Sheriff. Coming out of that feed store. Well, I'll... Dawson. Right on Main Street. Let's go. He must see us, but it don't seem to bother him. He's just standing there. He could be playing at KG. Watch yourself. Yeah. Jason's starting to move. Hold it, Dawson. What do you want? We'd like to talk to you. What about? About a bus ride you took yesterday. You crazy? I ain't been on a bus in months. Risk him, Sheriff. Put your hands over your head. Why can't you guys leave me alone just because I spent a few years in the pen? No gun, Jason. What are you talking about, gun? I never had no gun. Here's his wallet. Nothing. Not even a dollar That's deal. right, and you know why. Because you guys won't leave me alone so as I can get a job. Like just now in that feed Wait store. Wait I... There's something in this inside pocket. Yeah, a slip of paper. <laughs> What'd it say? Bella Ross, RFD 12, Odessa. Give me that. Who's Bella Ross? That's my business. Odessa's north of here, Jace. It's only 200 miles. Dawson could have made it up and back since yesterday. Were you in Odessa last night, Dawson? No. Then where were you? Well, I always am nights. Home. Can you prove it? Sure. Go talk to my wife. She'll tell you I was home the whole night. In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. There's a price tag on almost everything. Whether you drive a shiny new 1952 model or a pre-war jalopy, you had to pay the price. And when you're driving that car, remember that speed also has its price. Death or injuries that can cripple you for life. You may speed at times and get away with it, but the odds are too strongly against you that in some tight spot you'll make a mistake while speeding. It'll be curtains for you. Or you'll have it on your conscience for the rest of your days that you took a life, that you... And you alone could have avoided if you weren't speeding. The price tag on speed violations last year was 15,000 killed and 500,000 injured. This year, thousands of lives can be saved if you and millions of other motorists come to the sober realization that speed is the biggest killer on the highways. You can do your part. At all times, drive as though your life depends on it. It does. Now we return to the Texas Rangers. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and our authentic story, Ex-Con. Tom Dawson continued to insist that he'd been home the night before. We wanted to check his story, so we left him at the sheriff's office and drove out to see his wife. Oh? Can we come in, Mrs. Dawson? Yeah. Yeah, you can come in. Thanks. What do you want? Just like to talk to you about your husband. Tom ain't done nothing. We're not saying he has. But after talking to him in town, we got a few things we want to clear up. You talk to Tom. Where is he? The sheriff's office. He ain't done nothing, I tell you. I wish I'd never come to you. I should have known it wouldn't bring nothing but trouble. Where was your husband last night? He was here, home with me the whole night. Yesterday, you told me he left the house carrying a gun. You were afraid he was going to get into trouble. I don't know why I come and told you that. Once in a while, I, I get thinking things that never happened, like I've been dreaming. You told the ranger a man came up here and paid your husband to do something for him. Was that a dream, too? I... I don't know. Maybe it was. I don't know nothing no more. Mrs. Dawson, do you know a woman up in Odessa named Bella Ross? 
No. Ever hear your husband talk about her? No. Why you keep picking on Tom? Why don't you leave us be? I got a feeling, ma'am, you're not telling us everything you know. There ain't nothing to tell. I made a mistake yesterday. Well, can't force you to tell us anything. But we'll find out what we want to know. And if your husband has done something he wrong, ain't, we'll... He ain't, I tell you. He ain't done nothing wrong. All right, ma'am. We'll be going now. Ranger? Yes, ma'am? I'll... Nothing. Goodbye, Miss Dawson. Jace, that woman's story's full of holes. She's lying. I know. I was kind of hoping she'd save us that trip to Odessa. You mean to check on Bella Ross? Yeah. Let's get up there and see if she fits into this. When we arrived in Odessa, we made inquiries about Bella Ross. We learned she was a widow who lived alone on her ranch ten miles out of town. Oil had been discovered on her land several years before, making her a wealthy woman. We drove to her ranch. The main house was locked and the blinds were drawn. We began to suspect that Dawson's connection with her might have been robbery or even murder. Just as we were about to return to town and get a warrant to enter the house, we spotted a cloud of dust a few miles away. We took the car and headed across the range. As we approached, we saw that the dust was made by a group of men branding calves in a makeshift corral. Jace, I think we're just wasting time coming out here. I don't think any of these boys would have a key to the house. Yeah, if the foreman's out here, he might. He might. Hey, you men over there. Ah. Any of you got a key to the Ross Ranch house? Who wants a key to my house? Jace, yeah. Are you Bella Ross? Yeah, what about it? I'm Ranger Pearson. This is Sheriff Sims. We'd like to ask you some questions, ma'am. Well, sure, go ahead. Have you noticed any strangers around your place the last day or so? No, can't say as I have. Why? You know a man named Dawson? Excuse me a second, Ranger. Jim! You, Jim! Be careful how you handle them calves. They cost money. Oh, these hands nowadays just got no respect for stock. Uh, what's that fellow's name you was asking about? Dawson, Tom Dawson. No, I don't think I know him. Is he from Odessa? From High Point. Oh, only one I know down there is my nephew. Nephew? Art Finch, my dead sister's boy. Only kin I got. You know him? I've met him, Mrs. Ross. Oh, he's a fine boy, ain't he? Well, he... Bet your life he is. I set him up on a truck farm a few years ago. Told him if he was going to get all my money someday, he'd have to prove he could make some on his own. How's he been doing? Well, just fine. Here from him every week. Then you haven't been down there lately. No, but I'm figuring to go down there soon. I wrote and told Art a couple of weeks ago I was coming down. Look, I said I didn't mind answering questions, but I'd kind of like to know what this is all about. I don't want to alarm you, Mrs. Ross. I may be yeah. wrong, but we think yeah. someone's trying to make trouble for you. Make trouble? Well, who'd want to do anything to me? That's something we can't say till we do a little more checking. But in the meantime, we'd like you to stay in your house till we can get you a police guard. Police guard? Why, <laughs> that's downright crazy, Ranger. I can take care of myself. I'm afraid we'll have to insist on it. If you don't mind, we'll take you back to the house with us right now. Well... You probably know what you're doing, but I still think it's crazy. Wait till I talk to my foreman, then I'll be right back with you. That hey, nephew of hers, Jace. And if he's made the success of his farm, the bank sure don't know about it. How do you mean? Finch has got the farm mortgaged up to the hill. Bank's about ready to take it over. You ever been out there? Once. Place is in a shambles. I don't believe he's ever worked it. Well, maybe he's got other interests. I know he has. He's got a reputation around town for being a no-good playboy. We've had him up on drunk charges a couple of times. He sure managed to fool his aunt. Yeah. Jace, you starting to think the same as me, that maybe it's Finch who's trying to get his aunt out of the way? Maybe. He's got everything to gain from it. And then you reckon maybe we better pick him up and talk to it? We need something on him first. The only person who can help us with that is Tom Dawson. <laughs> We went back to High Point and began to question Dawson. We told him we thought Finch had hired him to kill Mrs. Ross. He continued to deny he had been hired to kill anyone. I saw we were getting nowhere and figured Mrs. Dawson might be able to help us make her husband talk. I drove out to pick her up. On the way into town, I told her our suspicions. From her reaction, I was convinced she still didn't know the nature of the job her husband had been paid for. She told me she was sure Dawson had changed his mind on his own accord. He had returned home just before supper and had stayed there the whole night. When we reached the sheriff's office, I asked Mrs. Dawson to wait in the corridor. Then I joined the sheriff, who was still questioning her husband and getting nowhere. 
I tell you, I got nothing to say. Now, why do you guys keep trying to push me around? Nobody's trying to push you around. You get that idea out of your head, Dawson, we'll get along a lot better. Huh? Me getting along with cops. Look, we know you didn't kill Bella Ross. We're pretty sure you didn't even try. But you were hired to do it, weren't you? Well, what if I was? I didn't do it. What made you change your mind? That's my business. Who hired you, Finch? You ain't gonna make a stool pigeon out of me. I don't tell nosy cops nothing. Why are you protecting him? Don't you know you'll be convicted right along with him? For what? I didn't go through with it. No, but you were in on the plans, and that makes you guilty. With your record, you could get ten years just for that. Ten years? Oh, what's it matter? Might as well be back in Huntsville as trying to make a living outside. Nobody cares anyhow. I think you're wrong about that. You can come in now, Mrs. Dawson. Hello, Tom. Liz, what are you doing here? Ranger brought me. He hadn't ought to come anyhow. What for? Because I love you. I don't want you locked up. You don't want to bother with me. I'm no good. Yes, you are. If you's no good, you'd have gone through with that killing. And if you's no good, I wouldn't ask the ranger to stop you. You told the cops. Yeah, Tom. It near killed me, but I'd do it again. I don't want you in jail. You belong with me and the kids. Sure. To watch all three of you starve. We'll make out. Sooner or later, people will forget you ever been in jail. They never forget. Man makes a mistake. He pays for it all his life. Now... Go on, Liz. Get yourself another man. That's the way you want it, Tom? Is that all you care about, me and the kids? Oh, Liz. All these years I've been thinking you loved us the way we love you. I reckon I was wrong. Liz, don't talk that way. Why not? It's true, ain't it? No, it ain't true. Can't you see everything I've done was for you? <laughs> Nothing works out. <laughs> Nothing ever works out. Tom. Oh, Tom, don't. What am I going to do, honey? What am I going to do? Tell them. <laughs> Tell them what they want to know. It's the only way we're going to make a real clean start. Tell them, Tom. All right. Finch hired me. I couldn't go through with it. I cashed in the bus ticket. And then I took the gun and the money back to his farm. What did he say? He wasn't there. I forgot he was going to be away a few days. I wrapped him up with a note and gave him to Finch's neighbor. And as far as Finch knows, you're still going through with the job? I reckon so. Dawson, it's not going to be easy to catch Finch. There's nothing that says you have to do this, but we need your help. How about it? Tom? All right. I'll help you. We picked up the package containing the gun and money and took it back to Dawson's house. I figured it wouldn't be long before Finch got curious and showed up there. Our job was to get the evidence that would convict him. I sent for a couple of lab men and had them ring a camera and a hidden microphone in the brush near the house. We placed the tape recorder inside the house and we coated the gun and money with a dye that would come off on a man's hands and could only be seen under ultraviolet light. We sent Mrs. Dawson and the children over to a neighbor's, and then we waited. The first day, nothing happened. On the evening of the second day, just after dark, the sheriff and I were standing in front of Dawson's house. I don't know, Jace. Could be when he didn't read in the papers about his aunt being dead, he figured Dawson backed out of the job. And he'll want to know why. Maybe so, but I still think we ought to get out of all points on him. Yeah, suppose we did pick him up. He'd say Dawson dreamed the whole thing up. And in a court, it'd just be his word against Dawson. Well, I reckon we do need more evidence than we got, but all the Hold same, it, I don't... Uh, what? Oh, yeah, I see the headlines. This could be him, boys. You ready with the camera? Yeah, right. Let's get inside. Yeah, I wish it was still daylight. Those flash bulbs will only give them one chance to get the picture. Anybody can get it, they can. Is he coming, Ranger? Somebody is. Better get ready. And get over by the recorder, Sheriff. Keep low so he can't see us through the window. Yeah, you want me to switch on the recorder, Jake? Not yet. Dawson. Yeah? Be sure to hand him the gun so he won't know the bullets are missing. Okay. Let him knock again. I won't talk to you, Dawson. Okay. I'll get 
get the recorder. Okay, Jase. Been watching the papers. Haven't seen any good news. I ain't going through with it. You what? You better get somebody else. Here's a gun and the money you give me. Oh, wait a minute. It's more money that you There's want. There's only $190 here. I used 10 for groceries. I'll have to pay you back when I can. A dose of milk, I... I'll give you $2,000 today. Debbie scum? Yeah. It's no use. Oh, well, 3000 Here, you want this stuff? Now, listen to me. That woman's my aunt. She's gonna leave me a lot of money. Good for you. But not if she finds out I haven't done anything with that farm she gave me. She'll be down any time now. Don't listen to me. I'll give you $10,000 to kill Bella Ross. If you don't take this stuff, I'm gonna drop it on the ground. Now, take it and get out of here. 10000 buys a lot of food. Take it. All right. But if you think that I... What was that? Come on. What was that light? What's going on here? You just had your picture taken, Finch. And now you're coming with us. Oh, why? We're trying to murder your aunt. You're not going to get me. Grab him, Jake. Uh, come back here. Uh, I'll kill you. Uh, not with that gun. Uh, put out your hand. Let me alone. Let me go. Now we're going to town and see how that picture turns out. I got an idea. It's one your aunt won't be proud to have in her family album. In just a moment, we will tell you the results of the case you have just heard. On Thursday, July 3rd, NBC will bring you the third in a special series of broadcasts in advance of the Republican National Convention, which will take place in Chicago. The program will feature well-known NBC newsmen assigned to the headquarters of the major candidates. You'll find your favorite commentators and reporters in Chicago, W.W. Chaplin, Merrill Muller, Richard Harkness, and Bob Letts. These NBC newsmen will describe campaign headquarters operations and they will interview campaign managers and other key figures in the camps of Taft, Eisenhower, Warren, and Stassen. Yes, the NBC microphones will listen in to every detail and report it to you. Consult your local newspaper for broadcast time and be sure to join us Thursday, July 3rd for Headquarters Report. This program is another step forward, making it possible for you to follow the campaign of the next president on NBC. Now, Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, here are the results of the case you have just heard. Art Finch was tried for conspiracy to commit murder. Because of Dawson's assistance in obtaining evidence for the state, the court dismissed the case against him. The judge convinced a local farmer to give Dawson a probationary job. He was later taken on permanently. Art Finch was sentenced to 10 years in Huntsville Penitentiary. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Charles E. Israel, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Wednesdays, hear the best of Groucho on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the file.
annals of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Death in the Cards. It is 11.30 p.m. on the night of January 26, 1947, at the ranch house of Chester Gentry in Reeves County, Texas. Chester is on the telephone as his stepson, Will, enters. No sign of him, huh? All right. Call me when you find him. Thanks, Sheriff. Where you been, Will? Just out having a beer. That Sheriff Bennett you're talking to? Yeah. Your friend Tovich telephoned you a while ago. Tovich? Oh, he didn't tell the sheriff about Tovich. I sure did. Sheriff just called to say he located Tovich's rooming house over in Biggestown, but Tovich wasn't there. But I've told you a hundred times, it's the worst thing in the world you could do. Tovich finds out to kill me. Will, I... Maybe he has found out you told the sheriff. Maybe he's on his way here right now to get me. Look, you've got to give me the money to pay him off now. No, Will. No more money. Do you know what you're saying? He'll kill me if I don't pay him. He told me so. Now you listen to me, Will. I've reached the end of my rope in this whole rotten mess. I'm through. And I couldn't get another dime from you. I've done everything I can for you, but you're just no good. Please, Dad, I need that donut. You shut up and listen to me. When your ma died, I promised her I'd do everything I could for you. And I have. I treated you like you was my own son. I've given you a home. I've given you money. A lot of money. And what have you done with it? You've thrown it away to a slimy gambler named Tovich. But, Dad... For two months has been going on. For two months you've been bleeding me white to pay off that gambler. I told you to stay away from him, but you didn't. Now it's high time for me to meet him and tell him face to face to stay away from you. No, Dad, no, no. If you just give me the money this once more, I'll straighten out. I promise Your you. Your promises ain't worth a bale of straw. That's what you said last week. You'd straighten out. I told you then I'd give you just one week to do it, and if you didn't, you'd get no more money from me now or ever. Dad, you don't mean... Oh, don't I? You got yourself into this mess, you get yourself out of it. Tovich can bluff you, but he can't bluff me. Dad, Dad. Huh? What's the matter? Window. Tovich, I just saw him at the window. What? Dad, now he's gone. He's probably heading for the front door. All right, let him. Turn off the lights, Will. But, Dad... Turn them off. What are you doing? Get my gun. I'll give this Tovich a reception he ain't looking for. No, Dad, no. Uh, front door, huh? No, look, stay away from that door, Dad. Don't open it, please, don't... Uh, can't see a thing. Now, look, Will, you... Will! Will! Chester Gentry lay dead at his own front door. Will immediately notified Sheriff Bennett's office. Sheriff requested help from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. He joined Sheriff Bennett at the Gentry Ranch. Yeah, it looks like an open and shut case, Jace. Tovich came here to get Will, but it was Chester who opened the door and collected the slugs instead. Where was the body, Sheriff? Lying right across the front doorway here. Hmm. How long ago did the shooting take place? Mm, a couple of hours ago. Chester notified me earlier in the evening he'd gotten a call from this Tovich. The call came from Biggerstown, so I went over there to see if I could find him. I located his rooming house, but he checked out. Looks like while I was there, he was here. You say Tovich had been bleeding Will and Chester for some time, huh? Yeah, about two months, according to what Chester told me on the phone. Well, let's talk to Will. Oh, oh, Sheriff, come on in. Uh, this is Ranger Pearson, Will. He'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Well, sure, Ranger. How long have you known this Tovich, Will? A couple of months, I guess. And where'd you first meet him? Pete's place, down the highway. That's a roadhouse, Chase. Mm. Is that where you did your gambling? No, no. Tovich would call me from time to time, tell me he had a game lined up. So I'd meet him at his room in the house in biggest time. Who else was in the games? A couple of other fellas, different ones each time. I didn't know any of them. Didn't even know their names. You kept losing to Tovich, didn't you? Yeah, I did. But you kept on playing cards with him. Well, I... I Kept thinking my luck would change. Your luck never changes when you're up against a professional gambler. <laughs> Guess I know that now. It's too bad you didn't know it two months ago. Your stepfather might still be alive. Ranger, there just isn't a thing you can say to me that I haven't already said to myself. I've been sitting here for two hours thinking about it. 
known if I had the guts to straighten out, this wouldn't have happened. There's only one thing I hope right now. I hope somehow Dad knows how I feel. All right, Will. What does Tovich look like? Well, pretty ordinary-looking fellow. Kind you never notice in a crowd. About my height, I'd say. Black hair, regular features, nothing to really set him apart. Mm, that's pretty general. I guess it is, but it's the best I can do. Okay, better get some sleep. You find any tracks outside, Sheriff? Nope, my deputy scoured the yard, but it's too gravelly to hold any kind of tracks, car or foot. Will, uh, do you remember hearing a car pull away from here after the shooting? Why, no, Ranger. Now, come think of it, I, I didn't even hear one come up. Hmm. Okay. When it gets light, we'll ride around a little in the back of the ranch, Sheriff, and see if we can pick up any footprints. All right. In the meantime, let's take a run over to Biggerstown and talk to Tovich's landlady. Maybe she can give us a better line on him. Afraid I can't help you much on a description, Ranger. I only got a good look at Tovich once. That was when I rented this room to him two months ago. Mm, it's pretty strange that'd be the only time you saw him, Mrs. Packer. Well, he came and went by night. I'd hear voices in his room sometimes in the evening. A couple of times a woman's voice. But as far as seeing him around, I didn't. You said he checked out earlier tonight. Didn't you see him then? No. He just left an envelope under my door with his key and the money he owed on the room. You think you'd recognize him if you saw him again, Mrs. Packer? Well, I might. I don't know. But to sit down and describe him to you, I'm afraid I can't be much help there. Uh, I don't like it, Sheriff. man's been living in this room for two months. Take a look around you. It's clean. Too clean. Nothing here to give us any line on. Hey, wait a minute. Have you cleaned this room since Tovich checked out? No. I ain't gotten around to it yet. I was figuring on giving it a good swamping out in the morning. I'd like to save you the trouble. What do you mean? I'd like to have one of our men from the lab vacuum the room for you. Well, <laughs> it's my back the way it is. I sure ain't going to say no. You figure on having the contents of the dust bag analyzed, Jase? Yeah. Kovitz has covered his tracks pretty well so far, but... Maybe he doesn't know you can sometimes pick up a lot besides dust with a vacuum cleaner. Mrs. Packer, if you should ever see Tovich again, I'd like you to get in touch with me right away. Well, you can count on that, Ranger. Say, I don't hanker to have any killers running loose around my room in the house. Dawn came, and the only thing new on the case was the publicity. Papers were carrying the story with pictures of Chester and Will. The sheriff and I started scouring the country in back of the gentry ranch on horseback. This is hunting weather, Jace, with all that frost on the ground. Yeah, so far the hunting hasn't been good. Let's see, we're right in line with the back of the ranch house now. Yeah, maybe we better split up and go around. Hey, whoa, whoa, hold it. Take a look on the ground there. Yeah, foot tracks. Coming from the back of the ranch house, too. And judging from the distance between the tracks, he was in a hurry. Come on. Heading straight north for the river, Jace. He could be trying for the New Mexico border. Could be. You know, one thing, it should be pretty easy to follow the tracks in the frost. Yeah. There's something funny about these tracks, though. What do you mean? I don't know yet. Can't just put my finger on it, but we'll keep trailing. See if we can put our finger on Tovich. Come on, Charcoal. Yeah. Can't understand why you don't want to cross the river, Jace. Tracks led smack into it back there. Uh, I know it, Sheriff, but let's just keep looking along the bank on this side. Okay, but he probably waded along a spell and kept going on the other side. What's on the other side? Santa Fe track, about 15 miles away. And what's between the river and the tracks? Just open country. That's what I mean. I don't think Tovich would risk 15 miles of open country. Yeah, see your point. Yeah, we'll keep looking along this side, then. Uh, we don't have to look any farther, Sheriff. Look, there they are. Ooh, oh, oh. ooh, Charky. Hey, they... They sure are. Tracks coming up out of the river and heading back the way we came. 
But there's still one thing I don't understand. What's that? The shooting took place about 11.30 last night. Tovich could have been halfway across that open country on the other side of the river by dawn. Now, why'd you double back? I think I've got an answer for that, Sheriff. I told you a while back something was bothering me about those tracks. I finally figured out what it is. Oh? Look at the tracks, and then look at the hoof marks of our horses. Well, they look just about the same to me. Hey, they both cut down through the frost. Yeah, that's the point. What time you figure the frost formed on the ground this morning? Mm, between four and five, maybe. And those tracks were made after the frost formed. They cut through it. If they'd been made before the frost, it would have formed over them. Wait a minute. Maybe Tovich realized he killed the wrong man. Maybe he hid around the ranch trying for another crack at Will. And now those tracks are heading toward the ranch again. Come on, Sheriff. We better get back there in a hurry. We followed the tracks back to the highway a mile below the ranch and lost them there. Then we headed for the ranch house. There was no sign of life around the place. I don't see Will outside anywhere. Uh, his car's in the driveway. I hope we're not too late. Uh, Will! Will! Oh, morning, Sheriff, Ranger. <sighs> well, that's a relief. Oh, come on in. Well, something the matter? We thought there might be. Can I use your phone? I want to call my office and see if there's anything new. I help us out. Back in the hall. Okay, thanks. Ranger... What's the sheriff mean about being relieved to see me? Well, it's possible Tovich hung around here the ranch last night after the shooting. What? You see or hear anything after we left? It wasn't my imagination. What do you mean? Well, after you fellas left, I locked up tight. About three or four this morning, a sound woke me up. What kind of a sound? Well, like somebody walking around outside. You think it could have been Tovich? I don't know. Well, I've got Dad's gun. Tovich ever shows up around here again, I'll handle it. Law enforcing's our business, Will. Don't try and take it into your own hands. Yes. Yes, Sheriff. Now, what is it? My deputy just told me that landlady, Miss Packer, phoned the office for you about an hour ago. Mrs. Packer? Yeah, they told her to call out here. Will? Yeah. Did a Mrs. Packer phone me? Oh, a woman phone. Didn't leave a name, but she did leave a number. I got it written down right here. Thanks. Operator, 2734J. How long ago did she call, Will? Oh, about an hour ago, I guess. she leave any message? No, no, just said to ask you to call her. You told her to get in touch with you if she ever saw Tovich again, Jace. Yeah, I know. Hmm. No answer. Come on, Sheriff. We better get over to Biggerstown and find out what's on Mrs. Packer's mind. Door's unlocked. Mrs. Packer. Mrs. Packer? Look, Jace. On the table there by the phone. Hmm. Newspaper. Folded to the story of the killing. Well, she can't have gone very far. Coffee's boiling on the hot plate. Hmm. Hot's just about boiled dry. Come on, let's take a look in the next room. You know, it's funny. She'd call and then be. Jace. On the bed. Yeah. Mrs. Packer. Strangled. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Death in the Cards, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We were getting nowhere fast on this case. First Chester Gentry, then Mrs. Packer. We questioned all the rumors, but none of them had seen a thing. Then we went back to the sheriff's office. And, Jace, there's no doubt about it at all. Miss Packer was trying to tell you something about Tovich. But he got to her first and killed her to shut her mouth. 
Yeah, we know who the killer is, all right. But the big question is, where is he? It's just like the earth opened and swallowed him up. Well, every sheriff's office in the state's been alerted. Highway patrol's on the lookout, too, so sooner or later we're bound to... Yeah. Excuse me, Jason. Mm -hmm. Sheriff Bennett speaking. Oh, yeah, just a minute. Your headquarters, Jace. Captain Stinson. Thanks. Hello, Captain. Just got a report from the lab on those vacuum sweepings you had them take from Plovich's room in Biggestown, Jace. What'd they find? Only items of interest were two or three women's hairs. Red. Hmm. A lot of redheads in Texas, Captain. I'm afraid that's not much help. Maybe more than you think. This hair wasn't naturally red. It was a henna dye job. And judging from the distance between the roots and the dye, the lab figures it was dyed about a week ago. Well, now that's a horse of a different color. Well, thanks a lot, Captain. I'll keep you posted. Sheriff, we haven't had any luck finding Tovich, have we? We sure haven't. Okay, now we're going to start looking for Tovich's girl. His girl? How many beauty parlors do you figure there are in Biggerstown? Oh, I don't know, six or seven, maybe? Before the day is over, we'll know exactly how many there are. We're going to visit them all. The sheriff had underestimated the town. There were ten of them. We had no luck on the first seven, and then, just at dark, we hit number eight. There we found an operator who remembered giving a henna dye job to a girl named Thelma Parrish about a week ago. We learned that Thelma was a waitress in a coffee shop, so I parked my car around the corner, and we dropped in on her. Well, you men look like you could use a nice cup of coffee. Nothing I'd like better right now than having a pretty red-headed waitress pour me one, ma'am. <laughs> Why, thank you, Ranger. Coming up. What do you think, Jace? I think maybe. Cream? Uh, black. Please. Yeah, black here, too. Well, here you are. Thanks. Uh, seen your boyfriend lately? Boyfriend? Tovich. Who? Tovich. You must have me mixed up with somebody else, Ranger. I don't know anybody by that name. Are you real sure about that, ma'am? Well, of course I am. A girl sure who she does know and who she doesn't. Well, either I'm mistaken or you're lying to me. Look, I don't know what this is all about, but I do know better than lie to a Ranger. I hope so. Well, come on, Sheriff. We better be getting back to your office. Okay, Jason. Here's for the coffee. Thanks. Sorry, I can't help you any about what's his name. So am I. This way, Sheriff. Where are we going? Across the street. Yeah, but the car's on this side, around the corner. Keep walking. She's watching us from inside. Oh. Think she was lying? That's what I want to find out. Well, she seemed pretty sure of herself. Okay, we're out of her line of sight now. Let's get in this doorway, quick. Good. Now we're in the shadows here. She can't spot us from across the street. Now we'll just keep an eye on the front of that coffee shop Jace, and... look. She's coming outside. Uh-huh. Yeah. False alarm. She's just washing the windows. Yeah? Well, that's the fastest wash job I've ever seen. She's heading inside again. She came out to make sure we'd gone. Come on. We'll work away along the sidewalk until we can see across the street into the coffee shop. Yeah, but she may spot us. Hey, hold it. She's on the phone with her back to us. She was lying, all right. Probably calling Tovich right now. Sheriff, how about slipping into the drugstore and tracing that call? Mm -hmm. I can keep an eye on the front of the shop from my car. I'll meet you there. The sheriff disappeared into the drugstore. I waited in my car. A couple of minutes later, he came over and got in, wearing a very puzzled look. There must be some mistake, Jason. Uh, what do you mean? That waitress, she just telephoned the Gentry Ranch. I don't think there is any mistake, Sheriff. And right now, it doesn't surprise me much. Yeah, but as far as we know, the only one at the Gentry Ranch is Will. Yeah, but Will's going to have company as soon as we can make it there. Wait a minute. You trying to say that Will Gentry... Sheriff... It looks like there is no Tovich and never has been. I guess the boy we've been up against right from the start is Will Gentry. Mm -hmm. 
I radioed KTXA to set up a roadblock on the highway ten miles each way from the Gentry Ranch in case Will should take off before we could get there. And I jammed the gas pedal to the floor and held it there. Will relay information. Jace, you're leaving me way behind. Will Gentry. Looks like I was way behind for a while, too. But looking back on it, it all falls into place. We know Will was always after money from his stepfather, Chester. And he invented the story about a gambler named Tovich as an excuse to get that money? He even went so far as to rent a room in Biggerstown under that name. But when Chester cracked down and threatened to disinherit him, Will used the same Tovich device to kill Chester. That way, he'd get all Chester's money. So when Chester opened the front door thinking Tovich was outside, there wasn't anybody there at all. And it was Will who plugged him. KTXA to Unit 10. Unit 10. Go ahead, KTXA. Unit 320 stationed at Tucker's Junction. Unit 256 stationed at Biggerstown. Turn off. Unit 10. 10-4. KTXA, clear. Well, we got the roadblock set up. Tucker's Junction's about five miles the other side of the Gentry Ranch, isn't it? Yep. And with another highway patrol car back of us at the Biggerstown turnoff, looks like we got Will bottled up tight if he makes a run for it. There's no side roads off the highway for six or seven miles along here. Good. As soon as we get the top of this rise, we ought to be able to spot the Gentry Ranch. Yeah, ranch house only a mile or so from here, Jace. It was Will who made those tracks in the frost then, huh? He heard me say we'd start trailing in the morning. I guess he figured on giving us something to trail. Yeah, and that explains Miss Packer's murder, too. She must have seen Will's picture in the paper, recognized him as Tovich, so she tried to phone you. And when she called the ranch house, Will knew he had to shut her mouth for keeps. He probably got back from killing her just before we showed up at the ranch house after the trailing. There's the ranch house, only half a mile more. And wait, the taillight's swinging out onto the highway. He's making a run for it. What kind of cars he drive? Gray sedan, isn't it? Yep. Unit 10 to all units in roadblock. Subject, Will Gentry, attempting getaway. Proceeding east on Highway 19 in Gray Sedan. Unit 10 pursuing. Unit 203 to Unit 10. Unit 10. Go ahead, Unit 203. Unit 203 on Highway 19, three miles west of Tucker's Junction. That's only a couple of miles east of us, Jace. Proceed west on Highway 19, Unit 203. Unit 203, 10 4. Unit 10, clear. Yeah, we got him bottled up for sure, Jace. We're backstopped at both ends, and we're coming at him from both ends. It's a squeeze, Clay. I sure hope so. Unit 10 to Unit 203. Unit 203, go ahead, Unit 10. Have you sighted Gentry's car yet? Not yet, Unit 10. We'll report contact. Unit 10, clear. I don't get it, Sheriff. We should have spotted Gentry by this time. We're almost together. Here, watch it, Chase. Sharp bend in the road just ahead, just past this drive-in movie here. Yeah, I see it. The only way Gentry could get off the highway is to ditch his car, and I don't think he'd do that. Hey, a red light coming at us. That must be Unit 203. He's stopping, too. But where's Will? No sign of Gentry? None, Chase. Oh, but there aren't any side roads at all. He couldn't have vanished into thin air. Hey, wait a minute. That drive-in movie we just passed. You think he turned in? It's the only place he could have turned in. Come on. We went back to the drive-in theater, stationed the highway patrol car at the exit, then the sheriff and I talked to the theater manager. He remembered a gray sedan pulling in there a few minutes before. He'd sent it to the rear aisle, so the three of us circled around the theater on the outside of the fence and then came in through a small gate in the rear. But Gentry's car wasn't in the back row. But he's got to be in this back row, Ranger. That's where I sent him. Look, there's a vacant spot in the row. The one in the next row ahead. He could have wormed his way forward a few rows. Yeah, that's right. A lot of people do that trying to get a better spot. About 200 cars in here. It's going to be like looking for a needle. Hey, hold it. Three aisles up, near the side. Yeah. That's his car, all right. Going to take him now, Jason? I can't. There's too many cars around him. It's a cinch he won't come peacefully. Somebody might get shot. If we could only get the car on each side of him to get clear... I could make an announcement on the public address. No, that's no good. He'd probably start shooting. I can't warn the car on each side. Will would spot me. Same goes for you, Sheriff. Want me to do it? You? Oh, I don't know. It'd be pretty... Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, I think I got it. You go up to the car on this side of Will. Tell him to clear out in exactly one minute. Then go to Will's car. Tell him you're checking the reception on those speakers they hang on the side of their cars. And then go to the car the other side of him. Tell them to clear out in two minutes. Good idea. That way, maybe Will won't get suspicious. 
30 seconds after the second car leaves, turn on all the lights. Okay, I'll give it a whirl. See you after it's all over, I hope. We watched the manager go along the line of cars. He worked his way to Will's car, then passed it to the one beyond. Then he headed for the projection booth. So far, so good. Seconds ticked by. At the end of the first minute, the car this side of Will pulled out. Another minute went by. And the car the other side of Will got going. He's out in the open now, Jason. Yeah. Twenty seconds till the lights go on. Come on. John, you change it. And we'll get just a little closer. I'll take him from this side. Hey, Jace. He's starting up. He must have got suspicious. He won't get far. You hit a tire. Will! Come out of that car with your hands in the air. There go the lights, Tom. That's coming out all right, Ranger. Look out, Jace! Oh. Come on, Sheriff. You okay, Jace? Uh, yeah. Hey, you sure knocked him down, Tonto. Uh, hit him in the shoulder. Why didn't you finish me off? That's up to the state of Texas, Will, not me. But I think they'll oblige you, all right. Will Gentry was tried and convicted of the murders of Chester Gentry and Leona Packer. On the morning of April 12, 1948, he was executed in the electric chair at Huntsville Penitentiary. Here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae, with another interesting story about the Texas Rangers. Although the Texas Rangers is a highly organized law enforcement agency, the men themselves are rugged individualists. One ranger in particular that I know of carries his six shooters with only five shells in each gun. One day he was asked why he did this. If the hammer's resting on an empty chamber, he said, the gun can't be fired accidentally. But, said his interested friend, with only five bullets instead of six in the gun, aren't you endangering your own position? Maybe so, he said with a grin, but if you can't hit your target with five shells, the sixth one won't do you much good anyhow. Good night, folks. See you next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of The Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Bill Johnstone, Farley Bear, Jeanette Nolan, Byron Kane, Mike Barrett, and Ernie Newton. This story was transcribed and adapted by Bob Reif, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Remember all the delightful troubles that beset Mr. Blandings when he built his dream house? Well, starting next Sunday afternoon, you can hear the further adventures of the beleaguered Mr. Blandings and his wonderful wife, Muriel. It's top listening for the entire family next Sunday and Sundays thereafter when Cary Grant and Betsy Drake star as Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. Stay tuned for the $64 question. Tomorrow, hear the symphony on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And the 60 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas...
Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, The Hatchet. It is 8.30 a.m. Sunday, May 16, 1941. The Halleck family of Rock Point, Texas, is preparing to leave for church. You want any more toast, Jim? Nope. All I want is another cup of coffee. I'll get it myself. Why don't you sit down and eat? Well, I would if I could get that boy to the table. Robert? Robert! I'm coming, Ma. You've been saying that for half an hour. Your eggs are getting cold and we'll be late for church. All right, all right. And never mind that all right business. When your mother calls you, you just come a running. See, where's Pa? I gotta wash my face, Donna. I'll be right there. Well, see the jar, you'll go without your breakfast. Now, you come sit down, Hattie. No need of your stomach being empty. Just coffee will do for me. Seems like the older a boy gets, the harder it is to get him out of bed in the morning. What time did he get in last night? After 11. Him and Sadie Lewis went to the picture show. I told him I wanted him home at 10 o'clock nights. Oh, Jim, it was Saturday night. He goes to school all week. Well, school will soon be over. He'll be working with me in the store all summer. Maybe he won't feel much like staying out half the night when he's been on his feet all day. Look at the time. Robert! Here, Paul. Here. Well, it's about time. I'll get your breakfast, but the eggs will be like rubber. I don't want anything to eat. I'm not hungry. Well, why didn't you say so before your ma wasted her time and the food? You gotta eat something. I'll have breakfast when we get back from church. Sure, that'll be fine. You can make more work for your ma that way. Oh, gee, Pa, I just don't feel hungry now. Oh, leave him alone, Jim. I'll get him something later. I just put the dishes in to soak. You two want to get out of my way. Why don't you go next door and tell Mr. Driscoll we're about ready to leave. Uh, is he riding with us again? Yes, he's riding with us again, so stop sulking about it. Come on. You ought to be glad to have your teacher for a neighbor. You wouldn't be at the head of your graduating class if it weren't for his helping you. And I see enough of him in school without seeing him Sunday, too. Yeah. Well, when you get away to college in the fall, you might be wishing you had somebody like him close by to give you a hand. Ring the bell. He don't answer. Maybe he went on. He'd have told us. And I didn't hear his car. Come on, maybe he's out in the back. Mr. Driscoll! Huh. That's funny. Run up the back steps and take a look in the kitchen window. Oh, why don't we just go without him? Will you do like I tell you? Okay. See anything? No, he didn't. Pa! Pa! What is it, son? What's the matter? Look at him, lying there on the floor. Oh, what is it? What happened to him? Come away, son. Don't look anymore. Come away. I gotta call the sheriff. It... It looks like he's been murdered. Sheriff Alvin Jeffers took one look at the scene of the crime and put in a call for the assistance of the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. Ah, mighty bloody job, Jace. No weapon in sight? No. Nope. Judging by the marks, though, it was something with two edges. One blunt and one sharp. Probably a hatchet, Sheriff. Either that or two weapons. Mm, it's possible, but not likely. You say the J.P.'s been here? Mm -hmm. Soon as we're finished, the body will be moved into the funeral home for autopsy. Established time of death. That'll help. Where'd your call come from? Neighbors next door, the Halleck's. Man, wife, and son. Man and boy spotted Driscoll through the window when they come to get him for a lift to church. I'd like to talk to him. Sure, I told him to stick to home. Well, we can go out back and hop the fence. Avoid that crowd out front. Good. Yeah, the front room looked like Driscoll went in big for books. Yeah, he was an English teacher at the high school. Alec's boy Robert was in one of his classes, I think. Did Driscoll live alone? Mm-hmm. widower. Here, step on this box and hop the fence. Yeah, you go ahead. I can get over without it. Okay. <laughs> Well, Halleck saw us coming. There he is at the back door. 
Uh, howdy, sir. Ranger. Come on in. Thanks. Ranger Pearson, Jim Hallett. Howdy, howdy. Oh, uh, my wife, Hattie, and my boy, Robert. Uh, howdy. Howdy, Ranger. Uh, you found Driscoll's body this morning? Me and Robert. Saw it through the window. What time? Oh, about quarter to nine. That's when we always leave for services. Oh, Jace, I ought to call my office. Have the funeral home come for the body now. All right, go ahead. Uh, mind if I use your phone, Hallett? You hope so. I'll show you where it is, sir. Oh, you better stay, Robert. Okay. You and your dad found the body. Would you mind, Mrs. Halleck? Not at all. In here, sir. Thank you. Either of you see Driscoll yesterday or last night? We both saw him outside last night, a little after six. I was coming home from the store. I sell groceries. Robert was outside waiting for me so he could take the car. Mm, big date, huh? <laughs> yeah. What was Driscoll doing? Digging a flower border on his lawn. You talked to him? Just called to him after Robert took the car and drove off. Asked if he planned on riding to church with us. No sense taking two cars when neighbors are going to the same place. I see. Is that all? That's all. You didn't hear anything during the evening or the night? Nope. Me and Hattie turned in a little after nine. How about you, Robert? What time did you get home? Um. What time did you get home? You can tell him. I know you was late. Your mother heard you come in. A little after 11. Where were you? To a picture show with Sadie Lewis. What did you see? I don't remember the name of it. Bing Crosby's in it. Jase, you going to be much longer? Oh, no, Sheriff. Why? I spoke to my office. One of my deputies got a report. Rancher named Finney chased somebody off his place with a shotgun last night. Doorbell, Hattie. I'm going. Uh, did the deputy think the report might have anything to do with the Driscoll's murder? Well, who knows? Fellow Finney saw was doing something around a cattle tank, though. Yeah, good place to get rid of a weapon. Cattle tanks have been used before. Well, maybe we ought to go out and take a look. Yeah. Robert? It's Gene to see you. Hi, Bob. Hi. Hi, Mr. Halleck, Sheriff. Hello, Gene. Yeah, I just drove in to see if Bob wanted to go out to the shack and camp, and I saw that crowd in front of next door. Somebody killed old man Driscoll, huh? Yeah, I can't go with you today. Well, yeah, I guess not. Are you helping the sheriff, Ranger? We're helping each other. Well, boy, I sure hope you catch that guy. Mrs. Driscoll was the best teacher we ever had. Uh, we'll try to square things for him, Gene. Come on, Jace. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your help. We may want to talk to you again later. Uh, you're sure welcome, Ranger. Bye. Bye, ma'am. So long, folks. Bye. Bye. So long, Ranger. Who's that kid, the one who just came in? You mean Gene? No, oh, name's Gene McCready. Hello, Roberts. They go to school together. Why? Just wondering. Robert Halleck ever give any of you any trouble around here? Yeah, we'll take my car. No, he's a good kid. Why? I just got a feeling he was covering up for something, that's all. Like what? If I knew that, I wouldn't be wondering about it. How far to Finney's place? Turn off to the right about six miles out, just this side of the Lewis place. The Lewis place? Well, Robert Halleck says that he was out at a movie last night with a girl named Sadie Lewis. Yeah, she lives out there. Mike Lewis' daughter. Only 15, but a big girl for her age. <laughs> Lewis watches her like a hawk. I'd like to stop by the Lewis place and talk to that girl. Okay, we can go out there after we check at Finney's. Well, right here's about where he was when I spotted him. I called, but I started to run out through a little buckshot after him. You didn't see who it was? No, I didn't. It was too far off, about 300 feet back to the house. What time was that, Penny? Oh, just for 11 o'clock last night. Wasn't that kind of late for you to be out here? Well, I've been visiting. I was cutting across the ranch walking home. From where? Mike Lewis's place. We get together Saturday nights, play cards. Oh, no, no, not for money, just passing time. You always carry a shotgun when you're passing time? Well, matter of fact, I do. Bag a jackrabbit once in a while, going, coming between here and Mike's place. So I always throw the gun just in case. I see. <laughs> I see better than you do, Jace. I've eaten out here. Mrs. Finney can do more things with a jackrabbit in a pot than most women can do with a chicken. <laughs> okay, I was just checking. Now about the fellow you saw. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, when he didn't answer my call, I flushed him with a shot. Don't think I hit him, though. A little too far. Barely saw him as it was. Well, which way did he take off? Well, that way. Highway's about a mile across country there. 
You chase him? Yeah, sure did. But I uh, reckon he was locked younger than me. Well, what makes you say that? Well, after two minutes of running, I was a pumping like an engine in a tunnel. He was pulling away with every jump. Is there anything around here he might have been trying to steal? No, not a thing. Unless he was trying to make off with a cow, and that'd be nothing to try on foot. Well, Sheriff, guess we'd better chuck our boots and hop in there. Well, ain't it my cattle tank? That's right, Finney. But what for? If we're lucky, the weapon that was used in the killing of the high school teacher, Driscoll. <laughs> cattle tank was big. The bottom was covered deep with a couple of inches of oozing mud and slime. And we slithered around in it for almost half an hour. Pretty thick along the bottom, Jace. Yeah, it sure is. I was going to have it cleaned out next month. Looks like we're going to have to save you the trouble and the expense. we we'll have to call a pumping crew, Sheriff. Yeah, it looks that way. Hey, give me a hand up, Penny. All right, now, easy. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Wait over here, Jace, and we'll boost you out. Okay, Sheriff. You know, we're sure going to feel silly if we have this pumped out and there's nothing here. We'll feel sillier if we don't have it done and there is something here that turns up later. I think we ought to... What's the matter, Jace? Uh, feel something. Here, under my foot. Yeah, I felt it coming over this way, too. Some stones in the mud. No, this is metal. Wait, I'll get it. What is it, Jace? Look for yourself, Sheriff. Just about what we're looking for. A hatchet. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, The Hatchet. An authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. It was the murder weapon, all right. The blood had been washed away from most of it, but there was skin tissue and hair that had stuck to the blood end. And yeah, I reckon that's it, all right, Jace. But uh, who threw it away on my place, and why? The killer wanted to get rid of it in a place he thought nobody would be liable to find it. Must have thought of this spot last night. That means he knew the place. He wouldn't cross the range on foot unless he did. You say he ran off that way? Well, that's right. Like Sheriff said, the highway's about a mile. He could have left a car there he was getting back to, or he might have cut off in another direction when you lost him. You have horses here, don't you, Finney? Why, sure, sure, but nothing like the one you're towing in that trailer behind your car. <laughs> it's really a horse, Ranger. I think so, too. What I want is a mount for the sheriff here. Where do you figure on riding, Jace? Out on the range, see if we can pick up a trail. I'll unload charcoal and start ahead, and you walk back to the ranch house and get one of Finney's horses and catch up to me. Chase! Hey, Chase! I'll wait for you, Sheriff. Easy, easy, boy. Find anything? Track's all right. Not too heavy on this ground, though. They're easy to lose. Yeah, but this is a straight shot from the ridge. Looks like he was sure going for the road, all right. No doubt about it. If he left a car there, we might be able to find some tire marks where he parked. Afraid you're going to be stymied there, Jace. Why? County just worked the roads over. Shoulders are all fresh gravel. Oh? What's the shortest way to the Lewis Ranch? Go back for the car or keep riding? Yeah, we'd save a little time going back for the car, not much. Well, charcoal's full of run. Let's give him a chance for a workout. Come on. Get up. Get up. ranch was big and well kept, but there was something dismal and brooding about it. When we got inside, I knew what it was. It was as though the place were reflecting the personality of the heavy-browed man who owned it. So you want to see my daughter, huh? That's right. What about? Just want to ask her where she was last night? She was into the movie house with Robert Halleck. Yeah, we'd like a little more information than that, Mike. The ranger... I know has... everything my daughter does. I can tell you anything you want to know. That may be so, Mr. Lewis, but we still want to see her. That's an official request. I'll call her. Sadie. Yes, Paul? Come into the house. Yes, Paul? Into the parlor. Oh, I didn't know anybody was here. Sheriff and the ranger want to talk to you. 
They don't think you and Robert was at the show last night. Nobody said that. You don't have to say it. Look, if you can't keep out of this, you can take your mind-reading act into another room until we're finished. It'd be better if you didn't interfere, Mike. Go ahead, ask. Maybe I'll be interested in the answers, too. Sadie, don't be nervous. Just tell the truth. Were you with Robert Halleck last night? Yes. Where'd you go? We, we went... Where did you go? To the movie. Remember the name of the picture? The new one with, with Bing Crosby. You saw that with me a month ago when I took you to Sweetwater. Oh, I saw it again. There's no other show to see in town. Is there... Robbie brought you the ticket stubs, didn't he, Pa? Brought you the ticket stubs? That's right, Ranger. Brought me the stubs. When my daughter's supposed to be someplace, I want to make sure she's there. I'm not gambling on being fed any lies. No, I can see that. You're not gambling that your girl might tell you the truth either, given the chance. Reckon the law's got nothing to say about that. I reckon not. Let me have that package, Sheriff. Yeah. Here. What's in it? Just something I want you to look at. Hatchet. Yeah. You ever see this before? No. How about you, Sadie? You ever see this before? No, sir, I never. Why are you asking us about it? Just routine. This is the weapon used to kill Driscoll, the high school teacher. <gasps> All right, Sheriff. Wrap it up again. Let's go. Sorry to bother you, Mr. Lewis. Yeah. You ready, Sheriff? Yeah. Goodbye, Mike. Sadie. Bye. Bye. Sadie, you've been lying to me. Answer me! Oh, Looks like Sadie's in for a rough time, Jace. And she wasn't telling the truth. He knows it. Her story ties in with Robert Halleck's, Jace. I know. Oh, oh, oh. It'll be dark by the time we get back to Finney's place. Movie house open tonight? Sure. Why? I want to talk to the manager. The theater was a small town show place. The manager couldn't remember seeing Robert Halleck and Sadie Lewis. He referred us to the ticket taker. Ticket taker turned out to be Robert Halleck's pal, Gene McCready. Come on, Gene, talk up. Was Robert here for the show last night or wasn't he? Uh, I, I don't know. He's your best friend and you were on the door last night. If he came in, you saw him. Yeah, he was here. Did he stay for the whole show? No. No, he didn't stay for any of it. How do you know? Did you see him leave before it was over? Well, he, uh, he didn't even go in. He, he just stopped by to... Get a couple of ticket stubs from me. So that's it. Why didn't you tell us that right off? Because I I promised Bob that if anybody asked, I'd say him and Sadie was here. Well, why would anybody ask? Bob thought Sadie's father might. He's asked me before when they were supposed to be here. Well, I guess that's what we wanted, Jace. Yeah, that's part of it, not all of it. Gene, I want you to forget that I asked you anything, understand? Yes, sir. Let's go, Sheriff. I guess we better pick up Robert Halleck and the Lewis girl, Jace. Not yet. All we know is they didn't see the show. That isn't enough. Don't see why not. This wasn't just a transient thing. Driscoll didn't have no enemies, unless it was one of his pupils hated him. We can't narrow it down to one student, though. Not until we've checked on all of them. I'm going to sleep on this tonight. When school opens tomorrow, I'm going out there. Driscoll had been a popular teacher at Rock Point High, but he had an iron-bound code of ethics where honesty was concerned, and that was the key I needed. I found the answer in a batch of test papers he'd been grading. I took the papers back to the sheriff's office. Morning, Chase. Morning. Find anything out the school? Plenty. Look at these. Mm, what are they? English class test papers of Robert Halleck and Jean McCready. Mm, I see. Alex Mark's pretty high. 94. Yeah. Hey, only half the answers on McCready's paper have been checked. His isn't graded. Compare them and you'll see why. His answer to every single question is exactly the same as Halleck's, all the way down the line. Crisco must have noticed it while he was marking. Hmm. You think McCready was cribbing his answers from Bob Halleck's paper? Halleck was at the head of the class. McCready was just barely hanging on. Those papers were clipped together in the drawer of Driscoll's desk with this slip of paper. A few notes scribbled on it in Driscoll's handwriting. Here, read what it says. Mm. An obvious case of cheating. Flunk McCready. If Halleck knew of this, 
advise principal neither should be permitted to graduate. Well, the test was on Friday. Driscoll must have been grading those papers after school let out. Halleck came home, but Gene McCready was sitting out of punishment in another class for being late. That means Driscoll might have run into Gene Friday afternoon and asked him about it. That's what I figured. Of course, Gene could have told Bob later. Yeah, he could have. <sighs> Robert Halleck's the boy, all right, Jace. He lied about where he was Saturday night, and Gene was working at the theater. Maybe yes, maybe no. You get the autopsy report yet? Oh, yeah, yeah. Came in this morning. What time did Driscoll die? Uh, between uh, 9.30 and 10.30 Saturday night. Then we can't eliminate Gene McCready. Well, why not? He starts taking theater tickets at 6.30, but the box office closes at 9 when the main feature goes on again. He's got nothing to do after that. His work's finished. Well, I didn't think of that. You better give me the hatchet, Sheriff. I'll need it. Sure. Got it locked in the drawer here. What's your plan? You go out to the school, get Bob Halleck, and bring him to his father's store. I'll meet you there. Don't you want Gene McCready, too? He's not in school. He's supposed to be home sick. We can pick him up later. I don't want him and Robert together. Ranger, you're crazy. Crazy, I tell you. Now, calm down, Mr. Halleck. You admit the hatchet comes from your place. No. A minute ago, you said it did. Well, it disappeared months ago. It was lost. It got lost again in a cattle tank. Where's your car? Out back. Through that door. All right, let's look it over. Your son was using this car Saturday night. Yes. Why? What are you looking for? Hatchet had to be carted away from Driscoll's and there was blood on it. I'm looking for a stain. Well, you don't see any, do you? No. But I see a spot on the front seat that's cleaner than the rest. Can you smell that? It's been robbed with gasoline. Ranger, you're wrong. You've got to be wrong. My kid wouldn't do a thing like that. Out here, Robert. Now, here we are, Chase. Come on. What's the matter? Why did they take me out of school? Son. Son. Whatever you've done, me and your mall stand by you. Now, tell them the truth. You were at this old Saturday. Tell them you were. How about it, Robert? Gene said you just dropped by to pick up ticket stubs. I... I wasn't at the show. Why didn't you tell me? Why? I couldn't. Because of Sadie's father. He'd kill her. You better tell us what happened, boy. Why? Well, I picked up Sadie in the car at 6.30... We went into the movie house to leave the car with Gene and get the stubs. You left the car with Gene? Yes. So it'd be around the theater in case Sadie's pa came by. Well, then what happened? Then we arranged for Gene to meet us out at the crossroads between Lewis Place and Finney's at 11 o'clock. So I'd have the car to take Sadie home. See? See, Ranger? He didn't have the car all the time. Now, go ahead, Robert. Where did you and Sadie go? We, we went for a ride with... Somebody who picked us up behind the theater. What do you mean by somebody? Who? Sadie's mother. What? Why, Sadie Lewis's mother is dead. No, she isn't. That's what Mr. Lewis tells everybody. They were divorced before he moved here with Sadie. Could that be true, Sheriff? Well, Jace, I don't know. Mike Lewis always said his wife died. She didn't. He just hated her, that's all. And, well, if he finds out Sadie's been seeing her, he'll beat her up. All right, Robert. I think you're telling the truth. There's something I want you to identify. This. Why, that's our old Kinlan hatchet. Where'd you see it last? Well, the shack. Me and Gene built a shack up in the woods last fall. We go camping up there. I built most of it because Gene, he was working part-time after school at Finney's Ranch. That's right, Jace. Gene did work for Finney for a while. Come on, Sheriff. We'd better go pick him up. <coughs> He wasn't at his home, and he wasn't sick. We got the location of the shack he built with Robert Halleck, got horses, and rode into the woods to look for him. There's the shack, Jase, just through that clump of trees. Yeah. Come on, Charlie. Hey, the door's open, and it's Gene. Howdy, Gene. What are you doing up here? Let's come up to take you into town, Gene. A few things we want to ask you about. 
Well, like what? Like how you spent Saturday evening between the time you stopped taking tickets and the time you met Robert at the crossroad between the Lewis place and Finney's. Come on, Gene. I'll boost you up behind me. Well, can I... Can I get my jacket? It's inside. Go ahead. He don't look guilty, Jace. Not a bit rattled. I know. Well, we could be wrong, but you better give me your holster, Sheriff, if he's going to ride behind you. Yeah, I guess you're... Look out, Jace! Oh! oh. You hit, Sheriff? No, but I hit him. He had a rifle in there. Stepped out shooting just as you leaned over. Oh, you hit me. Yeah. Let's see. There's a flesh wound through the side. I didn't want to hurt him, but Mr. Driscoll wasn't going to let me graduate, the old fool. All right, shut up, huh? Hold still till I fix this wound. Will he be all right, Jace? Yeah. I'm sorry I had to do that, shooting a kid. Yeah, but his being a kid doesn't make you bulletproof. And it didn't stop him from killing Driscoll. There. All right, Sheriff. Let's rig a litter and carry him in. Brady was just old enough to stand formal trial for the murder of his high school instructor. On September 20th, 1941, he was taken to the state penitentiary at Huntsville to serve out a sentence of 25 years. And here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. There's a poem that was sent to me by Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez, who is commander of Company B of the Texas Rangers. It's not only amusing, but seems to reflect the thoughts of many a police officer. I hope you'll enjoy hearing it. It's called Not Guilty. I guess I've seen a thousand men go in this jail and out, from tramps with month-old whiskers to rich men with a gout. Not one of them was guilty of the crimes the law accused. Seems they were all just victims of some officer's abuse. From the time the keys are rattled till they're locked up in the cell, their voices, though they differ from a whisper to a yell, the song is always just the same that everyone will sing. I don't see why they put me here. I haven't done a thing. Makes no difference what they've done or how mean the crime has been. When they're locked behind those prison bars, they're always free from sin. Though the evidence be solid and their voice with guilt may ring, they'll stand right up and tell you, I haven't done a thing. Good night, folks. See you again next week. Good night. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Farley Bear, Mike Barrett, Sam Edwards, Joe Duval, Tom Cook, and Gerald Moore. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's music, fun, and prizes Monday through Friday on NBC to help your busy morning along. Tommy Bartlett brings you Welcome Travelers. Walter O'Keefe MCs Double or Nothing. Clever Quizmaster Bud Collier asks the questions on Break the Bank. Jack Birch presents Songs and Stories. And Dave Garraway with Melody and Humor. That's Monday through Friday on NBC. Now, hear the $64 question. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Mm-hmm.